Celebration Day, which is a blatant display of white supremacy. It is profoundly dangerous for the survival of American democracy if the people who run our elections do not believe in counting people's votes. It is clear that the threat of election subversion is present and grave. We must continue our oversight work to expose this audit and prevent anti-democratic election subversion laws from spreading any further. Thank you, and I yield back. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all so much for streaming live now from Fox. It is 6 a.m. this morning, a bright start to our Friday. A lot of people looking forward to the weekend, just like myself. Today is Friday, October 8th. And again, thank you all for choosing live now from Fox as your source of raw and unfiltered nonstop news. Taking a live look now from Washington, D.C. Now, on Thursday, the Senate voted to extend the nation's debt limit after Democrats and Republicans reached a deal to avoid a government default looming in less than two weeks. The vote only needed a simple majority to pass after 11 Republicans joined Democrats in voting to break the filibuster to extend the nation's debt limit for a few more months. Fox News correspondent Caroline Shively is in Washington, D.C. with more. Do you support the short-term debt ceiling deal? Biden crossed his fingers Thursday afternoon ahead of the Senate debate on increasing the debt limit ceiling by $480 billion and preventing the federal government from defaulting on its debt through early December. On this vote, the yeas are 50, the nays are 48. Republicans played a dangerous and risky partisan game, and I am glad that their brinksmanship did not work. Republicans had threatened to make Democrats raise the debt limit on their own, saying their planned future spending was out of control. But Thursday morning, GOP leaders said they'd struck a deal. The majority didn't have a plan to prevent default, so we stepped forward. But that's not how Democrats see it. Uh, look, McConnell blinked. Bluntly, the debt ceiling in the 11 years that I've been here has really only been used for dangerous games of chicken that back 10 years ago actually did affect our rating. Mm -hmm and hasn't produced greater fiscal discipline. Not all Republicans are on board with the plan. We have spending that is literally out of control. And then there's the timing. Putting it in December is another train wreck we've got to deal with that probably empowers Schumer more than us. If the House passes the bill, then it goes to the president's desk. He says he looks forward to signing it. But all of this has just kicked the can down the road for less than two months. In Washington, Caroline Shively, Fox News. Thank you to Caroline Shively for that report. And good morning again, everyone, if you're just now joining us. Thank you all so much for streaming live now from Fox. During our 6 o'clock hour, we are bringing you all the latest top stories and major headlines from across the country. We started off our show with the latest political news and now want to bring you all the latest information on the coronavirus front. So Pfizer is asking the Food and Drug Administration to approve its COVID-19 vaccine for use in kids. It could mean shots in millions more arms by Thanksgiving, and this is all happening as President Biden backs vaccine mandates and also declares them essential to ending the pandemic. Fox News correspondent Caroline Shively again is in Washington with the details. We're headed in the right direction if we don't, if we keep our eye on the ball here. Look, I know the vaccination requirements are a tough medicine. I'm popular with some politics for others, but they're life-saving. 
a game-changing for our country. We enacted a mandate the president, um, poll numbers internally have turned in, upside in down spring. On two issues once considered by Biden world to be winners. COVID, where he's now got a 48% approval rating, and the economy, where he's got a 39% approval rating, according to Quinnipiac. He's done everything he possibly could to divide it. Uh, the most recent example is these uh, unconstitutional mandates that are being incredibly corrosive. <laughs> No options are off uh, the table. Vaccination rates at workplaces with mandates outpaced workplaces without by more than 20 points, according to a report released by the White House. Vaccine requirements work. They're also good for the economy, and it gets people back into the workplace. The opposite could be true, according to some critics. In a very tight labor market, workers who don't want to uh, abide by Joe Biden's mandate can simply walk down the street to a new company, sometimes getting higher pay as well. Meantime, these employers are going to face thousands of dollars of fines if they don't act as Joe Biden's COVID police, all directly contradicting the promises he made, not just in the election, but after the election as well. That if promise came in response to a December job, question so from really Fox calm. News. Do you think the COVID vaccine should be mandatory? No, I don't think it should be mandatory. I wouldn't demand it be mandatory. What a difference 10 months makes. And we know there is no other way to beat the pandemic than to get the vast majority of Americans vaccinated. While I didn't race uh, to do it right away, that's why I've had to move toward requirements that everyone get vaccinated where I had the authority to do that. That wasn't my first instinct. Very reflective by the president, who also says that hospitals are so overcrowded right now, the wife of a close friend was having a hard time being seen by doctors at a Pennsylvania ER. So the president claims that last night he called the receiving nurse to ask what the situation was. We have followed up with officials here to see exactly what happened next. At the White House, Peter Ducey, Fox News. President Biden still making his rounds around the country, pushing the importance of vaccinations. Now today at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, President Biden will speak on the jobs report, not the June jobs report, but the October jobs report, and we will stream it all live for you all right here on Live Now from Fox. All right, I do want to move right along when it comes to the top stories that we are having this morning. Now to the latest on the ongoing situation at the United States-Mexico border. Republicans upset over the Biden administration's immigration policy are slamming Vice President Kamala Harris. This comes as Border Patrol agents continue to be caught up in dangerous situations involving illegal immigrants along the southern border. Fox News correspondent Bill Malusian has more. An illegal immigrant hitching a ride on a train flees from Texas DPS. Hey, Corey, turn around. You got one running. Seems like this becoming more and more common as the border crisis continues. The migrants use the trains in an attempt to get further into the United States, but Texas DPS has positioned members of its special operations group along the way. And using ATVs, they will chase the runners down and make arrests. One recent DPS arrest at the trains included this member of the Latin Kings, one of the most violent street gangs in the world. In Rio Grande City Wednesday night, we embedded with a Texas DPS trooper as he hunted for illegal immigrant runners hiding in the brush. Turn yourself in. These are the what migrants who do not want to be caught and do not turn themselves in. In Yuma, Arizona, Border Patrol says they arrested this child rapist after he crossed illegally. He had previous felony convictions for first degree child rape and incest. Also in Yuma, journalist Julio Rosas encountered three men from Uzbekistan who had just crossed into the U.S. illegally, and they showed him their Uzbek passports. Very, in his exclusive interview on Special Report, former security. U.S. Border not, Patrol Chief not, Rodney not. Scott said immigrants from over 150 countries have crossed illegally at our southern border, and there are more than 400,000 known gotaways so far this year who were never caught. So who's in that 400,000? I can't tell you, but I can tell you statistically, it always includes rapists, murderers, potential terrorists. Every single year, if you look at CBP statistics publicly available, those all exist in who we actually catch. So to think that there's not just as bad or worse people and those getting away would be naive. And tomorrow, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will be traveling to Mexico with a U.S. delegation where they'll be taking part in some high-level security talks between the U.S. 
and Mexico. As for Texas, Texas Governor Greg Abbott sent President Biden a letter today officially appealing FEMA's decision to not declare a disaster here at the southern border. Reporting in Roma, Texas, Bill Malugin, Fox News. Thanks, Bill, for that reporting on the southern border. We are going to stay in Texas for this next story, and that is because abortion rights advocates are breathing a sigh of relief after a federal judge temporarily strikes down one of the country's strictest abortion laws. Fox News senior correspondent Casey Stiegel has more from Dallas, Texas. My body, my choice. Texas lawmakers can no longer enforce the state's abortion law for now. That's after federal judge Robert Pittman ordered the Lone Star State to temporarily suspend its ban on most of the procedures. The life of every unborn child who has a heartbeat will be saved. The law went into effect last month, bringing with it a series of tight restrictions. The law does not allow abortions in Texas once cardiac activity is detected. It also does not allow abortions in cases of rape or incest. But Wednesday's federal order marks the first time the law has successfully been challenged. Experts say it was designed to avoid legal challenges with ordinary people, not the state cracking down on illegal abortions. The state leaves it up to private citizens to file lawsuits. And if someone were to successfully prove an abortion was performed, the law would grant them at least $10,000. Come sue me. I dare you. The Biden administration expressing joy over the ruling, with White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki writing, quote, the fight has only just begun, both in Texas and in many states across this country, where women's rights are currently under attack. Texas Republicans, meantime, have already appealed. Governor Abbott releasing a statement saying the most precious freedom is life itself. That's the very latest from Dallas. Casey Stiegel, Fox News. Swiftly approaching the 615 mark here at Live Now from Fox. If you're just now joining us, good morning. My name is Rain Augustine, and we are bringing you all the latest top stories from across the country. So that last story was in Texas, but we're going to bring you all from coast to coast. Here's the latest information on the search for Brian Laundry in Northport, Florida. The hunt is continuing at the 25,000 acre preserve in in Florida. Now the 23 year old's dad is involved in the search. Here's the latest from Fox News correspondent Kevin Cork. The search for Brian Laundry taking a turn. His dad, Chris, assisted law enforcement at a swampy nature preserve where Brian is believed to have been before going missing. The Laundry family attorney says authorities wanted Chris to show them areas Brian was known to frequent. He says, quote, there were no discoveries, but the effort was helpful to all. It seems the water in the preserve is receding and certain areas are more accessible to search. The fact that the father is now showing uh, his son's favorite places suggests to me that everybody's on the same page, that the intelligence points to his being in that swamp. The park Chris helped search is connected to the larger Carlton Reserve and sits on about 160 acres of heavily wooded land. Local residents tell Fox News it's possible Brian could survive inside with plenty of fresh water available at the park's public restrooms. Former Assistant FBI Director Chris Swecker says he's confident law enforcement will find the 23-year-old. They're in a full court press here trying to find him, and they will find him with the help of the U.S. Marshals and, and a you know, nationwide dragnet and international dragnet. Gabby Petito's parents and stepparents are urging Brian to turn himself in to help piece together the case. Gabby's mother with this message for Brian's parents. Tell your son to do the right thing and if you have contact with him. And um, if you know anything, please tell us. This week, Gabby's family officially launched a foundation in her honor, which will help families with missing loved ones. I'm Kevin Cork, Fox News. We are going to take a two minute commercial break here at Live Now from Fox. But in the meantime, I do want to bring you all this gorgeous live shot that we are getting from Detroit, Michigan. That's what we do here at Live Now from Fox. We have the ability to bring you all live images from across the country. And sometimes we even get international pictures. Again, you're streaming live now from Fox and we'll be right back.
Welcome back to Live Now from Fox. It looks as though the cameraman is having a lot of fun there in Detroit, Michigan. Looks like we're catching someone paddle boarding or canoeing. Really, really early this morning. It is, I believe, 520 there in Detroit, Michigan. But welcome back to Live Now from Fox. This is the voice of Rain Augustine. We are moving right along when it comes to the top stories that you need to begin your morning commute this morning. Here's your latest consumer news from your Fox News business brief. Jobless claims falling for the first time in a month. 326,000 Americans filed first-time unemployment benefits last week. That's fewer than analysts were expecting. Paying for health care is making a lot of people financially sick. A third of working Americans tell the Employee Benefit Research Institute their costs rose this year. The typical family of four covered by a workplace plan is expected to see prices rise 8% this year compared to last. And many say it is having negative negative financial side effects like reduced retirement savings and higher credit card debt. Stocks rallying again Thursday. Investors were happy to hear lawmakers reached a deal to extend the debt ceiling until December. A good sign for the travel industry and travelers ahead of the holidays, United Airlines says it's planning to increase the number of domestic flights to 3,500 a day in December. That's the most in the U.S. since the pandemic began. That's business. I'm Jerry Willis. And that was your latest Fox Means Business Brief. We're going to have a live update from President Biden at 1015. He will deliver our October jobs report. And we do plan to stream that all for you live right here on Live Now from Fox, because that's what we do. We bring you all live events, raw and unfiltered, so you, our viewers, can make your own informed opinion and decisions with limited commentary from us, the Live Now hosts. So let's continue with our top stories this morning. This story coming out of California. A backlog at California ports is only getting worse as retailers look for other ways to receive goods. The distribu distributions could have an impact on the holiday shopping season. Here's the latest from Fox News correspondent Ashley Strohmeyer. It's being dubbed container debt. Dozens of container ships are stuck outside terminals in Los Angeles and Long Beach, California, waiting to unload electronics, clothing and furniture. Port of Los Angeles officials say before the pandemic, it was rare to see more than one ship waiting. But COVID-19, a labor shortage and increased demand for goods have strained the supply chain. The quickest route from Asia to the United States and interior points is through Los Angeles. It's like taking 10 lanes of freeway traffic and squeezing them into five. There's increased urgency for a solution as the holiday season approaches. Retailers such as Target, Walmart and Home Depot are chartering their own vessels to beat supply chain disruptions. But some fear smaller businesses could take a hit. They don't have the ability to get goods in. A lot of a lot of these smaller publishers and stores are holding inventory in China, trying to wait out just the freight to see if it gets cheaper. The delays could result in higher prices for many items, but consumers are still expected to spend big this holiday season. Retail and tech advisory firm CoreSight Research predicts consumers will spend as much as 10% more this year, fueled in part by federal stimulus funds. But for those with popular items on their list, businesses urge you to shop early. Be patient with the with the companies right now. Um, it probably will be hard going into the holiday season. Um, you know, get out, do your shopping early. The Port of Los Angeles says incoming cargo is up about 30 percent from last year's record levels. Ashley Strohmeyer, Fox News. A Colorado, Colorado woman says that her organ transplant was denied all because she is unvaccinated from COVID-19. Fox's Evan Krugel has the story. If I'm not allowed to get a, a transplant, and you know, basically my, my life is in jeopardy. Leilani Lutali says she needs one thing to survive, a new kidney. But the Colorado Springs woman is now facing the possibility of not getting one if she continues refusing a COVID-19 vaccine. I have too many questions that, that remain unanswered at this point. I feel like I'm being coerced into not being able to wait and see and that I have to take the shot if I want this life-saving transplant. 
Lutali and her potential donor, Jamie Fogner, found out about the change last week while going through compatibility tests. Both say they have religious concerns with taking the vaccine. When I explained that, no, I wouldn't be able to take the COVID shot, the comment was, well, then your journey ends here because we require all of our donors and all of our recipients to have the COVID-19 vaccine. In a statement, UC Health confirming the new policy, saying in part, patients who have received a transplanted organ are at significant risk from COVID-19. Should they become infected, they are at particularly high risk of severe illness, hospitalization, and death. According to UC Health, studies show transplant patients are more than 10 times as likely to die from COVID-19 than the general public. UC Health saying this is why it's essential that both the recipient and the living donor be vaccinated. Lutali says she had COVID last summer and isn't terribly concerned. If I probably came down with a second case of COVID, it would be minimal. And my first time around, I was almost asymptomatic. So I'm not worried about that piece. If I'm not allowed to get the social media and tech giant says that it's establishing a $10 million creator fund to encourage virtual reality development on its platform. This is going to be called Horizon Worlds. The platform is still in beta testing and Facebook will roll out the cash in different ways. Community competitions will reward 10,000 in cash for the top three competitors and the company is encouraging people from diverse backgrounds to take part. Funding will be made available for developers making a difference in their communities. And again, thank you all so much for streaming live now from Fox. For a list of all of the ways that you can stream our nonstop news coverage, make sure that you all visit livenowfox.com. Now, one streaming platform that you definitely can stream us on is Tubi. So I do want to bring you all the latest from Jake Hamilton. He is a part of the Fox All-Stars group, and he's producing this next segment called Fox All-Stars, Tubi, and Takeout. Out, where we share our favorite picks on Tubi, your free at home and on the go entertainment streaming service, and what takeout to pair them with. In this episode, we're getting a little spooky just in time for Halloween, and I'm going old school. If you've never seen it, check out the original 1932 classic Universal Monster movie, The Mummy. If I could get my hands on you, I'd break your dried flesh to pieces. But your power is too strong. Boris Karloff as Emotep is one of the best monster movie performances ever. And the entire collection of these old black and white monster movies are not just a staple of classic horror cinema. They also laid the groundwork for a generation of monster movies to come. Looks as though he died in some sensationally unpleasant manner. The contorted muscles show that he struggled in the bandages. Buried alive. And if you're looking to pair some takeout with The Mummy, you know you have to go with a nice wrap. But be sure it's packed tight. You don't want anything scary to happen while you're eating it. What's up next, guys? All right, thanks a lot, Jake. Classic pick there with The Mummy from 1932. What's incredible to me is the practical effects filmmakers had to use back then. Without CGI, necessity really was the mother of invention. Now, I'm Kevin McCarthy with the Fox Entertainment All-Stars. And speaking of great horror films, but fast-forwarding many decades later, one of my all-time favorites is streaming right now on Tubi. It's called Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Benjamin Park. No Park. Sweeney Todd now. And he will have his revenge. The film is Tim Burton's adaptation of the Tony Award winning musical and stars Johnny Depp as the title character. The film has such a unique tone as we navigate this story through song and suspense, gorgeously haunting cinematography, incredible cast and performances from all. Now this is a perfect film for a Friday night. I would say stay in, order a pizza, get a meat lover's pizza. That'll pay homage to Mrs. Lovett's meat pies, which is a reference that you will see as you see the film. There are a few things that are better than dinner at a movie, and now Tubi has made that so much easier at home. Amanda, what's your pick?
Thanks, Kevin. I'm Amanda Salas, and while my fellow Fox Entertainment All-Stars have some frightful faves, mine is a little more loving. Why would Jeremy Milton want to hurt you? He attacked me at a dance in junior high, and he got sent to reform school because of it. Ten years is a long time. This could be anyone. Some kid that you all tease in the sixth grade is probably not worth getting all worked up with. Cue Cupid's Arrow. It's time for Valentine. The 2001 thriller turns the most romantic day of the year into the scariest. Watch out, ladies. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Denise Richards, Katherine Heigl, and Jessica Capshaw. The film also stars David Boreanaz. That's right. Before Bones, it was all about blood. I pair Valentine with my favorite sweet treat, chocolate-covered strawberries. Chocolate for Halloween and the red berry for all things valentine chef's kiss we're sharing the love on tubi because you can watch all of these movies and more for free just go to tubitv.com to get started which genre will we choose next to be continued to be continued make sure that you all are streaming live now from fox on the tubi app you can also download the fox app for our non-stop coverage let's take a quick commercial break here in the meantime look at this gorgeous shot that we're getting over sin city las vegas nevada nevada it's about 76 degrees there pretty hot to say that the sun's not even out but we know that las vegas is a pretty hot spot although the area is expecting cooler possibly wet days in the forecast in the near future all right we'll be right back you're streaming live now from fox
Welcome back to Live Now from Fox. Tesla is packing up and moving out of California. The electronic car company is putting California in the rear view mirror, moving its headquarters to Austin, Texas. CEO Elon Musk made the announcement on Thursday, saying Tesla will not be closing the doors on its Fremont, California location will and will also actually be expanding operations there, but will relocate the headquarters to Austin, Texas. Musk says that the California location has become too crowded and housing has gotten too expensive for employees. Talk about putting your employees first, huh? So let's move right along. How's this for the latest health news? According to new research published in the Games for Health journal, gaming is just as important as traditional exercise. Researchers concluded this after testing a group of patients with type 1 diabetes. The patients took part in both active video games and running on a treadmill. Afterwards, the subject's heart rate, blood pressure, and efficiency of oxygen consumption was tested. The researchers say that the results were similar to jogging or gaming while playing the Wii or Xbox Connect. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense because when you're playing the Wii or Xbox Connect, you are definitely using a lot of physical activity. So that makes a lot more sense. Let's stay on the topic of the latest health news. This next segment from Fox 13 Tampa is bringing us the latest on the Pfizer vaccine for children. for students in elementary school. Today, Pfizer officially requested approval for its shot for five to 11 year olds. Fox 13's Craig Patrick joins us now to show us what happens next and when those shots will likely be available for kids, Craig. We don't exactly know, but you can look at the calendar and get a pretty good estimate at this point because we now know the FDA Advisory Council, the independent panel of experts, has already scheduled October the 26th, two and a half weeks from now, in order to review this information. It could then at that point vote on it that very day. Shortly thereafter, that takes us on the fast track to then FDA approval, of course, CDC approval as well. That could only take just a couple of days perhaps thereafter. Uh, then there are a couple of other steps to roll it out across the nation, which is all suggesting that for kids ages 5 to 11, that this will all be approved and rolled out in the course of about a month. Even if the advisory committees vote on the same day they meet and the government approves the vaccine for 5 to 11 year olds the last week of October, it could still take us into November before the shots roll out for them. That's because the pharmacies would need to update their systems and they, Pfizer and the government, would have to make some slight adjustments in distribution. One, two, three, ready? All done. The 2,200 kids who participated in the trial got a smaller dose that tested to be just as effective for them as the larger dose is for adults. Excited and not surprised. We fully anticipated that these vaccines would be safe and effective in this age group. The appropriate uh, trials have been done, and uh, this is great news. So Pfizer is seeking approval for that smaller dose. And that means they'll have to nail down a way to make sure kids ages 5 to 11 get that smaller dose when it's approved, either through separate packaging and shipping or a dilution process that does not alter the vaccine dose's effectiveness. All of that may take a few extra days after the panels meet in late October and presumably vote to approve it. And that suggests the time frame for giving out the shots for children ages 5 to 11 is somewhere between Halloween and Thanksgiving. But either way, it's a two-shot vaccine given three weeks apart, which means once it is approved and rolls out, elementary students who get it should be fully vaccinated by or before Christmas. Which on that presumed time frame would be very, very good news for families all across the nation because while children in that age bracket are uh, statistically far less likely to contract serious illness if they do get infected, they can still transmit it just as easily to older family members, parents, mm -hmm. and grandparents. So that timeline lining up with the holidays certainly bodes well if we stay on that track. Again, the dosage 10 micrograms instead of 
30 micrograms that's been approved for older age groups at this point. We're only talking about Pfizer, not Moderna yet. That's still in the works and should follow in the not too distant future. And that smaller dose still appears to give kids the same level of protection shown to be very safe, very mild side effects. In fact, in fact side effects uh, milder than other age groups, most likely because they are getting a smaller dose they're not ready yet to move forward on those under the age of five, but the trials and the research is already underway on that. They would be looking at yet an even smaller dose, five micrograms under the age of five, once we reach that point, which would seem to be perhaps the first part of 2022. And Craig, what is the scientific reasoning behind giving younger children an even smaller dose? It's biological. They have a stronger defense system because our defense systems weaken over the course of time and with age. So children have naturally stronger defenses. Therefore, giving them a smaller dose can ultimately achieve the same level of antibodies and therefore the same level of protection. Craig Patrick with the latest on Pfizer's request now officially requesting its FDA approval for the use of a vaccine in kids ages 5 to 11. Thanks, Craig. We're now getting much closer. All right, a huge thank you to Fox 13 Tampa for that report. Again, Pfizer asking the Food and Drug Administration to approve its COVID-19 vaccines for kids. Now, staying on the topic of COVID-19 vaccines, there are clinical trials taking place across the country. Would you participate? There are mixed reactions from a lot of people, and Fox 11 Los Angeles is bringing us the latest. Thank you. 547. Right. Uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services currently looking for volunteers to take part in clinical trials for possible COVID-19 treatment. Yeah, the clinical trials are conducted in person and virtually all across the country, hoping to find a COVID-19 treatment. Dr. Rowena Dolar uh, joins us now as she's one of the doctors involved in this clinical trial testing, which I can't even begin to to, I think, emphasize the importance of this. Doctor, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. So, so what can participants expect if they, in fact, enroll in this clinical trial? If you enroll in a clinical trial, we will meet with you um, either by phone or in person to review the informed consent so we could go over the study procedures and review the risk and benefits for partic participating in the trial. Then you'll be randomly assigned to one of the study treatments that are being looked at in that trial. Um, you'll have you'll be asked to fill out surveys about your symptoms every day, either online or by phone. Um, you'll have frequent contact from the study team to check on your well-being and your safety. Uh, some of the trials require in-person visits to collect blood or nasopharyngeal samples to see how you're doing with the infection. Um, and many of these studies will reimburse participants for their time spent on any study related activities. Um, finally, we aim to share the results of the, the trial with participants before we share it with the larger public. Now, who can participate in this clinical, clinical trial? Um, what kind of people qualify and what's the age that you're looking for? Um, anybody who tests positive for COVID-19 and has symptoms can participate in these trials. And that includes those who have been vaccinated as well as those who have not been vaccinated. Um, these clinical trials will are being done either on patients who are hospitalized, but we also have trials that focus on those that don't require hospitalization or have been recently discharged from the hospital. Why is it so important to have a diverse population when it comes to th this type of, of, of trial? Great question. It's really important to have racial and ethnic diversity in these clinical trials, particularly for those in the black and Hispanic communities who have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 infections. So including communities of color in these clinical trials will be important to know that these treatments are also beneficial in those patient populations. We wanna make sure that the treatments that we have for COVID-19 are safe and effective for everybody. Where are the trials taking place? The trials are taking place all across the U.S. Um, and the U.S. territories, including Puerto Rico, wherever we can ship study medication. Um, there are over 800 clinical trial sites, and you can find those enrollment sites on the Combat, Co Combat COVID website, which is combatcovid.hhs.gov. 
Is there any reason for for anyone to be really concerned about participating in this particular trial? You know, people always have questions about, well, what if I do this? It's, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I guess people do worry about the risks of participating in a clinical trial. I can say that in general, these trials have a very low risk and they're very safe. So we're required by the federal government to follow strict protocols designed to protect the health and safety of the study participants. Um, and the members of the research team will review the study procedures and the risk and benefits with you before you participate um, in any of these studies. Dr. Dollar, I, I missed it in case you said it, but what was the age that you were looking for? Is there a specific oh. age range? So the age range, these, most of these trials are in adults, um, age 18 or older. The active six study, which I'm involved in, is age 30 or older because we are looking for adults that have a higher risk of developing mm. worsening complications from COVID um, infections. Okay, and where can people go if they want to participate? Um, people can visit the Combat COVID website, which is combatcovid.hhs.gov to learn more about the studies and to find an enrollment site that's near them. All right, combatcovid.hhs.gov hhs.gov. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Dollar, for your time. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Very important. 552 right now. Almost. Coming up at last <laughs> game. All right, huge thank you to Fox 11 Los Angeles for that report. Let's stay on this very topic because there's been a lot of controversy swirling around New York City's guidelines for not only athletes but performers. The rules for athletes and performers in the city do not apply to out of towners we are hearing in Fox 5's Robert Robert Moses is outside Madison Square Garden with the latest. Good morning, Robert. Rain, good morning to you. Yes, there's a lot of outrage over this. Many people can't make sense of this apparent contradiction. That is one standard for out of town athletes and performers at venues like Madison Square Garden, a totally different standard for audience members at those venues. Well, one state lawmaker is vowing to close that gaping loophole. A double standard. State Especially Senator Brad Hoyle's message to non-New York City-based performers and athletes goes something like this. Get jabbed or get out of town. As of now, they don't have to be vaccinated to perform and play here, even though audience members do. Hoyleman introduced legislation called the Fairly Applying Individual Requirements or Fair Vaccine Mandates Act to change that. I think it puts the public at risk. It puts employees who work at these venues at risk. And it sends a terrible message to New Yorkers that we have a different standard here for the public than we have for very well-known people who also, by the way, are in part responsible for a lot of vaccine misinformation. People like Joe Rogan, who performed at the Garden on Saturday and has expressed plenty of anti-vaccine feelings on his podcast. While Rogan has not disclosed his vaccination status, those who came to see him had to be fully vaccinated. Have your vaccine identification cards out, ladies and gentlemen. That double standard bothers some. It doesn't make sense. It needs to be consistent all across the board, I believe. Yet one woman we spoke to who says she is going to tonight's Chris Stapleton, uh, Chris Stapleton. concert at the Garden is not worried about Stapleton's vaccination status. Um, I would be okay with it if he was not, because I feel like there's a separation between the performers and us. The double standard will be on full display when the NBA season begins later this month. Case in point, as of now, Washington Wizards star Bradley Beal, who recently said he is unvaccinated, can play in New York City because he is not based here. Yet Brooklyn Nets star Kyrie Irving, another vaccine skeptic, will not be allowed to play in the city if he is unvaccinated. I urge uh, Mayor de Blasio to close the loophole. He could do that today if he wanted. But if he doesn't, we're going to pass a bill in Albany that's going to force him to do that. A mayor uh, spokeswoman tells Fox 5 that City Hall will review the legislation. To engage in youth in a whole new way, proactive. Robert, when it comes to athletes, we already know that the world of sports ushers in so much attention, right? So let's talk about Kyrie Irving with the Brooklyn Nets because he's been pretty outspoken about not getting vaccinated. 
Yeah, Rain, so as of now, he will not be able to play not only the 41 regular season home games at Barclays Center, his home arena in Brooklyn, but also two games against the Knicks here at Madison Square Garden. So that's 43 regular season games that as of right now, if he's not vaccinated, he will miss. So not only is that a lot of games, that's also a lot of missed paychecks. That's definitely a lot of mixed paychecks. So you're joining us now from uh, Times Square. Can you tell us about the vaccination rates in the city overall? And so according to city numbers, Rain, as of now, 64% of city residents here in New York are fully vaccinated. 71% have gotten at least one dose. Back to you. All right. Fox 5 New York's Robert Moses joining us with that live report from New York City. Now, we do know that President Biden has been very outspoken when it comes to pushing the coronavirus vaccine. It was just yesterday when he traveled to Michigan to push mandates and booster shots. So in case you missed that announcement from President Biden, I do want to replay it all replay it for you all right here on Live Now from Fox. And also remember that President Biden is expected to speak on the October jobs report. And we will have that live for you all today at 1015 Eastern right here on Live Now from Fox. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the passport into town. I tell you, every time I come to the greater Chicago area, there's somebody I want to steal and bring back to Washington, Gov. I've done it a couple times, you know. <laughs> any rate, uh, look, uh, Jerry, every company, uh, needs people like you, every single one. Someone who knows uh, what my dad taught me, and a lot of people who know me well, including the, uh, the governor's sister, who I worked closely with for eight years. My dad used to have an expression. He used to say, everyone's entitled to be treated with dignity. And Joey, a job's a hell of a lot more than about a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, Everything's going to be okay. That's the God's truth. He said every time, ever since he lost, things went south in Scranton, Pennsylvania when I was a kid and coal shut down. My dad was not a coal miner. I had a great grandfather who was a coal miner engineer, but, you know, he, he was a salesperson. Everything, we moved down to Wilmington, Delaware, a little town called Claymont, a little steel town where there's no steel anymore, but right on the border of Pennsylvania. And uh, it was always about the dignity of work. And what you've been doing here about this pandemic is about protecting the dignity, the dignity of your fellow Americans. You know, uh, you stayed in an operations mode, lining up protective equipment for the rest of the country, all around the country. And when the vaccine came out, you all stepped up and you got the shots. And as a company, you're getting more shots in arms. And I want to thank Auto for hosting us here at Clayco, one of the Midwest's biggest construction companies. Three billion dollars a year in revenue thousands of employees nationwide and here in Elk Grove, 100% union, not labor, union, <laughs> union. One of the reasons I said I ran was to rebuild this country, rebuild the backbone of the country. And I meant this sincerely. And the backbone is to build from the bottom up and the middle out. I'm a capitalist. I think these people should be, go, be able to go out and make a lot of money. That's not, that's not the problem, but everybody should have an even shot. And who built the middle class? Unions built the middle class. Without the, not a joke, without the unions, we would not have a middle class in America. So everybody owes you all. You know, you're constructing buildings for some of America's biggest companies, but you're also doing something bigger than that. You're helping us beat back COVID-19. So are the great leaders who are here today. JP, you, uh, Governor, you've done more than about anybody I can think of in any state. I mean that sincerely. You've stepped up. You've always done what you said you're going to do, and you've been relentless in getting people vaccinated. In the Midwest, you're leading. You're leading, and it's real. It's not. It's not hyperbole. And Mayor Lightfoot, who I said, please go back to work. I'm going to get in trouble. She had to leave, but Mayor Lightfoot, the same thing. And Elk Grove. Mayor Johnson, you've, uh, you, you've done a hell of a job as well. You know, we have 11 members of Congress here. Raja, thank you for hosting us in your district, for permission to come into the district. And I also want to thank uh, colleagues in the House of Representatives, Mike Quigley, Robin Kelly, Bobby Rush, Danny Davis, Jan Sikowski, an old friend, Bill Foster, Brad Schneider, Sean Caston, Lauren Underwood, and, uh, and Marie Newman. 
And I know, uh, and I, 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 for them, you don't quite under, you'd all understand it in a different context. But this is a busman's holiday for them to have to come here and other politicians speak. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not a joke, folks. I appreciate it. I genuinely appreciate it. I appreciate it. And, uh, and, and I know they wanted to be here, uh, but uh, there's others who are in Washington who can't be here. Dick Durbin and Tammy, who I've both spoken to, they, they're in Washington and hopefully, hopefully will be voting soon. And also, we've got state leadership here. Lieutenant Governor Julius here, Stratton, and the Ohio, Pennsylvania, the Ohio, Pennsylvania, I'm from Pennsylvania. The, uh, the, uh, the Illinois president uh, of the, uh, Don Harmon, State Senator Laura Murphy, State Rep. Uh, um, Martin Mo uh, Mo Moylan, and uh, we got great labor leaders here, too. Tim, wh where's Tim? There you go, Tim, thank you. Thank you, pal. AFL-CIO State President. And Jeff Isaacson, United Brotherhood of Carpenters, You've, and uh, Don Finn, IBW, uh, and, uh, and Robert Reiter, Reiter, R-E-I-T-E-R, Reiter, Chicago Federation of Labor. And folks, uh, that's how we beat COVID-19, by working together. We have an expression in that little town of Claymont I'm from. Uh, you all brung me to the dance, Labor. You're the, you're the reason I'm standing here. Not a joke. Not a joke. I can look and I was 29 years old to the United States Senate, 17 days before I was eligible to be sworn in. I had to wait around to be sworn in. Not a joke as well. And uh, I won by 3,300 votes and Labor. Labor, including the police unions as well as the firefighters, stood up and endorsed me. And because I, I kid with the governor, I said I grew up in a town called Claymont, Delaware from third grade on. I went to a little Catholic school called Holy Rosary, and across the street from Holy Rosary was, a, was the fire station. And the guys I grew up with, they became either a firefighter, a cop, or a priest. I wasn't qualified for any of them, so I had to be president. And so, but look, it's, it's been a month since I laid out a six-part plan to accelerate the path out of this pandemic. One, vaccinate the unvaccinated. Two, continue to keep the vaccinated protected. Keep children safe and schools open, which the governor's doing. Increase testing and masking. Protect the economic recovery and improve the care of the people with COVID-19. We've made real progress across the board. More than 185 million Americans are now fully vaccinated. More than 75 percent of eligible Americans have gotten at least one shot. We made great progress on equity as well, in, in closing the, the racial, the, the gaps in race as well as ethnic uh, vaccination rates. Recent data shows Latino Americans, Black Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans have now gotten vaccinated about the comparable rate as white Americans. That's not happened before. And our work on equity isn't done, but it's an important piece of progress. We're also starting to see less than 19, less COVID-19 cases in a vast majority of communities around the country. Cases are down this past month by 40 percent. Hospitalizations are down by 25 percent. We're headed in the right direction if we don't, if we keep our eye on the ball here. We still have a long way to go. The fact is, this has been a pandemic of the unvaccinated unvaccinated. The unvaccinated overcrowd our hospitals, overrunning emergency rooms and intensive care units. The unvaccinated patients are, are leaving no room for someone with a heart attack or in need of a cancer operation, and so much more because they can't get into the ICU, they can't get into the operating rooms. The unvaccinated also put our economy at risk because people are reluctant to go out. Think about this. Even in places where there is no restriction on going to restaurants and gyms and movie theaters, people are not going in anywhere near the numbers because they're worried they're going to get sick. I've tried everything in my power to get people vaccinated. First thing I did when I was sworn in office back in January 20th is I bought enough vaccine right off the bat to vaccinate every single American. There were only 4 million Americans who have been vaccinated up to that point, even though the virus had been around. Second, we made everyone eligible to get a vaccination and made it easy and convenient for them to find a place to get vaccinated, over 880,000 places around the country. Third, we gave everyone ample time and information to deal with their concerns. We developed hundreds of million, we, millions of dollars in incentives, you did here in the city and the state of, 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 of Illinois. 
in cities and community organizations to encourage vaccinations. Governor Pritzker, Pritzker, you've done one hell of a job in terms of encouraging people before we get to the mandate. But even after all these efforts, we still had more than a quarter of the people in the United States who were eligible for vaccinations but didn't get the shot. And we know there is no other way to beat the pandemic than to get the vast majority of Americans vaccinated. It's as simple as that. And to, and to, to spread to our children, to spread throughout society, in our hospitals, or the risk of other variants, it's all dangerous and obvious, but we're still not there. We have to beat this thing. So while I didn't race uh, to do it right away, that's why I've had to move toward requirements that everyone get vaccinated where I had the authority to do that. That wasn't my first instinct. My administration is now requiring federal workers to be vaccinated. We've also required federal contractors to be vaccinated. If you have a contract with the federal government working for the federal government, you have to be vaccinated. We're requiring active duty military to be vaccinated. We're making sure healthcare workers are vaccinated because if you seek care at a healthcare facility, you should have the certainty that the pro people providing that care are protected from COVID and cannot spread it to you. The Labor Department is going to shortly issue an emergency rule, which I asked for several weeks ago, and they're going through the process to require all employees with more than 100 people, whether they work for the federal government or not, this is within the uh, in the purview of the Labor Department to ensure their workers are fully vaccinated or face testing at least once a week. In total, this Labor Department vaccination requirement will cover 100 million Americans, about two thirds of all the people who work in America. And here's the deal. These requirements are already proving that they work. Starting in July, when I announced the first vaccination requirement for the federal government, about 95 million eligible Americans were unvaccinated. This was mentioned a little bit earlier. Today, we reduced that number to 67 eligible Americans who aren't vaccinated. And today, we released a new report outlining effective vaccination requirements that are already proving their, their worth. This report shows three things. First, vaccination requirements result in more people getting vaccinated. In the past few weeks, as more and more organizations have implemented their own requirements, they've seen their vaccination rates rise dramatically. For example, the Department of Defense has gone from 67 percent of active duty forces being vaccinated to 97 percent as of tomorrow. Vaccination just six weeks into this vaccination requirement. That's how quickly it's moved. We're also seeing this at colleges and universities across the country. More than 95 percent of students at colleges and universities like Northwestern University of Illinois, Chicago, are vaccinated. And we're going to see it in health systems around the country as well. Rush University Medical Center here in Chicago has gone from 72 percent to more than 95 percent of its employees fully vaccinated under its requirements. These requirements work. And as the Business Roundtable and others told me when I announced the first requirement, that encouraged businesses to feel they could come in and demand the same thing of their employees. More people are getting vaccinated. More lives are being saved. Let's be clear. When you see headlines and reports of mass firings and hundreds of people losing their jobs, look at the bigger story. I've spoken with Scott Kirby, CEO of United Airlines, who's here today. United went from 59 percent of their employees to 99 percent of their employees in less than two months after implementing the requirement. 99 percent. And by the way, Scott, I want you to know I've instructed the Justice Department to make sure that we deal with the violence on aircraft coming from those people who are taking issues. We're going to deal with that. In the last days of their implementation, they cut the remaining number of employees left to get vaccinated in half. They went from 67,000 United employees to 66, of 67,000, 66,800 complied. People chose to get vaccinated. That's why we're seeing more companies signing up. I recently met with the CEOs of Disney, Microsoft, who you're familiar with here, Walgreens, to hear about their requirements. The Business Roundtable represents 200 of the largest businesses in the world and is championing vaccination requirements to keep businesses open and workers safe. America's largest aerospace companies, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, who I met with yesterday, the chairman of the board, Northrop Grumman, they all just announced plans to implement vaccination requirements. <clears throat> Even 
This I always get a kick out of. Fox News. <laughs> Fox News requires vaccinations for all employees. Give me a break. Fox News. And over the past week, we've seen American, Southwest, Alaska, JetBlue Airlines all announce requirements. The leaders of Chicago are step stepping up. As I said, the mayor, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, Governor Prisker are requiring vaccinations for state and city workers, health care workers, and teachers. Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, Jack Levin, who is here, has called for all members of, his, of, the, of the chamber to require vaccinations for their employees going back to work in person. And I came here to Clayco to thank this company for doing the right thing. Today, Clayco is announcing it's going to require all employees to be fully vaccinated or test once a week. It matters. I know these decisions aren't easy, but you're setting an example and a powerful example. Second thing I'd like to say, today's report shows that vaccination requirements are good for the economy. Not only increasing vaccination rates, but to help send people back to work. Back to work. You know, when I first started the vaccination program and we got all that vac vaccine enough for everyone, we're vaccinating three million people a day. We're getting very close before things began to slow down. The economy is growing leaps and bounds. Six percent, the fastest growing major economy in the world. In fact, increased vaccination coverage results in as many as 5 million American workers going back to work because they feel safe they can go back to work. There'll be more economic demand to drive people back to the workforce. But don't take it from me, not from some, you know, liberal think tank this comes from. But here's what Wall Street's saying. Goldman Sachs, quote, vaccinations will have a positive impact on employment. It means less spread of COVID-19, which will help people return to work. Moody's on Wall Street. Vaccination means fewer infections, hospitalizations, and death. In turn, it means a stronger economy. One economist called vaccine requirements, and I quote, the single most powerful, he didn't say single, the most powerful economic stimulus ever enacted, end of quote. Third point I'd like to make. The report shows that vaccination requirements have broad public support. Yes, some object, and some object very strenuously. And some are making a political statement out of this issue. But a strong bipartisan majority of Americans support vaccinations. They know it isn't about politics. It's about life and death. That's what it's about. It's about looking out for one another. It's about being patriotic, doing the right thing. Folks, vaccination requirements work, and there's nothing new about them. They've been around for decades. We've been living with these requirements throughout our lives. Students, healthcare professionals, our troops have been required to see vaccination for everything from polio to measles to mumps to rubella. And the reason most people in America don't worry about polio, measles, mumps, rubella is because they've been vaccinated. I don't quite get this, you know, why it's a matter of no violation of your right to be able to go to school or get a job to have etc. But now, it's a great cause to celebrate. So today, I'm calling the more employers to act. My message is require your employees to get vaccinated. With vaccinations, we're going to beat this pandemic finally. But without them, we face endless months of chaos in our hospitals, damage to our economy, and anxiety in our schools, and empty restaurants, and much less commerce. Look, I know the vaccination requirements are a tough medicine. I'm popular with some, politics for others, but they're life-saving. They're game-changing for our country. We're in a position to leap forward in a way that we haven't for a long, long time economically. Businesses have more power than ever before to change the arc of this pandemic and save lives and protect and grow our economy. So as president, I'm going to continue to do everything I can to get us out of this pandemic. I look forward to more businesses joining that effort. And for folks who haven't gotten vaccinated, get it done. Do the right thing. It can save your life. It can save the lives of those around you. You know, if I can digress for just a second, last night I was on the television, on television. I was 
on the telephone with uh, a person at an emergency hospital ward in Pennsylvania because a good friend had called and he had rushed his significant other to the emergency room because this woman was having trouble breathing, had a high fever, and could not really catch her breath. And they got her into the hospital, but the waiting room was so crowded, things were so backed up, they couldn't even get her to be seen initially. So because I knew this person, I called, I called the desk, the receiving nurse, and asked what the situation was. And has anyone even, and by the way, I wasn't complaining because they're getting the living hell kicked out of them, by the way. Doctors and nurses, some of them are just, they're running dry. I really mean it. They're getting the living hell kicked out of them, and sometimes physically. And to make a long story short, it took a while because all of the, not all, the vast majority of the emergency rooms and the docs were occupied taking care of COVID patients. I bet every one of you can name somebody who got sent to the hospital with something other than COVID and couldn't get it taken care of. How many people do you know, I know, who've had to put off elective surgery, surgery they need done, but they couldn't get a hospital room? Didn't mean they were going to die in many cases, but some places in the world that's happening. You can't even get to the, do the elective surgery that's necessary, particularly for a lot of cancer patients. So look, things are changing, and we can end this. We can end this thing. It's easy, it's accessible, and it's free to get the vaccine. Text your zip code to 438829, 438829. Text your zip code there, or visit vaccines.gov to find a vaccination location near you. I promise there's one within five minutes of where you are, 15 minutes of where you are. And it's free. Let me close with this. We have a plan. We have the tools. We're using them. We're making progress. We just have to finish the job. Finish the job. So for God's sake, for your own sake, for the sake of your families, get vaccinated. We can do this. We can do this if we do it together. And we can literally change the circumstances, the health, the camaraderie, the employment, and the access to a growing economy if we step up and lead the world. And one last thing I'd like to mention, which is not directly, it's not part of what I was going to say today, but I've made a commitment that just like World War II, we were the arsenal of democracy providing the means by which the Allies could fight and win the war. We're the arsenal of vaccines. I've not only purchased enough vaccine to make sure every single American can get a vaccine shot, get the full dose, and a booster, but provided for already we put out a million eight hundred thousand doses of vaccines in other parts of the world, and we're going to end up doing over a billion, 200 million doses between now and the end of the first quarter of next year. Because, you know, it's not just being decent and honorable what we, what, we, what we can do, but it's in our own naked interest. If we haven't learned before, you can't build a wall high enough to keep out you can't, a virus. You can't do it. You cannot do it. So we have an obligation in our own naked self-interest to help other countries. And by the way, I've, get, I've traveled the world. I've met with all the major world leaders, and I'm going to continue to meet with them. And guess what? Other countries are making like they're really doing a great deal. We have provided more vaccines around the world than every other country in the world combined combined. And guess what? President Biden making his case for COVID-19 vaccine mandates and booster shots. Make sure you all stream President Biden's live announcement on the jobs report right here on live now from Fox. That's taking place today at 10 15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Taking a quick commercial break here. In the meantime, let's enjoy this beautiful shot from Houston, Texas.
Welcome back to Live Now from Fox. We are taking a live now look over the city of Houston, Texas. A lot of people just now beginning their morning commute. It's just after 6.15 a.m. there in Houston in the long Lone Star State. I do want to bring you all the latest information from one of Houston's neighboring cities, I guess we can say this, coming from right outside of Dallas, Texas, Arlington, Texas, to be specific. The student accused of opening fire at an Arlington high school is released on $75,000 bond. Before his release from jail, family of 18 year old Timothy Simpkins prayed outside for all of those wounded in Wednesday's shooting at Timberview High School. Simpkins is accused of injuring two students and two teachers, including a 15 year old boy who is still in critical condition. Police say the shooting happened after Simpkins got involved in a fight with another student. His family says the teen was being bullied and was trying to protect himself. They also allege that there are documented reports of ongoing incidents between him and other students. Let's check in with Fox 4 Dallas for the most recent developments on this story. Classes canceled today at Timberview High School in Arlington following a shooting on campus there. Yeah, that school is part of Mansfield ISD. The accused gunman, 18-year-old Timothy Simpkins, turned himself into police hours after yesterday's shooting. Police say it was a targeted attack following a fist fight that he was involved in. Two students and two teachers were hurt. A 15-year-old boy was shot and critically injured. A teenage girl grazed by a bullet has been treated and released from the hospital. A 25-year-old teacher was also shot but is expected to be okay. A pregnant teacher was injured in a fall but not hospitalized. Well, the family of the shooting suspect said that he was bullied, and uh, that's going to be part of the police investigation, as you can imagine. And joining me now is Assistant Arlington Police Chief Kevin Colby. Good morning to you. Thanks for being with us. I have detectives interviewed Timothy Simpkins uh, since he turned himself in. What do you know about that? Yeah, good morning, Lauren. Uh, yeah, we he turned himself in with an attorney, and of course, uh, he, uh, he waived his right to, uh, to make any statements at this time, so we don't have any information. So our, our case is uh, going to be based on uh, eyewitness testimony, uh, videos, and uh, physical evidence that we, we've already gathered. You know, we heard from his family, and the family says that he was trying to protect himself, that he had been bullied, that there were all these different incidents with other students. Uh, what, what can you tell us uh, about that and, and how far you're going to be looking into the past? Oh, absolutely. We're going to be looking into any allegations of bullying, uh, basically his past history, the school history. But again, that's part of the investigations that the detectives will uncover through multiple interviews of not only students, but uh, dealing with the teachers in, 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 in the school, as well as the parents. Uh, we are aware of the allegations are, that are made for that. But I just want to, I want to stress that you know, uh, we don't accept bullying and, and, and you know, we it's the responsibility of, of the teachers to, to deal with some of those things in Mansfield Independent School District. And, and again, there was a police department that was there that responded uh, quickly to the, that shooting incident. But even if you're bullying, there, there are other options besides carrying a gun into mm -hmm. a school and using a gun uh, in a situation like that. That's just that's just not acceptable today. Yeah, this is a, a 45 caliber gun for, for those that don't know much about guns. I mean, how powerful of a weapon are we talking about here? And, and do we know where he got it from? No, uh, currently we have given uh, the, the gun over to uh, ATF and they have done a tracing. Uh, I will tell you uh, that we recovered uh, several other weapons in search warrants and uh, ATF has done forensics and has matched that weapon with the, the casings uh, that were found in the school. So we are a uh, high confident degree that we have the weapon that was used. But the 45 caliber is a very large caliber handgun and it is very, uh, uh, very potent, very deadly. I was talking to a teacher who uh, taught at that school for 16 years and said that guns are an issue uh, at the school. Does this does this incident make it clear that uh, not enough safety measures are, are, are in place right now? And, and what do you think will happen as a result? Well, I think I think Mansfield Independent School District uh, needs to reevaluate some of their safety measures, needs to look at uh, maybe some history. I will tell you that 
over the past several years, we have seen an increase in our youth uh, in Arlington, around the other cities too, carrying weapons. And we just can't stress enough that, you know, today uh, young kids carrying weapons is just not a solution uh, to any type of, uh, of violence or anything like that. So there's, there's, there's several things that we have to work on. And one is socially uh, understanding that uh, kids are wear, uh, having weapons, but also we need to look at our schools. How can we ensure that these kids can enjoy a safe environment, a learning environment in some of our schools? So there'll be a lot of reviews, uh, not only from the independent school district, but the police department and, and multiple cities that yeah. were involved in this uh, for safety measures. Yeah, and by other school districts as well. I know something that the other school districts, you know, even far and wide, are going to be looking at the response yesterday, which I think has been praised by by many people, at least you know, all the emergency personnel. This is something that I know you guys train for. And uh, I mean, there were so many different agencies. And uh, let me know what went right and what needs improving. Yes, I mean, it, it was a model response. Now, first of all, I will tell you that uh, Mansfield Independent School District had two officers there that responded quickly to a distress call when they heard a distress call from the teacher. And as one of the officers was making his way to second floor, he heard the shots. Of course, the individual subject left and they provided medical attention. When that call went out as a shooting and, and, and people were injured, every local police department, Mansfield Police Department, uh, Arlington Police Department, Grand Prairie, they were all coming uh, to, to provide a lockdown procedures, which we have practiced in the past. Uh, so it was a unified effort. We had uh, the ATF that will also respond from federal services to provide uh, uh, investigation resources and the FBI uh, also responds. So in, in a situation like that, when you have 1,700 kids in a school and they go through the appropriate protocols that they have been taught to lock down, it takes a lot of law enforcement resources to go in and clear and make sure that these kids are safe. Were you happy with how quickly the response was to making sure the threat was over? Yes, yes, I, I believe so. I think that uh, we have trained and learned so many lessons from Back in the Columbine day, mm -hmm. uh, that any time that we have uh, what we call an active shooter uh, call uh, or any type of violence at a school, that two or more police officers, the first one, they're going into the building. And we're going to go in, and our job is to try to identify that threat, uh, neutralize that threat, right. and provide aid and safety to those uh, victims. Arlington, Assistant Arlington Police Chief uh, Kevin Colby, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the additional information on uh, what's going on. Appreciate it. And now to a story that we first brought you on Thursday here at Live Now from Fox. The desperate search is continuing for missing three-year-old child in Grimes County, Texas. The search is now entering day three as intense efforts to find the missing three-year-old Christopher Ramirez, who only speaks Spanish, but responds to his name ramps up. He was last seen on Wednesday afternoon after a neighbor saw him chasing a dog down the street and then never returned. Since then, dive teams and search crews, as you see here, have worked tirelessly combing through every inch of woods and different bodies of water. His mother now desperate for his safe return. Let's check in with Fox 26 Houston for the latest. Rescue crews, uh, law enforcement, even concerned citizens, all of them working together to try and find little Christopher. I can tell you that I spoke with the sheriff uh, tonight and he says they'll be out here all throughout the night uh, and as long as it takes until they find this child. We're not leaving until we find him. The desperate search for three year old Christopher Ramirez is still underway. He was last seen around 1 30 Wednesday afternoon. A neighbor told his mom she saw him chasing their dog down the road. The dog came back. But that was the last time anyone saw Christopher. Survival is, uh, fortunately, where it's not too hot. Fortunately, uh, he's young. Fortunately, there's a lot of prayers from so many people. Dive teams and search crews have been working tirelessly, combing through every inch of the woods and different parts of the water. Thursday evening, officials completely drained a pond nearby. Thankfully, they didn't find Christopher at the bottom. I was hoping that, that, that worried me that uh, 
young man might have fell in the stock tank. Christopher's mom believes someone may have abducted him. She thinks somebody has her son and is hiding him from her. But Grimes County Sheriff Don Sowell says right now there's no evidence of foul play. But they have and will continue to canvas the surrounding areas. Sheriff Sowell says right now they still believe they can bring Christopher home safe. We're still a rescue mission, not a recovery mission. And the sheriff says it's going to take the entire community to bring this child home safe. He wants to remind people if you see anything, if you know anything, if you hear something, pick up the phone and call authorities. Reporting in Grimes County, I'm Gabby Hart, Fox 26 News. Yeah, all throughout the Brian Laundry has been on the run for several weeks since his fiance Gabby Petito was declared missing and the Petito family believes that Brian could be the missing piece to the puzzle. We now know that Brian's father has joined the search operation. Take a look at this video that live now Fox received less than 24 hours ago. Christopher Laundry, the father of Brian Laundry, visited the environmental park in Florida on Thursday to assist law enforcement in searching for his fugitive son. Laundry spent about three and a half hours with police. You can see him in this truck right here as he was leaving. Brian, who's 23, remains a person of interest in the homicide of Gabby Petito. He's also alleged to have committed debit card fraud. So this is a story that we are closely following here on Live Now from Fox, and we are bringing you the latest up-to-date information and video as it relates to search efforts in real time. And if you're just now joining us, we are almost at the 7.30 a.m. mark. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for waking up with us. This is live now from Fox, your front row seat to raw and unfiltered nonstop news. All right, we're going to take a two minute commercial break and we'll have more raw and unfiltered news right after this.
Welcome back to Live Now from Fox. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Looks like a foggy morning there in Detroit, Michigan. We like to bring you all live images of major cities across the United States. And sometimes we even bring you international pictures when we get them here at our desk. Let's move right along with a story that has definitely been gaining national attention after a federal judge temporarily strikes down one of the country's most restrictive abortion laws. Live now from Fox's Daytona Everett is bringing us the latest. You're watching Live Now from Fox. I'm Daytona Everett. I am joined by Jessica Levinson. She is our constitutional law expert, a professor at Loyola Law. Thank you so much for being on the show again, Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of legal news out of Texas. For sure. So we actually spoke last night over the phone um, talking about what is going on with abortions in Texas. A, a new restrictive law was passed not long ago. And then there was obviously a block, a possible block of the new law. And then that was appealed. It's confusing for all of us. Can you break it down? It's super confusing, but I think you actually did a great job of explaining what's going on. Uh, on September 1st, SB 8, Texas's uh, restrictive abortion law that essentially bans all abortions after six weeks of pregnancy went into effect. It went into effect uh, mainly because the Supreme Court didn't block it. And then the next day said, here's why we're not blocking it. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a number of lawsuits since then, but the one that made news yesterday is a district court judge, Judge Pittman out of Texas, who was appointed by President Obama, said, Texas, stop enforcing this law. So any members of the Texas government, whether it be the clerk who accepts a filing or a judge who oversees a hearing, do not enforce this law. Now, this is a really weird case, and I think this is where it gets kind of confusing because Texas's law isn't set up like other abortion laws where if you violate it, then the government comes in and enforces that law and prosecutes the violation. Instead, Texas's law says any private individual can sue another private individual for aiding, abetting, or abetting a woman in trying to obtain an abortion. So it's really private person versus private person. Now, what happened in this particular case, the Department of Justice, the federal government sued Texas and they said, we get to sue you because you passed a law and members of your government are implementing a law that violates the federal law. What's the federal law? Basically Roe versus Wade. Right. It, Texas defended themselves in this law, in this lawsuit, and they said, we're not the ones enforcing this. You know, basically try your hands somewhere else. And what happened uh, yesterday on Wednesday is that the district court judge said, I do have jurisdiction. I can rule in this case. Texas, you can be enjoined, meaning you can be stopped from implementing this law. And uh, the judge said he doesn't think that the law is constitutional. So that's what has already happened. Okay. Well, we're seeing some of these clinics open back up today um, and start to be operating again. If you're speaking to a girl right now who is in Texas who wants to get abortion. Could she get one done legally? Yeah, the reason I'm pausing is because strangely, this actually isn't a totally straightforward answer. Right. So I believe there's a 24 hour waiting period in Texas. So you can get the ball rolling on that right now. Now, the reason I pause is for two reasons. I think that Texas's the decision in the district court to push pause on Texas's law will likely be temporary. Mm -hmm. So the appeal went from Texas, went straight to the Fifth Circuit, I think within an hour. Mm -hmm. The Fifth Circuit is very conservative. I think they're likely to overturn this district court decision. The other reason that I kind of paused is because Texas's law is written so that if you do help a woman obtain an abortion while there's an injunction, meaning while a judge has paused that law, then you can later be sued if that injunction is lifted. So anybody who's helping that woman obtain an abortion is potentially going to be sued 
when and if that injunction is lifted. That's why it's it's a very complicated legal and practical answer. Is there a timeline on all of this? Because like you said, it, it took just an hour for it to be appealed last night. So what is the timeline on the possible lifting of the injunction? So I believe that was actually just the notice of appeal. It was, hey, Fifth Circuit, like we're coming, get ready for what we're gonna ask you to do, which is basically swat away what the trial court did. Is there a timeline? No, I mean, everybody understands that this time is of the essence, but the Fifth Circuit can take a day, a week. If they want to take a month, they can. I don't think that they will. But there's nothing in this case where it, something is set in a court mm -hmm. and you can't change that date. This is really a kind of an education for people that federal judges can set their own timelines. Yeah, which it brings up an interesting point for these abortion clinics because as we know with the pandemic businesses can't close their doors and open their doors the next day there's a lot that goes into that so there's a lot of questions right now for these abortion clinics and for women um, out in texas in hopes of getting an abortion you know i don't know if you have a clear answer for either of those parties well, I mean, I think the answer, frankly, depends on your risk tolerance. So for women who are able to um, find an abortion provider who's willing to take on the risk that this injunction could be lifted really at any time and that whoever helps that woman could later be sued and that they could owe money damages, then, you know, you can go forward. It really depends on who you can find, whether or not they can withstand one of these lawsuits again, when and if an injunction is, is lifted. And do we know what they would be facing? So we know that um, you can face, I think really an indefinite number of lawsuits from private individuals. And if those individuals are successful against you, you pay $10,000, your attorney's fees, and the other person's attorney's fees as well. So it, it really does add up. Yeah, um, especially depending on how many patients um, that these clinics are taking in at this time. You know, I think that clears up a lot of the questions that people have right now. Our focus is on Texas, but we brought up an interesting point yesterday um, talking about how Texas could just be a precedent for other states. Do you still feel the same way? I do. In in the 24 hours, my mind, although it often does change, has not changed that much. I will say, I think we need kind of a longer horizon to determine whether or not other states like Florida will pass laws that look like Texas's law. And the reason I say that is, as you know, and as we've talked about, there's this big Mississippi case that will be heard before the Supreme Court on December 1st. Mississippi essentially bans all abortions after 15 weeks. There's really no way to square that law with Roe versus Wade. And I think for a lot of us, we thought, well, we're just going to be waiting till June 2022 when the court makes its decision in that case, really to determine what the landscape is going to look like, what states can do in terms of restricting access to an abortion. I still think that that long-term horizon is largely true, but what people should look for is that this Texas case could keep going up and mm -hmm. down the federal court system. Frankly, I think that Judge Pittman's ruling, we know it's going to the Fifth Circuit. Whoever loses almost certainly will go to the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court is going to have to answer again mm -hmm. about what's happening with this temporary injunction in Texas before it even hears that Mississippi case on December 1st. Right. So you think before December, we could be getting some answers from as high as the Supreme Court? Not definitive answers about the constitutionality of Texas's law, but really good indications about what the Supreme Court is thinking. Mm, interesting. All right. Well, I'm going to leave it on that cliffhanger. <laughs> Jessica Levinson, thank you so much for being on the show. We appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thank you. You're streaming live now from Fox, taking a two minute commercial break here for most of our viewers, taking a live now look over Washington, D.C., closely approaching that 745 a.m. mark here on the East Coast. Don't go anywhere. More nonstop news is right after this.
Welcome back to Live Now from Fox. We're taking a Live Now look over the city of Washington, D.C. It's almost 8 a.m. on the East Coast. Now, if you are unfamiliar with Live Now from Fox, what we like to do here is check in with our Fox-owned and operated television stations across the country. So I'd like to use this opportunity to check in with Fox 5 D.C.'s Melanie Alnwick, who's joining us from Northwest D.C. So, Melanie, we've been hearing a little bit about this story Tell us about how the Kennedy Center's stagehands recently voted to authorize a strike. Am I correct? That's right. So they have been negotiating for 16 months on a contract, and those contract negotiations have stalled. So union members voted to authorize a strike. There is still perhaps a little bit of time to avert this action, but uh, it could come as early as next week. Meanwhile, the Kennedy Center, this is a really critical time for them. They just reopened two live theater performances and Hades Town, a Tony Award winning musical, the traveling show is scheduled to open next week. And this was really said to be uh, the Kennedy Center's triumphant return to live performances. So this could definitely uh, be a big problem here for the Kennedy Center and its audiences. So the other thing that a lot of people maybe they know but they don't really think too hard about is the fact that it takes a lot of people behind the scenes to make these productions happen and so we're talking about the stagehands here from the international alliance of theatrical stage employees or iatsi so workers say they are facing wage cuts job cuts and they want better health and safety protections the local union president said that the management here is using the pandemic as a way to slash their contract at the same time that they took millions in federal relief dollars just as large audiences are scheduled to return the kennedy center though says it has a problem here because the union is also saying they want all stagehands to be union hires and not just at the kennedy center main building itself but anywhere that they might travel for performances. And the Kennedy Center says, look, we're facing a $16 million deficit projected this year and next year. And if you force us to use union employment everywhere we are, that that's going to be too expensive. So that's really where things are held up. There's a lot of people now that are holding tickets for Hades Town, waiting and wondering what they're going to do. And the Kennedy Center is telling them, Rain, just to hang on a little longer. Just hang on a little longer. All right, Melanie. Well, we'll check in with you as the story develops. Thank you so much for sharing the latest developments. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's move right along with our top stories this morning. This next segment is from Fox 32 Chicago. They're bringing us the latest when it comes to teen bullying. having a little bit of trouble playing this story. Let's check in with Fox 6 Milwaukee for the latest. Also on a natural high, Tim Van Voren goes beyond the game. Look up in the sky. It's not a bird. It's not a plane. It's high diver Braden Rumpin. Every time you go up higher, the pool looks smaller and smaller. Braden has a cool, if fairly typical, diving backstory. Started as a kid, competed in club and high school, winning the state championship in 2019, and landing a spot on the Badger squad. And then, after his freshman year... Over the summer, I was looking for a job, and I saw a posting on Instagram from another high diver. And he basically said, I'm looking for a high diver ASAP. <laughs> Does anyone want to do it? And I direct messaged him and I was like, I'd love to do it. A week later, Braden was in Alabama where he spent the summer participating in high dive shows with the emphasis on show. The more you could do in the air, the more reaction you got from the crowd. The biggest thing is to break up your dives into each individual component and do those at lower heights. So just off the side of the pool, like maybe a foot above the water, you would practice your takeoff a whole bunch of times. And then from three meter, you would practice the flight of the dive, all the flips and the positions and all of that. And then 
from about 10 meters, you work on the entries that come out and spotting the water and making sure that you're tight to survive and withstand the impact. In traditional competitive diving, 10 meters is the highest height a diver would enter the water from. In Braden's new life, he's at least double that. This kind of works really well for me because I'm an engineer. So you can kind of do the calculations and see, oh, it takes 1.4 seconds to fall 10 meters, but it takes about 2.3 seconds to fall from 27 meters. So then you can kind of take the number of flips that you're doing on 10 and being like, okay, so I have an extra second. I can probably add maybe two flips. And then from there, you just have to do a lot of visualizations and a lot of drills to make sure that you can do it safely. Braden says safely and survive because those concepts accompany him all the way up and all the way down as a high diver. He also peppers his conversations with fun, but doesn't use a different F word. I wouldn't say I'm fearless because every time I got up there, there's a little bit of fear. Sometimes there's a lot of fear, but you just have to manage it and believe in yourself and trust your preparation. When you get it right, it's super, man. Tim Van Voren, Fox 6 Sports. I guess diving high. People realize that it's wrong. And that way parents can teach their kids not to do it. That is a 13-year-old girl describing her reaction today after being attacked by bullies at school in May. That attack left her with a bloody face and broken tooth. Well, her family is now suing the Gardner School District where she attends classes, uh, claiming that the district failed to protect their child, did not follow up properly after the attack, and violated the Americans with Disabilities Act. And joining us is attorney Andrew Miltenberg, who represents Charlie and her family. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, very disturbing story. This attack happened on May 13th in the small community of Gardner, just, just about 70 miles south of Chicago. But we're told the sheriff's office did investigate what happened after that that resulted in the family bringing this lawsuit forward with you. Well, quite frankly, nothing, uh, nothing particularly helpful. Uh, the young lady was suspended for several days and uh, then had finished the year uh, virtually and is uh, now in a different school. But the real issue is that this bullying of uh, Charlie had gone on for months prior to that. And this was an individual, uh, the bully, that had uh, intimidated and tormented other children. And the school knew this, and they knew that this was an ongoing problem and, and quite frankly, did nothing. What you see in that photo was completely unavoidable. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So I'm looking at, um, and, and it's, it's pretty detailed, I'm looking at the statute here in Illinois with regard to uh, the school's responsibility. I'm not seeing a lot with regard to your case in particular where there might be a glaring failure on the part of the school. Is there one underlying issue that you would like to point to where the school failed this young lady? Well, they failed to investigate this as it was developing over many months. They failed to heed uh, the child's concern, uh, Charlie's mother's concerns. And this, uh, this was a, an assault that didn't have to happen had the school properly investigated and properly protected uh, Charlie, or at least done some type of early intervention to ensure that this didn't happen. So, you know, bullying is, a, is an epidemic. And uh, although schools talk about it quite a bit, uh, at the beginning of the school year, that fades. And it, there needs to be an ongoing conversation about this. Okay, I understand that you're actually an out-of-state attorney from New York. Uh, this story did make some national headlines. What made you decide to get involved and represent the family? That's, that's a great question, and bullying uh, has always been a, a particular uh, interest of mine, and stopping bullying and stopping the victimization of young children. We know that uh, the damages uh, stay with you, the trauma stays long after the scars heal. And I think most people have had some incident of bullying throughout their lives, and it remains very stark in their memory. 
And I think that there has to be more done by parents and by administrators and faculty to make sure what you're seeing in that photo does not happen again. And I would venture that there are quite a few students every day that get bullied that don't have the wherewithal or don't have the, the courage to come forward and they suffer in silence. Okay, we're almost out of time real quick. We'd be remiss if we didn't ask how Charlie's doing this morning. Charlie is doing okay. She still wakes up every day afraid to go to school uh, and she still wakes up uh, wondering if today she's going to get bullied or beaten up or made fun of. And that's something that she's going to have to work through. But she's happy that she's standing up for herself. Well, I, what does the family want in the long run? What do they want to walk away uh, with? I think they want to walk away with the school changing its policies, becoming more vigilant about this issue, and also uh, continuing the discussion on a national level about bullying and the impact it has and what early intervention can do and what parents should be talking to their children about at home. Well, we appreciate you joining us and sharing their story with us. And I know we'll be following this and, and hope to hear more from you as this uh, story progresses. Thanks again. That was the latest on teen bullying from Fox 32 Chicago. Now with gun violence on the rise across the nation, the, go the governor of New Jersey and three neighboring states, including New York, Pennsylvania and Connecticut, all agreed to share data about firearms used in crimes in an effort to curb illegal gun trafficking and reduce shootings. We are going to take a two minute commercial break, but we will begin our eight o'clock hour with that announcement. And at 815, we'll have a live conversation with Fox 4 Dallas's Dan Godwin on the latest developments when it comes to that Texas school shooting. I suspect we're all in violent agreement. We couldn't have better partners than the folks on this screen. Again, I thank my fellow governors for their commitment to public safety and to closing the pipeline of guns that lead to our state. And it is my great honor to introduce the governor of the great state of New York, Governor Kathy Hochul. Thank you, Governor Murphy, for your incredible leadership on this and so many other areas where we have a, a common bond as the, the governors of the adjoining states of Pennsylvania, our friend Tom Wolf, as well as Ned Lamont from Connecticut. And I wanna thank all of you for your willingness to collaborate. It's not always a word used in terms of governors or people in our positions, but it's the way we get things done for the people we are honored to represent. And the gun crisis, uh, the gun violence crisis has been with us a long time. As a young staffer on Capitol Hill for Senator Moynihan many decades ago, we worked on this issue. But what we have seen as a result of this pandemic is a spike in gun violence. And I'm sure there'll be psychologists who study a long time from now what, what that's exactly attributed to. But we do know that the results are being seen in our streets and in our communities. And people deserve to have leadership, people who are going to work together to find solutions. This memorandum is transformative. I believe this is going to give us and our law enforcement entities in each of our states the tools we need to be able to trace guns that are coming from other states, to understand when a crime has been committed. We want to share information with our neighboring state if someone's on the run. Where are the guns coming from? How are they getting on our streets? And why is there such a disproportionate impact of young people, particularly in communities of color, who are being the victim, becoming the victims of gun violence? So we all share in this common goal to do whatever we can in our power to eradicate this situation and to do uh, everything we can to save lives in our states. And part of it comes down to just fixing something that as you mentioned, if Congress would simply allow us to share this nationally, what a better place we would be. But in the meantime, this is where the states are the incubators. So they're the ones who are the innovators who come up with policies working collaboratively among ourselves. And if we can be a model for the rest of the nation, and again, I thank Governor Murphy for, your, for bringing us together and your leadership on this to say that we can do so much more together. So I'm hoping is that we can put this template in place, have our law enforcement partners uh, work in sync together, share the information that we get from the FBI already, but only goes to our individual states. That information is going to be useful, but I think other states should either form a join our coalition or that they should uh, form their own regional collaboratives as well. And that's how we're going to get to the bottom of this crisis. But I look forward to working on this and many other issues in this spirit of collaboration that we see here today. And with that, I'd like to join my my neighbor, our great governor, Tom Wolf from the state of Pennsylvania. So thank you very much, Governor Hochul. I really appreciate uh, 
working with you on this and 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 I agree with you Governor Murphy thank you for your leadership in this it's it's great to work with our neighboring states and of course it's always good to work with the state of Connecticut and Governor Lamont thank you very much for for uh, working together on this really important project and I couldn't agree with you more Governor Hochul uh, we, if we want to reduce the scourge of gun violence, we have got to work together in ways that we have not before. We've got to work with our partners within our states and our communities, but also with each other. Uh, and I think this can be a very powerful and innovative way to approach this, this issue. And I'm very proud to be able to work with New York and New Jersey and Connecticut in, in doing this. Listen, we know that gun violence and homicide rates have risen over the past year. And, and Governor Hochul, you're right. You know, I think it'll take years for psychologists and others to figure out exactly why that is. But the pandemic has certainly had uh, an influence, at least in Pennsylvania. Uh, while it was necessary to stay apart uh, to fight that pandemic, uh, the isolation that many experienced, uh, at least is that this is our experience in Pennsylvania, also stripped away support networks and safety nets. At the same time, it caused increasing stress, anxiety, fear, and clearly anger. Data shows that in 2020 gun violence, and I'm talking about Pennsylvania here, were up across the board, all across the state. Uh, according to data published by the Pennsylvania State Police, the number of gun homicides statewide in 2020 increased by 48% compared to 2019. In Philadelphia, fatal and non-fatal shootings also increased by nearly 48% in 2020 compared to 2019. And in the first eight months of 2020, almost as many people have been shot in the city of Philadelphia as were shot in all of 2019. So gun violence cuts right to the heart of our communities, tearing families apart. It sows fear, it sows distrust. And just like so many forms of systemic inequality, and Governor Hochul, you said this very well, interpersonal gun violence disproportionately affects people in communities of color. In 2020, 67.5% of gun homicide victims in Pennsylvania were Black, even though Black Pennsylvanians make up just 12% just of the population of Pennsylvania. Reducing gun violence in communities throughout Pennsylvania is a priority for me and my administration. And that's why in 2019, I signed an executive order making sweeping charge changes to reduce gun violence in Pennsylvania. I created the Special Council on Gun Violence within the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And my administration invests nearly $7 million in community violence prevention and reduction grant programs over the past several years. This year's budget, we put $30 million uh, into the violence pre prevention effort to give local communities and local community-based organizations the resources they need to work on preventing gun violence. These efforts are making a difference, but as Governor Murphy said, I don't think anybody disagrees. We have so much more that we have to do. This data sharing agreement, this memorandum of understanding between our states is an important step in the right direction. And I'm proud that Pennsylvania is joining this agreement. So thank you for including Pennsylvania in this. I'm proud to be part of this. So thank you. And now I'm gonna turn this over to my good friend, Governor Ned Lamont of Connecticut. Governor Lamont. Well, hey, you guys, and uh, Kathy, welcome to our um, merry group here. We work together very closely um, during COVID, and uh, we found that uh, working together, we were a lot more effective. Uh, as Phil said, COVID doesn't know uh, state borders, and neither do guns. Um, Phil, your comments about where these guns are coming, coming in from out of state, uh, what we can do together to track and trace them. Um, you know, Phil, you're right. I mean, Talking just about gun violence is a symptom of so much more that's going on in this uh, COVID, post-COVID world, the isolation, the quarantine, what that's done in terms of stress, what that's done in terms of um, uh, extreme activities going on in our schools, uh, on our streets, and guns just exacerbate that. And uh, Kathy, I think you're right. I want to see this coalition grow and expand because that will make us so much more effective. This database is really important. Uh, you know, right now, we're all putting more um, police on the street, more community policing, more folks of the community looking out. But a little like, um, you know, the war on drugs. You don't want to just go after um, that kid with a nickel bag or that, that kid with a pistol. We're going to take care of them. But I want to go after the kingpins. I want to go after those pushers. I want to go after those big drug and gun wholesalers, uh, those big guns, so to speak. And that's what this, uh, you know, E-Trace system allows us to do. 
We can track that gun back, see where it originates from, see what commonality there is, and find the big guns that are pushing these out on the street. You know, despite our best efforts, despite our best gun safety laws, we have more damn guns in the street than we ever have before. And if you're not taking guns seriously, you're not taking law and order seriously. And that's why I'm really proud to be with each and every one of you. And um, Phil, thank you so much for convening us and getting us together and taking a lead on this. Ned, thank you. So I was just handed the actual, those are our four signatures. Uh, so this is official, uh, a really huge step, but I wanna also echo Kathy's point. Uh, this is a coalition that I believe will, should grow and it will grow uh, as we welcome in more of our fellow governors and fellow states. And Kathy also alluded to another point in the absence of national action in Congress. Maybe there are different coalitions in different parts of the country that may not be neighbors with us, but the, the who should be doing the same thing. So to each and every one of you, Governor Hochul, Governor Wolf, Governor Lamont, uh, my late mother would say you're known by the company you keep. We're all keeping darn good company on this one. Wish you a great uh, day ahead. And again, this is a huge step uh, for our region. And I can't thank you enough, everybody. Thank you. Take care, folks. That's it. Take care. All right, that was an update from governors speaking on the latest developments when it comes to gun violence prevention. Now to a story that we have been following for some time here at Live Now from Fox. The Texas student accused of opening fire at the Arlington High School is released on $75,000 bond. Joining us now is Fox 4 Dallas's Dan Godwin. Dan, you're joining us from Timberview High School where that shooting took place. Uh, what can you tell us about what led up to this incident? Well, Rain, in the aftermath of this shooting, there are conflicting reports about the circumstances that may have led up to it. Both the police department and the school district are investigating. 18-year-old Timothy Simpkins was released from Tarrant County Jail Thursday afternoon on $75,000 bond surrounded by family and friends. Simpkins didn't say anything after receiving an electronic ankle monitor. His grandmother told us he is, quote, a good child and had never given us any problem. The Timberview High senior is charged with three counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon after Wednesday's on-campus shooting that injured four people. It started with a fist fight in a classroom. An arrest warrant affidavit details witness accounts. One person says they saw Simpkins get a firearm from a backpack and shoot a student seven to eight times. That student is 15-year-old Zacchaeus Selby, according to a GoFundMe post set up to raise money for medical bills. He remains in the hospital in intensive care. Police are investigating claims by Simpkins' family that Simpkins was a victim of bullying, but the organizer of Selby's GoFundMe page described Selby as a bright and respectful boy and said he had not bullied Simpkins, who's three years older than him. In addition to the injuries sustained by Zacchaeus Selby, one teacher was shot but is said to be in good condition. One student who was grazed by a bullet and a pregnant teacher who fell are also said to be okay. Reporting live in Arlington, Texas, Dan Godwin back to rain. All right, again, that was Fox 4 Dallas's Dan Godwin giving us the latest information that we have on that Texas high school shooting. Let's take a quick commercial break, and when we return, we'll check in with our very own Daytona Everett bringing you the latest on the Gabby Petito case.
You're watching live now from Fox on Daytona Average. I am joined now by Vinu Varghese. He is a criminal defense attorney located out in New York. Vinu, thanks for being on the show as always. My pleasure. Good to see you. Okay, so we haven't talked in a little while about the search for Brian Laundry, the Gabby Petito case. We're going to dive into a bunch of different topics, but first off, I want to start out with what is going on with the attorney, Stephen Bertolino. Uh, he is representing uh, Roberto Laundry and Chris Laundry, the mother and father, and then, of course, Brian, even though he is missing at this point in time. We've been hearing little snippets from him throughout this case, and just coming out this past week, there was a little bit of a discrepancy in the timeline for when they last saw Brian. Typically for cases like this, what is a defense attorney, what is an attorney, a family attorney, supposed to be doing uh, in public sight as far as talking to the press, talking to the public about their clients? Well, he should be talking. He should actually be saying things publicly, as in to reporters in front of cameras, but he shouldn't be saying much. And this is where it gets a little weird. I mean, these snippets or these text conversations that he's having, he shouldn't do that. You should be out there saying simply, look, the families, and this is a very difficult time for the family, please respect their privacy. Obviously, no one will, that, but you have to say that. And then you have to say that, please remember that Brian is presumed innocent. And we're not going to speculate as to where he is or what he's done or what time I've last, you know, I've last seen him or spoken to him. None of that should be spoken about, right? Because that's between him and, and Brian. So not, no detail from him should be coming out as to communications or as to whereabouts or anything along those lines should be coming out. It's a simple respect the family's privacy. This is a difficult time. Remember, Brian is presumed innocent. And please keep that in mind as this case progresses. That's it, two to three sentences. But you got to say that publicly. And he doesn't, uh, he hasn't done that. Yeah, we haven't heard any press conferences or anything from him, just uh, like you referenced text messages between him and several reporters who were following this story. Um, you also pointed out an interesting nugget right there about the fact that Brian Laundry, still up to this point, is a person of interest. He is not a suspect in the case. Why? It's just, it's just semantics at this point, right? He's obviously suspect number one. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there could be a number of reasons why they haven't issued a murder warrant for him. Uh, some of them may be procedural in, you know, in Florida law, but uh, that's not a big deal. I mean, obviously they're looking for him. There's no doubt he is the prime suspect in, in terms of her murder or the only suspect, in fact. I mean, he was with her, you know, he comes back in her car, and she's not there. Later, she's found dead in the woods. I mean, there's more than enough for the state of Florida or the state of Utah, wherever you know she was found, to charge him with uh, murder. And uh, but that's they may decide not to at this point. They don't have to. So mm -hmm. they're probably waiting till they find him. And and you know, assuming they find him, or if he's not, you know, in the belly of some crocodile or. I mean, that's that's where he may be. Uh, but, you know, they don't need to they don't need to charge him at this point. They don't. And, and everybody's looking for him. Everyone knows that he's going to be charged if he's you know, caught alive. Well, we haven't gotten the final autopsy results out yet. Um, do you think that could flip the script and make him a, a suspect in the case? Sure. If it shows, if it if the autopsy shows that uh, that she was beaten, uh, injuries, you know, head injuries, body injuries, anything along those lines, and if there's um, when they executed the search warrant on his home, they took some of his clothing to hopefully get a DNA match. So if there's his DNA is on her, then yeah, that's that could be a, a, a easier, a much easier case for the uh, prosecution um, that you know, in terms of eventually charging him and, and ultimately proving the case. Mm -hmm. Chris Laundry, the father of Brian, has now become a part of this search effort at the Carlton Reserve at this time. What were your thoughts when you heard that, that he was starting to become involved? Because up to this point, they've pretty much remained in their home going in and out only sometimes. 
uh, it's weird. <laughs> I think at this point he should just be holed up and, uh, you know, uh, looking, you know, and, and keeping quiet. It's a very strange thing um, to be part of a search party for your son. Um, I, I don't know if there's some master plan in effect or he knows something that, you know, can ultimately lead to, you know, maybe his theme is that my client's innocent. He only ran because everybody's pointing the finger at him. So let me help find him. Perhaps that's the outlook or the perspective he has, but otherwise it's just strange. I mean, clearly the police are, are the FBI and, and local law enforcement are all looking for him. So there's no reason for the father to be involved in that. They're going, you know, unless he has some information that he just wants to give to them that will help locate his son. What do communications typically look like um, between the FBI investigators and the family and the attorney? What, what do those look like? Well, they're usually not very pleasant. So like, you know, for, I'm not talking about Petito's family. I'm talking about for Laundry's family, mm -hmm. right? So because there's been talk about charging them as accomplices or, you know, after the fact or, you know, a, you know, or potentially in government obstruction, I mean, there has been some commentary on that. So they themselves need to be very careful, but usually um, it's, it's not going to be pleasant because they're, they're, it, it seems that there's already a, a shadow cast upon them for, um, with regards to you know, their potential assistance in helping him get away. So they could be end up being charged themselves. And, and that's another reason why they shouldn't be talking to the FBI. Do you think that that could be a part of uh, now Chris Laundrie's assistance with trying to find Brian? Because they've said that they've had no part in the disappearance of Brian, that they want him to come home just as much as anyone else. I mean, if that's the case, that means then the uh, laundry's hired a separate attorney and, and maybe, you know, or they hired uh, this guy and, and they worked out a, a, a non-prosecution agreement. Uh, I mean, I guess it's theoretically possible, but it's, you know, it's unlikely. So it's very strange what's what's going on here. And, and without knowing more, you know, it's it's almost uh, um you know, to some extent, irresponsible to speculate. But is it a possibility that that they've entered into some deal with the FBI for non-prosecution? Yeah, but that would have been reviewed by a lawyer. They would have had, um, it wouldn't even be the FBI, it'd be the U.S. Attorney's Office. So the, US, uh, the federal prosecutor would have had to authorize that. And they would have, in these deals, they would, they actually tell them you need a lawyer to be part of this process. We're also hearing from Gabby Petito's family at this time. The family has been pretty outspoken um, about Brian coming forward and turning himself in is if he is out there somewhere. Do you think that there's any type of communication between uh, those two lawyers? Is that is that rare or is that common um, for those two to be speaking? Well, I'm not sure how much. I mean, I would think so. I think it would be strange if they are. I know that the Petito family lawyer uh, was angry with the laundry family lawyer because there were pictures of, of them on his Yelp page. Uh, I'm not sure who goes to Yelp to find lawyers anyway, but you know, that's, that's a whole other issue. Right? <laughs> but, I mean, maybe restaurants, you know, now, but anyway. Uh, so I, I, I would doubt it. I mean, uh, if they're communicating, I'm not sure why, why they would be communicating. If I'm the laundry family attorney, I do not want any part of that communication. I mean, it'd be one way. You can send me any messages you want, you know, Petito family lawyer, and I'll certainly consider them, but I'm not responding. So there, there seems to be nothing that would be in the advantage of the uh, Petito, of the laundries if they're communicating with the Petito family attorney. Hmm. As a defense attorney, what would you be looking for at this point in the investigation and keeping your eye on? Well, I, I want to... You know, look, right now it's it's a fugitive hunt, right? So um, the only thing that I would be concerned with and I would want to know is whether they conducted the search properly, whether they tainted any evidence. I mean, if there was like a DNA match, was there something tainted, you know, to uh, to, you know, match the DNA of laundry to, you know, uh, with 
the body of Petito or any of her clothing or what they're, whatever they're saying. So there are things to look, to look out for, but they're not going to be an issue at this point until you get an arrest um, and a prosecution. Mm. And when something is there, so if they are, charge him, they, they find him, he's alive, they charge him with murder, and then they seek to introduce evidence that they did, they recovered from the search warrant, then you really want to make sure that you have proper, uh, that everything was done properly. So really, in these kind of cases, um, often law enforcement um, becomes overzealous and they because they're out to get somebody and they skip critical s- steps along the way. So that's what I'd be looking for. But at this point, it's not it's not ripe, as they say, for for looking because he's not going to be able to get any of that. He will only know this stuff, the, the criminal defense lawyer for the future criminal defense lawyer for Brian Laundry, if and when Laundrie's charged with murder. So credit card fraud is a different issue. I don't think DNA is so much involved in that, but you know, yeah, that's so, the things that he can f- potentially look forward, look for in the future. Got it. So two things that we'll be watching for that, that final autopsy result, that report, which uh, is taking a little longer than I think we all thought it was going to take. And then also that the possibility of Brian Laundry changing from that person of interest into an actual suspect in this case. Anything else that you want to add on, Benu? I mean, look, if the autopsy comes back and let's say, you know, she had died of, you know, natural causes or something along those lines and he just freaked out and left. I mean, that's something that could, you know, that could be, you know, possible. We don't know at this point. Obviously, the the I think that based on the optics, they have enough to charge him, but maybe they're just waiting to to be sure and, and getting that final report. Mm. All right, Benu Varghese, uh, criminal defense attorney. Thank you so much for being on the show. We're watching live. And that was the latest on the search for Brian Laundry. Now, many people across the country feel that the Gabby Petito case, although very unfortunate, inspired other missing persons cases, bringing those cases to light allowing them to have national attention as well. So now I want to bring you all an update to a story that we've been following here at Live Now from Fox. The Mia Marcano case, her body was confirmed by a medical examiner last Saturday. And now a lawyer for Mia's family says that they still have not yet heard from the apartment complex where she lived and work. And they're also calling out the Orange County Sheriff's Department saying that they mishandled the case. So here's the latest from the family attorney. confirmation that uh, it was indeed Ms. Bidey, uh that they found. So as you can imagine, uh, it's it's been a very difficult day for, for the family. It's been extremely tough. Uh, and now the family are, are left to be making fam- uh, funeral arrangements at this time. So um, thus far, we still haven't uh, heard, personally heard from the, uh, the Art and Villas uh, apartment complex. Uh, I will tell you that has been very disappointing. You're streaming live now from Fox, listening into the family attorney for the Mia Marcano case. Just getting word to our desk that the family attorney did provide another update that is a little bit more recent than this one. Working to get that all for you all here. In the meantime, let's check in with Fox 5 Atlanta for the latest coronavirus Q&A. A newly published study shows the shot's protection against infection weakens with time, but the vaccine's protection against severe disease seems to remain strong. The Fox Medical Team's Beth Galvin joins us live to talk about this. Good morning to you, Beth. And good morning, Portia. Let's start off with how long that protection from the infection actually lasted. Was there a point where researchers saw a significant significant drop in the effectiveness? There was about five uh, to six months into the, you know, after the second dose of the vaccine. And what they did to try to figure all this out, uh, Portia, was they went over the electronic medical records of about 3.4 million uh, members of Kaiser Permanente in California. Mm-hmm. And uh, researchers from Kaiser Permanente and Pfizer worked together, poured through their medical records and looked at, you know, who had been vaccinated, um, who had been tested for COVID-19, who had been hospitalized to get a, a better picture. And what they found was that 
that over time, the protection from the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine did tend to wane. So it started off, um, you know, it started off at about 88% protection against infection. Mm -hmm. And then over a period of about uh, six months, it dropped to 47% uh, protection or effectiveness against infection uh, for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And that's after the second dose. And this is some of the information that federal regulators, you know, from uh, the Food and Drug Administration and then the CDC advisory panel looked at this data. But now the data has been, it was pre-published. Now it's been published in the British medical journal, The Lancet. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting a better idea of like what data they saw and why they decided, you know, that certain groups like people uh, 65 and older and people who have underlying medical conditions may need a booster at about that six month mark, because it looks like that's the six month mark where we really start to see the effectiveness of the vaccine dropping significantly. So even though the protection against the infection dropped, sounds like the vaccine still worked well at just at least keeping people out of the hospital. Exactly. And I think that's the big takeaway of this very effective, 90 percent effective at preventing severe disease at that six month mark. So uh, 90 percent effective at keeping you out of the hospital, out of the ICU from developing severe complications of disease. And, you know, experts have been trying to to really make people understand that no vaccine is 100 percent effective against infection. What we want it to do is keep us from becoming severely ill and and so they're saying, you know, in that sense, it really looks positive that this Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine does really seem to consistently still protect people at a very high level against becoming very sick if they do get infected, not doing so well at preventing them from becoming infected, at, you know, at all over time. Portia? Do we know why the effectiveness against the infection drops? Is it because the protection starts to wane with time or because the vaccine just has a harder time fighting those more contagious Delta variant? And that's a good question, Portia, and that's something that they were looking at. You know, they were looking at is it is it one or the other and they or is it both? Um, and what they believe from their data shows that it is the vaccine's protection is waning with time. Mm. Um, it is not the Delta variant. The vaccine to, seemed to perform extremely well. They followed these patients from December to August when the variant had already taken hold and they didn't see that 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 you know, the, this variant, this vaccine seemed to do pretty well in holding its own against the Delta variant. Um, but, you know, they do think that the just it's sort of a natural process with vaccinations or with vaccines that, that they do lose some of their protection as time goes on. And that's why we have sometimes you have to get sort of a yearly flu shot or, a, a you know, booster shot of different vaccines. And it looks like, you know, at least with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, they're recommending that for, for specific high-risk groups. Portia? Beth, I've said it before, a lot of details, lots of moving parts as we keep track of this virus. So glad we have you here to keep track with all of it and break it all down in such simple terms. Thank you. Thank all right, you. and now to that announcement that I wanted to bring you all moments ago. The family attorney for Mia Marcano, Daryl Washington, says that law enforcement apparently dropped the ball when it comes to her case. In this update, he's also saying that the Orange County Sheriff's timeline of Mia's death and disappearance is not accurate. Today, whether Mia was alive when she left that apartment or whether she was uh, deceased, and it's unfortunate that nobody can give us those answers. These answers are so very important for the family because it's just, it's hard to get closure. As you can imagine, this family drove in from Miami. You had individuals driving, uh, com coming down from Toronto, the Virgin Islands. We had individuals coming from all over and sadly they had to conduct their own investigation because no one uh, would listen to them. Despite the pleas from the family, the thing that was most upset was this sheriff's deputy told the family on the Saturday, if you don't hear from me by Tuesday, call us back. And that is just totally unacceptable. So they wanted the family to sit in the hotel room and wait to see if they were going to hear back from Mia on Tuesday before they do something about it. And, and it just should not be like that. It is not proper protocol, uh, despite the sheriff representing that they did not have reasonable suspicion or probable cause uh, to detain this individual. I highly dispute that.
there was enough information that was given by this family uh, where he could have, they could have detained this individual, they could have taken him down for questions. And I think if you see, watching the video, the questions that the family was asking him, they basically had this guy about to say something. So imagine if you had trained professionals asking him that question. So for seven days, this family, seven to eight days, this family had to go through pain that they would never be able to get rid of because so many people dropped the ball. If management from the Arden Villas would have come to this apartment complex when the family reached out and called them, if someone would have come out at three o'clock in the morning and checked that key file, we would have known immediately that that individual had been in Mia's apartment. So they would have had, at that point, they would have had probable cause to arrest him. So again, this was not taken serious at all. Uh, and we know, based on statements that have been given to us, that the, the sheriff deputy who was at the scene said clearly that this case is not a priority to us. We asked the question again, did he say that? And they were clear that he said that this case was not a priority. They asked him, did you dust the facilities, uh, the, the apartment, for fingerprints? They didn't do that. They didn't do anything that uh, uh, you would do in a basic investigation. And when this security guard did the things that these sheriff deputies should be doing, they simply laughed at him. And they did not even take the fingerprints uh, that he had gotten off the windows for them. So again, I think you are gonna learn over the next few days or next few weeks, there is, very, there is more to this story. There is no one in Orlando who could stand up with a clear face and say, that they know for a fact that there was only one individual involved in the disappearance of Mia. Nobody knows this. We don't know if this was some type of uh, activity that's been going on around Orlando for some, uh, quite some time. That's why it was so important to de detain this individual and not allow him to commit suicide. So we're going to take a few questions at this time. There, there will obviously there be no trial. Clear. What does justice look like for Mia? Justice for Mia it's gonna require that the sheriff's department takes accountability. They need to take full accountability. I think the sheriff needs to come up, he needs to look at that video, and he needs to compare that video to everything that he learned about that morning and see if there are inconsistencies. And I think if there are inconsistencies, I think the sheriff owes it to people of Orlando to tell the truth. I know watching that interview just a short moment ago, he could not say, whether what those officers uh, or the deputies did was proper. All he can say was that we need to conduct the further investigation. So again, I think uh, that would be justice. Justice for, for Mia and the family would be having laws changed. You heard us talk about the Mia's law. I mean, these students that are out protesting right now should be studying. They should be focusing on college life. They should be getting ready for a football game this weekend. But instead, they are out there demanding change. So when we see those type of change, uh, you know, then we will see some type of justice. But the only justice truly that this family can get for Mia is if Mia was gone home with them. That's the only justice that, that they can ever get. Daryl, you, you saw it with this investigation, the family is repeatedly saying, look in the car, in the hour of the day this gentleman was here. There were so many outliers of why this person should have at least been detained. In your legal opinion, did, did the sheriff's office miss the mark? Should he have called a supervisor? Is this is that the protocol? Because it seems like there are more than enough outliers to make a, a detention there. At a minimum, a, a supervisor should have been called. One of the things, and we have not been able to confirm, but one of the things that we have heard is that those early morning shifts are the time of the, of the morning when they put their most inexperienced deputies uh, on the job. So based on that, there should have been a supervisor who should have been called. It's no question, when you saw that, that uh, the door had something blocking the entry, that was enough. I mean, that is just not common. She's missing, we've already said that Mia's missing, and now you see that there's a dresser that's blocking the entrance to that room. What more do you need? I mean, they had everything that they need to know that this was a crime scene. Do you foresee filing a lawsuit against the sheriff's office, the apartment, and how forthcoming do you think that that legal action could be? 
Well, I, I will tell you, and as we have always said from day one, everybody that had played a part in Mayor's death are going to be held responsible. And how forthcoming? When do you think a, a time scale on when do you think that those filings could be made? I mean, I, it, it could be very soon, but again, we've said early on that our focus right now is on Mia. Our focus is um, having the family to properly grieve. And, that's and, and that's the focus this week is going to be about Mia. And, uh, and the family. And that's that's always been the number one priority. The timeline says, according to the sheriff's office, that after the family spotted that blanket when he went into the apartment, it says Castleberry PD stands by while Mia's family looks through the apartment with his permission. Did which is fairly extraordinary. Did they? Did he react to them? Did they find? I guess they didn't find what they had just seen him with. Any ideas how that all transpired then? After that? I mean, it's very clear. And again, uh, he knew at this point that the family had, had been uh, questioning him and they knew where, where he lived, et cetera. So it, if he invites them in, he's inviting them in because he know that all the evidence that he had was no longer there. So again, uh, in these type of investigations, every second matters. Uh, and, and the time that they needed, uh, they just basically dropped the ball solid proof or evidence or tips that there is somebody else involved? Well, I do have solid evidence of I don't know if someone else is involved. I don't think the sheriff knows if someone else is involved, but I, I do know that there are so many questions. When I walk into the apartment for myself and, and just looked at the window and, and, and looked how high it is off the ground, it's just, it's a lot of things that gives you some pause. I, I do know uh, based on some conversations that he was with a couple of individuals uh, during the day. So again, we don't know, uh, but we are hoping that somehow we, we do find those answers. But this investigation is far, should be far from over. Have they given you any indication what may have happened to her? Have they talked to the family about any anything that they think may have happened to her after we, she left? Honestly, we wish that that's just something that we wish we did know, but we, we don't have those those type of details. At some so point, saying, did the case, did they close the case and reopen it? Well, from what we understood is that, or uh, what I understood when I heard the sheriff's first press conference is basically that he said that nobody else was involved. So to make that comment tells me that the investigation was over. Now I'm hearing something totally different. I'm hearing now that they're gonna continue with the investigation to, to find out what happened. Do you have any details about what they found on the second crime scene pretty much from here? No, no, I don't have a... I have not gotten those those details yet. Uh, again, they haven't given us all the specifics about what was all what was found. Daryl, I know a lot's happened in the last few hours here, but also when we met yesterday, you talked about possible litigation against Arnold Villas. Have you had a chance to look at a copy of Mia's lease? Because there are a lot of outliers in that lease about security protocols and measures here. And just wondering if that's something you've had a chance to look at. I know your protesters are out here. How do you guys proceed with going with the lease sets? Well, again, the lease is deflection. What they put, what they've given to the, the media is total deflection. They, they're focusing on security. Our focus is on this guy having access to that, that key fob. So that's totally separate from the security issues. We agree that there are major security issues in this complex, uh, but we need to see the provision. We, what we want to see is the policy on dealing with that key fob, not the security issues, although that is very important, and that's what we need to see. Do, do you think the scene was contaminated because they don't continue with the procedures of the, of the sheriff? It's clear that the scene was contaminated uh, when they allowed the, the roommate to go in side of the apartment from that window to open the door. That should have never happened. What if there was still someone in that apartment? The, the roommate could have been harmed. When the deputy saw that that door was barricaded, there is no reason why he should allow that young lady to go into the apartment. He put her life in danger. So that, that just tells you how, how poorly this entire investigation was done. I mean, I need to know what uh, police protocol would authorize them to allow a young girl to go into an apartment when you see a door barricaded, what would allow that? Why didn't the deputy do that? Or why didn't he call somebody out to the scene immediately to say that this door is barricaded? I don't know if somebody else is in here. We need to get somebody out here immediately. That was not done. And the reason why it was not done, because as he told the security officer, this was not top priority. Have you asked you have the identity to see the body camera video of that response when police showed up? first time 
we don't know if they had a body cam video. I'm not sure if they're even one. That's one of the things that we are requesting, uh, whether there was body cam video, whether there was some type of dash cam video in his vehicle. We don't know. And I'm I assuming this is me as a teddy bear. Uh, the medic at Examiner yeah. office have they told you when you will have a final result? We, we have not gotten uh, any answer as to when we're going to have a final result. Uh, obviously, um, you know, because Mia was left uh, out for so long, uh, this is just not the ordinary autopsy that they had to conduct, so things are taking just a little longer than they ordinarily would. Uh, the family is here. Do any of them want to speak to us at all? No. What's I mean, the next step? I mean, again, as, as we said earlier, uh, the family is going to be grieving, uh, continuing to grieving. Uh, we're focused now on the, the funeral for, for Mia. That is what is most important. Uh, the family is already uh, starting a, a foundation in Mia's honor. Uh, and, and I think that is going to be something that you're going to hear about. Uh, that's going to be very important uh, for the family because they want to make sure that Nobody ever has to go through what they experience. Uh, they're going to be looking at changes to how apartment complexes uh, uh, deal with uh, key fobs. Uh, also, they're going to be looking at procedures, how law enforcement officers deal with the investigation of a, of a missing person. Uh, I think this is something that has been swept under the rug for so very long. And, and sadly, uh, you see the support system that's here today. Think about the people who go missing who don't have that support system. Sadly, they just become a statistic. So the family has decided that they don't want Mia's death to be in vain. Sadly, it, it took the loss of Mia to bring attention to a, a, a very huge issue. I cannot tell you how many people who have contacted us over the last couple of days who said they had the very same experience at the Arden Villas. There's uh, several individuals have an experience with him at the prior uh, apartment complex that he was working at. So this is something that's not only going on in Orlando, this is something that's going on throughout the country and it, it just simply has to change. In the video, he makes the comment, Caballero, if I, if I was guilty, I wouldn't come out here or something to that effect. Was the family who was on the scene surprised that he used the word guilty? Did that set off an alarm bell to anyone? I mean, the way we explain it, and I, I talked to the family about this, uh, I asked them, how did they know this guy had something to do with it? And, and honestly, the best way we were able to explain is that Mia was inside of him. I mean, she really, I mean, you look at a city as large as Orlando and all the people around, how would you know? And I mean, they just had that parent instinct, that intuition that this guy had something to do with it. And just from his questioning, I mean, the father was asking questions and he knew that something was not right. And uh, that is the thing that is so upsetting to the family, that they were able to get this information and, and the sheriff's uh, deputies refused uh, to take the information that they did. A family should not have to do their own investigation when uh, deputies are being paid to do that. Have you guys obtained any information on how many text messages he, met messages he had sent her in the time that they knew each other? We have not gotten any information. Uh, uh, at all. So uh, again, what we can tell you, and we have spoken to, to a number of individuals, this was something that was constant, that she was not interested in him. Uh, employees of, of the complex knew this and that he acted inappropriate. Uh, so that was something that something should have been done about that. Uh, and that's our position. He should have not been there. But, but again, uh, they were co-workers. They knew each other. But again, uh, you know, she had absolutely nothing to do with him and, and didn't want to have anything to do with him. And sadly, uh, whenever a lady says no, it should not result in her dying. How would you describe Arden Villa's um, willingness to communicate with you in this present time? There's been no willingness. Uh, I will tell you, uh, in my over 20 years of practice, I have never seen anything like this ever. I've been a part of some of the most egregious situations uh, that there is that ever happened and victims families uh, police departments they have all reached out to the family and offered their condolences Mia was an employee at the Arden Villas she was an employee so more than more than anybody they should have reached out to the family and offered their condolences when the family tried to call and say that Mia was missing an employee they should have been out at the Arden Villas with the family 
assisting the family. And that didn't happen. And it's, it's sad that they are making millions of dollars off of these young students. And these young students to the Arden Villa is nothing more than, than a dollar. And, and it's sad that these students have to pay to live in fear. And this is what is happening. And I, I think what Ms. Debt has done, it has given a lot of students the courage to step up because I think many of them thought that this was just a norm, that it's okay for a maintenance person to come into my apartment unauthorized. And when they saw what happened to Mia, they are now realizing that this could have easily been them. And they're saying enough is enough. So I, I totally applaud the, the students, the tenants who are coming out here and, and asking for some protection uh, because again, this should not be happening. I think ladies, young ladies, women need more protection. And there was a family, a family going to stay here in Orlando. I know you were saying the funeral next week. Is the family now going to start heading back to South Florida? They can stay with the body. The family is going to be heading back. Just to tell you just a little bit about the family. Uh, the family wanted to be here to offer their support to the tenants uh, of the Arden Villas. This is the only reason that the family is staying here right now. But the family is going to be be gone back so all right all right that was the latest from the family attorney in the Mia Marcano case the missing road who unfortunately was found dead a little more than a week ago we will continue to all the latest developments from her family as the situation unfolds I do want to take a commercial break here in the meantime let's look at this shot from Tampa, Florida. When we return, we'll have the latest consumer news from Fox 13 Tampa.
prices are going up at the grocery store, at the gas pumps, and beyond as the country contends with the shortage of truck drivers and other supply chain issues, it's limiting products. Consumer reporter Sirbani Banerjee joins us. So, Sirbani, this has been going on for months now. What exactly is new today? Well, new today, we're getting a little bit of a timeline, and it's not necessarily a good one. Food industry analysts say that they expect prices to continue rising for the next year and a half, and that's not all. Shipping backlogs could impact many different sectors and, and affect the holidays. An estimated 250,000 containers are currently floating on American coastlines due to a lack of space. And this is all kind of this trickle-down effect from disruptions to the global supply chain. Some major companies, including Walmart and Costco, they've taken matters into their own hands. They chartered their own ships to deliver to ports that are not as congested. President Biden has said that he'd like to see ports operating up to 24 hours a day to catch up. These issues are causing concern across all industries, especially heading into what could be a record holiday season. In the retail sector, for example, more than 80 percent, so really almost all, of executives said that they are somewhat or very concerned about inventory shortages during the 2021 holiday season, according to a recent survey. Yeah, the visual of all those ships out in the water, I know most of us have never seen no, anything like that. No, not at that. all. So adding to the struggle, um, a shortage now of truck drivers, how's that impacting food prices? Well, restaurants across the country have had to switch up their menus for what's available, and then prices at the grocery store, yeah, you know they're going up. According to Labor Department statistics, wholesale inflation increased more than 8% between August of last year and this year. Officials say to expect the biggest increases to come from animal products like milk, meat, and eggs. The nationwide labor shortage continues to impact things too. It just it creates this domino effect, Linda. So inflation isn't always spelled out for us right there on the price tag. How does it creep up on us? Yeah, watch out for something called shrinkflation. You don't always see inflation in the actual cost, but it can be hidden in the size. Same price, smaller product. The price of a product remains the same, but you're just getting less of it. This can happen a lot with packaged food products like, like breakfast cereal, for example. In some cases, 12 ounces might be reduced to just 10 ounces, so not super noticeable, but enough for the company to save money. Many consumers will just switch brands if they notice a sudden price hike, but not too many pay attention to the weight of a product. Boxes and bags might even stay the same size, but there's just less in it. So check that net weight next time you shop. Yeah, it's too bad we can't all just pry open that bag of potato chips right and look in. You say, it's all air. Where'd the chips go? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Sir Bonnie. All right. That was the latest consumer news from our colleagues over at Fox 13 Tampa. And we do have some breaking news to share with you all here at Live Now from Fox. The Labor Department is reporting that the United States economy added 194,000 jobs in the month of September. This is falling a little bit short of the Dow Jones estimate of 500,000 and the unemployment rate fell 4.8% against the expectation for 5.1%. And we do expect President Biden to deliver a live update on the September jobs report. We'll stream it live for you all right here on Live Now from Fox at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, speaking of President Biden, we know that he has been pushing for vaccine mandates and booster shots traveling across the country to do so. So I do want to bring you all his most recent address from Chicago, speaking on the importance of vaccinations. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the passport into town. I tell you, every time I come to the greater Chicago area, there's somebody I want to steal and bring back to Washington, Gov. I've done it a couple times, you know. <laughs> any rate, uh, look, uh, Jerry, every company uh, needs people like you, every single one. Someone who knows uh, what my dad taught me, and a lot of people who know me well, including the, uh, the governor's sister, who I worked closely with for eight years. My dad used to have an expression. He used to say, everyone's entitled to be treated with dignity. And Joey, a job's a hell of a lot more than about a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, everything's going to be okay. That's the God's truth. He said every time, ever since he lost, things went south in Scranton, Pennsylvania when I was a kid and coal shut down. My dad was not a coal miner. I had a great grandfather who was a coal miner engineer, but, you know, he, he was a salesperson. Everything, we moved down to Wilmington, Delaware, a little town called Claymont, a little steel town where there's no steel anymore, but right on the border of Pennsylvania. And, uh, it was always about the dignity of work. And what you've been doing here about this pandemic is about protecting the dignity 
the dignity of your fellow Americans. You know, uh, you stayed in an operations mode, lining up protective equipment for the rest of the country, all around the country. And when the vaccine came out, you all stepped up and you got the shots. And as a company, you're getting more shots in arms. And I want to thank Auto for hosting us here at Clayco, one of the Midwest's biggest construction companies. Three billion dollars a year in revenue. Thousands of employees nationwide and here in Elk Grove, 100 percent union, not labor, union, <laughs> union. One of the reasons I said I ran was to rebuild this country, rebuild the backbone of the country. And I meant this sincerely. And the backbone is to build from the bottom up and the middle out. I'm a capitalist. I think these people should be, go, be able to go out and make a lot of money. That's not, that's not the problem, but everybody should have an even shot. And who built the middle class? Unions built the middle class. Without the, not a joke, without the unions, we would not have a middle class in America. So everybody owes you all. You know, you're constructing buildings for some of America's biggest companies, but you're also doing something bigger than that. You're helping us beat back COVID-19. So are the great leaders who are here today. JP, you, uh, Governor, you've done more than about anybody I can think of in any state. I mean that sincerely. You've stepped up. You've always done what you said you're going to do, and you've been relentless in getting people vaccinated. In the Midwest, you're leading. You're leading, and it's real. It's not. It's not hyperbole. And Mayor Lightfoot, who I said, please go back to work. I'm going to get in trouble. She had to leave. But Mayor Lightfoot, the same thing. And Elk Grove. Mayor Johnson, you've, uh, you, you've done a hell of a job as well. You know, we have 11 members of Congress here. Raja, thank you for hosting us in your district, for permission to come into the district. And I also want to thank uh, colleagues in the House of Representatives, Mike Quigley, Robin Kelly, Bobby Rush, Danny Davis, Jan Sikowski, an old friend, Bill Foster, Brad Schneider, Sean Caston, Lauren Underwood, and, uh, and Marie Newman. And I know, uh, and I, I, I look, for them, you don't quite under you'd all understand it in a different context but this is a busman's holiday for them to have to come here and other politicians speak you know what i mean <laughs> not a joke folks i appreciate it i genuinely appreciate it i appreciate it and uh and, and i know they wanted to be here uh but uh there's others who are in washington who can't be here dick durbin and tammy my both spoken to, they, they're in Washington and hopefully, hopefully we'll be voting soon. And also, we've got state leadership here. Lieutenant Governor Julius here, Stratton, and the Ohio, Pennsylvania, the Ohio, Pennsylvania, I'm from Pennsylvania. The, uh, the, uh, the Illinois president uh, of the, uh, Don Harmon, State Senator Laura Murphy, State Rep uh, um, Martin Mo uh, Mo Moylan, and uh, we've got great labor leaders here too. Tim, where's Tim? There you go, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, pal. AFL-CIO State President. And Jeff Isaacson, United Brotherhood of Carpenters. You've, and uh, Don Finn, IBW. Uh, and, uh, and Robert Reiter, Reiter, R-E-I-T-E-R, Reiter, Chicago Federation of Labor. And folks, uh, that's how we beat COVID-19, by working together. We have an expression in that little town of Claymont I was from. Uh, you all brung me to the dance, Labor. You're the, you're the reason I'm standing here. Not a joke. Not a joke. I got looking, I was 29 years old to the United States Senate, 17 days before I was eligible to be sworn in. I had to wait around to be sworn in. Not a joke as well. And uh, I won by 3,300 votes and Labor. Labor, including the police unions as well as the firefighters, stood up and endorsed me. And because I, I kid with the governor, I said I grew up in a town called Claymont, Delaware from third grade on. I went to a little Catholic school called Holy Rosary, and across the street from Holy Rosary was, a, was the fire station. And the guys I grew up with, you became either a firefighter, a cop, or a priest. I wasn't qualified for any of them, so I had to be president. And so, but look, it's, it's been a month since I laid out a six-part plan to accelerate the path out of this pandemic. One, vaccinate the unvaccinated. Two, continue to keep the vaccinated protected. Keep children safe and schools open, which the governor's doing. Increase testing and masking. Protect the economic recovery and improve the care of the people with COVID-19. We've made real progress across the board. 
More than 185 million Americans are now fully vaccinated. More than 75 percent of eligible Americans have gotten at least one shot. We made great progress on equity as well, in, in closing the, the racial the, the gaps in race as well as ethnic uh, vaccination rates. Recent data shows Latino Americans, Black Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans have now gotten vaccinated about the comparable rate as white Americans. That's not happened before. And our work on equity isn't done, but it's an important piece of progress. We're also starting to see less than 19, less COVID-19 cases in a vast majority of communities around the country. Cases are down this past month by 40 percent. Hospitalizations are down by 25 percent. We're headed in the right direction if we don't, if we keep our eye on the ball here. We still have a long way to go. The fact is, this has been a pandemic of the unvaccinated, unvaccinated. The unvaccinated overcrowd our hospitals, overrunning emergency rooms and intensive care units. The unvaccinated patients are, are leaving no room for someone with a heart attack or in need of a cancer operation, and so much more because they can't get into the ICU, they can't get into the operating rooms. The unvaccinated also put our economy at risk because people are reluctant to go out. Think about this. Even in places where there is no restriction on going to restaurants and gyms and movie theaters, people are not going in anywhere near the numbers because they're worried they're going to get sick. I've tried everything in my power to get people vaccinated. First thing I did when I was sworn in office back in January 20th is I bought enough vaccine right off the bat to vaccinate every single American. There were only 4 million Americans who had been vaccinated up to that point, even though the virus had been around. Second, we made everyone eligible to get a vaccination and made it easy and convenient for them to find a place to get vaccinated, over 880,000 places around the country. Third, we gave everyone ample time and information to deal with their concerns. We developed hundreds of million, we, millions of dollars in incentives, you did here in the city and the state of, 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 of Illinois, in cities and community organizations to encourage vaccinations. Governor Pritzker, Pritzker you've done one hell of a job. And, in terms of encouraging people before we get to the mandate. But even after all these efforts, we still had more than a quarter of the people in the United States who were eligible for vaccinations but didn't get the shot. And we know there is no other way to beat the pandemic than to get the vast majority of Americans vaccinated. It's as simple as that. And to, and to, to spread to our children, to spread throughout society, in our hospitals, or the risk of other variants, it's all dangerous and obvious, but we're still not there. We have to beat this thing. So while I didn't race uh, to do it right away, that's why I've had to move toward requirements that everyone get vaccinated where I had the authority to do that. That wasn't my first instinct. My administration is now requiring federal workers to be vaccinated. We've also required federal contractors to be vaccinated. If you have a contract with the federal government working for the federal government, you have to be vaccinated. We're requiring active duty military to be vaccinated. We're making sure healthcare workers are vaccinated because if you seek care at a healthcare facility, you should have the certainty that the pro people providing that care are protected from COVID and cannot spread it to you. The Labor Department is going to shortly issue an emergency rule, which I asked for several weeks ago, and they're going through the process, to require all employees with more than 100 people, whether they work for the federal government or not, this is within the, uh, in the purview of the Labor Department, to ensure their workers are fully vaccinated or face testing at least once a week. In total, this Labor Department vaccination requirement will cover 100 million Americans, about two-thirds of all the people who work in America. And here's the deal. These requirements are already proving that they work. Starting in July, when I announced the first vaccination requirement for the federal government, about 95 million eligible Americans were unvaccinated, as was mentioned a little bit earlier. Today, we reduced that number to 67 eligible Americans who aren't vaccinated. And today, we released a new report outlining effective vaccination requirements that are already proving their, their worth. This report shows three things. First, vaccination requirements result in more people getting vaccinated. In the past few weeks, as more and more organizations have implemented their own requirements, they've seen their vaccination rates rise dramatically. For example, 
the Department of Defense has gone from 67 percent of active duty forces being vaccinated to 97 percent as of tomorrow. Vaccination is just six weeks into this vaccination requirement. That's how quickly it's moved. We're also seeing this at colleges and universities across the country. More than 95 percent of students at colleges and universities like Northwestern and University of Illinois, Chicago, are vaccinated. And we're going to see it in health systems around the country as well. Rush University Medical Center here in Chicago has gone from 72 percent to more than 95 percent of its employees fully vaccinated under its requirements. These requirements work. And as the Business Roundtable and others told me when I announced the first requirement, that encouraged businesses to feel they could come in and demand the same thing of their employees. More people are getting vaccinated. More lives are being saved. Let's be clear. When you see headlines and reports of mass firings and hundreds of people losing their jobs, look at the bigger story. I've spoken with Scott Kirby, CEO of United Airlines, who's here today. United went from 59 percent of their employees to 99 percent of their employees in less than two months after implementing the requirement. 99 percent. And by the way, Scott, I want you to know I've instructed the Justice Department to make sure that we deal with the violence on aircraft coming from those people who are taking issues. We're going to deal with that. In the last days of their implementation, they cut the remaining number of employees left to get vaccinated in half. They went from 67,000 United employees to 66 of 67,000, 66,800 complied. People chose to get vaccinated. That's why we're seeing more companies signing up. I recently met with the CEOs of Disney, Microsoft, who you're familiar with here, Walgreens, to hear about their requirements. The Business Roundtable represents 200 of the largest businesses in the world and has championed vaccination requirements to keep businesses open and workers safe. America's largest aerospace companies, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, who I met with yesterday, the chairman of the board, Northrop Grumman, they all just announced plans to implement vaccination requirements. <clears throat> Even this I always get a kick out of, Fox News. <laughs> Fox News requires vaccinations for all employees. Give me a break, Fox News. And over the past week, we've seen American, Southwest, Alaska, JetBlue Airlines all announce requirements. The leaders of Chicago are step stepping up. As I said, the mayor, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, Governor Prisker are requiring vaccinations for state and city workers, health care workers, and teachers. Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, Jack Levin, who is here, has called for all members of, his, of, the, of the chamber to require vaccinations for their employees going back to work in person. And I came here to Clayco to thank this company for doing the right thing. Today, Clayco is announcing it's going to require all employees to be fully vaccinated or test once a week. It matters. I know these decisions aren't easy, but you're setting an example and a powerful example. Second thing I'd like to say, today's report shows that vaccination requirements are good for the economy. Not only increase in vaccination rates, but to help send people back to work. Back to work. You know, when I first started the vaccination program and we got all that vac vaccine enough for everyone, we're vaccinating three million people a day. We're getting very close before things began to slow down. The economy is growing leaps and bounds. Six percent, the fastest growing major economy in the world. In fact, increased vaccination coverage results in as many as 5 million American workers going back to work because they feel safe they can go back to work. There'll be more economic demand to drive people back to the workforce. But don't take it from me, not from some, you know, liberal think tank this comes from. But here's what Wall Street's saying. Goldman Sachs, quote, vaccinations will have a positive impact on employment. It means less spread of COVID-19, which will help people return to work. Moody's on Wall Street. Vaccination means fewer infections, hospitalizations, and death. In turn, it means a stronger economy. One economist called vaccine requirements, and I quote, the single most powerful, he didn't say single, the most powerful economic stimulus ever enacted, end of quote. Third point I'd like to make. The report shows that vaccination requirements have broad public support. Yes, some object, and some object very strenuously. 
and some are making a political statement out of this issue. But a strong bipartisan majority of Americans support vaccinations. They know it isn't about politics. It's about life and death. That's what it's about. It's about looking out for one another. It's about being patriotic, doing the right thing. Folks, vaccination requirements work, and there's nothing new about them. They've been around for decades. We've been living with these requirements throughout our lives. Students, healthcare professionals, our troops have been required to see vaccination for everything from polio to measles to mumps to rubella. And the reason most people in America don't worry about polio, measles, mumps, rubella is because they've been vaccinated. I don't quite get this, you know, why it's a matter of no violation of your right to be able to go to school or get a job to have, et cetera. But now it's a great cause to celebrate. So today I'm calling on more employers to act. My message is require your employees to get vaccinated. With vaccinations, we're going to beat this pandemic finally. But without them, we face endless months of chaos in our hospitals, damage to our economy, and anxiety in our schools, and empty restaurants, and much less commerce. Look, I know the vaccination requirements are a tough medicine. I'm popular with some, politics for others, but they're life saving, they're game changing for our country. We're in a position to leap forward in a way that we haven't. For All right, and that was the latest from President Biden as he continues his tour across the country, pushing for vaccine mandates and booster shots. We also know that the Labor Department is now reporting that the United States economy added 100 194,000 jobs in the month of September, falling short of the Dow Jones estimate of 500,000. And make sure you all are streaming live now from Fox at 1130 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. President Biden will be speaking on the September jobs report, and we will stream it for you live right here on Live Now from Fox, because that is what we are all about, bring you all the latest live events and announcements from across the country. And I want to bring you all the latest on a story we first brought you on Thursday the desperate search for a missing child in Grimes County, Texas, continuing, and it's now entering day three. I do want to bring in Fox 26 Houston's Chelsea Edwards, who has been closely following this story. Chelsea, thank you for joining us. So what's the latest when it comes to the search operation? Because the last time we checked in with you, we know that officials were intensifying their efforts. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're saying. Unfortunately, we're going into more than 40 hours uh, that he's been missing. Little Christopher Ramirez, a uh, three year old lost out here in Grimes County. So uh, Wednesday afternoon, that was the last time he was seen. Uh, his mom says that they were coming home. She was unloading some groceries. She took her eyes off of him for two minutes and, uh, and turned around and he was gone. And a neighbor told her that she saw him running off, chasing a dog into the woods. That dog came back. Christopher did not. So that's what that was the latest that we have as far as uh, the last time he was seen. But right now, ever over the last couple of days, we've been seeing uh, more and more agencies here, you know, dozens of volunteers, all sorts of search teams, including the FBI. Uh, we were here early this morning, and there was a lot of drone coverage before the sun came up. So the FBI was operating. One of them. We also had Texas Search and Rescue operating another. But um, as the light has come, we've gotten more and more people out here, including a Texas DPS and some other agencies. So we are expecting this search to continue. We are told that they will continue looking for uh, little Christopher until he is found. I see the multiple agencies there on the scene uh, with you in Grimes County, Texas. I'm wondering when's the next time we'll hear from authorities when it comes to any further updates on the search? We are expecting an update from the Grimes County Sheriff at any moment now. Um, he's actually doing a little powwow with some of those agencies. I did speak with the founder of Texas EquiSearch for a moment, and he, he did mention that they are looking at expanding that search today. We've been talking about how they've been going over the same two mile radius over and over and over again, because this is a three year old. You wouldn't expect him to get too far, but he can also easily be overlooked. He could be, you know, cold in a deep sleep, huddled up somewhere 
aware. So they've gone over the area and the woods around the house multiple times, and now they're looking at expanding that search. That's what we're hearing. All right, Fox 26 Houston's Chelsea Edwards, thank you for the update. Thank you. All right, guys, again, we do know that search efforts are intensifying for missing three-year-old Christopher Ramirez as it ramps up again. I do want to bring you um, a, a full screen image of his picture for our nationwide audience. He was last seen on Wednesday afternoon after a neighbor saw him chasing a dog down the road that never returned. Since then, dive teams and search crews have worked tirelessly combing through every inch of woods and different bodies of water there in Grimes County. And we are on standby for a live update from authorities. We'll try to bring you all that update live right here on Live Now from Fox. For now, I'm going to send most of you off on a two minute commercial break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're streaming live now from Fox. We're taking a live now look from Grimes County, Texas, where search efforts are intensifying as authorities continue to search for the missing three year old. Christopher Ramirez was last seen Wednesday afternoon after a neighbor saw him chasing a dog down the road. The dog returned, but he did not. We are on standby from a live update from authorities there in Grimes County, Texas. We'll bring it to you as soon as we can here on Live Now from Fox. In the meantime, I do want to bring you all this update from Houston, Texas. The FBI in the city is bringing us the latest on an anti-hate crime campaign. Color, religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. Now, hate crime itself is not a crime. And the FBI is mindful of protecting freedoms of speech and civil liberties. Now, as the lead investigative agency for criminal violations of federal civil rights statutes, the FBI works closely with local, state, and tribal and federal law enforcement partners in many of these cases, even when the federal charges are not pursued. Now, ASAC man, ASAC man is the principal executive who oversees the Houston Division Civil Rights Program. She's charged with investigating hate crimes, color of law, and FACE Act as a part of her violations. When federal hate crimes victims are identified, members of the FBI Victims Specialist Team 
will assist that individual with identifying the appropriate resources to support. Now, the FBI also works to detect, the prevent, to detect and prevent hate crimes throughout the civil rights squad, and also utilized in our community outreach by working in partnership with community partners such as the ADL. I'll leave you with this quote. Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the nation. And everyone who lives here should embrace diversity and create awareness about the strengths that come from our differences. As defenders of the civil rights in the United States, FBI Houston works to ensure that those who violate federal hate crimes face federal charges. Now, ASEC man will share her thoughts. Good morning. Welcome to FBI Houston. Our remarks today will be in Spanish and in English. Buenos días. Soy Nichiana Men, agente especial adjunto a cargo a nuestra oficina del FBI en Houston. Y yo dirijo la rama de derechos civiles. Nosotros en el FBI creemos que la gente no debe de vivir con el temor de convertirse en víctima de un crimen de odio, simplemente por quienes son, por el color de su piel, a quienes aman o cómo y a dónde veneran a su Dios. Estamos aquí hoy junto con ustedes para lanzar nuestra campaña de concientización sobre los crímenes de odio, con la esperanza de que las víctimas o testigo los denuncien a las autoridades. A pesar de nuestros esfuerzos y de tantas otras agencias para colectar estadísticas precisas sobre estos crímenes, reconocemos que existe la posibilidad de que estos crímenes no sean reportados ni por víctimas ni por testigos. El año pasado se reportaron 406 crímenes de odio en el estado de Texas. Esta es la cifra de crímenes de odio que tenemos que sabemos que fueron denunciados. Con nuestra campaña para motivar al público a, anunciar, a denunciar los crímenes de odio, el FBI ha invertido en anuncios a nivel local y también a nivel nacional. Nuestros anuncios están en los aeropuertos, en los terminales de buses, en varias redes sociales y algunas publicaciones. Queremos que el mensaje sea claro. Si usted ha sido víctima o testigo de un crimen de odio, por favor, denúncialo. Lo puede denunciar a través de tips.fbi.gov o llamándolos a 1-800-225-5324. Le prometemos que si usted nos llama para hacer una denuncia, le vamos a contestar y a usted será tratado con respeto, dignidad y compasión. Si usted es víctima o testigo de un crimen de odio, por favor, denúncialo. Su estatus legal no nos importa. Nos dirigimos una palabra a los testigos. Los testigos son una parte muy importante de nuestras investigaciones. Y los casos no pueden ser juzgados con éxito en una corte sin la participación de nuestros testigos. Gracias por venir y bienvenidos a la FBI en Houston. Good morning and thank you for coming today. Welcome to FBI Houston. My name is Nitiana Mann. I am assistant special agent in charge of the white collar program here in Houston to include our civil rights team. The FBI fully believes that people should not live in fear of becoming a hate crime victim simply because of how they look, who they are, who they choose to love, or how they worship. We're here because in August, the FBI released nationwide hate crime statistics for 2020. And we're well aware that there is speculation that hate crimes go largely unreported. We hope it's clear. If anyone is in imminent danger, please call 911 or your local officers. 
The local officers are well trained and work closely with us and they will share that information with us when it's appropriate. In Texas, there were 406 hate crime incidents reported last year. From our law enforcement perspective, that is one crime too many. With the launch of our hate crime reporting campaign, the FBI is proving our continuing commitment to put our actions behind our words and end, and end hate crime, particularly in our city of Houston and we're counting on the public to help us. The FBI has invested in the media. We're here with you today. We're on several social media platforms. We're on local publications. We're on transit because we want our message to be clear. If you have been a victim or a witness to a hate crime, we want to hear from you. You can reach us directly and anonymously by dialing 1-800-CALL-FBI, that is 1-800-225-5324, or going online at tips.fbi.gov, again tips.fbi.gov. Your immigration status is not taken into account when we receive your information. I should also add, you can write to us in whatever language you feel most comfortable in. We promise if you pick up the phone and you call us, we will answer you with respect, compassion, and dignity. Now, some of you may be wondering why are we doing all this and investing in such a large campaign nationally and locally, and that is because we hope our return on investment translates into more victims being accurately reported, identified, and that the subjects of these crimes are held accountable for their actions. Also, from our own Houston standpoint, the legacy left behind by Mr. Byrd and all of the law enforcement officers who worked on that investigation is alive and well. It is Mr. Byrd's legacy that pushes us every day to deploy every tool available to fight this threat. Because it's important, and before I conclude, I want to highlight how appreciative we are of the victims who have come forward and the courage they have to share their story with us but I also want to direct some words to our witnesses. When hate crimes make headlines and you hear that federal crimes, federal charges have been brought, it is our witnesses who are typically the unsung heroes behind the scenes who tell the story of these investigations. They help us accurately identify the victim. They help us collect the facts which support our criminal investigation. We understand the, victim, the witnesses may be reluctant to come forward and will do everything within our power to protect your identity and your privacy. Please remember that the FBI needs witnesses to take action and call law enforcement to. Their information is an important piece of the puzzle which supports our criminal investigations. Tips from witnesses coupled with our victims reporting is what strengthens the FBI's investigations and increases the likelihood that federal charges will be brought. Lastly, the FBI know we know we have a lot more work to do to end hate crime, and we're counting on each one of you, we're counting on each of our communities to come together to fight this threat. Now I'd like to introduce you to Supervisory Special Agent Heather, Heather Armstrong, who's going to discuss our Victim Specialist Program. Thank you for coming. Good morning. My name is Heather Armstrong, and I'll be speaking on behalf of Victim Specialist Cheryl Morris as she was called away on another pressing matter. Hate crimes strike at the heart of one's identity. They strike at a victim's sense of self and belonging. FBI victim specialists stand ready to assist and identify victims of federal crimes. The FBI victim specialists in Houston are part of the multilingual nationwide FBI victim services division staff that are located in all 56 offices and headquarters. That Houston team that serves and assists identified federal crime victims throughout the entire Houston area of responsibility. Being local ensures victims of crime are immediately supported in the aftermath of a crime by someone with knowledge of our community and the resources available to them. 
The FBI knows that victims may be reluctant to call law enforcement after attack if they, are, they feel scared, targeted, and worried that they might be a victim again. Lose trust in anyone who is a member of the perpetrator group or are uncertain how to report it and not sure how law enforcement can help. While victim assistance is, impo is important for all victims of crimes, it is especially important for victims identified in federal hate crimes. If the FBI determines that a federal hate crime has occurred, then FBI victim specialists work with FBI special agents to help victims to understand the legal rights that they are entitled to as part of the Victims' Rights and Restitution Act. Most importantly, the FBI takes an individualized approach to providing victim services. FBI victim specialists tailor our assistance to fit their specific needs and earnest appreciation for the fact that every victim is unique and so is how they might respond in an aftermath of a crime. Thank you, and I'll now introduce Mark Tubin, ADL. Good morning. I'm Mark Tobin, Regional Director of ADL Southwest Region, which includes Jasper, Texas. We're grateful for the close partnership on issues of hate crimes and extremism, which ADL and the Southwest Region enjoy with the FBI, and appreciate the invitation to speak here this morning. Twelve years ago today, the United States Congress set our nation on a new course of responding to hate crimes when it passed the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. ADL, a 108-year-old anti-hate organization dedicated to stopping the defamation of the Jewish people and to securing justice and fair treatment to all, has been on the forefront of the drafting and adoption of hate crime laws having written the legislation, the model legislation, that served as the model for the federal law. We know three important characteristics of hate crime laws. Hate crime laws help protect individuals, families, and communities from the criminal intentions of the intolerant, the bigoted, and the racist. The training required to enforce hate crime laws enable law enforcement officers to become better at their jobs. And reporting of hate crimes help law enforcement effectively allocate their resources. If not adequately reported, however, hate crimes cannot be addressed. ADL is encouraged by the recent passage of the Jabari Hire No Hate Act, which seeks to dramatically increase the number of law enforcement agencies that report hate crime statistics to the FBI. The FBI's hate crime reporting and education campaign announced today is an additional and important effort to improve hate crimes reporting and support for victims in our city. We applaud the FBI's initiative and look forward to continuing our mutual work of combating hate and intolerance. Lastly, to report a hate incident or hate crime to ADL, please visit adl.org backslash report incident. For training on how to recognize hate crimes and report them, please email us at southwest at adl.org. Thank you and thank you to the FBI. Thank you for your question. It is a question that we, not, we often receive. Um, as our acting special agent in charge uh, started his speech, uh, hate speech in and of itself is not a federal crime. It is an incident 
in which to become a federal crime, you have to be coupled with a substantive crime. Typically, what you see is a crime such as an assault, such as arson, a crime with the added hate speech, which concludes into a federal violation that we can pursue. Thank you for your question. So what's the federal punishment for people who Thank you for asking. Uh, as you know, our one of our closest partners is the United States Attorney's Office, and they are the prosecutors and the attorneys who take these cases to court. We, as FBI agents, are in charge of investigating and putting a complex case together. Once the facts are together, we bring it to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Often, the sentencing is based on the initial substantive crime that was committed. So whether that crime is an arson, whether that crime is an assault, that is what is going to impact, along with the criminal history of the subject, that will impact its final sentencing. So to answer your question, sentencing varies largely based on the underlying crime that was initially committed by the subject. Thank you for your question. Gracias. La definición de un crimen de odio simplemente eh, es, el, es un crimen que realmente pasa y este crimen con una parte que, que significa como unas palabras que son utilizadas. Cuando agregadas con el crimen, esto sí se torna, significa un, un hate crime. All right, everyone, we are streaming live now from Fox, 9.40 a.m. here on the East Coast. We are taking a listen as the Houston FBI provides an update on their most recent efforts to curb hate crimes and to increase reporting on that topic. In the lower right-hand corner of your screen, we are taking a live now look from Grimes County, Texas. We want to bring you all a closer look here on Live Now from Fox as authorities and investigators are continuing their search for the missing three-year-old. We know that Christopher Ramirez, who actually only speaks Spanish, went missing on Wednesday. Now, according to his family, Christopher was following a dog down the street and the dog returned. However, Christopher did not. We also know that his home is surrounded by wooded areas. so. That is why authorities and investigators are continuing, not only continuing, but intensifying their search efforts there in Grimes County, Texas. As you can see, this is a multiple agency operation and we are on standby as we do expect authorities to provide another live update any moment now. We will try our best to stream this all for you live as soon as we get an update. All right, guys, we're going to take a two minute commercial break. We'll be right back.
9.45 a.m. here on the East Coast, taking a live now look from Washington, D.C. Now on Thursday, the Senate voted to expand the nation's debt limit after Democrats and Republicans reached a deal to avoid a government default looming in less than two weeks. The vote only needed a simple majority to pass after 11 Republicans joined Democrats in voting to break a filibuster in order to extend the nation's debt limit. A few more months now, Fox News correspondent Caroline Shively has more from Washington. President Biden crossed his fingers Thursday afternoon ahead of the Senate debate on increasing the debt limit ceiling by $480 billion and preventing the federal government from defaulting on its debt through early December. On this vote, the yeas are 50, the nays are 48. Republicans played a dangerous and risky partisan game, and I am glad that their brinksmanship did not work. Republicans had threatened to make Democrats raise the debt limit on their own, saying their planned future spending was out of control. But Thursday morning, GOP leaders said they'd struck a deal. The majority didn't have a plan to prevent default, so we stepped forward. But that's not how Democrats see it. Uh, look, McConnell blinked. Bluntly, the debt ceiling in the 11 years that I've been here has really only been used for dangerous games of chicken that back 10 years ago actually did affect our rating mm -hmm. and hasn't produced greater fiscal discipline. Not all Republicans are on board with the plan. We have spending that is literally out of control. And then there's the timing. Putting it in December is another train wreck we've got to deal with that probably empowers Schumer more than us. If the House passes the bill, then it goes to the president's desk. He says he looks forward to signing it. But all of this has just kicked the can down the road for less than two months. In Washington, Caroline Shively, Fox News. While Democrats in recent polls cut President Biden a lot of slack, independents have shifted dramatically to disapproving the job he's doing. One, in the areas of disappointment, how he's handling the coronavirus epidemic. But most underwater in the latest polls on the issue of border security and immigration. We'll get to that story a little bit later, but right now, here's the latest from White House correspondent Peter Ducey on the latest when it comes to vaccine mandates across the country. We're headed in the right direction if we don't, if we keep our eye on the ball here. Look, I know the vaccination requirements are a tough medicine. I'm popular with some, politics for others, but they're life-saving, they're game-changing for our country. On two issues once considered by Biden world to be winners, COVID, where he's now got a 48% approval rating, and the economy, where he's got a 39% approval rating, according to Quinnipiac. He's done everything he possibly c could to divide it. Uh, the most recent example is these uh, unconstitutional mandates that are being incredibly corrosive. No options are off uh, the table. Vaccination rates at workplaces with mandates outpaced workplaces without by more than 20 points, according to a report released by the White House. Vaccine requirements work. They're also good for the economy, and it gets people back into the workplace. The opposite could be true, according to some critics. In a very tight labor market, workers who don't want to uh, abide by Joe Biden's mandate can simply walk down the street to a new company, sometimes getting higher pay as well. Meantime, these employers are going to face thousands of dollars of fines if they don't act as Joe Biden's COVID police, all directly contradicting the promises he made, not just in the election, but after the election as well. That if promise came in response to a December job, question from Fox time. News. Do you think the COVID vaccine should be mandatory? No, I don't think it should be mandatory. I wouldn't demand to be mandatory. What a difference 10 months makes. And we know there is no other way to beat the pandemic than to get the vast majority of Americans vaccinated. While I didn't race uh, to do it right away, that's why I've had to move toward requirements that everyone get vaccinated or I had the authority to do that. That wasn't my first instinct.
Republicans upset over the Biden administration's immigration policy are slamming Vice President Kamala Harris. This comes as Border Patrol agents continue to be caught in dangerous situations involving illegal immigrants along the southern border. Fox News correspondent Bill Malusian has more. Yes. Here we've all they around, got one running. Scenes like this becoming more and more common as the border crisis continues. The migrants use the trains in an attempt to get further into the United States, but Texas DPS has positioned members of its special operations group along the way. And using ATVs, they will chase the runners down and make arrests. One recent DPS arrest at the trains included this member of the Latin Kings, one of the most violent street gangs in the world. In Rio Grande City Wednesday night, we embedded with a Texas DPS trooper as he hunted for illegal immigrant runners hiding in the brush. Turn yourself in. These are the what migrants who do not want to be caught and do not turn themselves in. In Yuma, Arizona, Border Patrol says they arrested this child rapist after he crossed illegally. He had previous felony convictions for first-degree child rape and incest. Also in Yuma, journalist Julio Rosas encountered three men from Uzbekistan who had just crossed into the U.S. illegally, and they showed him their Uzbek passports. Very, in his exclusive interview uh, on Special Report, border former security. U.S. Border not, Patrol Chief not, Rodney not, Scott not. said immigrants from over 150 countries have crossed illegally at our southern border, and there are more than 400,000 known gotaways so far this year who were never caught. So who's in that 400,000? I can't tell you, but I can tell you statistically, it always includes rapists, murderers, potential terrorists. Every single year, if you look at CBP statistics publicly available, those all exist in who we actually catch. So to think that there's not just as bad or worse people in those getting away would be naive. And tomorrow, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will be traveling to Mexico with a U.S. delegation where they'll be taking part in some high-level security talks between the U.S. and Mexico. As for Texas, Texas Governor Greg Abbott sent President Biden a letter today officially appealing FEMA's decision to not declare a disaster here at the southern border. Reporting in Roma, Texas, Bill Malugin, Fox News. Thanks for sticking with us this morning here on Live Now from Fox. A federal judge on Wednesday ordered Texas to suspend its most restrictive abortion law in the United States. While some clinics are planning to resume providing abortions, others worry that the ruling does not offer them enough legal protection against lawsuits. My body, my choice. Texas lawmakers can no longer enforce the state's abortion law for now. That's after federal judge Robert Pittman ordered the Lone Star State to temporarily suspend its ban on most of the procedures. The life of every unborn child who has a heartbeat will be saved. The law went into effect last month, bringing with it a series of tight restrictions. The law does not allow abortions in Texas once cardiac activity is detected. It also does not allow abortions in cases of rape or incest. But Wednesday's federal order marks the first time the law has successfully been challenged. Experts say it was designed to avoid legal challenges with ordinary people, not the state cracking down on illegal abortions. The state leaves it up to private citizens to file lawsuits. And if someone were to successfully prove an abortion was performed, the law would grant them at least $10,000. Come sue me, I dare you. The Biden administration expressing joy over the ruling with White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki writing, quote, the fight has only just begun, both in Texas and in many states across this country where women's rights are currently under attack. Texas Republicans, meantime, have already appealed. Governor Abbott releasing a statement saying the most precious freedom is life itself. That's the very latest from Dallas. Casey Stiegel, Fox News. The Texas heartbeat bill is very controversial, so I do want to stay on this topic a little bit more. Live now from Fox's Daytona Everett is going to bring us a few more details. You're watching Live Now from Fox. I'm Daytona Everett. I am joined by Jessica Levinson. She is our constitutional law expert, a professor at Loyola Law. Thank you so much for being on the show again, Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of legal news out of Texas. 
for sure. So we actually spoke last night over the phone um, talking about what is going on with abortions in Texas. A, a new restrictive law was passed not long ago. And then there was obviously a block, a possible block of the new law. And then that was appealed. It's confusing for all of us. Can you break it down? It's super confusing, but I think you actually did a great job of explaining what's going on. Uh, on September 1st, SB 8, Texas's uh, restrictive abortion law that essentially bans all abortions after six weeks of pregnancy went into effect. It went into effect uh, mainly because the Supreme Court didn't block it. And then the next day said, here's why we're not blocking it. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a number of lawsuits since then, but the one that made news yesterday is a district court judge, Judge Pittman out of Texas, who was appointed by President Obama, said, Texas, stop enforcing this law. So any members of the Texas government, whether it be the clerk who accepts a filing or a judge who oversees a hearing, do not enforce this law. Now, this is a really weird case, and I think this is where it gets kind of confusing because Texas's law isn't set up like other abortion laws where if you violate it, then the government comes in and enforces that law and prosecutes the violation. Instead, Texas's law says any private individual can sue another private individual for aiding, abetting, or abetting a woman in trying to obtain an abortion. So it's really private person versus private person. Now, what happened in this particular case, the Department of Justice, the federal government sued Texas and they said, we get to sue you because you passed a law and members of your government are implementing a law that violates the federal law. What's the federal law? Basically Roe versus Wade. Right. It, Texas defended themselves in this law, in this lawsuit, and they said, we're not the ones enforcing this. You know, basically try your hand somewhere else. And what happened uh, yesterday on Wednesday is that the district court judge said, I do have jurisdiction. I can rule in this case, Texas, you can be enjoined, meaning you can be stopped from implementing this law. And uh, the judge said he doesn't think that the law is constitutional. So that's what has already happened. OK, well, we're seeing some of these clinics open back up today um, and start to be operating again. If you're speaking to a girl right now who is in Texas who wants to get abortion. Could she get one done legally? Yeah, the reason I'm pausing is because strangely, this actually isn't a totally straightforward answer. Right. So I believe there's a 24 hour waiting period in Texas. So you can get the ball rolling on that right now. Now, the reason I pause is for two reasons. I think that Texas's the decision in the district court to push pause on Texas's law will likely be temporary. Mm -hmm. So the appeal went from Texas, went straight to the Fifth Circuit, I think within an hour. Mm -hmm. The Fifth Circuit is very conservative. I think they're likely to overturn this district court decision. The other reason that I kind of pause is because Texas's law is written so that if you do help a woman obtain an abortion while there's an injunction, meaning while a judge has paused that law, then you can later be sued if that injunction is lifted. So anybody who's helping that woman obtain an abortion is potentially going to be sued when and if that injunction is lifted. That's why it's it's a very complicated legal and practical answer. Is there a timeline on all of this? Because like you said, it, it took just an hour for it to be appealed last night. So what is the timeline on the possible lifting of the injunction? So I believe that was actually just the notice of appeal. It was, hey, Fifth Circuit, like we're coming, get ready for what we're gonna ask you to do, which is basically swat away what the trial court did. Is there a timeline? No, I mean, everybody understands that this time is of the essence, but the Fifth Circuit can take a day, a week. If they want to take a month, they can. I don't think that they will. But there's nothing in this case where it, something is set in a court mm -hmm. and you can't change that date. This is really a kind of an education for people that federal judges can set their own timelines. Yeah, which 
brings up an interesting point for these abortion clinics, because as we know, with the pandemic, businesses can't close their doors and open their doors the next day. There's a lot that goes into that. So there's a lot of questions right now for these abortion clinics and for women um, out in Texas in hopes of getting an abortion. You know, I don't know if you have a clear answer for either of those parties. Well, I mean, I think the answer, frankly, depends on your risk tolerance. So for women who are able to um, find an abortion provider who's willing to take on the risk that this injunction could be lifted really at any time and that whoever helps that woman could later be sued and that they could owe money damages, then, you know, you can go forward. It really depends on who you can find, whether or not they can withstand one of these lawsuits again, when and if an injunction is is lifted. And do we know what they would be facing? So we know that um, you can face, I think, really an indefinite number of lawsuits from private individuals. And if those individuals are successful against you, you pay $10,000, your attorney's fees, and the other person's attorney's fees as well. So it, it really does add up. Yeah, um, especially depending on how many patients um, that these clinics are taking in at this time. You know, I think that clears up a lot of the questions that people have right now. Our focus is on Texas, but we brought up an interesting point yesterday um, talking about how Texas could just be a precedent for other states. Do you still feel the same way? I do. In in the 24 hours, my mind, although it often does change, has not changed that much. I will say, I think we need kind of a longer horizon to determine whether or not other states like Florida will pass laws that look like Texas's law. And the reason I say that is, as you know, and as we've talked about, there's this big Mississippi case that will be heard before the Supreme Court on December 1st. Mississippi essentially bans all abortions after 15 weeks. There's really no way to square that law with Roe versus Wade. And I think for a lot of us, we thought, well, we're just going to be waiting till June 2022 when the court makes this decision in that case, really to determine what the landscape is going to look like, what states can do in terms of restricting access to an abortion. I still think that that long term horizon is largely true. But what people should look for is that this Texas case could keep going up and down the federal court system. Frankly, I think that Judge Pittman's ruling We know it's going to the Fifth Circuit. Whoever loses almost certainly will go to the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court is going to have to answer again Mm -hmm. about what's happening with this temporary injunction in Texas before it even hears that Mississippi case on December 1st. Right. So you think before December, we could be getting some answers from as high as the Supreme Court? Not definitive answers about the constitutionality of Texas's law, but really good indications about what the Supreme Court is thinking. Mm, Interesting. All right. Well, I'm going to leave it on that cliffhanger. (laughs) All right. That was the latest from Live Now from Fox's Daytona Everett, catching up with a law professor, bringing us the latest on that very restrictive Texas abortion law that a federal judge has temporarily blocked. I do want to bring you all a preview of the upcoming live events that we are on standby for here at Live Now from Fox. Any moment now, we do expect authorities and investigators to deliver a live update as the search intensifies for that missing Texas three-year-old who's been missing since Wednesday. According to reports, he followed a dog outside of his family home. The dog returned and he did not. So again, authorities are continuing their search for that missing three-year-old in Grimes County, Texas. Also coming up at 11.30 a.m., we do expect President Biden to speak on the September jobs report. We know that according to the United States Labor Department, the U.S. economy added 194,000 jobs to the economy, falling a little bit short of the Dow Jones estimate of 500,000. Also coming up at 1 o'clock, 1.30 p.m., we'll give you the daily White House press briefing Press Secretary Jen Psaki, as always, taking questions from reporters on the Biden administration's latest agenda. And those last live events will bring you in its raw and unfiltered form because we would like our viewers to make their own own decisions with limited commentary from our hosts. So 
Let's take a two minute commercial break here and when we return, we'll check in with NASA. They have an upcoming mission and their crew, three astronauts are discussing all of the details. We'll have that right after this break. Specialist for Crew 3. As a mission specialist, she will work closely with the commander and pilot to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and reentry phases of flight. This will be her first space flight. And Matthias Maurer will also serve on a, as a mission specialist for Crew 3, working closely with Raja Chari and Tom Marshburn. And this mission will also be his first space flight. We're going to be taking questions through the phone bridge and on social media today using the hashtag AskNASA. But before we begin taking questions, let's run down the line with some opening remarks from our Crew 3 astronauts. Raja, we'll start with you. Sure. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, very excited to be here and being this close to launch. Uh, so first off, we probably need to, to let people know we can stop calling it Capsule 210, which is the serial number for our SpaceX Dragon. Uh, and we can. Uh, come up with uh, what and let people know the crews come up with the, the name of the vehicle which is endurance and it speaks to us on a number of levels uh, first off you know just a, a tribute to the the tenacity of human spirit as we push humans and machines farther than we ever have uh, going both to stay in extended stays for low earth orbit opening it up to private companies and private astronauts uh, and knowing that we'll continue our, our exploration to go even further uh, and continue and also a nod to the, to the fact that development teams the production teams, the training teams that got us here have endured through a pandemic. Um, and then, of course, just the fact that we are going to reuse this vehicle. So one of the really cool things about the SpaceX Dragon is we'll be the first ones to use Endurance, but it won't be the last time it's used. Uh, you know, it's going to be used many times by many missions, and it'll continue to support long-duration space flights, just like the one Mark Vandehei is doing up on the space station, where he'll be eventually become the longest-duration human uh, from the U.S. to be up on a space at the space station towards uh, the end of our mission. Uh, and then also a nod to the Shackleton, Captain Shackleton, and just the amazing story of, of the original Endurance. So we're proud to, to carry on that namesake and excited to get to fly in Endurance. Uh, as you mentioned, we'll be launching October 30th at the end of this month in the middle of the night, so stay up and catch us. And we'll be up there for six months, coming back in the spring of 2022. So we'll dock with the space station about uh, 22 hours after we launch. And so that'll happen, and you can watch that all on uh, nasa.gov. With that, I'll uh, talk, turn it over to Tom Marshburn, who'll talk about what we're doing up there for the six months we're on the space station. Hey, uh, like the rest of the crew, super excited to be going up uh, and seeing the space station again. We'll be uh, joining Expedition 66. Looking forward to seeing Anton, Mark, and Piotr uh, when we're there. Uh, as always, there's going to be a, a really robust uh, backbone of science that we're going to be executing throughout our entire mission. That's going to peak in December when the SpaceX Dragon arrives with uh, a full uh, full uh, compartment of uh, more experiments for us to be doing, which we need to complete in that month so we can return back with the samples. But also during that time, I uh, want to note that we're going to have spaceflight participants coming up on the Soyuz, private astronauts on the Axiom spacecraft. So uh, we'll be inviting a lot of guests to the space station. Uh, looking forward to uh, helping introduce this new phase of human spaceflight, which will occur during our expedition. We have a lot of uh, maintenance we're going to be doing, and we want to keep the space station uh, healthy. Uh, some uh, NASA events are going to occur while we're up there with the launch of the James Webb Telescope, launch of Artemis 1. So uh, we're looking forward to having a nice seat, but also taking some pictures of those events uh, as best we can as well. And now I'm going to hand it over to uh, my crewmate, Kayla Barron. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today to talk a little bit about our upcoming mission. Uh, it's hard to express adequately how excited we are as a crew. Uh, we're definitely feeling ready to launch in just over three weeks, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, but as Tom and Raja both mentioned, we couldn't be more excited about joining the space station crew for Expedition 66. We have a lot of exciting things planned from spacewalks to 
science experiments to visitors with the private astronaut missions and space flight participants. Um, so it's kind of a, a dream mission for a rookie flyer um, to be joining such an experienced crew aboard the space station. And we're really excited to share more about it with you. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to Matthias Maurer to introduce himself. Yes, hello, I'm European Space Agency astronaut Matthias Mauder, and I'm really excited to fly to the station. Um, the main objective for us flying to the station is to do science, lots of experiments. Together as a crew, we have around 300, 350 experiments in our luggage. Um, uh, roughly 10% of these are European experiments, and these experiments will range from material science, engineering, life sciences, uh, technological demonstrations, but also um, experiments that enable us to do the next step from low Earth orbit to exploration to fly to the moon. So lots of exciting stuff that we will be performing and uh, we are all excited also to share what we are doing while in space. And back to Roger. And I'll take it from here. We'll go ahead and open it up for questions now. If you're on the phone, just a reminder to press star one when you're ready to ask your question and star two if your question has already been answered. And on social media, be sure to use the hashtag AskNASA if you'd like to submit a question. We'll start on the phone bridge with Bill Harwood from CBS News. Yeah, hi, thanks. It's uh, Bill Harwood, CBS at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, for Tom, you're one of the handful of guys who you know, been assigned to three different spacecraft, the shuttle, the Soyuz, and now Crew Dragon. I'm, it's almost apples and oranges, but what are your impressions of the Dragon based on your training? How does it compare to the other spacecraft in terms of, I don't know, creature comforts, uh, the automation, and safety? You know, when you uh, climb into, quote unquote, your spaceship, uh, no matter what, it seems very, very special. Uh, there's lots of innovation in the Dragon, uh, which we expected from our uh, commercial partners anyway. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful spacecraft. Um, in terms of the, the human factors and the automation, uh, they've taken on advances um, and have a lot of innovation there. Uh, looking forward very much to seeing how that plays in as uh, Raja commands and I uh, pilot the vehicle and we put it through its paces again. Um, so it's uh, a huge amount of excitement. Uh, in some ways though, you know, leaving the launch pad zero miles an hour to, to reaching low Earth orbit at 17,500, the physics are at play. Uh, be very interested in seeing if there's really any difference in the, in the feel of the Falcon 9 or not and would love to talk about it. Look forward to talking about it when I get back. And a NASA fan on social media asks, what are you guys most looking forward to on the space station? I think most of us have the same two answers to that question. I think we're all really looking forward to looking out the window down at the beautiful Earth. Um, and we're also all really looking forward to the opportunity, hopefully, to perform a spacewalk. Uh, so I think as long as we can knock out those two things, we'll be pretty happy campers. Um, and in addition, we'll be excited about all of the amazing science we get to do every day. One of the sort of wise mantras in our office is that there's nothing more important than the thing you're doing right now. Um, and I think that's especially true when we're aboard the space station and have the opportunity to perform some incredible experiments on behalf of some amazing principal investigators on the ground. And our next question comes from Marsha Dunn with Associated Press. Hi. Um, thanks for doing this. I'm wondering um, if you've had a chance to meet the Axiom crew or the two Japanese tourists going up from Kazakhstan in December. Have you had a chance to get a warm, fuzzy feeling for who you're going to be living with for a couple weeks? And um, if not, have you touched base at all with them? And what's your overall uh, views of having visitors pop in for a week or two who are not trained professionals? Thanks. So we, we have uh, got a chance to meet all, all of them, uh, both the space flight participants from uh, Japan as well as the Axiom crew. Uh, so we've met the Axiom crew both here and at SpaceX and have met the uh, Japanese crew here at Johnson Space Center. And so uh, they are, have gone through basically uh, enough training here at Johnson Space Center to be familiar with the modules that they'll be experiencing and some of the equipment if we had off nominal situations to be at least familiar with it. And I think, uh, you know, it's a great time in space flight to, you know, we've talked for a really 
really long time at NASA and I think as a nation and as a world about the idea of, of making low Earth orbit accessible. And I think during our increment, one of the coolest things we're going to do is see that happen with our own eyes uh, and, and see a private mission come to the space station. Um, and our job is to help enable that. And so, uh, you know, it's very similar in my mind, you know, being with an Air Force background to, you know, your question about what we think about that. I, first, we think it's great. It's, the, it's what NASA is here to do. Um, when I look at it from an Air Force pilot background perspective, I think about, you know, there's, uh, when you get on a, you know, a commercial flight, you don't think about the fact that there's also uh, private people flying around, you know, private planes, there's military people flying around military planes, and everyone's doing that in the airspace, all during different missions with different training for different purposes. And I think the space station and low Earth orbit is eventually going to become very much like that. So there'll be private, uh, private objectives, there'll be government objectives, um, there, and that will, can all coexist, and we're at the very beginnings of it. So it's a, it's a really cool time to be going up there and I echo what Kayla and Matias has said as, as rookies going up there especially you know what a what an amazing opportunity to get to see that and be a part of a, a new sort of uh, era in space flight and a Twitter user asks how have the prior Dragon crews described splashdown to you well let's see I think uh, I'll the uh, both Demo 2 and Crew 1 are the two that have come back so far, and I think they both had uh, really nice conditions. Uh, as you know, Demo 2 was the, the first uh, flight, the test flight, and then Crew 1 was the first operational flight. They came back at night. So we've got, now gotten to see both a daytime landing, a nighttime landing, and I think what uh, they've both expressed is how pleased everyone has been with the quickness of the recovery forces. And so SpaceX and NASA have done a great job uh, really making that as efficient as possible from getting the capsule out of the water and the crew extracted and uh, now we recently saw with Inspiration4 a very similar uh, timeline and so I think uh, it's a great uh, you know, great example of what the, the government and private companies working together can do is we rely on the government uh, for a lot of the search and rescue forces for off nominal situations and we rely on the private industry for the nominal recovery and so uh, getting those things working in tandem has so far worked out really well and and everyone has come out uh, I think we saw after the crew one uh, you know Hopper came out and even did a little dance of happiness so he, he was obviously both uh, you know physically and mentally uh, very excited about uh, about the recovery. And our next question comes from Chelsea Goad with Space.com. Hi. Uh, so, Tom, as a veteran of two previous space station missions, what pieces of advice have you given your crewmates as they approach their first space flights? And do you anticipate sharing this kind of advice with private astronauts and other new flyers and passengers on the station? Oh, uh, yes. I think the, the device... Uh, that I would give my crew and have given my crew and and the private and uh, uh, astronauts and the spaceflight participants um, would apply to anyone arriving. Uh, spaceflight, uh, we we always say spaceflight is difficult. We all say that it's uh, uh, complicated. And when you actually arrive there and see it, not only is it an incredibly joyous uh, and um, thrilling place to work, but indeed, uh, every day is filled with solving 10,000 little problems just to get the simplest things done, as well as the complex work that we have to do. So um, the training has been good. You can believe in yourself. Not everything is going to go exactly right. That's okay. We're all here to help each other. Space flight is tough, and uh, that's why they've uh, pick these people to uh, to do these missions so uh, and to accomplish these tasks so um, it's uh, it's good to be able to come away from a flight uh, feeling good about what you've done and to continue to be friends and and have uh, good relationships when you get back home so uh, we'll be focused on that and Nils on Twitter asks which German food does Matthias Maurer plan to bring up to the International Space Station all right, I think I can take this question here. Um, well, I asked my fellow countrymen to choose for me, and it's a venison ragu that is prepared for me, also potato soup, very typical German food, and uh, I bring it up and I will share it with my crewmates. Uh, it's a surprise for me, so I haven't tested it yet, but uh, I'm pretty sure it will be very delicious and everyone is looking forward to it. And that's only one of the special meals that we have prepared from Europe. There's also another special meal uh, linked with a special event next year, February most probably, where we will be uh, linking the entire world, the entire planet, um, around the topics of food, music, and uh, yeah, uh, linking the world with these topics to communicate space. 
And just a reminder, if you're on our phone bridge, go ahead and press star one when you're ready to ask your question and star two if your question has already been answered. And of course, on social media, be sure to use the hashtag AskNASA if you'd like to submit a question. Our next question comes from the phone bridge from Jackie Goddard with Times of London. Hello, thanks for doing this. Um, currently on the ISS, there's um, a Russian actress shooting parts of a film whose plot pivots, um, I, I believe, on a heart surgeon who flies to space to perform some kind of medical heroics on an astronaut who suffered a heart attack. And I wondered whether one of you, uh, maybe you, Dr. Marshburn, could give um, some insight into the extent of medical training that astronauts really do um, go through for a mission, what between you you're able to handle up there in terms of medical emergencies to give some idea of, of the reality behind this kind of storyline. Thank you. Oh, sure. I'll say a few words, and then I'll uh, also hand over to Matthias, who is uh, EMT, you know, a frontline uh, medical care provider. Uh, we have a, a kits that are, are pretty uh, primitive in the sense that we can administer first aid. We can do some intensive care with the kits that we have, but the fact is with the lack of staff, uh, lack of the infrastructure that a hospital has. It's very limited what we could do. We could give intensive care uh, to an astronaut for about 24 hours. Uh, surgery, of course, with trying to maintain a sterile field would be quite, um, uh, quite a challenge in space. So I imagine the film would uh, uh, have to bring in some fiction in order to pull off heart surgery in space, but I, I think I'd probably look forward to seeing what they come up with. And Matthias, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, well, um, we all got our training, medical training, to uh, deliver first aid. Um, uh, well, we can, uh, in case of severe problems, we obviously link up with the specialists on the ground. Uh, we also learned as part of our training how to do a tooth filling or also even to, to pull a tooth. Um, also, I wouldn't recommend my dear uh, crewmates to ask me to pull a tooth. Uh, not an absolute specialist on that one. But I think we are well trained to help each other. And um, if there's a severe problem, then we obviously need to return to the ground and, and uh, shorten the mission. Um, but I would like also to take this topic of a heart problem in space and link it, uh, link it to the science that we are running in space. Um, so obviously there are kids that are born that have heart problems that only have one heart chamber. And we are running ex uh, experiments on the space station where we have cultures of cells that then we are growing. Taking a quick break here on Live Now from Fox, we'll have more from Crew 3 astronauts right after this break. Uh, I believe there is a huge potential with the science experiments that we are doing in space to help to contribute uh, fighting diseases and problems on the ground. Our next question comes from social media. This one is for Raja. You are one of only a few astronauts to command your first flight. Can you please talk about how the selection of who would command Crew 3 was made? Did you and Tom discuss it or was the decision made by NASA? So they the decision was made by NASA, and I think it's really a tribute to the, the rest of the crew that they trust me to actually do this. Uh, I think it's more a testament to their training and skill that they trust a rookie to do that. I think it's also a sign of our trust in the maturity of the vehicle, the fact that we've proven it out. Um, obviously, spaceflight is never without risk, uh, but I think uh, you know, we, have, we as an organization, as, as NASA, as our uh, private companies and our partners, have had an extensive test program to try to make the vehicle as safe and, and ready for a crew as possible. But um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, being in the commander role, it's, I, I use this analogy all the time, but it's really more like being a coach than a dictator, um, and, and specifically more like a professional coach, where you're not really, uh, everyone on the crew is just as qualified and skilled to do, to the, do the job, and it's just a matter of uh, finding the best way to work efficiently together. And so that's kind of really my role, um, but uh, yeah, everyone is, is more than qualified, and uh, I'm just actually super happy to, to even have a chance to go to space. Uh, let alone, uh, you know, in a, in a brand new vehicle. And our next question comes from Mark Corot with Aviation Week. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Tom, and uh, Tom is a veteran on this flight, and Kayla is a freshman. How do you see this experience on this mission contributing to the future goal of Artemis uh, returning human explorers to the moon? This mission is critical, and that the main reason for that is three people who haven't flown in space before getting the experience they need that will prove so helpful when perhaps they'll be going to the moon. They'll play a part, uh, and maybe crew members as well. 
so I, I feel very blessed to be able to uh, uh, be with them, uh, provide whatever I can uh, as a veteran, uh, but otherwise just stay out of their way. They're operationally incredibly successful and uh, capable um, as it is. So what they need is an experience of space flight. Uh, it'll do NASA and the space station and the, our science output do great things for that, but also for Artemis as well. So this is very important for that. And Justin on Twitter asks, what experiments will Crew-3 be performing? I'll take a, a first hack at that. Um, there's so much going on up there. It's uh, something we could each talk about for about an hour. Um, there are experiments going on outside and inside the space station that we just tend or that we watch. The alpha magnetic spectrometer looking for uh, the dark matter origins of the universe. The cold atom lab which is trying to create a uh, creating an environment that's so super cold that you can actually study um, atomic particles um, uh, close to their quantum state. A lot of medical experiments. We're testing out medical devices. Uh, I'm going to be working with a, um, a muscle sensor that um, will help us figure out how uh, muscles atrophy in space but also is a tech development for this uh, device so that people can have these evaluations done when they're in ICUs or out in the field. Uh, there'll be ultrasound going on, lots of uh, material science. Um, I love to uh, to work with and talk about the um, uh, magnetic levitation uh, experiments that are taking fluids and using zero G and magnetic containment to really study how fluids in a sphere uh, react with different temperatures. Um, you know, Matthias is a, a PhD in material science and he, he probably would love to throw in some of those answers as well. Well, I think you covered the fear, Tom. <laughs> Okay, and our next question comes from Paul Brinkman with UPI. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, my question is for Kayla. Um, as the youngest uh, member of the crew, um, maybe you'll be on the moon in a few years, but um, what do you think about the possibility of flying to a private space station um, after ISS is retired in 8 to 10 years and whenever that happens? Um, would you like to do that, and uh, how do you think that would change the nature of the experience? You know, I think that's something we've started to wrap our heads around as we think about what will happen when we don't have the amazing platform, the International Space Station, which we're hoping to continue f to fly at least through 2030. So um, we're hoping the space station will be around for a little while longer. Um, but like you mentioned, we're kind of at the dawn of a new era where we're bringing commercial partners into a low Earth orbit economy to include partnering with companies who are interested in building destinations in low Earth orbit like commercial space stations. Um, and I think going forward, we can imagine a world where we continue to visit those space stations as NASA astronauts to do science and also to train for future exploration missions. Uh, for me, my inspiration to apply to the NASA program was recognizing all the parallels between serving aboard a submarine, which is what I did before becoming to, coming to NASA, and the space station itself. Um, and so since coming here, as the Artemis program has really come into focus and become a big part of what we're hoping to do next. In fact, Artemis 1 is set to launch during our time on the space station, so we're really hoping we're on an orbit to uh, catch some of that launch. Um, but we're really starting to think about Artemis and how to prepare for it, and I think for um, those of uh, the rookies on this flight, we're really thinking about this as the best way to train for those future exploration missions, to learn from the fantastic experience we have from operating the space station continuously for 20 years, learn from veteran flyers like Tom, um, and then also start thinking about how the technology we're using on the space station can be applied on the moon and eventually on a trip to Mars. And next question is from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Hey, thanks. I was going to ask Caleb the, roughly the same question, but let me ask it to Raja. Is your, you're both in the, in the Artemis cadre. I assume that nobody's got cold feet and both of you would like to go to the moon someday. So can you just, I mean, I know the next flight's the one that counts, but, but what do you think about that long term? 
Uh, well, I think, I, uh, Kayla said, I think that m one of the most exciting pieces of science for me that we're doing up there is we call it ECLIS, which is basically life support uh, type experiments. But it has both a, a terrestrial application for Earth, but also, to your point, uh, Artemis. And so, uh, you know, we'll be looking at uh, new waste management systems uh, that involve uh, better ways and more reliable ways to process waste. And kind of what's key there is to get to the moon and to stay there, which is the goal of Artemis, not to just go and come back, but to stay there and to go to Mars. You need more reliable equipment and higher recovery rates than what we have now. So, you know, right now we recover between 70 and 90 percent of the water that's uh, that's wasted on the space station that comes out of us. Um, and we need to get that closer to 98 percent. And so some of the work we're doing up there and some of the equipment we'll be working on and using is designed and built to try to test that out. And so not only is it exciting because we're part of the group that's helping, you know, as we look at Artemis designs and architecture, uh, but it also helps here on Earth. So, I mean, if we could recover wastewater and and have almost a closed loop cycle that would, would solve a whole lot of problems here on Earth as well. And so I think for you know all of us in the office, uh, you know the Artemis team per se is just some people that have been helping, but really the whole office is involved with the Artemis program. And so when we're not assigned and getting ready for a mission, what we're doing in the office is helping with different programs, whether that's the Lunar Lander, the HLS, uh, the Gateway, the Orion, the SLS, which is the rocket. Uh, so you know astronauts in our office are involved in all these programs, and then. You know, as you mentioned, and you're very rightfully, when you're assigned a mission, that's your, your main focus. And so, uh, so right now, our, our eyes are on, on successfully executing, getting to and from the ISS safely, integrating with uh, Expedition 66, and you know, making as much life-changing science happen as we can during the six months we're, we're lucky to have up there. And our next question comes from Whitney on Twitter, and she asks, what places on Earth are you most excited to see from space and photograph from the cupola? I think I'll take this question. It's uh, before becoming an astronaut, I actually fulfilled my big dream of traveling around the world um, for one entire year. And now from space, I obviously want to revisit these same places. And it's like a place in every continent of this beautiful planet. So I think uh, I also want to discover Africa because I have like, I haven't seen a lot of Africa and the perspective from space, the third dimension, that's something really fabulous. And every time I think of it, I get, I get goosebumps all over my skin. And our next question comes from Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Yes, um, for Raja, I'm wondering, um, yesterday we heard from the NASA managers that they're, they're taking all lessons learned from the last Dragon flight with the Inspiration4 crew, and I'm wondering if you've talked with uh, Jared Isaacman about uh, his trip and whether there's anything to be learned from their three-day journey. Thanks. Uh, so we had a chance to meet with uh, some of the Inspiration4 crew before we launched. We haven't talked to them since they've been back, I think, because they've been pretty busy. Uh, if you follow the news and social media in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sharing all the, all the joy and, you know, experiments they did up there. We definitely have had a lot of interaction between SpaceX and NASA. And so uh, even though that was a private mission, there is, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a common vehicle, the same vehicle we used on a previous NASA flight. And so there has been a whole bunch of engineering back and forth discussions, lessons learned, past us that uh, involve making you know improvements to our vehicle as well and the fleet and so there's a very close relationship there um, and so yeah we haven't talked to Jared but I there has been uh, daily uh, back and forth between NASA and SpaceX about um, where to make future fixes and enhancements uh, and improvements and our next question comes from Dane on Twitter what will the crew be dressing for for Halloween I don't think we've necessarily decided yet, but I heard a rumor that Mark Vandehei, who is currently on the space station, might have some plans in store for our Halloween costumes. So I think we have a, maybe have a surprise in store when we uh, cross the hatch for Halloween. All right, and that's all the time we have for today. I just want to thank our Crew 3 astronauts for joining us and everyone who tuned in and asked questions through our various platforms to join in in our conversation today. Be sure to tune in to watch this crew launch in Crew Dragon Endurance to the International Space Station in the early hours on October 30th. You can watch live online at nasa.gov, on NASA TV, or by following NASA on social media. That'll do it for our press conference today. Thanks for joining.
All right, guys, thank you all so much for streaming live now from Fox. We are your source for raw and unfiltered nonstop news taking place across the country. We do have some breaking news to share with you all here. I want to bring you all this live now image that we are getting from Prince George's County. We are getting reports that two are dead and one is in custody following a shooting at a senior living facility. Now, information is very limited right now, but we do know that the shooting was reported around 9.30 a.m. This took place in the 500 block of Suffolk Avenue in the Capitol Heights neighborhood. There, this is also a developing story. However, we are in touch with local authorities in the area. I do want to show you all this tweet that we have from local authorities saying that the scene, as you can see, remains very active. Again, at 9.30 a.m., authorities were called to a shooting at a senior living facility as of 10.25. The latest information we have shows that one suspect is in custody and two victims have died. Authorities say that they are searching the facility for any additional victims as well as suspects per protocol. And we also know that the nearby elementary school is also on lockdown out of an abundance of Caution. It looks as though we are about to receive a live update from our colleagues over at Fox 5 DC. So I want to bring you all back out live to Prince George's County for that update. Good. Yeah, because where we are isn't as good as the VO that where Joseph was earlier. So I'll say where we are. We got a scene here. Let's show you. Were you in there at the time? What can you tell us? What the... All right, guys, you're streaming live now from Fox breaking news. We are showing you all these images raw and unfiltered happening in real time. We are getting an eyewitness report from Fox 5 DC. Let's go ahead and listen in. Right. I just don't let me screen it better than just doing it live. All right, this is Fox 5 DC's Bob Barnard. It looks as though he was just having an encounter with some witnesses there on the street. Again, we know that two are dead and one is in custody following a shooting at a senior living facility. Getting this information in real time, let's listen in as Bob Barnard speaks to people there in the area. Donald. Okay, can you hang just stay here one second? Thanks, Donald. We're going to be live in just a minute, all right, Donald? Thanks. Why don't you start on me and then we'll go to him. All right, please keep in mind everyone that these images are raw and unfiltered. We like to bring you all the latest updates as soon as we can here at Live Now from Fox. But the latest information that we do have, two people are dead and one is in custody after a shooting took place at a senior living facility. We are in touch with our colleagues in the D.C. area currently on standby for a live report happening any moment now. And this is the most recent announcement announcement from authorities in the area. They say that the scene is still extremely active. And this took place at 915 a.m. OK, it looks as though we're getting that live report, guys. Let's go ahead and listen in. Hey, welcome back. This is Fox 5 reporter Bob Barnard here in the middle of Central Avenue where there's been a shooting at uh, Gateway Village, which is a, a senior assisted living uh, facility here in Capitol Heights, Maryland. We can report that uh, the alleged shooter is in custody and sad to tell you, uh, Prince George's police are telling us two people have been shot and killed here this morning. Uh, while you may look at other images of the scene here, I want to bring in Donald, who's come over here to speak to us. Donald, you say you live at uh, Gateway Village, and, and what happened this morning, as best you know? Uh, the fire alarm went off, so that means everybody comes out, come out front to be accounted for, except those that are handicapped. So I stuck my head out in the hallway to see if people were moving. I saw my friend Roy. I'm sorry. I, I saw him, the shooter, lying on the hallway with his arms stretched out and the weapon was like six feet in front of him. He told me to let the police know that he is no threat. He's ready. He's waiting for death. What he had done, 
He knew he was going away. He told me that. I called the police and get them on the phone to tell them what was going on. And when they get there, they manhandle me. They push me up against the wall, twist my arm behind me, and would not listen so they didn't realize I was the guy that called you. Okay, meanwhile, I had just gotten my fiance out of the bathtub when the fire alarm went off. So I just wrapped her in a towel and laid her on the bed. This is an 81-year-old woman that does not communicate well, cannot ambulate well. She's in stage four cancer, so she has her own fight. For her to be in there by herself for almost 45 minutes now, and they tell me that she's okay, which means somebody went in there to see her. So that may cause a problem in itself. Donald, can, I, go in there. can I say, without mentioning names of your friend here, what did you say may have set him off? I know what set him off. The way they treat the seniors in Gateway Village. So know, he's a resident who got upset. He's a resident. What are they, what's the bad treatment? All right. Thank you, Donald, very much. And, and, and what Donald told us was that uh, he believes the people who've been shot are people who work at Gateway Village, not necessarily other residents of Gateway Village. What we're told is that there are two people dead, that police are now going through the apartment building to see if they can find any other victims. We don't want to mention names, but Donald did say that uh, he believes, again, the people who were shot by his friend who is in custody were people who worked at Gateway Village here in Capitol Heights, Maryland, guys. All right, and that was the latest update from Fox 5 DC reporter Bob Barnard. We are getting this information in real time right along with right you, our viewers yes, at home. I but I do want to bring you all the latest tweets from place. Prince George's County and Police Department. The most recent the information alarm, that we have. At approximately 9.15 a.m., police were called for a shooting at a senior living facility as of 925, we do know that one suspect is in custody and two have been shot and killed. Um, the scene remains active as authorities are searching the facility for any additional victims as well as suspects per protocol. The scene, I do want to bring you all another live now look of the scene as it is still extremely active. You can see agencies there in Prince George's County responding to this breaking news situation. Again, we are finding out information in real time with you all, our viewers, but right now we do know that two people are dead following a shooting at a senior living facility. This happened in Prince George's County. As you can imagine, a lot of people are beginning their afternoon commute in the area so you can see police are blocking off roads in the area and we also got word that the nearby schools are on lockdown following this shooting at the senior living facility again this took place around 9 15 a.m authorities were called to a shooting and we now know that two people are dead and one person is in custody now we also just had a live update from fox 5 dc's bob barnard who spoke with an alleged witness there on the scene who said that it's possible the shooter was angry at the treatment that seniors were getting at this at this living facility just had that live report but again information is very fluid at this time and I do want, this is the only tweet that we have so far from Prince George's County Police Department. We do not know for sure what caused this incident, but it is confirmed that two people are dead following a shooting in Prince George's County at this senior living facility. I'll bring you all back out live to the D.C. area. As you can see, police are beginning to tape off the area and block off traffic. All neighboring schools are on lockdown following this shooting just out of an abundance of caution. Still working to find out exactly what prompted this incident there at that senior living facility. But as soon as we find out, we will share it with you all here on Live Now from Fox. All right, we're gonna take a two minute commercial break. We'll have more nonstop news right after this.
Welcome back to Live Now from Fox, everyone. We are your source for raw and unfiltered nonstop news. Are you are, if you are just now joining us, we do have a breaking news situation happening in Prince George's County, Maryland, and we are getting some live images that I would like to share with you all here. Information is very limited, but right now we do know that two people are dead and one is in custody following a shooting at a senior living facility. This all took place around 9.15 a.m. We are being told that the Prince George's County Police Department responded to a call upon arrival. They found two people dead and one is in custody. We just had a live report with Fox 5 DC's Bob Barnard and he said that he can only confirm that two are dead and one is in custody. We do not yet know who is behind this shooting or a possible motive yet. Although we did hear a few words from witnesses there in the area. As you can see here, still a very, very active scene. Agencies are on the ground there blocking off traffic. And we also know that nearby schools are on lockdown following this shooting. I want to show you all the most recent tweet that we have from Prince George's County Police Department. They're announcing a media staging area. As you can imagine, a lot of people in the area are waking up to this news or receiving the latest news about this taking place in their community and they want to know exactly what happened and what's going on. So again, Prince George's County announcing that PIOs are on the scene and please continue to monitor, monitor social media for the latest update. You can imagine that we will receive an update from authorities any moment now. However, this is such a fluid situation taking place there in the DMV area. Um, let's go ahead and look at the scene. Still very, very active. You can see traffic is backing up along the area in Suffolk. Authorities there on the scene. I also witnessed a few community members walking up to police officers, presumably asking exactly what happened and what took place. Right now, we are finding out information in real time, right there along with you, our viewers. We're bringing you all this live image, raw and unfiltered. Right now, all we know is that there was a shooting at a senior living facility that left two dead one person is in custody. We do not yet know what the motive is, although we did hear from community members who alleged that the shooter was possibly angry at the treatment that seniors at this living facility were receiving. However, that information has not yet been confirmed. And if you are just now joining us, we are taking a live now look from Prince George's County, Maryland, where a shooting at a senior living facility left two dead. We know that one person is in custody. Still no word yet on who that suspect is. We do know that the shooting occurred around 9.30 a.m. this morning. This took place in the 500 block of Suffolk Avenue. This is in the Capitol Heights area, as you can see seem very much active. Nearby schools are on lockdown as an out of an abundance of caution. This is still a developing story, guys, so make sure that you all stay tuned into live now from Fox for the most recent and up to date information also getting word that Prince George's County Police Department is asking neighbors in the area to please shelter in place at this time. It is almost 11 a.m. here on the East Coast. So as you can imagine, a lot of people are either beginning their morning commute or making their way to the office around this time. So as you can see, authorities have blocked off neighboring streets and again are asking neighbors to please shelter in place. There's a nearby elementary school that we got word is actually on lockdown. There's 
No threat, however, police decided to lock that school down out of an abundance of caution. As you can imagine, anytime something like this happens in the community, authorities want to make sure that everyone is safe. You can see community members here speaking to law enforcement officers, probably asking all of the questions that we are doing the work to find you here at Live Now from Fox. So why did this take place? Who is the suspect that's now in custody? Who are the two victims that are now dead following a shooting at the senior living facility there in Prince George's County? At this time, we know that Prince George's County Police Department is on the scene. I'm not quite sure, still working to figure out if other agencies are responding to this, to this shooting there. Still a developing situation. Here's the latest information that we have from Prince George's County Police Department. As you can imagine, a lot of people are wondering what's going on in their community. So we can expect an update from authorities there in the area. Public information officers are already on the scene and PGPD is asking that community members and everyone paying attention to this story continue to monitor social media for the latest update. And that's what we do here at Live Now from Fox. We bring you all the latest breaking news situations, raw and unfiltered, as they unfold. We are getting some more information to our desk that I want to share with you all. This update coming at 10.55 a.m. is the most recent information we know. So we told you all that neighboring schools are on lockdown. We are now getting information that the scene is secure at the National Church Residences in this neighborhood at Gateway Village. We have one male suspect who is in custody. Again, two confirmed victims, both the And we continue on right here with tragedy in Maryland right now. You're taking a look at two shots that we have for you right here on Live Now from Fox coming out of Prince George's County in Maryland right now of this a tragic shooting leaving a two dead. One person is in custody after the shooting at a senior living facility. And when you continue to watch live right here on Live Now from Fox, we appreciate all our viewers from across the country and around the world. It is now 11 o'clock Eastern right there, local time that uh, we are taking these shots here for you. We have uh, been telling you uh, in the last couple of moments that there is a media staging area and uh, we are expecting a news conference to happen pretty soon soon. We are going to stay on this story here for you. That's what we do live raw and always unfiltered here for you. We get the feeds that, uh, that come in through our news programs and we push them out to you in real time. No editing involved here. We bring it out just like if you were out on the scene as well. And we're hoping for the very best for everyone else associated with that senior living uh, facility. Let's just show you the map right now, kind of give you an idea of where we are uh, looking at right now in Prince uh, George's County here. So let's just uh, zoom out a little bit here and kind of give you more of a uh, lay of the land here in the D.C. area. So you can see that this is uh, just about east of uh, downtown uh, D.C. right there in this uh, area of Capitol Heights, it's called. Capitol Heights, Maryland is uh, the official locator there, but we are also in Prince George's County. So uh, we are going to wait and see what happens. Let's just uh, re brief everybody about the very latest that we know here at this hour. 
Uh, just in case, if you're just joining us here on Live Now from Fox, we always appreciate uh, you joining us here, especially when we are in breaking news coverage. Uh, just to remind everybody that in these types of situations, uh, information coming out is always fluid. It's uh, coming out in real time. And sometimes the numbers that come across now, like the two dead, one in custody, those can change over time. We're hoping that that uh, death toll uh, count is not change uh, however though as police say two people are dead and one person in custody after a shooting at the senior living facility in prince george's county i'm just going to switch the shot here i saw in the corner of my eye that it was changing there we'll wait for them to uh, re-establish their shot there on the ground the incident happened about 9 15 local time uh, this morning in the 500 block of sulfic avenue in capitol heights shooting prompted uh, to the uh, police to have residents shelter in place this is a developing story as always, but you're taking a look here at the scene that we're seeing from Sky Fox high up above right now, just showing you the first responders uh, that all came out obviously for this shooting call and uh, your heart really just goes out to everybody that was inside the facility. We're talking about the workers. We're talking about uh, the actual seniors, what they must have been thinking at the time when they heard gunshots ringing out. And what about the family members associated uh, with these seniors? They get the call, they get a text message, an alert saying that there's been an incident at uh, your parents or your grandparents' uh, senior living facility. You need to come out here. Uh, I mean, that is something that uh, your, your heart would just drop and you're thinking the absolute worst and you're wondering oh no could uh my loved one be one of those two we don't know if there's any other injured at this moment we don't know what prompted this and uh obviously a lot more information will be coming out in the next couple of hours here but we're hoping that we could get a news conference here pretty soon here for you and we'll be bringing it to you live raw and always direct right here on live now from fox we appreciate all the viewers from around the country and around the world joining us here in real time But this is uh, live footage right now. Sky Fox uh, high up above Prince George's County right now showing the aftermath of a tragic shooting. We don't know what prompted this, but uh, you're taking a look like looks like there you are. You got two, maybe maybe one police officer taking somebody in this area away from the scene as well. You got others coming out uh, of the area. There was a shelter in place. We don't know if that is still happening because they do have a person in custody as soon as they get a all clear of the perimeter i'm, I'm guessing that that uh, shelter in place would uh, stand down at that moment So this is exactly what we do here on Live Now from Fox, uh, bring in the live and breaking news feeds as they come in and just really push them out to you. And you could catch uh, all of uh, our coverage always at LiveNowFox.com. There's just so many uh, different avenues for you to really consume our product here from so many different streaming services. You could catch them all at LiveNowFox.com and really pick your favorite and see uh, just which one you want to go with and uh, really watch us from, uh, you know, at any point in the day where we're covering these live events or, or different kind of feeds that we're bringing in, top stories here of the day. And boy, we're just hoping for uh, everybody, for the very best for everybody associated with this shooting. It's a very, very uh, difficult one. Obviously, so many questions right now left unanswered. And the sad part with these types of stories when there is a shooting and and something like this where it, it was definitely an attack on the senior living facility, there's going to be so many questions. Why, why, why did this happen? And for so many times, family members in these tragic uh, situations sometimes never really get that answer. And you know what? That answer is never going to be good enough because at the end of the day, we have uh, two people that are dead here 
in this shooting that shouldn't be. They should be still living and uh, trying their to live their best life at the senior living facility. And uh, now tragedy has occurred. We don't know why. There's no reason for it. But uh, once again, we just uh, continue to see shootings happening across the country at really a rate that is just outstanding. When you think about all the major cities here in this country that seem to be plagued by shootings. Uh, I mean, D.C., no, uh, no stranger to gun violence. And uh, just in the last couple of months, we've been seeing in the D.C. area just about uh, all the shootings that they've been having just, you know, in broad daylight. And we're, we're at a restaurant a couple of months ago that we were covering right here for you on Live Now from Fox. And then and you talk about other major cities. Look at Chicago. Uh, every weekend, they are dealing with huge amounts of gun violence, so much so that come Monday, you report the numbers, 50 dead, 60 shot. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't get any traction. They'll talk about it maybe for two minutes on national news, and that's it. Yes, you're lucky if you get two minutes on that. I mean, it's coming such commonplace now, and uh, we continue to just showcase everything that is happening across the country all times in real time right here on Live Now from Fox. Looks like they are setting up like that podium shot right here that we have for you of this uh, breaking news alert. And uh, this is where the news conference will be and we'll be waiting on that as soon as it happens. We're bringing it to you right here on Live Now from Fox. Don't go anywhere. We are going to stay on this breaking news element uh, for as long as we have these shots available to you. Here's what we got coming up as well a little bit later. In about a half an hour, we are expecting President Biden to talk about jobs numbers. And uh, the jobs numbers missed the mark big time. And uh, we'll see just how the Biden administration will try to spin those numbers and uh, talk about uh, everything that is happening with the economy there. So we'll be uh, featuring that for you in real time as well. So much to talk about today, but we're going to stay on this coverage as long as we have the shot available to us. And while we wait for this in-demand news conference here of the day, for just joining us, welcome everyone here to Live Now from Fox. I'm your host, Mike Pache, as we are taking these live aerials right now of the aftermath of a deadly shooting that happened at a senior living facility about nine o'clock local time. So just about two hours ago, this all happened. Investigation is still ongoing right now, all happening in Prince George's County in Maryland, uh, just uh, east of Washington, D.C. And you can see that bus. Maybe that bus is taking some of the senior living uh, members away from there because we did see a bus being boarded up there with people coming right across the street. You can see the media members there right now. That's the shot that we have right here. You see the bus going away. So we got you covered really on all angles right now from the air to the ground. We're going to have this news conference as soon as it happens. But boy, you know, these are the types of stories that uh, really leave people saying, why did this happen? And who did this? Was this an, uh, a possible employee that got mad at, uh, at the, the worker? Was it a disgruntled worker? You just don't know. Or was this something so random that they decided to go after this facility? You just don't know. And then we're hoping to get some answers in just a little bit for this news conference when police will be briefing us on the situation at hand. And remember, uh, during these break news elements, information does come uh, very fluid so we will be updating the best we can in real time as it is happening but uh, boy this is just something that uh, you just never wanted to report but we got to do what we got to do when it uh, when the feeds do come and the information does come across we break it out to you right here on live now from Fox, everybody. So this is the shot that you are seeing and continue to see right now of a deadly aftermath. Two dead, one in custody. And we don't know who that suspect is. We're hoping to get a lot more information at this first update. Uh, coming up in just a little bit, everyone. Let's uh, let's keep you in double box right now. The podium is set up. We are waiting for the officials uh, to give us an update. But as soon as we saw this uh, feed come through, we were like, you know what? 
We're going to go to it right away. And that's what we do. We saw the feed. They, we saw the information from Fox DC, our, our partner there. And they said, hey, here's a heads up. We got this situation going on. Here's the elements. We said, we're going right for it, right here on Live Now from Fox. That's exactly what we do uh, when the breaking news comes to us. We just deliver it right for you. And you're just seeing these raw images play out uh, in real time here for us. And you'll see the news conference from beginning uh, until the end. If you're just joining us here, everybody, this is happening in the Capitol Heights neighborhood in Maryland right now. And uh, we continue to wait for the very latest from police. But another situation and the thing you've really got to think about, too, is... We want to know just what the workers were doing at the time to help maybe help guard some of these seniors that, you know, for a lot of them, they, they, they're, maybe they're in wheelchairs and they, they couldn't get out of the way. What did they see? How did they try uh, to save them? There's probably a lot of heroes associated with this story and it'll come out in due time. But right now we're just waiting on what they call, you know, the nuts and the bolts of, of the story to get a little bit more details. But no matter what way you look at it, something sick happened here where somebody came in and just started to shoot. We don't know why. And sometimes the family members will never know why, but uh, the person is in custody. So we will see just what happened here and what, how it all uh, started and why it started coming up in just a little bit here on live now from Fox. Uh, you could see some more on the left hand of your screen here from Sky Fox. Looks like some more police are coming in and uh, to help out with this investigation. Another uh, question is, where are the other seniors going to go from this facility? Obviously, they are going to have to leave here while this investigation is ongoing. So we'll uh, want to hear from that and uh, just hear all about what was the timeline of this shooting and how did it all play out in real time? And again, how did they try to aid those uh, seniors that maybe are in wheelchairs or, or not quick on their feet uh, to safety here. We're gonna go back out to that Sky Fox shot because it looks like that photographer is gearing up and we don't wanna take him here in our box right now. But uh, we'll continue to showcase this breaking news for you in real time. So this is uh, uh, what the you see a lot of times in these murder cases is you get the big vans here, the big trucks here from the county police, maybe the state police also coming in and uh, they'll be doing a very thorough investigation and they'll be there all day to figure out, okay, what happened? How did this person maybe get into the facility and uh, where do we go from there? But uh, once again, talking about another tragic shooting in America and we continue to showcase the breaking news here for you all in real time right here on live now from Fox. Some of you are going to see a quick two minute break. Uh, we're going to hit that break. Some of you might not see it. So we're just going to continue to talk. It's going to be very fluid here, everyone. And we'll continue to bring it out all for you in real time. Some of you seen that two minute break. Stay right here with us. We're just getting started on live now from Fox. And, and as you can see, it's looking like it's going to be a pretty busy day right here on live now from Fox. Okay, we have just entered that break, but maybe some of you didn't hit that break. We know we know I have a lot of streaming partners right now, and not all the times those breaks are happening uh, for you. So we stay on the air right here for you on Live Now from Fox and really showcasing, unfortunately, this tragic shooting happening in Maryland today that leaves two people dead and so many questions left unanswered right now. And we're hoping that we'll get some uh, information from the police in just a little bit here. But you can see another bus here, maybe coming to the area and, and we'll see if uh, they'll be picking up more seniors to take them away and out from this uh, facility, everyone. I continue to look for more updates just in case. I just want to be uh, the very latest here for you and give it everything that I got here today as uh, this information comes in. 
sporadically, as you can imagine, and uh, we try our best to push it out right for you in real time while we do wait for the officials to give us an update as well. But just imagine, everyone, you're in the facility, you're thinking it's just going to be a normal Friday morning. You're thinking of the maybe the events that they have planned for a Friday. Maybe there's a bingo session or, or something going on later in the day. You're looking forward to that. Or maybe they have a special uh, lunch on a Friday that you're looking forward to. And then all of a sudden, you're hearing shots ring out. And you know how loud gunshots are and how they just ricochet the sound and the the vibrance off of walls and you're thinking okay this is not a normal Friday and then it continues and you just want to know how many shots were fired who was targeted who was the shooter and why did this all happen some of those questions we may never ever know but we'll continue to follow this story for you at every angle right here on Live Down from Fox. We appreciate all our viewers from around the country and around the world that continue to join with us in real time as we take these Sky Fox aerials right now. Fox 5 DC always doing a great job of giving us updates, letting us know of what's going on in their area and that was a situation that happened about 40 minutes ago. They alerted us and we said, you know what? We're going on the air with it. We're gonna push it out. And uh, that's exactly what we did here. And you're seeing a large police presence. They're gonna be there all day. Anytime there is a deadly shooting, a murder, uh, they are going to be there for quite, quite uh, some time. And uh, boy, your hearts just go out to the loved ones here that have lost someone. You know, you, you think you're, you're, you're helping them in their best way, putting your loved ones in a senior home, trying to give them the best care that they can get, never ever thinking that something like this would take them away from you. And that has to be just an ultimate shock to the family and friends of these ones that have just lost at least two people and forever their, their lives are forever changed anytime you 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 deal with something like this that is so tragic you, you your life is forever ever changed and so many times i think in the media we we don't really talk about that too much you know we talk about the breaking news we'll give you this uh story and then you know days later weeks later we don't hear about it anymore, and we don't hear about those long, uh, really standing problems and uh, emotions that go with the family members that have uh, lost someone. You know, so many times that's what people say during uh, the loss of a loved one is, in the beginning, you know, it's, it's more of a surreal moment because you're getting a lot of attention from family and friends are calling you, people are around the home, and it's easy to, you know, still be okay with everything. But then when the cameras go away and everything else and, and people, and then life happens, then you're left with wondering, okay, now I really did lose someone. And now why did this happen? Especially in a tragic situation. I couldn't imagine losing a grandma or a grandpa to something like this. And, uh, that's just something that uh, a lot of people just never uh, will be able to understand. And your heart goes out to everyone uh, right now that is dealing with this and really across the country that uh, have lost loved ones to tragic situations of shootings, violence, or, or other things that uh, we, we talk about on the news so much, but we really never really follow up with those um, family members to see how they're doing, you know, a, a month later, a couple of months later after, after the spotlight has definitely uh, come off. 
Just joining us here on Live Now from Fox, we appreciate you joining us here today. We wish we were meeting on better circumstances, but we are uh, detailing this breaking news situation on Prince George's County, Maryland. Two dead, uh, one person in custody after the shooting at this senior living facility that happened about 9 o'clock local time. So... Uh, it's about two hours now, two and a half hours that this has happened and the investigation is ongoing. We did lose that shot for the podium, which we are expecting a news conference. We're hoping that they're just trying to save some battery and uh, we'll power back up as soon as uh, that news conference does get going. We'll break it all for you right here on Live Now from Fox, everyone. We're getting some additional information right now, thanks to our team here at Live Now from Fox that continues to, to try to give me updates in real time, so we appreciate that. Fox 5's Bob Barnard said the shooting happened at Gateway Village, a senior apartment complex in Capitol Heights. The reporter spoke to Donald, a man who lives at the apartment complex, who said he saw the alleged shooter, also a resident of Gateway Village, after the shots were fired. Donald told the reporter that the alleged shooter shot and killed two workers at the senior complex after he claimed they mistreated the residents there. So that is some new information here that uh, we're bringing to you right here on Live Now from Fox. So that uh, really changes some of the dynamic here of this shooting, obviously still very tragic. So uh, according to that report, according to that uh, witness that was telling our Fox 5 team there in D.C., this, uh, we're waiting for police to confirm this here, but uh, what that reporter is reporting that uh, this shooter was a resident of Gateway Village and uh, apparently said that they were mistreating the residents and two of the people that were killed were workers at this senior complex facility. So that is some new information just coming in to the newsroom right here. So we appreciate our team for always um, looking for the latest updates while we uh, provide these images here for you right here on Live Now from Fox Everyone. It is now 1124 out in the East Coast, 824 on the West Coast. Thank you again for joining us here in real time on Live Now from Fox. If you're just joining us or maybe new to the uh, stream, this is uh, sort of what we do here. When we have a breaking news element, we'll, we'll just stay on it. You know, so many times when you're watching a traditional newscast, uh, you know, they'll stay on it for maybe just a little bit and then go on to whatever uh, is happening. And that's all great. That's a different product. We're a different product showcasing, uh, giving you this feed for as long as we got it. And as, as long as the information continues to come in, we'll stay on it. And we're waiting for another, for the first news conference here of the day associated with this uh, shooting that is very, very tragic. And I was just talking about the, the, the loss and the feeling of loss if you were uh, just joining us here. I'm just really how, you know, any shooting is tragic, but when, when you're dealing with something that is like this in, in a much, much uh, heavier way, you know, you go to work thinking you're just going to go to work and then you might not be able to leave work and your life and your family members are forever uh, changed because of that. So that was the new information that Fox 5 DC was putting out there, that the uh, Fox 5 reporter there said the shooting happened at Gateway Village. This is a senior apartment complex in Capitol Heights. The reporter spoke to a man named Donald, a man who lives at the apartment complex, who said he saw the alleged shooter and was also a resident of Gateway Village after the shots were fired. The man told our Fox 5 reporter that the alleged shooter shot and killed two workers at the senior complex after he claimed they mistreated the residents. And uh, we will see what police say uh, when they give us this update right here live, raw, and always unfiltered for you on Live Now from Fox. Thanks to our team again for always uh, updating us and uh, putting that in so we could really give it to you here uh, in real time.
All right here on live now from Fox, everybody. But we're taking a look here still of the one shot that we have available here to us. Sky Fox, let's go back out to the maps just to give you a, a relation of where this is uh, there in Capitol Heights right now. So I'm just going to zoom out a little bit so you can see D.C. obviously in the center of your screen, but we're going to go just... Uh, east of that, and I'll really just uh, zone in here on Capitol Heights here. This happened on Sulphic Avenue on the 500 block right there. Going back out to live images right now that we continue to play out for you. Showing you the investigation that is ongoing here at this moment. We'll continue to update this here for you, and we are going to take another quick two-minute break for some of you. Stay right here with us. We'll continue to wait for that live update coming up, uh, we're hoping, pretty shortly. If you did not enter into a break, don't worry. We're still here with you and providing you uh, the late, very latest right here on Live Now from Fox, everybody. So the plot thickens in this story here. You know, when you first saw the images, you heard about a shooting at a senior living facility, you're thinking, oh, no, boy. Uh, it could be, you know, some of the seniors that, uh, that, that passed away. And the new information that we're getting from our reporting partners there in Fox 5 DC is that we're waiting for police to confirm this there. But a, um, um, there was an interview that was done not too long ago from a man uh, that says he is a member here of this complex and saw the alleged shooter and said that this shooter was a worker of the facility and said he was, he shot and killed two workers. Because they, he felt like they were mistreating the senior uh, living members there. So let me just uh, clarify that for everyone because I know it's getting a little jumbled here in this uh, breaking news here, but uh, the latest report here is from Fox 5 DC is that the shooter may be a, a resident here of this senior living facility and shot two of the workers. We're waiting for police to confirm that there, but uh, that was the latest report that Fox 5 DC uh, was putting out there and we'll continue to wait for the very latest obviously very fluid right now as i was mentioning earlier you just don't know uh, which way a breaking news story will have its twists and its turns but we'll follow it for you at every angle right here on live now from fox everyone Thanks again for everyone coming back from their break right here on the live now from Fox. You're watching it all happen in real time. We have some updates here that we want to bring to you uh, on this uh, evolving story that continues to play out in real time. So this incident happened about 915 local time there in Capitol Heights. Fox 5, Bob Barnard said the shooting happened at Gateway Village, a senior apartment complex in Capitol Heights. Barnard uh, spoke to a man named Donald, a man who lives at the apartment complex, who said he saw the alleged shooter, also a resident of Gateway Village, after the shots were fired. Donald told the reporter that the alleged shooter shot and killed two workers at the senior complex after he claimed they mistreated the residents. Police have not confirmed who the victims are at this time. They have not identified the alleged gunman as well. We wait for those updates coming up in just a little bit here, everyone. We'll continue to follow it, but as soon as we have President Biden talking about the economy and the jobs numbers, we'll go to it and uh, keep this update in mind for everyone. 
We did have another shot available to us, but uh, it looks like they are maybe saving battery here as best as they can while they wait for this news conference to happen. Rest assured, everybody that is joining us, we will play that out for you. When we do get it. So the shooting happened about 9.15 local, and then police said as of 10.25 local time, they had that suspect in custody. They were able to confirm right away that they had uh, two, victim, two victims that were dead. They searched the facility for any additional victims as well as suspects per uh, the protocol that you could imagine when a shooting call comes out. They got to make sure that the rest of the scene is cleared before first responders can get in there and try to help people that have uh, been associated with this shooting. So more and more, it's looking like a targeted shooting that is coming from Fox 5 uh, DC reporting right now that uh, Fox 5 DC reporting that the alleged shooter may have been a senior living facility member and shot two workers over claims of mistreatment. Obviously, uh, that is not been confirmed yet by the police, but that is the reporting that is out there from Fox 5 DC. So we wanted to just push out everything that is coming from them. They're on the ground and they continue to work their sources for the information that continues to play out right now here on Live Now from Fox, everybody. We have a full slate of news events in store for you today. We got a lot of coverage planned. So uh, stay with us on Live Now from Fox. You can always check us out, livenowfox.com. Check out our social channels as well. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. We, uh, on Twitter, we do always a great job of uh, giving you the updates. Uh, and a lot of different articles that we push out there. Um, a lot of interesting stories you can imagine throughout the day come. And, and if you want to be in the know, check us out on Live Now Fox uh, on our Twitter account. And uh, we'd love to have you as one of our followers. But while we do wait for this update, some of you, again, are going to hit a uh, two-minute break, and we will continue to uh, follow this breaking news and really tragic story out of Maryland. Still joining us here on Live Now from Fox, we're seeing another ambulance come here uh, to the scene right now of a story that is tragic and we continue to follow it really for you at every angle right now. And this whole street is blocked off uh, because of uh, the police, the first responders that continue to uh, come out here and uh, showcase this this story and uh, try to get everybody that is involved here the proper care that they need right now. Just joining us here, everyone, this happening In Prince George's County, Maryland, two dead, one in custody after a shooting at a senior living facility. Let's just update everyone right now in case you're just joining us here on Live Now from Fox and you're wondering, oh no, what happened now in this country? This is happening in Capitol Heights, 
Maryland. And police say two people are dead right now, one person in custody after the shooting at the senior living facility. The incident happened around 9.15 local time in the 500 block of Sulphic Avenue. Shooting prompted uh, police to have residents shelter in place. Fox 5's Bob Barnard said the shooting happened in Gateway Village, a senior apartment complex in Capitol Heights. Barnard spoke to a man named Donald, a man who lives at the apartment complex, who said he saw the alleged shooter, also a resident of Gateway Village. After the shots were fired, Donald told Barnard that the alleged shooter shot and killed two workers at the senior complex after he claimed they mistreated the residents. Police have not confronted, uh, confirmed who the victims are at this time. They have not identified the alleged gunman as well. But we do have the shot now available back up to us for this uh, news conference. The podium is set up there. We will be waiting for that. And as soon as it happens, we'll play it out for you right here on Live Now from Fox. Also coming up uh, within this hour, we are expecting President Biden at the White House to be talking about the economy and the latest jobs numbers. We don't know if off the top he might mention this just because it is so close to the White House. We'll wait and see on that one right here for you. But uh, once we get an idea of when this news conference is happening, we'll bring it to you, of course, right here on Live Now from Fox. This is exactly what we do here is show you the uh, feeds and different elements that we have for a story and bring it out right to you in real time. You know, you got to figure um, how we are just so much different than a traditional newscast. Think about your traditional newscast that starts at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., all day that you are gathering information and getting it ready for that special 5 and 6 o'clock newscast. Here on Live Now from Fox, you are seeing the gathering happening in real time. And when we mean the gathering, the feed is just going right out to you. We put out uh, the graphic with the lower third to give you a little idea of uh, what is happening and the location. And then we just let uh, the story really tell the story and the images tell the story as well. So our gathering process is happening live right there in front of you while a traditional newscast uh, will, you know, continue to uh, wait and for their five o'clock newscast or six o'clock newscast. Another thing that you're going to see a little bit different as well is when we have the news conference, we're not going to show you a sound bite, 20 second clip, 30 second clip. We'll just show you the whole news conference. That's another uh, thing that really makes us different. A lot of people like that, too, because they're getting a sense, a better sense of what happened. They get to hear questions from the reporters. You know, a lot of times you don't hear that. You just hear that 20 second little snippet in a story and that's it. And then uh, then they go on to the next one. We'll stay in a story for a particular time. Obviously, in a breaking news situation, we we give it a little bit more space, a little bit more depth for our viewers. And um, that's one of the great things here about Live Down from Fox and really separates us from a traditional newscast that makes it just a little bit different and I think just a little bit more uh, engaging for the viewer because as a consumer, you want to try to get as much information as you can in a particular story. And if, you, if we're showcasing a story that is of interest of you, uh, you want to try to get as much information at that uh, time that you can. And when you put out a news conference from start to finish, you're getting to see it all play out. As it does. So we appreciate all our viewers from around the country and around the world as we continue to wait for an update on this news conference and really update on this tragic shooting that played out. As soon as President Biden gets going, we'll bring it to you right here on Live Now from Fox as we wait for this. But as of right now, uh, we are gonna stay on this shot as long as we have it. Sky Fox continues to be up there in real time. And thank you again for joining us here. Let's step away for another two minute break while we have it and while we wait for an update from police.
If you not enter into that two minute break, don't you worry. We are still here with you on live now from Fox showcasing this breaking news story of a senior living facility shooting that leaves two people dead, one person in custody waiting for the very latest from police as uh, they will be giving us this update in real time and we'll push it out to you as well. Live, raw, and always unfiltered here for you. I want to give everyone the latest update that I was getting from our team that was uh, giving us this information just a moment ago. So uh, Fox 5 DC's Bob Barnard has said the shooting happened at Gateway Village, a senior apartment complex in Capitol Heights. Barnard spoke to a man named Donald, a man who lives at the apartment complex, who said he saw the alleged shooter also was a resident of Gateway Village after the shots were fired. Donald told Barnard that the alleged shooter shot and killed two workers at the senior complex after he claimed that they mistreated the residents. Police have not confirmed who those victims are at the time. They have not identified the alleged gunman as well. So we wait on those things right now. I'm just going to see on Twitter if there's anything confirmed yet uh, from the authorities right now. So the scene is now secure. That was the latest update about 30 minutes ago. That suspect is in custody. So they did not find any other suspects. The scene right now is secured. The perimeter is secured. Now that'll be able to give the authorities, the investigators, the space and the time for them to conduct their investigation to see what happened, how did this all happen, and why did it happen is the main cause right there that uh, we continue to wait on right here. As of always, we're waiting to see. Maybe we could talk to one of uh, Fox 5's uh, reporters. Maybe we could do a phone interview. We're waiting for those things to happen. We're waiting for our team to see if that is a possibility. If it is, great. We will uh, take it in real time right here on Live Now from Fox. But uh, we continue to showcase what is happening of this tragic situation out there in Maryland. Fox 5 reporting is that the two victims are workers at this facility and not actually members. Police haven't confirmed that yet, but that is what our Fox 5 DC team is uh, reporting there. They heard from a witness that was inside at the time. So we're waiting for that confirmation from police. Here's the other shot that we have here for you. The podium shot is ready. The police obviously have that whole block shut down and probably a good portion of the surrounding area as well. But uh, this is where they are going to come and step up and give us all the update that we have been waiting for in the last 45 minutes. We've been covering it for you from start to finish. And that's what we'd like to do right here on Live Now from Fox Everyone. Also, coming up in just a little bit, we are going to be hearing from President Biden. He is going to be talking about the latest job numbers and the economy. So we'll be pushing that out to you as well. We're hoping that um, this news conference will happen and then President Biden will come and we can play it out for you both live. But uh, if Biden gets going, we're going to have to break away and bring you those job numbers uh, to hear from the president himself on this Friday here. It is setting up to be a busy, busy day here. 11.45 out on the East Coast, 8.45 out on the West Coast. I'm your host, Mike Pache, continuing to man this operation of Live Now from Fox. We do have a team that continues to look for updates here for us, try to book us some interviews, try to book us some phone interviews associated with this story. We'll wait for those things and uh, we will continue to broadcast live raw and always direct here for you on live now from fox thanks again for joining us here we wish we were meeting on better circumstances and uh, it just seems like 
Another day in America, another shooting that we are bringing to you. I wish we didn't have to report on these things, but boy, when they happen, we have to uh, bring it out to you. And it seems like there's just a lot of that lately, unfortunately. So when this information first came out, you know, you were thinking, okay, was this maybe like a disgruntled worker? Was this something that uh, this place was obviously targeted? Because it just seems like a, such a random uh, spot here for such a horrific shooting. And the Fox 5 DC team continues uh, to report here that the shooter could potentially be a member here of this facility and uh, shot two workers. Nothing of that has been confirmed by the police, but that is what Fox 5 DC is putting out there right now. We're going to take our final break here of the hour for some of you on Live Down from Fox. And uh, as you can see, we continue to wait here for... Ooh, we might want to hold off on that break there. Looks like uh, it could be getting close here to an update. I'm going to hold off on that break. Yeah, so the, the, we're going to hold off on the break. That one has been confirmed, everyone. And it uh, looks like we may be getting a little bit closer to an update. We do see some officials right there gearing up. Looks like maybe more members, uh, authorities coming to the podium here. So this could be underway shortly right here on Live Now from Fox, everyone. Hoping to get a lot more answers to whatever happened here at this facility. And hearts go out to uh, the loved ones of these victims. They thought it was just going to be a normal Friday. And unfortunately, gunshots rang out. And life forever has been changed, not only, of course, for the victims that they are no longer here, but the family members, the friends of those victims' lives forever changed. And we're thinking of the very best for them at this time, a very sad time, obviously, as well. Just joining us here today, we appreciate you and wish we were had better news of the day for you. So many times people say, hey, I don't watch the news because I just don't want to be depressed. And boy, we're with you on the same way. Uh, we wish we had a lot more uh, happier news to put out there. And of course we would. And, uh, you know, because we don't like it either. Now, this shooting happened almost now. We're going on three hours when we hit the top of the hour. So when we come up at the top of the hour, it's going to be about three hours ago that this happened. And the shooting prompted police to have residents shelter in place. Obviously, that's a proper protocol. Now, Fox 5's uh, Bob Barnard said the shooting happened at Gateway Village, a senior apartment complex in Capitol Heights. Barnard spoke uh, to a man named Donald, who actually lives at the apartment complex, who said that he saw the alleged shooter, also a resident of Gateway Village, after the shots were fired. Donald told uh, Barnard that the alleged shooter shot and killed two workers at the senior complex after he claimed that they mistreated the residents. Police have not confirmed who the victims are at this time. They have not identified the alleged gunman as well. But that is something that uh, hopefully we can get cleared up for you at this news conference. We'll just see just how forthcoming uh, the police will be. Obviously, it's still an ongoing investigation. They really can't say too much uh, during these times because, of course, they will have uh, pending uh, legal proceedings as well. And you don't want to jam up anything in those 
uh, proceedings there as well as in, and let the uh, court case and process really go through. But Sky Fox has been doing just a great job of uh, giving us the shot all morning long here. We've been on it for now almost an hour for you right here on Live Now from Fox, detailing everything that is happening and uh, really telling you about all the twists and turns that happen in a breaking news story just like this. And, you know, I was, I was mentioning when we first came on here saying that during these breaking news situations, there's a lot of fluid information out there, right? It comes and it goes, and you just don't know where it's actually going to end up. And that's why I always say, Jay, just uh, brace with us here a little bit. You know, give us, give us a little moment here as to let us collect our information because people put out that information and then it could change so rapidly. Everything is uh, different. You could see it. Uh, the investigation is still ongoing. Maybe police are still trying to get those latest details for us. And uh, we'll definitely be giving that out to you right here on Live Now from Fox as it's happening. We appreciate all our viewers here around the country and around the world for joining us here today. You can check all of our information and feeds at LiveNowFox.com. You can see where else uh, that you can consume us at because maybe you have a favorite right now, but you might have you look on LiveNowFox.com and say, oh, I didn't know that they were broadcasting on that outlet as well. Yeah, we got a lot up there, and uh, we're, we're still going to be adding in the future. So come in and join uh, us at LiveDownFox.com. You can tell we're a much different operation in the, in the terms of the way we cover news events and breaking news events at that. We were just talking about it earlier, saying that, you know, traditional newscasts would have moved on a long, long time ago. And who knows if they would have taken the news conference live or maybe just showed you a 20 second clip later in the day, later in the evening. We like the immediacy of things. We like the things that are happening live, now, raw, unfiltered. I like to say if it's happening live, it's happening now. It's a good chance it's happening on live now from Fox. And that's really some of the different elements that uh, we bring out to you right here. Coming up a little bit later, we'll hear from Governor Ron DeSantis out of Florida as well. We'll be featuring that for you. So we've got a full slate of activities and events here for you. It looks like uh, we may have maybe some more officials coming to the scene right now. As we continue to wait for Prince George's County officials, also Capitol Heights officials, to give us the very, very latest update. We were gonna take that break and we said, you know what? We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna take the break in the next hour. That's another great thing that we can really push, push breaks away uh, during these breaking news events and a lot of places, other places can't, so. It's just an opportunity for me just to have the conversation with you, the viewer here, and uh, we get to uncover the story and all the different angles that go with it uh, together. Because we don't know what's going to be said here, but that is makes it some of uh, the rawness of it. Looks like more officials there getting ready to come to the podium here. Let's regroup for everybody. If you're just joining us here on this story, you know, some people, so many people come and go, obviously, uh, you got things to do and you consume the news at different times. We get that. Let's break it all down for you as we come up at the top of the hour, getting close to the noon on the East Coast, nine o'clock on the West Coast. We wish we were meeting on better terms here, but uh, we have two dead, one in custody after a shooting at a senior living facility in Prince George's County in Maryland, just east of uh, Washington, D.C. Here's the latest that we know from Fox 5 D.C. right now. As the Fox 5 D.C. reporter spoke to a man named Donald, who a man who lives at the apartment complex, who said he saw the alleged shooter, who also is a resident of Gateway Village, after the shots were fired. 
The man told our Fox 5 DC reporter that the alleged shooter shot and killed two workers at the senior complex after he claimed that they mistreated the residents. Obviously, we have not uh, have that confirmed yet by the police. We wait for that confirmation here on Live Down from Fox, but we wanted to just to break everything to you um, as it's happening there in real time right here on Live Now from Fox, everyone. Well, we did see some of the officials there moments ago. We don't see them in the shot right now. So what I'll do is just take us full right here and wait for that news conference to happen here. But still a long stretch of police vehicles, first responder vehicles here at this facility. They'll be there all day as this investigation still and it's very, very early start right now and uh, they'll have a lot of work ahead uh, from them and we'll continue to bring you the updates that are happening here in real time on Live Now from Vox. And we are getting closer to hitting noon on the East Coast, 9 o'clock on the West Coast, everyone. We are continuing to wait for an update out of Prince George's County, Maryland, here of this situation and really tragic story that happened at a senior living facility. Two dead, one in custody. The scene is now clear. They are able uh, to do their investigation right now. There were no other suspects associated with this shooting. And, uh, you know, when we were first coming on, we are saying this had to be some sort of targeted attack just because of uh, the randomness here of uh, shooting at a facility here. And you were wondering, was it maybe a disgruntled employee? Could it have been? Could it have been uh, somebody, a family member that uh, was trying to, to uh, wreak havoc at this facility for some odd reason? But that doesn't seem to be the case. The, the case that it seems to be, according to Fox 5, DC right now is that uh, from a witness that Fox 5 DC was able to talk to the uh, the man told our crew out there that the alleged shooter shot and killed two workers at the senior complex after he claimed that they mistreated residents there and uh, obviously this investigation will be ongoing we haven't heard from the police yet that's why you still see the podium shot up there and uh, we wait for more updates from our uh, team on the ground there, right there on Live Now from Fox. As we get, get you all squared away here at the top of the hour right here on Live Now from Fox. We appreciate you joining us here in real time today. It is now 12 o'clock out on the East Coast, 9 o'clock on the West Coast. Thanks again for joining us here today on this very sad story that we're starting uh, our meet of our coverage here today on. Coming up in just a little bit as well, President Biden going to be talking about that jobs report that didn't hit the mark at all uh, when it comes to expected job numbers. We'll be hearing from him in a little bit. We'll be hearing from Governor Abbott while we wait for that news conference to get going here, everyone. I'll show you the map again, give you an idea of what this is all around. I'm just going to... Uh, pull out just a little bit because this is the Capitol Heights area where it is. And we're just pulling out to show you the vicinity there from uh, White House, Washington, D.C., not too far away at all. A uh, quick drive away right there in Prince George's County in Maryland. Zoom in right there to show you the Capitol Heights area there in Maryland. 
back out live down to the podium shot while we do wait for more updates and i await for more updates from anybody out there from our fox 5 dc team that continues to do their work on the ground giving us uh, these updates as quickly as they get them if you know this area it happened in the 500 block of sulfic avenue the scene is now secure one suspect is in custody We're waiting to hear from the police right now. Families of those who live here are asked to gather outside at the firehouse at, on Old Central Avenue. So that is where the family staging area is, and that'd be a difficult call to get. You're thinking it's just going to be a normal Friday. And, it, and if that report is right from Fox 5 DC and it's actual workers that were shot and killed, and think about it, you're, you're thinking you're happy, hey, it's Friday, it's going to be uh, the weekend soon, and then tragedy happens and you don't even hit the weekend. And that just really just shows you just how quick life can change and how it can change on a dime for us, for us all and really puts things uh, into perspective right there. Police uh, still have this whole block shut down right now and uh, really surrounding area as well as they try to get a grip of what happened as well. All right, everybody, while we do wait for this news update to happen, we're going to take a quick two-minute break for some of you. Some of you may not hit that two-minute break. Just stay right here with us. We'll continue on right here on Live Now from Fox. And for those of you that did not hit that break, we are still here with you live, raw, and always a direct right here showcasing this breaking news story. That's what we do. We'll stay in a story long as we have the shot here available to us and long as not other breaking news is happening in the mix as well. And we'll just wait on this shot while we wait for uh, the police. It looked like just, you know, about 10 minutes ago, it looked like we could possibly have been getting a little bit closer to an update. We saw people on the authorities just right around the podium getting ready and then for some reason, they left, and uh, we are waiting for the very latest right here on Live Now from Fox, everyone. Thanks so much for everyone uh, continuing uh, to join us here on Live Now from Fox. We will wait for this, uh, but what we'll do is we'll go to some other news here of the day because it doesn't look like we're getting closer. We thought for a moment we we're maybe getting a little bit closer, but we'll wait on this for you right here on Live Now from Fox. And as soon as it happens, we'll bring it to you just as long as we're not in the shot there with President Biden that is expected. He's about a half an hour late right now. Hi, everyone. Mike Page here. Thanks so much for joining us here today as we continue to bring you the news, events, breaking feeds that have come uh, really right to us and we push it out to you in real time right here on live now from fox that's what we do here exactly for you live look at the white house while we do wait for president biden to talk about those job numbers let's talk a little bit about them right now as u.s economy added 194 
thousand jobs there in September, badly missing the estimates that were expected. Non-farm payroll increased by 194,000 workers in September as the unemployment rate fell to 4.8 percent. The Labor Department uh, said today, economists surveyed, we're expecting the addition of 500,000 new jobs in the employment rate to slip to 5.1 percent. The job gains in August were revised up to 366,000 from 235,000. The labor market recovery continues to hit the brakes this month, but is far from completely stopping, said a senior economist at Glassdoor. Despite the soft September report, there's still a case for optimism in the coming months as we are beginning to look in the rearview mirror and the peak of the Delta wave's re repercussions is behind us. The September report was the first since the 300 Dollars per week in supplemental unemployment benefits expired on September 5th. Economists are still assessing the impact of the child tax credit, which pays families up to $3,600 per child per year. Also having an impact going forward will be the mandatory vaccine requirements being enforced by a growing number of companies. Companies. The notable job gains, though, occurred in leisure and hospitality. 74,000 jobs up there were led by the Arts and Entertainment and Recreation Center. 43,000 uh, jump right there. Hiring in food service and drinking places was little changed for a second straight month after averaging a monthly gain of 197,000 from January through July. Professional and business sectors up 60,000, retail trade up 56,000, and transportation and warehousing up 47,000 jobs also saw sizable gains. But both local government education and state government education jobs were down last month. Local government education was down 144,000. The number of workers re-entering the labor force decreased by 198,000 last month at 2.3 million. The labor force participation rate was little changed at 61.6 percent and was 1.7 percentage points below its February 2020 level right there. The Fed will hold a two-day meeting that concludes on November 3rd, and that is what a lot of people are looking forward to next. The central bank could, at that point, announce plans to taper its $120 billion per month of asset purchases. A rate hike is not expected until late next year. We'll continue to follow that. Where is President Biden? We will wait on that, and as soon as it happens, we'll bring it to you right here on Live Now from Fox, and we'll see uh, how President Biden responds to these job numbers that did, did not hit the mark quite at all. We'll take another quick two-minute break for some of you. Stay right here with us on Live Now from Fox as we continue to wait for more breaking news elements and live feeds from across the country and, of course, around the world.
Welcome back, everyone, here to Live Now from Fox. I'm your host, Mike Pace. We are still waiting for a news update from police on the tragic shooting that left two people dead, one person in custody in Prince George's County at a senior living facility. We'll get you the very latest as it happens. We got that shot back up for you from Sky Fox, showing you uh, the images from high up above. We'll keep an eye on that for you right here as well. Always in a double box for you right here on Live Now from Fox. Still waiting for President Biden to talk about the latest job numbers that did not quite hit the mark there. What economists were thinking, we were thinking we were going to hit 500,000 new jobs. Not the case there, only 196,000 jobs added. So we'll see what the president has to say about that. The market right now, it's flat. It's only down a uh, percentage of... Uh, just a, not even a, just a point. So uh, we'll wait on that for you right here on Live Now from Fox as well. I do want to go out to some other news here of the day while we wait for that update for you out of Prince George's County right now. But let's give you another just unfortunate, sad story revolving around a suspect in the murder of a woman and her unborn child has been arrested and taken into custody in North Carolina news conference happened just a little bit ago to discuss the arrest and further information on the case. You're watching live now in Fox, always live, always raw, always unfiltered here for you. I can't discuss that at this time. Can you say? Um, you know what type of evidence it was that the name addressed that? Uh, car parts. Car parts, tag, tag. No. Okay. Do you know how many shots were fired? Uh, I can't give that out. Do you know if this was premeditated? I can't give that out right now. What's his age? I want to say he's 35. Around 35. Can you tell us where the incident happened specifically and kind of how far it took for the end? Um, do you know the area of Highway 18? Okay. Um, we believe it's, well, the... Where Highway 219 and the Highway 18 meet, that area is called Jones Crossroad. And we believe it started in that area. And she ended up wrecking just south of where East Drummond Road comes into Highway 18. About, about, three, miles. about three miles. One to three miles. Were any other cars involved? Just those two. So just to be clear, was while she was driving or was her car and body dumped? Oh, no, it was not. No, she wrecked. Oh, okay. Yes, and she was shot while she was, the car was moving. Do you have any, you have any phone records of contacting texting or phone records? I can't discuss that right now. Do you believe that he shot from his vehicle, like he pulled up beside her and started shooting, or was he out of the car somewhere? No, they were, they were both driving. Do you believe he followed her for some period of time? Can you elaborate on that at all? I could just say that they were together. He was following her from Jones Crossroads. We know that for a fact. And then where the incident ended. And was he stationed in North Carolina at Fort Bragg? Yes, ma'am. So this was a long distance relationship? Yes. Okay. So she did live, live here? She lived around right here? Right? Yes. Okay. Is he married or unmarried? He's married. Children? I believe so. Do you know how many? I don't. But he is an active duty soldier. Yes. And that was where you guys arrested Yes. Has, has he had any criminal history or any, um, or has, has there been any domestic issues between them that you guys are aware of? Not that we're aware of. Okay. Will he be prosecuted here in your case? Yes, sir. We have, um, the extra, they will do the extradition process and then he will be brought back to Troop County. Is he currently in military custody? No, he, the military took him in custody for us and then turned him over to the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office. For He will be held there until um, extradition is, process is complete and can be transferred back down here. Can you please repeat the charges? Murder, feticide, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime. Possession of? A firearm during the commission of a crime. Do you know what kind of weapon he used? A handgun. We're, we're not... I'm not going to release caliber. How, how, he's from there, and she's from here. What was the name? He grew up in um, Troop County, and they went to school together. Was his wife aware of this relationship? I can't release that at this time. Was there military issues with him? We don't know. 
Yeah. Yep. Are you guys looking at anybody else as a um, potential suspect? No. Just for everybody watching, uh, Venusine. I can't understand you. What? For the uh, record, Venusine is uh, that the definition of Venusine. It's the the death of the unborn child. Just for everybody watching. Thank you. And do you know if the unborn child was a boy or a girl? I believe it was a boy. Yes. Okay. So nothing that you can speak to as far as motive goes at this time? No. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, if you guys got any questions, I heard some uh, related directly to his military status, please refer those to the United States Army Public Affairs Office. We don't have any information on that, so just refer those to them. Can you, can you spell his name one more time, please? Yeah, uh, one second. Alonzo. Oh, gotcha. Uh, Alonzo, A L O N Z O, Dargan, D A R G A N, Jr. I do, right here. And this is um, available through the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office, North Carolina website. That's quick service. All right, are there any further questions? And when we're done here, I will send out what information we provided today through a printed press release. And you can follow with me if you've got any further questions. I do have one more question. All right. um, you said they were following each other while they were driving. Did he run her off the road? Yes. Okay. And then when was he taken into custody again? Uh, yesterday afternoon, 3 30. It was around 3 30. Yeah, around 3 30 in North Carolina. Wait, so he ran her off the road, then shot her? No. Mm. He shot her first and then ran her off the road. Oh. And how many shots, how many times was she shot, or how many shots did he fire? Before? We're still determining that, right? I mean, we don't know how many. I mean, we don't know. Multiple. Several. Yeah. Multiple gunshot wounds. And were any of those gunshot wounds in her uh, stomach area? I can't really say that happened. When authorities found him, was he cooperative? Um, we didn't have any issues with him. Um, we didn't have any issues of taking him into custody, um, but no statements were made in regards to the incident or his charges. And how did y'all find his whereabouts? Uh, with the help of uh, the CID division at Fort Bragg. Uh, no, no, he didn't. Was he living there on the post? No, he lived off post. So, so you know so the small, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the county in North Carolina take him into custody, or was this? MP? No, the, th the the Fort Bragg has their own criminal investigation division. They actually took him into custody and then released him to the, the local county. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Gunshot killed or I, I can't. Yeah, we can't. Do you know his rank? I don't. Again, reach out to Public Affairs, U.S. Army. Is there any kind of a timeline on the expedition process? Just, I mean, I don't really know what timeline. No, yeah, that. yes, sir. Of course, if he agrees to be extradited back to Troop County, it'll be very fast. If he fights it, we would then have to get a governor's warrant, and we would have to bring him back against his will. But either way, he's coming back to Troop County. Face these charges. Sheriff, could you just put into perspective the, just the horrific nature of this case? You've got a young woman pregnant. Sure. Absolutely. You know, I went to the scene and could not believe that somebody had shot and killed a young mother of five children, and on top of that, killed her and she had a baby inside of her that resulted in the death of that baby. I personally, along with my chief deputy and one of my chaplains, went to the home of her father and had to deliver this news that your daughter is dead. That's very terrible news to have to hear from anybody, especially when it's one of your children and a grandchild, even if it's unborn. And then for my team to step up the way they did and work tirelessly to bring this man to justice speaks volumes for them. And I appreciate them and I know the family does as well.
Wow, just a terrible, terrible story there. Just to regroup here, everyone, before we go to a break. A Fort Bragg soldier was arrested in connection to the murder of a pregnant woman in Georgia, according to officials with the Troop County Sheriff's Office. That man has been arrested in North Carolina in connection to the murder of the woman. Police said that the suspect was the father of the woman's unborn child and that they were in a relationship at the time of the shooting. The woman was just 33 weeks pregnant when she was killed, according to the sheriff's office. Terrible, terrible tragedy there. A suspect now waiting to come back to Georgia. You're watching live now from Fox. As you can see, we are still waiting for that update coming out of Maryland uh, associated with the shooting at a senior care facility. We'll be bringing you the very latest as it's happening. Let's go to a two minute break right here on Live Now from Fox. We are also awaiting President Biden to talk about the job numbers. He is about an hour late right now. We will continue to wait and see what he has to say about the job numbers that did not hit the mark right now. We leave it with a shop. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. New York City here on this Friday as we go to a break. Stay right here with us. More new live now from Fox coming up in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, here to Live Now from Fox host Mike Page as we continue to bring you the top stories and headlines from across the country. Right now, we continue to wait for the latest update regarding uh, this breaking news story that we had for you all morning and afternoon long regarding out of uh, Maryland of a shooting that leaves two people dead. The person is in custody at a senior fa uh, care facility. We'll be bringing you the very latest as we get that update in real time right here on Live Now from Fox. We also wait for President Biden on the latest job numbers and economy remarks. We'll have that for you as soon as it happens. He's about an hour late. No guidance right now on when uh, we will be seeing him, but uh, we'll keep an eye on that shot as well. Here's a look at how the Dow is performing right now. Just down about 25 points there in the red and nothing major. We'll continue to follow that for you right here on Live Now from Fox. But let's continue on. Got some other news here of the day. Let's go out to Florida right now. Governor Ron DeSantis was making some remarks. Let's listen in what he had to say. In, in Bay County, I want to recognize all the dignitaries we have. I brought Dane Eagle from the Department of Economic as well as Kevin Guthrie from the Florida Division of Emergency Management. And of course, we have our uh, Chief Financial Officer, uh, Jimmy Petronas and Jay Trumbull, um, our uh, Appropriations Chair. I think Senator Gaynor's here. Senator, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, we also have, I think, a Sheriff. Is Tommy here? 
All right, the sheriff. We got folks from the Bay County Commission. Uh, we've got folks from Panama City Beach. Uh, we have folks, I think, from uh, from the city here as well, mayors, and, and a lot of good folks uh, who've really been working hard um, over the last three years. And we're here today to commemorate uh, three years, almost three years, uh, for the anniversary of Hurricane Michael. And, uh, you know, I remember leading up to Michael, uh, there wasn't a week out from Michael. No one was even talking about talking about a hurricane. Uh, and then you started to see the storm in the Gulf, and it was an event. But even 72 hours before, people were not predicting it to be uh, the type of event that it became. And of course, once it hit landfall, it was the first Category 5 storm to hit hit the state of Florida since Hurricane Andrew in 1992. And for those of you who've ever been down in that homestead area down in South Florida, uh, Hurricane Andrew absolutely kneecapped uh, that part of the state uh, and it still hasn't hasn't fully recovered and so when you have a storm of that magnitude uh, this is not something that can be dealt with in days weeks or months I mean this is a, a long-term project when you would drive in I mean if you came in from the west there were things that look fine all of a sudden you would go and it was like catastrophe and it really, I mean, to me, it didn't even look like a hurry. It looked like a tornado that went through and would just absolutely devastate uh, buildings. Of course, the trees, I mean, we drive in, I still see a lot of the trees knocked over from that. And so this was a really, really serious punch. It dislocated people forever, uh, changed uh, uh, lives, and, and, and obviously uh, changed this community. And so, you know, the question is, when you, when you face that, uh, you know, how do you respond? And that was uh, May of 2018. I was not governor yet. I got elected shortly thereafter. And when I got sworn in, we came here. And outside of this community, most people kind of moved on from Michael. You know, it just wasn't on the front pages. It wasn't something that people were talking about. And um, you know, we made it clear that, that we understand that um, you know, it was not over and really was just beginning the, the recovery process. And so we made uh, our commitment to, to this community and, um, and, and we've been able to accomplish an awful lot. Uh, if uh, When I first got into office, one of the first things I did was fly up to Washington, meet with President Trump, and ask him to uh, authorize additional assistance for things like debris removal and, and individual assistance because people needed it, the communities needed it, and to his credit, he supported us at really significant levels uh, and because he had the discretion to increase the reimbursements you know that ended up being hundreds of millions of dollars extra for both uh, the local communities as well as the state for doing things like cleaning up all the debris in Mexico Beach and doing all the stuff around uh, around Panama City and everything else that was affected uh, and so through those efforts in terms of the public assistance uh, portion uh, we in the state of Florida uh, have been able to to, to help with about 1.3 billion in things like debris removal and processing individual assistance and obviously with with federal reimbursements you know that's been very very significant uh, we've also done a lot with the Department of Economic Opportunity and today one of the reasons we're here is obviously uh, commemorate uh, three years uh, ago uh, but also to just remind people we're still in the fight we're still going to do more so today we're actually proud to be able to announce an additional 3.1 million in hazard mitigation uh, matching awards from the Department of Economic Opportunity. So as counties, as the counties and cities continue to rebuild, this money will provide 2.7 uh, million to Bay County for generators, emergency services improvements and water lines. Also money for the city of Chattahoochee for critical facilities and infrastructure generators. Uh, money for uh, Talquin Electric Cooperative for generations and for generators in Gadsden and Leon. And Wakala money for generators to operate shelters and maintain operations and so you know these FEMA hazard mitigation uh, uh, program funds are important funding the issue is is that when you get the funds the community has to pay a 25 percent match for receiving the funding 
And as many of you know, I mean, some of the cities uh, in, in really all of Florida, but in Northwest Florida, I mean, some of the cities are not going to be able to produce uh, that type of money. And so we're happy that what we're doing today is basically we're covering, uh, you know, that match uh, for, for these communities. And so that will now mark uh, more than $228 million in total funding to date from DEO to Hurricane Michael impacted communities in long-term disaster recovery. Uh, we have 160 million more in this funding that we will continue to provide communities that are still rebuilding uh, and we're looking um, uh, to secure additional mitigation money as well. Recently, the Division of Emergency Management requested the federal government to review the state's mitigation allocation for Hurricane Michael. We were able to secure an additional $43 million to be used for existing projects, bringing the total allocation from three seventy four to $417 million. Of course, as many of you know, I mean, we have some significant inflation, so a lot of this yes. stuff is just more, more expensive, and we've had to move stuff around with our uh, long-term uh, rebuilding across the state, not just for Michael, but for that. So, so that's going to be very helpful to at least keep things on schedule. Um, and so we are, um, uh, we think that you can uh, do what needs to be done um, and also in the process potentially uh, do things that, that, that maybe we would have liked to have done anyways. And so you can have even stronger infrastructure here. Um, you know, we've uh, worked with, of course, the legislature on the Hurricane uh, Michael State Recovery Grant Program, and that's $20 million to the affected county. So we were proud of doing that. We're also proud of securing funding for the Florida Timber Recovery Block Grant Program, which directly supported timber producers who suffered losses as a result of Hurricane Michael. And so uh, we are um, uh, going to continue in the fight. And while Michael eroded beaches, downed trees, which littered forest floors and clogged waterways and caused major damage at our award-winning state parks, we've been hard at work at restoring those natural resources. And thus far, we've invested more than $120 million to renourish beaches, remove debris from our land and waterways, and rebuild a state park. And obviously, we've also had recovery funding dispersed to agriculture producers, schools, places of worship, as well as to municipalities. We'll continue to make strides in this recovery. We continue to recognize the importance of disaster mitigation and how it can help prevent, uh, protect Floridians. And so I think um, uh, we're very, of course, mindful of, of the long haul. But I'll tell you, uh, this community has bounced back uh, very resolutely. And this is not an easy thing to go through. And I can tell you when, when we've worked with everybody you know, on the ground, uh, people do work together. Uh, people are very appreciative uh, anytime we're able uh, to, to be helpful. And, um, and I think you know, the process obviously isn't over, uh, but I think you've done better uh, than many other communities would have done uh, given, the, given the cards that you were dealt. And so uh, it's really been an honor for me to be able to come and, and work with a lot of great people. And uh, of course, we've got uh, a lot of folks uh, that, that wield some, some significant power uh, in Tallahassee that are from this area that, that are always uh, looking out for, for everybody's best interest here. So I'm going to let some of them come up and, and say a few things. And so we'll have uh, our chief financial officer, Jimmy Petronas. Good morning. Thank you, Governor. Um, you know, you're the, you're the third governor that I've had the honor to work with. And so you get a lot of anticipation, excitement, what, what's in store. And uh, I, I love to remind people, especially the people here in this community that I love so much, his very first most significant speech he's given since he's been in public office is inaugural address. And one thing he outlines is the recovery of Northwest Florida. And his very first day in office, very first day, we climbed in Tommy Ford's Tahoe and you flew in town with Casey and we drove down to Mexico Beach and you were boots on the ground not just that first day but I think three more times on the next next week as you never let any daylight get between you and the recovery of this part of the state and your um, your commitment is has been steadfast it has been you know ever supportive and uh, the men and women here went through the storm they dealt with uh, incredible tragedy. It's hard to believe it's three years and we still drive around town and we still see the elements of what happened here three years ago. But you haven't forgot about us. You uh, you continue to remind people like Kevin Guthrie and Dane Eagle that Northwest Florida needs help. And uh, the men and women of this part of the state are forever in your debt. Um, 
I had some prepared notes, but I think it's more important just to uh, just to make sure you knew how much these people here in this room um, get to look forward to raising their kids and staying in this community. But if it's not for your leadership, you leverage in the White House, you're making such a difference in the lives of our first responders who have been through so much over the last two years. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you for what you've done and helped us navigate COVID. Um, it has been, uh, yeah. Hey, you didn't have a playbook to work from. You 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 studied the math, you studied the science, you made decisions, but you kept people safe and you kept the economy open. And uh, you know, and and I know you're already pre-spending some of Jay Trumbull's money with uh, with what you're doing next year, but that's okay because because I know Jay Trumbull and George are going to be looking out for the people in Northwest Florida. So um, anyway, uh, staff, sorry I didn't read a damn thing there, but uh, but uh, but I just want to. Let you know from the bottom of my heart in Northwest Florida, we love you. Thank you. Um, first, thank you, Governor, for being here. Uh, you know, you like Jimmy said, you made a promise before you got elected when you came to to, to our communities, and you said we, we're not going to let we're not going to forget about you. Um, and boy, you have shown us uh, that you have not forgotten, and and that means uh, so very much. Um, you know, you have stood uh, time and time again, shoulder to shoulder, with myself and Senator Gaynor when we're fighting for uh, much-needed resources of our ravaged community uh, in Tallahassee, um, and and you've been there. And thank you so much for that. You know, shortly after the storm, we were looking for resources to be able to start the rebuild process. Um, we looked locally and realized that all of those dollars had already been depleted. Um, you know, we called up to FEMA and no one seemed to answer the phone. But we short, you know, quickly started looking at Tallahassee uh, and you reminded us that you would be there with us. And, you know, today marks a, an incredible uh, point in, in our journey of rebuilding of over a billion dollars just from the state of Florida uh, to, these, to these, uh, these communities that need it absolutely the most. You know, Jimmy talked about it, you talked about it, um, I like to talk about it a lot. There is no stronger group of people than Northwest Floridians. To have gone through this unprecedented past three years of a hurricane and a global pandemic, uh, to be able to see that, that prosperity is continuing to happen in our community is, is really uh, something to behold. And, you know, I, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, we all live here and that we all can you know, pick ourselves up by our bootstraps the day after Hurricane Michael and, you know, even and face adversity as it relates to, to the pandemic, but due to your policies and, and due to the resources you've been able to, uh, to help provide to us, you know, this place is growing and it's coming back. We've got an Air Force base that is going to be uh, the greatest in the world. Um, we've got, um, uh, you know, a place that people want to grow a family uh, in and, and, and start a business in. And, and we could not do that without uh, without the support of, of folks like you in Tallahassee. Um, we could not do that without you going to D.C. and convincing uh, the president to, um, uh, to help us out in a significant way. So, you know, thank you very much uh, for what you've done. And, you know, I look forward to, uh, to what, what the next year looks like, the next uh, budget looks like, and, um, you know, hopefully continuing to, to be able to bring, you know, much-needed resources to, to these areas. So thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. I want to thank uh, you know, Jay for, for helping out with things really across Florida. You know, they were, uh, uh, Jay really helped us get through our law enforcement and first responder bonuses, which we were very proud of being able to do. Told them, I was like, I may want to do it again, so be prepared. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, and, uh, and and really just did, delivered on a lot, of, a lot of good stuff for the state of Florida and did it in a way that is really preserving our long-term solve it. We have bigger, more budget reserves than we probably have ever had. Uh, a lot of people weren't predicting that. You look at the amount of revenue that's coming in just because of the underlying strength of our economy. You know, we're getting three, four, five hundred million dollars over the estimate almost every month now. You know, that'll be billions more dollars. And so you, know, you go through a difficult period and to be able to come out, you know, really strong. And that doesn't even count this federal money. Uh, 
you know, that's really, I think, I think good for Florida over the long term. And hopefully we are able to navigate whatever comes down the pike. I am concerned about the inflation um, that's being driven by, I think, a lot of bad policies in Washington. And um, that eats away families' budgets. The gas is going through the roof. I mean, it's incredible how much gas has gone up. Uh, and then just building things, everything's more expensive. So it's like, yeah, there's people want to come and build homes here. It's harder to build them because it's harder to get the materials and it's more expensive and everything. So, so this is going to have a huge effect. They said that this was not going to be something that was sustained, and yet we see it. It is sustained. It's real. The energy. Why are we not doing energy resources that we have? We should be doing the pipelines. We should be doing the stuff. In and Anwar and other things so that we're energy independent. Instead, we're now begging OPEC to, to lower prices. That's not where you want to be. So, so those, I think, are um, you know, beyond our control at the state level, uh, but those could be you know, some significant headwinds. And I think it's just unfortunate if that were to happen because you know, we've got a lot of great momentum going and we've really done our job well here in Florida to make sure people have opportunity. And you know, we've, I mean, how many hundreds of thousands of jobs were saved and how many businesses were saved and, and, and we're proud of that. Um, we want to make sure we can keep going. So the inflation needs to be dealt with. The gas prices need to be dealt with. And, and th these, are, these are really legitimate problems. All right, uh, Kevin Guthrie. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I, I just, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and pull a uh, CFO maneuver here. I'm probably going to go off script. Sorry, Sam. But um, I do want to just start with saying, uh, again, Governor, thank you for your leadership. CFO, Secretary Eagle, Chairman Gaynor, Chairman Trumbull, thank you for your leadership as well. You know, as I look around this room, I, I don't see, you know, uh, three years ago today, I was sitting in an EOC in Tallahassee monitoring a tropical depression that 72 hours later became a Cat 5 landfalling hurricane up here. But what I see now, instead of uh, individuals that were just in their first couple of days of being a city manager or experienced emergency managers now become county administrators, Bob, Sheriff Ford, I see friendships, right? And I think that's very, very important as we move forward that we continue to develop and foster our relationship, relationships. I know that all of you know and have my phone number, and you know, as, as well as the governor, I will, we're, we're here to support you. So I just, you know, just a little off script there. You know, this mitigation money, again, as the governor mentioned, we went back to the federal government and said, look, we want you to, you know, get that pencil out and start looking again because we think we got more money out there. And we were able to get 43 more million dollars for uh, the 13 counties that were impacted by uh, Hurricane uh, Michael, working with Secretary Eagle, you know, looking for innovative ways that we could do that match program. We uh, have been able to get this money out to you today, and we're going to be looking for more opportunities as we continue to move forward on how we can do more match programs in Despite the panhandle Despite with this money. One, so again, you know, uh, it's with the governor's leadership, this is what we've been able to do. And again, you know, I apologize to my staff for going way off script there, but um, it is our staff in Tallahassee that's that recovery staff, it's that mitigation staff that have been uh, working so diligently over the last three years to help the, the panhandle out. And we're going to still be here. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. So uh, I'll be here with you through long haul. All right. Thank you. And thank, I want to thank Kevin for all his hard work. Also, his predecessor, Jared Moskowitz, worked really hard. And uh, the uh, our emergency uh, management folks uh, are, are really great. I mean, they you got to be in Florida. And I know at the local level, we've got a lot of great people, too. So it's just, you know, we're proud of, of, of having the type of folks that we have that, that have helped. So I want to thank uh, Kevin uh, for, 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 for leading a great team. And then now we have a Dane Eagle Department of Economic Opportunity. Well, I want to thank the governor for the opportunity and, and his leadership all along the way. We're here at the three-year anniversary of Hurricane Michael, and hurricanes are nothing to be celebrated, but what we can celebrate today is the collaborative efforts of everybody towards recovery uh, through the local community who has suffered through the storm, but then were boots on the ground the next day helping their neighbors, uh, their family, of course, as well, uh, to the state leadership under Governor DeSantis and, and the FETs. Uh, this has been remarkable. I know a lot of numbers were thrown around today, uh, but if you add it all up, under the governor's leadership, leadership, the state has been able to award the Panhandle community in Northwest Florida for the Hurricane Michael $1.5 billion. That's a significant amount of money. And 
any governor could come in and make promises and deliver and say it's been three years and a billion dollars, let's move on. This governor has not. We've come back again, again, and again to make sure that we are holding up the promise he made on day one of his, his administration. I was in the legislature serving with Jay, Representative Trumbull at the time, and it was so refreshing to see this governor come in and, and really focus on uh, the need. And here we are three years later, and in this role, I'm so thankful to be able to help deliver on that. Uh, the governor told me on day one, we've got this money coming down from the feds. Don't sit on it. Get it out. A month later, I was able to sign a, a grant agreement with Secretary Carson with HUD. And uh, through the collaborative efforts of um, Director Guthrie and FEMA, we've been able to do $1.5 billion. And there's still so much more to come. So $3.1 million today, that's remarkable. It's a drop in the bucket compared to the bigger number. And there's still more to do. So we'll be back again and again. It's because of the governor's leadership. So thank you all very much. And we, we've been fortunate from the time I came into office in 2019 to have two years of, of really great support uh, from the federal government. I mean, obviously, the president, Secretary Carson, uh, that storm happened today. I can't guarantee you we get quite the same amount of support, but, you know, who knows? Um, uh, and it's interesting. Where did we, when, when we announced the... Uh, 100% reimbursement in the in the 9010. Do you remember where we did that announcement yeah, at? Yeah, so it was at a pier park. So yeah, okay. The president came in and, and he worked him over. <laughs> <laughs> well, because uh, what happened was, it's an interesting story. You know, I came here and said, we're with you. I'm going to do what I can. And so we were looking at, you know, like Mexico Beach. I mean, they have like a, what, a $3 million annual budget and their debris costs were like tens of millions of dollars. So it's like, how are you going to be able to do that even at a 75% match? And so we wanted to get 45 days of 100% reimbursement, particularly for the debris removal, and then 90% for every day after that. And so that was basically a, a lot of money. I mean, it probably ended up being a quarter of a million dollars in additional than what we would have had if we didn't do it. But so we came, we saw that that was a clear need. Need. So I flew up to, to Washington either very soon after that, a day or two after that, and uh, I met with the pr President Trump. So I'm in the Oval Office, and you know, just me sitting like across from him at, at, at the desk. Um, Mick Mulvaney was the acting chief of staff. I served in Congress with Mick. He's a good friend of mine. He does not like spending money on anything, so he was not going to necessarily be my friend on this. And so Mick's kind of pacing in the back background. And then the president put the FEMA director on, Brock Long, who's right. another good guy. And, you know, he's reading, President Trump's reading my letter, my request, and uh, to Brock, he's like, what do you think, Brock? And you could tell, you know, look, Brock was respectful of me, and, and but you know it was a big ask, and so he just kind of was like, well, you know, there's a lot of other things. So he didn't he didn't say no, but he didn't say yes. But it was kind of like, uh, and so and I was just like, look, Mr. President, this and, and it, and it kind of was underrated as a storm because from what Kevin said, 72 hours before this was not like Dorian where it was f category five for like a week, and we're just waiting to get hit. And fortunately, we didn't. This thing happened very quickly, and even probably. 24 hours it was probably what a category yeah, yeah it was, it was cat really yeah so so this thing and then it just it was like a bull so and I told them I said you know you go and look and I mean there are things that are just totally obliterated um, the the costs are going to be enormous and, and and I was like you know what these folks are working hard they're resilient but we need help and so the president's like you know he's like he's like he's like yeah he's like we'll do it and um, he's like you know you go down and tell those folks that that we're doing it that that, that we're here for you we're here for for, for you governor we're here for people to panhandle and I'm like I'm like good so I'm walking out and Mick grabs me when we leave the Oval Office and he's like do not announce that and I was like why he said <laughs> and, 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 and in Mick's defense he made a good point he's like you know you didn't put the dollar amounts on your sheet I mean we, we got to figure out how much this is going to be that's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars and he may and he may want to do it I was like well but I mean he said he wanted to do it I was like listen and he's like just give me 24 hours okay and um, whatever and so you know I'm thinking look they're going to present him with numbers that say you're just authorizing two three hundred million dollars uh, additional do you really want to want to do that um, especially given all the different budget constraints that we're constantly under up in Washington so I'm like fine so we waited uh, and I told these guys I'm like I'm gonna come announce this and so it hit 24 hours we had not heard from Mick 
So I got on the plane, we went, and we announced it. And uh, and I had almost everybody, every uh, leader in Bay County up. Everyone was excited. Everyone knew it was a big deal. Uh, President, incidentally, was very happy. Um, Mick was not as happy because he's like, but you know, I gave you the 24. I mean, what am I supposed to do? So we did it, announced it, and then obviously uh, at that point, we uh, we just got the ball rolling, and so it was good. But you know, I appreciated the, the president because most of the staff, because you know, look, it's not that they had anything against here, but a staffer is going to look at it and say, well, if you do it for them, you got to do it for California wildfire. You got to do it for this. You got to do it for that. So that's what they were doing, and I understand that. But I think you know the thing the president understood. Uh, he understood the area. He he understood. He loved the people here, and uh, you know, I like to think that I was persuasive, and so 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 he did it, and he didn't need to necessarily have uh, you know six meetings with different staffers you know it was the right thing to do and so he did it and so we were happy uh, to do that and um, and I think that that's really uh, made a difference as well as all the other things that, that Kevin and 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 Dane have been working on and we're gonna do more we've got more money to, to be able to do uh, and there's a lot more work to be done but I think you know it's like as like Jay mentioned man I mean there's there's a lot of life there's a I mean I think this the the, the best days of this community are still in front of us I mean I flew in the airports busy I mean people realize, uh, you know, as sad as it was to see the Mexico Beach, a lot of people never even heard of Mexico Beach. And so they're looking at this like, oh my gosh, that's a, that's a beautiful beaches and all this other stuff. And so I think especially as, um, you know, you've had COVID lockdowns drive people to Florida, uh, this was a place not just to, to move, but to vacation. Because if people are going to vacation, I think one of the reasons we've done so well in tourism, particularly in this part of the state, is because if people go on vacation, they want to be able to be on vacation. They don't want to be hectored about wearing a mask or all this other stuff. They just want to be able to make the choices that they want to make. And so I think they knew that coming to a place like uh, Bay County and other parts of Northwest Florida, they were going to be able to have a normal vacation. And I tell you, I get correspondence from people that write into my office that talk about uh, how important it was for them to come to Florida for two weeks when they escaped a, a, a lockdown last winter, let's say, in some of these other states, just for their physical and their mental uh, well-being. And I get thanks on that all the time. And really, it's thanks to, to people uh, who, who, are, who are in those industries and in those communities. And so, yes, it's, we look at it and we see, oh, man, tax revenue, people are paying you know, the hotel taxes, all that. People are coming down. The restaurants are doing good, all this stuff. And that's great. And that's important. President Biden right now speaking on the latest job numbers. Let's listen. The American unemployment rate is below 5%. In just eight months since I became president in the midst of a grave public health and economic crisis, unemployment rate is now down below 5% at 4.8%. Let me just repeat that. Today's report has the unemployment rate down to 4.8%, a significant improvement from when I took office and a sign that our recovery is moving forward, even in the face of a COVID pandemic. That improvement was widespread. Unemployment for Hispanic workers was down, and the unemployment rate for African Americans fell almost a full percent. And it's now below 8% for the first time in 17 months. A drop of 496,000 in long-term unemployment is the second largest single month drop since we started keeping records. The largest was in July. So in the past three months, we've seen a drop of 1.3 million long-term unemployed. That's the largest three months fall in long-term unemployment since we started keeping records in 1948. More to do, but great progress. And working Americans are seeing their paychecks go up as well. In September, we saw one of the largest increases in average wages paid to workers, on, uh, uh, working Americans on record. Today's report comes one day after the Labor Department found in the third quarter of this year, the number of layoffs and job reductions was the lowest in this country since 1997. Overall, the unemployment report shows almost 200,000 jobs were created last month, over 300,000 in the private sector and 26,000 in manufacturing, offset by some seasonal adjustments in education hiring. The monthly totals bounce around, but if you take a look at the trend, it's solid. On average, 600,000 new jobs created every month since I took office. And in three months before I got there, that was one-tenth what was being created. 
is 60 to 60,000 as opposed to 600,000 jobs a month. <clears throat> in total, the job creation in the first eight months of my administration is nearly 5 million jobs. Jobs up, wages up, unemployment down. That's progress. And it's a tribute to the hard work and resilience of the American people who are battling through this pandemic, working to keep their businesses afloat. Remember, today's report is based on a survey that was taken during the week of September the 13th. Not, not, not today, September the 13th, when COVID cases were averaging more than 150,000 per day. Since then, we've seen the daily cases fall <clears throat> by more than one third and they're continuing to trend down. We're continuing to make progress. Right now, things in Washington, as you all know, are awfully noisy. Turn on the news and every conversation is a confrontation. Every disagreement is a crisis. But when you take a step back and look at what's happening, we're actually making real progress. Maybe it doesn't seem fast enough. I'd like to see it faster and we're going to make it faster. But maybe it doesn't appear dramatic enough. But I too would like to, as I said, move it faster. We're making consistent, steady progress, though. And thanks to bipartisan agreements, we're making progress on funding the government and raising the debt limit. So people continue to get their Social Security checks, the military continues to get paid, and so much more. We're making real progress on COVID-19 as well. More than 186 million Americans are now fully vaccinated. More than 75 percent of eligible Americans have gotten at least one shot. And COVID cases are down 40 percent in the past month. Hospitalizations are down over 25 percent. In July, when I announced the first vaccination requirement, about 95 million eligible Americans still had not been vaccinated. Today, we reduced that from 95 to 67 million eligible Americans that haven't been vaccinated. That's still much too much. There's more work to do, including getting more people vaccinated. But we continue to make progress, progress. And the American Rescue Plan, which we passed <clears throat> shortly after I was elected, we made progress providing rent and mortgage relief to help keep roofs over people's heads. We provided checks and pockets and other benefits so families can put food on the table for their families. Hundreds of thousands of loans to help small businesses stay open and keep employment, employees on the job getting paid. Today, towns and cities and states that were at risk of losing hundreds of thousands of jobs before because they didn't have the budget to pay, we helped make their payroll for them so they could keep teachers, police officers, firefighters, essential workers on the job helping schools stay open with the equipment and resources needed to keep students and educators safe. And we finally gave a tax break. I've been looking at this for a long time to families with children, which as I speak is providing monthly checks for more than more families with for 60 million children, $300 per month for every child under the age of seven, $250 per month for every child under the age of 17, keeping the tax cut, it's a tax cut for these people in cutting child poverty nearly in half, over 40 percent. We're making progress protecting our air and water as well and our natural lands. Much more to do. And I have more, have more to say about that later today. The jobs numbers also remind us that we have important work ahead of us and important investments we need to make. America is still the largest economy in the world. We still have the most productive workers and the most innovative minds in the world. But we risk losing our edge as a nation if we don't move. Our infrastructure used to be the best in the world. Today, according to the World Economic Forum, the United States of America ranks 13th in the world, 13th on infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports, etc. We're among the first in the world to guarantee access to universal education back at the turn of the 20th century. Now, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development Catch this, ranks America 35 out of 37 major economies when it comes to investing in early childhood education as a percent of GDP. 35 out of 37. On all these investments that fuel a strong economy, we've taken, we've taken our foot off the gas. And the world has taken notice, including our adversaries. And now they're closing the gap. Look, so it's essential 
that we have to regain the momentum we lost. As my wife says all the time, a professor, she says, any country that out-educates us is going to out-compete us. The work of our time is to prepare ourselves for it to be competitive to win the fast-changing 21st century global economy. That's why I propose two critical pieces of legislation being debated here in Washington right now. One focus on the investments we need to make in the physical infrastructure of America, roads, bridges, ports, etc. The second focus on the investments we need to make in the American people to make us more competitive. I know this is my legislation and I feel strongly about it, but the people who have the most at stake are the American people. So we need to stay focused on what these bills will mean to the people who are just looking for a little bit of breathing room, a fair chance to build a decent middle class life, to succeed and thrive instead of just hanging on by their fingernails. We need to keep an eye, an eye on what's fundamentally at stake for our country the ability to compete and win the race of the 21st century as we did the 20th century. A race that other countries are doing everything they can to win. In recent years, China has spent around three times as much on infrastructure, three times as much as a share of its economy than the United States has. Our infrastructure bill makes investments we need to rebuild the arteries of our economy, the roads, the highways, the bridges, the ports, the airports, the rails. And we're going to allow us to replace lead water pipes, which are poisoning our children and families. It's ridiculous. Build a modern energy grid that can withstand storms and carry renewable energy across America. Make high-speed internet affordable and available to everywhere in America. And create good union jobs in the process of putting that together. We're going to make the largest investment in public transit in American history. And we're going to make the most important investments on our rails since the creation of Amtrak 50 years ago. But is isn't enough just to invest in our physical infrastructure. We're going to lead the world like we used to. If we're going to do that, we also have to invest in our people. That's what my second bill does, the Build Back Better plan. That's what it does. Today, only about half of the three and four-year-olds in America are enrolled in early childhood education, early childhood education. In Germany, France, the UK, Latvia, that number is more than 90 percent. We're falling behind. It's not just early education. According to one study, America ranks, catch this, America ranks 33rd out of the 44 advanced economies when it comes to the percentage of our young people who have attained a post high school degree. The United States, 33rd out of 44. My Build Back, plan, Build Back Better plan gets us back on track to making four additional years of public education available for every person in America. Two years of high quality preschool in the front end, which indicates that over 56% of the children will be able to go through all 12 years and beyond without any, any interruption. And investments in community college so our students can gain the skills they need and carve out a, piece, a place for themselves in the 21st century economy. We're going to help build families. We're going to help them afford to care for their new baby, a child, an elderly relative. It's going to extend the tax credit for families with children. It's going to help us meet the moment on climate change and become a global leader in the fast-growing clean energy industries like solar and wind power. The whole world knows that the future of the auto industry is electric, electric and battery technology. We need to make sure America builds that future instead of falling behind. We should build those vehicles and the batteries that go into them and the charging stations they're going to need, the 500,000 we're going to build across America. Here in the United States, we should be doing this. And look, if we get this done, we're going to breathe new life into our economy and our workforce, and we're going to breathe cleaner air at the same time. These are the kinds of investments that will get America back in the game and give our workers a chance, a fighting chance. Economists left, right, and center agree. Earlier this year, Moody's on Wall Street projected that the investments in these bills will bring us a higher GDP and additional 2 million jobs per year and lower unemployment. These bills are not about left versus right 
or modern versus progressive or anything else that pits Americans against one another. These bills are about competitiveness versus complacency. Competitiveness versus complacency. Opportunity versus decay. They're about leading the world or whether we're going to let the world pass us by. The American people understand what's at stake here. They understand that when workers and families have a better shot, America has a better shot. Given half a chance, the American people have never, never, ever, ever let their country down. Today, we receive more evidence of the progress we're making. And I know we can make a lot more in the days ahead. I want to thank you, and God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you very much. So President Biden taking a no questions right there from the media after those dismal job numbers. You're watching here live on Live Now from Fox. We appreciate always everyone continuing to join us here. We were expecting, hopefully, hoping that the president uh, would make some remarks there to the media. He did not and uh, steps and walks away. You're watching live now from Fox, always in the mix here for you, bringing you the events, the live breaking news, all in the mix right here. We appreciate you always joining us here today on this Friday. We're just getting started here for you. If you've been with us in the mer early morning hours, we've been covering this breaking news out of uh, Maryland regarding a uh, horrific shooting that happened at a senior care facility. Two people died, one person in custody. You can see there in the distance, the police are congregating. We're waiting for this news conference. We are expecting it to happen at any moment. And, you know, I said that about an hour ago, so who knows what, but it, we're being told that it could happen at any moment. So we'll wait and see on that. Let's, while we have it, do we have it uh, pinned up here for us? We do. Let's take that two minute break right here on Live Now from Fox. Everybody, just stay right here with us. More news and updates from all over the country. Like we said, we're just getting started. Welcome back, everyone, here to Live Now from Fox. I'm your host, Mike Page. As we continue to navigate the world of news, we appreciate you joining us here. Top headlines, breaking news, 
all in the mix right here on Live Now from Fox. We continue to wait for that update out of Maryland. You can see it could be happening at any moment right now. Two dead, one in custody at a senior care facility, Prince George's County. We're waiting on that one. As soon as it happens, we'll bring it to you right here on Live Now from Fox. But for the latest here, I do want to go We've got to Texas right now, getting an update on the search for a missing three-year-old that does continue. Let's get the very latest right now southern border. We're checking everything. We've had offers from all of it to help us out. Uh, as I said, the biological dad lives in Mexico, so we're having, we're having people help on that. We're doing everything we can with all our partners to check out every remote lead we have, which is very few. The partners on the ground, the law enforcement and the searchers, are doing their part. So we're kind of combining those. So we connected the dots this morning, and we still have really nothing that of any substance to follow up on. So I'll be glad to cut my part off now, and if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them, but that's an overview, yes. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any plans to expand the search? We are uh, slightly expanding it now, slightly, just a little bit past the subdivision. Then we're going to slightly expand it some more with the grid and the search teams in their particular areas. We're going to pull them back after a while to let them rest up and get uh, maybe another team to go out and let them take a break. And we may expand it some more if we have reason to believe there's a, an area that needs to be checked out. So I'll keep you all informed on that as we have it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I know that yesterday you had mentioned that some neighbors had given over surveillance video footage of their home. Yes, ma'am. We, is it still connecting uh, directly with what the mother's story was? It's, it's corroborated the mother's story of the time frame. We've had to make sure all the timing on the film is coincided with not 20 minutes late or off sync. All that's been checked out by the professionals. Uh, it's, it's almost, a, unfortunately, I, I just have to say, it's at a standstill right now. No. Yeah. And again, to, to remind how, our, how we're working, to, we have a, a team of investigators from the Fed, state, local level, on the doing a criminal overview of any investigation. We have the officers, Fed, state, and local, with the volunteers doing a field. So, so there are two different missions where they're connecting each other with dialogue, and if anything from the ground can help them out, vice versa, but right now we're coming up with zero as we speak. And sir, no so, we're looking at uh, the family again to go over, we've already done that once, the family, extended family, but nobody is, uh, to use the term, throw up a red flag so far. However, uh, we're going to, we have a team right now revisiting the uh, family members, extended family, checking out their, where they were at the moment, et cetera, et cetera. We're pinpointing employment records, time, uh, clock out uh, time sheets at one place where the stepfather worked at. All these things are being checked. They're already been checked, but they're rechecking. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, ma'am. Just the just the elderly the elderly lady that lived across the street that saw him, but that's that's already been checked out from day one. And she's the one who said she saw the dog go or him follow the dog. Right. Go. Yeah, with the one we talked about the first day. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. We know that the authorities do some special research on the cellular phones of the family. Did they find any substance? Here? Did they find anything on that phones? We have the uh, federal agents and state agents with their expertise to scrutinize the phone records in ex extensive detail, all that's being checked out, to go along with the alibi time frames, et cetera, et cetera. So, so far, nothing. So, so when you speak that you are working 
together with our authorities. It means I'm working with Mexican authorities on this on this issue right now. The, the, the consulate and others have called me to offer their assistance if needed. In the event there might be a connection, and I say might be, they called us to offer, if need be, any assistance, and we've graciously taken them up on that and shared that information. In the event, and I, like I told them, like I told them, we have no, at this moment, reason to believe that that's the case, but we're expanding it to that uh, the source there, which is great to have their resources on that. We have seen this morning uh, almost 20 construction workers who are right to the scene just yes. for mm -hmm. So, do you need more support on this moment? I'm sorry. Do you need more people coming? No, at this time, we, as I said yesterday, uh, we heartfeltly tell everybody, y'all tell, we appreciate the, the civilians, citizens wanting to come out here, but we have a, a difficult area here. In, in, in uh, the woods, et cetera. We have to keep it in a, the grids. That's why everybody's got a grid area where they're assigned. There's a law enforcement personnel assigned to the, the organized search teams, that, like the ones that showed up a while ago, so they can co communicate if they find anything. We everybody got their area of expertise to on the ground to search, and then there's, it's all keeps coordinated. So we don't, if we had too many people out here, to be honest with you, the good good faith effort would clog it up. And I, I hope that people understand, I, I, we do appreciate the offer, but it, we have to keep it in a structured, organized environment where everybody knows where everybody's at. If we have too many people out here, we would, we would probably contaminate some areas. Everybody knows what to look for, and, and to document it so we get GPS, coordinates on that particular object should have something be located. And so if, if too many people that came out we we could have it we could have a mess. So that's why but thank them on your your news reports and at this time no we don't. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it is, and I remind you this morning what I said yesterday, we are not getting any tips like to a 911 call to our dispatch center. We're not getting any tips from, uh, say, to our Grimes County Crime Stoppers. We're not getting any tips on any Facebook or other related social media types of uh, uh, systems out there. And we're, monitor we're monitoring all this uh, Facebook that we can in case somebody says something there. Uh, I've had very few random calls from people that I know or just call my cell phone saying, hey, I heard this or I heard that. Uh, there's nothing of any substance. And that's what's so frustrating about the, the boots on the ground, the people who work in technology and telling you folks to tell the public uh, uh, that we're just running into a, uh, a, a, a stalemate right now. Yes, sir. Uh, Grimes County is about to embark on one of the busiest times of the year with the Texas Rangers. Yes, mm -hmm. I was fixing to bring that up. Uh, uh, do you anticipate any impact on the search? Well, uh, no, the search is going to be contained, but I was going to say to the media, and uh, we just talked about that a while ago in a recon meeting, the Texas Renaissance Festival starts this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, but it, it starts out tomorrow also, and the people re responding, the workers, so the, the traffic is going to be clogged up with people attending it from the north the Bryan College Station uh, resources of a uh, tourist Conroe coming from the north to the south the Houston Metroplex coming from the south to the north we're going to have a gridlock of uh, traffic here so you plan your trips up here accordingly uh, y'all or your colleagues that come up here you may be delayed if you've ever been up here during renaissance season. So <clears throat> it, it doesn't affect the areas we're covering, it's just gonna clog up the area. And again, if you know what the renaissance is like, it's a lot of people up here, but. Sure, but I, I probably didn't hear what you said, but are you still searching in the same grids you did yesterday? Uh, we've in the same grid, we've, we've, we've expanded a little bit, no, particular reason other than we 
we've, we've crossed this, we've crossed this, we've crossed over what we've done day one, yesterday, last night. We've crossed over everything over and over. So we're expanding it. We're still keeping the people here, but we're expanding it a little bit and with a little bit more and looking for anything of, uh, uh, anything that may be suspicious clothing or anything. Uh, we're we're, we're doc documenting on GPS coordinates so we know exactly where it is, analyzing it to see if it's related. Uh, is it uh, a rabbit trail? Yes, like I said, it could be a rabbit trail, but we're chasing all rabbit trails. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of disappointing that uh, we, we don't have anything yet to go on that's, that's got any substance, but we're hoping that we'll change in a little bit. Y'all's messages to the public, their eyes and ears. Y'all are the messengers. Tell them what we're asking for in and all. If you saw anything suspicious, like Mr. Miller said last night, if you saw anything suspicious that might be five miles away, he'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, let us know. We'll follow up on it. We haven't had that many leads, factual leads, to follow up on. Most time on things like this, you get deluged with them. We're hoping for the very best there for the family and friends there of uh, that poor three-year-old boy that is still missing right now. Search continues. We're hearing from the sheriff there, Grimes County, uh, Texas. We got some other breaking news to go to. Let's go out to the news alert here that we've been covering for you the last couple of hours here on Live Now from Fox. The shooting that happened in Maryland at a, a senior facility center. That news conference happening right now. We're bringing it to you live, raw, and direct right here on Live Now from Fox. At about uh, 9, 10 this morning, a.m., uh, Capitol Heights Police Department received uh, phone calls of a disturbance at Gateway Village. Uh, at that time, officers responded to the scene and found that a uh, young male was at the rear of the building uh, running out and said there was a shooter in the building. Uh, the officers made entry into the building, uh, at which time they found victim number one in the uh, corridor. Uh, they continued their advance and found a second vi victim. Uh, in the office. At that time, they tried to evacuate the uh, citizens of Gateway Village, and we called for assistance from Prince George County Police Department, uh, at which time we got a great response from them, and we were able to uh, contain the scene. And uh, at this point, I will uh, defer to Deputy Chief Webster. Good afternoon. As a result of this incident, Prince George's County police officers responded to the scene to, to provide support for those officers current already on the scene, Capitol Heights officers and C. Pleasant. At that time, a barricade situation was called and we activated our conflict management team who was actually in nearby in training and they were able to respond immediately to the scene. Upon their arrival, they were able to locate the suspect the suspect and at that time the suspect was apprehended and taken into custody without incident and along with that our homicide investigators assume investigation good afternoon everyone so while uh, we are here today you know we woke up this morning and yet another case of inexplicable grief and so we first of all really uh, want to extend our condolences and uh, our prayers uh, to the families of the victims in this case. We are absolutely devastated uh, about the loss of life again today. And uh, as we think about it, the depravity that we're seeing uh, just not only here in Prince George's, but we're just seeing in general is inexplicable. There really is no good explanation uh, for why this kind of occurrence can happen again and again. Uh, there's we're providing resources as a government, uh, job resources that we're providing uh, all that we can think of rental assistance. There are just so many uh, sources um, that we are providing. We'll continue to do those things, but the, the heart of a person that's capable of committing this kind of crime is just really is inexplicable. Uh, we are at this time, we've turned our attention uh, that we want to thank, first of all, I want to thank the department, uh, thank the Capitol Heights Police Department, the Prince George's County Police Department. They did an excellent job in responding, uh, making sure that they were able to make an apprehension uh, that did not result in a further loss of life and so they did a really excellent job of responding in this case uh, and they are currently investigating and collecting evidence the state's attorney 
uh, is here as well. I want to thank her. Uh, State's Attorney Aisha Braveboy and her uh, team are here as well. And we are now turning our attention to make sure that the seniors who are in this facility uh, who have been temporarily displaced, some are still in place sheltering, uh, but that we are really focusing on providing what we can to them in the way of medicines and food and uh, and just really caring for them in this in this time. Um, and so uh, I don't know if there are, let's see, at this point I'm going to turn it over for questions. Uh, can you tell us anything about the suspect? I mean, we've talked to a number of witnesses who say this was a, a resident, lost his job, and they did Can you get into anything of that at all? Right now, we're unable to provide that information to you at this time because everything is a, it's still an active investigation, and to uh, keep the integrity of the investigation, we're not going to release that information at this time. Are you able to tell us anything about the victims? Are they women? Are they men? Did they work at the building? Did they live there? As of right now, we can confirm that it was two female. Okay. Did they live in the building? Were they residents, or did they work there? That is unconfirmed at this time. Well, based on the incident itself, the incident was, was fluid. Um, and based on how the call went out uh, and knowing that we had an active shooter inside, that was enough to meet the criteria of calling the actual barricade itself. Was anybody else injured or just the two victims? Or As, as of right now, uh, we believe that there were just the two victims. A lot of those residents or all of those residents were evacuated and brought here to the fire department. Uh, how long you know, will it be before they're able to go back into their homes? Will that happen today, or is that going to be, are they going to be able to live there anymore? Let me just, let me just say this. They're going to be, we're working on getting them back today. Uh, we're working on providing, uh, uh, as the county executive said, any type of support they need medical-wise. And understand, some, some residents were, were sheltered in place. Uh, so we're trying to make sure we address and account for every resident that was there, every resident that's in the fire station. And we think there were about 19 residents in the fire station. So we're doing the best we can right now to account for everyone and, and, and as quickly as possible, we turn them back to their facility. How many people live in the building? Uh, there was 89 total. Uh, 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 there was 89 total based on my number. Uh, and that's, that's what we're trying to confirm for sure. But right now I've got 89. I don't want to give any more details right now until the investigation is, is, is sort of finalized right now, but right now I don't want to give that information at this point. What floor was he found on? Actually found on the third floor. Can I ask, and I don't know if the county executive would like to answer this, but the role of mental health, what role does that play in this? So we don't know yet what the role of mental health played in this, but as I explained before, um, the violence that we're seeing now, it is depravity is one word that's associated with it. And we are responding uh, with increased mental health services in the county. We are preparing to open, for example, a new mental health and addictions care facility. Uh, we see the need for it here, uh, and we are going to continue to open those services across the county. What we know is that COVID has impacted us in, in so many ways. We're still learning the true impact of COVID. But we know that mental health has been one of the issues uh, that we believe has worsened. And it's not just for some of our older residents, but we know, of course, for adolescents. And so we, the government is responding by really increasing the availability of mental health and addiction care uh, services for our residents. But the depravity is just, it's really, I'd say still, it's just inexplicable. How you shoot in a senior facility, how you shoot children, all of this is just there are no words to go with it. And it really is very hard to understand, but we're going to continue to do what we can um, to provide every service uh, necessary, jobs, mental health care services, activities for our young people. These are all of the things that we're working on, continuing to provide uh, to, to make sure that, um, that we spare families from the kind of grief that this particular killing causes. Can you tell us anything? That's probably your response. I mean, we were today, you hit 100 last night. And, you know, there's discussion of that already before this even happened. Is 
terrible milestone, jumping ahead like this. I, I guess that's what you've just addressed. It is. I mean, it's it is a terrible mile, milestone, and um, you know, and we're not alone in it. What we're seeing is that this kind of uh, violence is happening here. We're responding to it, and it's happening all around. It's across our state. It's across our country. Um, and there is a again. I keep using the word because it's the word that keeps coming to mind. Is there is a depravity of heart that is associated with a killing like this one? Can you tell us anything about the weapon that the suspect used? Did, do we know if he owned the weapon or if this was an illegal firearm? And all of those things will be subject to uh, investigation and will you know and will not be released at this point. But those are all matters that will be a part of the investigation, and the investigation is, is active right now. Did anyone yeah, give us any information on the history of the facility? One from the county's perspective, have you had any inspections, complaints lodged about quality of services or facility there? And then for the police department also, have you had calls for service to this location before? And those are all of the questions that we will absolutely be able to answer. You know, we're a few hours into this, um, but your question uh, regarding the facility is a good one, and we're going to be, uh, th that's, that'll be a part of what we investigate. The call came in at night. I'll let them. Uh, the, the call actually came out at about 9:10. The first unit arrived on the scene at 9:14. Uh, but he was, he was arrested out for 10. No. Yes. Yes, he was. And and the reason for that is, as as uh, Deputy Chief Webster said, it was treated as a barricade situation. So we have to. Uh, taken into consideration the, the safety of, of the residents and we have to do a methodical search to make sure there's not uh, more than one shooter. Chief, can you tell us anything about prior calls to service to your department for this facility? We don't, we don't get a lot of calls to this facility. My officers actually patrol that, that area very, very much. Uh, we go in and talk to the residents, so we're not aware of any ongoing uh, situations there. Was the suspect known to your officers? I'm not, I don't know if that information is available. I, I'm not sure. Can you we've had a lot of people say that this guy, quote, snapped because he was being harassed and that things were not good in that building. I'm not ready to address those thoughts just yet. No, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, Brad, as you know, uh, this is an investigation. All those things are going to be answered. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's rumors out in the community. There's always rumors about who said what or whatever, but until we do our complete investigation, do the background on this gentleman, uh, those kind of things, we'll find out what's going on. Can you say if weapons were allowed on the premises and how this person was able to have a gun inside the building? Well, this is, this is an open facility. Uh, it's a residence, so they don't uh, manage what weapons or things are brought in. There's no, no uh, things set up for that, for that situation. Can anyone tell us what the suspect's going to be charged with? Again, uh, we don't know yet until we uh, see if he makes any comments or any statements. Uh, we got to make sure our investigation clarifies everything that went on today, and then we'll decide the type of charges uh, that we decide to uh, charge the suspect. Again, we also got to work with our state's attorney's office uh, to see uh, if the charge is appropriate. Uh, we're going to take two more questions, and then we're going to close. So if you could just go over the timeline again. The call came in around 9, 10 in the morning. Capitol High School. Uh, Prince George's County Police, and, and I really want to thank all of our partners uh, in the area, C. Pleasant Police Department, uh, U.S. Park Police, everyone responded uh, to the scene, and uh, at 917 is when the call went out for assistance. Um, I can't uh, give you the timeline of when the suspect was actually apprehended, uh, and Deputy Chief, if you know. Okay. All right, so I can't give you that time. Because so many people responded, so many agencies responded to the scene, who is going to be the lead on the investigation going forward? Prince George's County Police Department. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. All right, that was the update there from officials on that tragic uh, shooting that happened earlier this morning there in Maryland. Uh, two dead, one in custody. They did not uh, confirm, though, the... Uh, who, what the relation of the shooter was, even though our Fox 5 DC team was reporting that the shooter uh, may have been a senior care member there that uh, was mad at some of the treatment 
from the people that work there. But that, that was not confirmed yet by the police. We'll wait on that right there. You're watching live now from Fox. Let's take a quick two minute break. Welcome back, everyone, here to Live Now from Fox, always in demand here for you. Uh, we got a shot here out of Oakland, California, expecting pretty soon the governor of California, Gavin Newsom. He's going to be signing legislat legislation supporting the state's nation, leading economic recovery and highlight his California comeback plan. So we'll be listening to a little bit of that coming up on live now from fox while we do wait for that let's go from coast to coast right now going out to florida Today, we're going out on to polk county right now where the sheriff here is talking about how deputies were called to, to two locations earlier this morning shortly after midnight related to a single motorcycle crash and a shooting that is believed to be occurred on interstate four there in polk county florida let's listen right here on live now from fox the outlaws all right so we're having a little playback issues on that right now we'll uh, wait that out and try to get that back here for you on live now from fox you can see how the market is doing down about 45 points there in the red we'll keep on it right here for you on live now from fox everyone we do have another live event here that just popped up that uh, we'll be getting to you in just a moment. But let's take another quick two-minute break.
Welcome back, everyone, here to Live Now from Fox, taking out to Oakland right now. We are going to soon hear from Governor Gavin Newsom uh, talking about COVID-19 uh, relief. Let's listen right here as the recovery continues in California. We purchase for our foods, fish, meats, et cetera, et cetera. So the ecosystem of the restaurant is pretty much the lifeline of the city. So when you're talking about community, it's not necessarily just us alone here. In addition to that, we've been able to, during the pandemic, feed several thousand low-income families um, throughout this whole period. Because as the city and the state shut down the schools where a lot of young kids will get their meals, they don't have that opportunity. So we stepped in. And in addition to the mayor and the governor with the support financially, allow us to not only support our community, but also maintain our working staff. So um, we are excited about the future. It's still very um, difficult as we move forward. So um, you know, I'm equally important, uh, interested to hear what the um, governor will be announcing today. And um, other than that, I would like to introduce our mayor, Ms. Libby Shaft. Thank you. Good morning. It is always exciting to have the governor here in Oakland, California, lifting up what is successful uniquely in California. And I have to say, as a Californian, I could not be more proud of the support that this state provided our lifeblood, and that's our small businesses. The state of California provided more than $10 billion in combined tax relief and grants. This is something that the federal government did not do as good of a job at, although I know, Congress Member Lee, you were fighting for it, because you fight for us every day. And here in the city, we pivoted. We tried to get creative to respond to the moment and to support incredible businesses like Kingston 11 that not only support an entire ecosystem of businesses, but our culture keepers, our community gathering places. And this restaurant provides thousands of meals to hunger, uh, to, to people who are suffering from uh, food insecurity and to our unsheltered residents. Uh, and the, and, and as a fun aside, the reason it smells so good right now is Kingston 11 is catering my State of the City event tonight. They're making 200 dinners while we talk. So you picked a great restaurant to highlight. They are so much more than just a business. They're community heroes. Now cities like Oakland, uh, we worked quickly to overnight permit outdoor spaces so people could continue to gather safely. Uh, we enjoyed the allowance of delivery of alcoholic beverages. There were some nights that we all needed those to be delivered to our homes. And let us learn the lessons of this pandemic. There are things that we tried that our residents enjoyed and want to keep. And that is what I am hopeful is going to be part of this announcement that we are all looking forward to. How we are going to keep the lessons that we've learned from this pandemic to continue to support these cultural institutions, these pillars of our economy, our beloved small businesses. And with that, it's my pleasure to announce my assembly, my assembly member, I think California's newest assembly member, and that is Mia Bonta. Thank you so much. Uh, we are so excited to be able to host at Kingston 11 in Oakland, in the fine district of Alameda, Oakland, and San Leandro, District 18, the governor and uh, our fellow legislators in this moment of being able to recognize that our small businesses are the lifeline to our communities. I'm so thankful to be able to have this opportunity to be able to know uh, that when our restaurants closed, so did a part of our community. And here we had 
an opportunity through legislation and through the boldest, most progressive budget passed uh, by this governor to ensure that that lifeline could be opened in AD 18 and throughout the state of California. Uh, we will hear some progressive legislation passed that will help us to be able to keep the moment that we had right now, uh, that moment of relief while we were sitting in COVID to know uh, that we could still enjoy our restaurants and our spaces. And I'm so thankful that we have fellow legislators who are going to introduce legislation that the governor will hopefully signed today uh, to ensure that the parklets and the opportunity to have on-the-go cocktails will be something that we can continue to have after COVID is uh, long behind us. So thank you. Welcome to AD18. Welcome to the most progressive, the boldest, the finest, the most wonderful district in the state of California, Oakland, Alameda, San Leandro, AD18. Thank you. Good morning. Well, uh, welcome to the 13th Congressional District, the most enlightened and progressive and creative Congressional District in the country. <laughs> and also welcome to Oakland. <laughs> so let me uh, just say how happy I am to be here. And uh, Nigel, let me just tell you how proud I am. First of all, that, you know, during very difficult times, some of the most uh, creative ideas come forward. And you have truly shown what creativity and what, what really, when you pull together with the community and with our government officials and the private sector, what can be done during very dire circumstances. And so I'm very proud of what you have done and definitely intend to uh, showcase this restaurant, Kingston 11, with my uh, California colleagues. Uh, and Mayor Schaaf, I want to thank you so much for your uh, tremendous leadership. You know, um, I was a former small business owner before going to Congress. Started out with three individuals in my business and over 11 years, we grew to 450 employees. Uh, and let me tell you, had Mayor Schaaf, had the governor been the governor and the mayor, I wouldn't have faced so many barriers, struggles, and really horrific circumstances just to be a small business, a woman-owned business, and a minority-owned business who just wanted to create jobs and economic growth. But we finally did it, but it was really difficult. And what you have done during this pandemic, Governor, has been just amazing because you have set forth policies, even before the pandemic, to make sure that our small, minority-owned, women-owned business not only survive, but thrive. And uh, with now half of our workforce uh, being small business, uh, from small business owners, small businesses, I mean, this is critical to economic, our economic growth in um, the state of California. And yes, we're leading now, even at this point in the pandemic, in terms of uh, economic growth. And, and the future looks good, even though we're still faced with many of the challenges that uh, are upon us. And I, I just have to say that uh, this, is a truly, this is truly a moment uh, when we're coming together once again. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for working in my district, in your assembly district, in my, in my city, in a very collaborative way with, with our governor leading on, on so many fronts. And finally, I'll say, Governor Newsom, this is the first bill signing by a governor of the state of California since I was in the California legislature. And so I'm really proud to be here at the signing of these very important bills by Governor Gavin Newsom. Thank you again. We prefer presidents. <laughs> Uh, I'm not Governor Gavin Newsom, but um, <laughs> I am uh, uh, Senator Scott Weiner. I have the honor of representing San Francisco and Northern San Mateo County uh, in the state Senate. Um, I'm not going to get into uh, an Oakland, San Francisco, who's more progressive. They're both amazing cities, <laughs> S sister cities in many ways. Um, so uh, at the when this pandemic started and everything shut down, uh, I was so deeply concerned that we were going to see just a mass die-off of restaurants and bars. Uh, I live in the Castro in San Francisco, and uh, I was just uh, I was just so concerned about what was going to happen to our neighborhood restaurants and bars. <clears throat> and I don't want to leave the bars out. <clears throat> uh, and especially in the LGBTQ community, uh, we treasure our bars. And I was worried that they were going to die. They were going to close, and we were going to lose that critical part of our community. 
And when the outdoor dining started, when our cities pivoted and quickly allowed outdoor dining, uh, both with restaurants and bars, and often with restaurants and bars working together, that was a lifeline. And I really want to commend the governor and ABC for quickly issuing emergency regulations to allow restaurants and bars <clears throat> to serve alcohol uh, outdoors, uh, which normally they wouldn't be able to do. Uh, and we know the business model without alcohol, it's really hard to make a go of it. And so what the governor and ABC did with these emergency regulations, absolutely through a lifeline to restaurants and bars in the state of California. And I know in San Francisco, I know so many of these small businesses that simply would not have survived um, absent these emergency regulations. And so today, uh, we're, I don't want to assume what the governor is going to do, but hopefully he'll be signing a few bills um, that make these uh, emergency regulations permanent, uh, that step back and say, uh, you know, we, we did this thing quickly during the pandemic, uh, and, and as big a catastrophe as this pandemic was, let's take the good that we learned during this emergency uh, and make it permanent. Uh, and so uh, I want to really acknowledge my uh, colleague uh, up from Los Angeles, Assemblymember Jesse Gabriel. The two of us uh, collaborated and worked in partnership on Senate Bill 314 and Assembly Bill 61. Uh, and although he will be rooting for the wrong team in tonight's game, um, he, uh, he's a, a great legislative partner. And I'm really thrilled that we've been able to place these bills on the governor's desk. And what SB 314 does um, uh, is allows uh, ABC to extend uh, these emergency regulations uh, and to extend it for a year past the end of the state of emergency uh, so that we don't just pull the rug out from these restaurants and bars as soon as the emergency ends and we create space uh, to make these parklets uh, permanent. Um, SB 314 also grants more flexibility uh, for alcohol manufacturers to share space with bars and restaurants so we can have more shared space. And also uh, makes it much easier for pop-up restaurants uh, to exist. We have a lot of vacant space now and we want our next generation of entrepreneurs uh, to be able to create more pop-ups uh, in these spaces and to be able to get the, more of these temporary uh, liquor licenses to be able to do that. Uh, so I'm really excited uh, that uh, these uh, bills will hopefully become uh, law uh, and it's now uh, my uh, honor to introduce uh, my colleague and legislative partner, uh, Assembly Member Jesse Gabriel. Thank you, Senator Weiner. As the senator mentioned, I am the token Dodgers fan here, uh, and there are a lot of things I want to say about the game tonight, but, but I really want this bill signed, and I'm mindful of the fact that the, the guy who holds the pen is from San Francisco, so I'm going to keep it focused on, on public policy right now. But I do want to thank uh, uh, Senator Weiner for his incredible partnership on all of this, thank the governor for his incredible leadership. It's such a privilege to be here with such a distinguished group of elected officials. And I think, as you heard said so beautifully by Nigel, neighborhood restaurants are the backbone of communities across the state of California. And right now, so many of them are barely hanging on by a thread. And as we heard, outdoor dining has, has offered a critical lifeline. It's allowed these businesses to keep their doors open, and that's something that we want to make sure continues. This is one of the good things that has come out of this pandemic. And outdoor dining is going to continue to be important, and I will give myself uh, as a personal example of this, I'm fully vaccinated, my wife is fully vaccinated, but we have three little kids that aren't. We have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a little guy who's a year and a half. And so right now, we're not yet fully comfortable with indoor dining, but we do want to go out to eat. We do want to support the incredible restaurants in our community so that they can continue to thrive. Sometimes on a, on a Sunday night, we just want someone else to clean up after our kids so, so we can have a little break. And so we really want outdoor dining, and we want it to be able to continue because it is safe and consistent with our public health priorities and what we think is important for our family. It's also really important from an, from an equity perspective. We know that the restaurant industry employs one of the most diverse workforces in the state of California. Six of ten restaurants in this state are owned by, by people of color. We can all think of incredible uh, stories of, of immigrants who have come to this state and who have, you, who have opened restaurants and used that as a way to climb into the middle class. And we know that our pandem this pandemic has hit 
uh, has hit communities of color and low-income communities uh, much harder. And so the work that we're doing to support the restaurant industry has an important equity component to it, to it as well. So this is something that is really important. We're going to get back out to California, everybody, but we do have uh, some other news to get to. We have the president. Once again, we are seeing him. He is uh, right there outside of the White House. We uh, He is going to be uh, talking about protecting national monuments and uh, so much more. So let's listen a little bit to uh, President Biden right here on Live Now from Fox talking about Restoring the protections for national monuments and steps the Biden-Harris administration has taken to better conserve and restore lands and waters. You're watching live now from Fox, always bringing you the events that are happening in real time, live, raw, and direct. Good afternoon, everybody. Please be seated. We're here for a celebration. We're here to celebrate the latest step that President Biden is taking to protect, to conserve, and to restore the lands and the waters that all of us cherish. Today, President Biden is restoring protections for three magnificent national monuments. And this announcement follows on consultations with a wide variety of stakeholders, and it fulfills a key promise to the American people. Restoring protections for these national monuments is part of this administration's broader commitments to protect our natural and our cultural resources, to honor tribal sovereignty, and to advance environmental justice. President Biden's conservation agenda is also a critical part of how we're tackling the climate crisis. By protecting our ecosystems, we strengthen the power of our soils, our grasses, and our trees to trap carbon pollution. And healthy natural systems build up our resilience against the climate impacts that we know we are already facing. Tapping into these natural climate solutions will protect public health. They will protect us against climate impacts. They will promote biodiversity. And yes, they will grow our economy. That's worth a clap. That's why President Biden, through his Build Back agenda, has also proposed creating, are you ready for it, a new civilian climate corps which will partner with our unions in putting to work a new generation that looks like America, receiving good benefits and good pay to restore the health of our public lands, our coasts, our waters, and our forests, and to advance environmental justice and help communities to better prepare for the impacts of a changing climate. And across our administration, we're taking a whole of government approach to conservation and to climate with the agencies that steward so many of our lands and waters like the Department of the Interior and Agriculture and Commerce. We're all working together to advance wind and solar to promote climate smart agriculture and forestry and create good paying union jobs all along the way in implementing these innovative climate solutions. So as we celebrate today's restoration of these three national monuments, we're also committed to building back better as we tackle our climate crisis. And with that, I am so honored to introduce my good friend, Brenda Mallory, the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, who is leading on our conservation and environmental justice efforts. Brenda. Thank you, Gina. It is so great to see all of you in person. I can't tell you how exciting it is to uh, be in person on this day in this event. I want to welcome you to the White House. Uh, and I also want to thank you, each and every one of you, from tribal leaders to business leaders to conservation leaders to hunters, anglers, cl climbers, scientists, educators, and millions and millions of American people. Thank you for speaking up, thank you for standing up, and for fighting to keep a simple but sacred promise that in America, when we protect a place as a national monument, 
It is to be protected for all time for all people. Let us reflect on the meaning of this moment. The single largest elimination of protections of lands and waters in U.S. history was met by the single largest mobilization for conservation in U.S. history. Millions and millions of Americans rallied to help tribes defend Bears Ears, to restore Grand Staircase Escalante, and to safeguard the Atlantic Ocean's first marine uh, national monument. This fight has galvanized a new and powerful vision for conservation in America. A vision in which we act with urgency and ambition to conserve and restore the lands, waters, and wildlife we love and that are disappearing so quickly. A vision in which, we, in which the stewardship traditions and conservation priorities of tribal nations and are celebrated and supported in both law and policy. A vision in which every child in America, no matter where they live, has a chance to experience nature's wonders. And a vision in which we harness the power of our forest and farms and ocean and coast to keep our climate livable and communities thriving. This is the vision that President Biden, with your help, is pursuing. And let me tell you, there is no one better to stand beside as we drive this work forward than our extraordinary Secretary of the Interior. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend and partner in so many things, Secretary Deb Holland. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I start, I just have to say that I have the best team at DOI, and I'm so grateful for all of you. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Brenda. Thank you for your introduction. We are here today on the ancestral homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway people, bending the arc of the moral universe toward justice. Thank you, Mr. President, for the profound action you are taking today to permanently protect the homelands of our ancestors. Our songs, our languages, and our cultures are strong, and many people from many Indian tribes have sung and spoken in unison to protect this sacred place. Bears Ears is a living landscape. When I've been there, I felt the warmth and joy of ancestors who've cared for this special place since time immemorial. It's a place where you can stand in the doorway of a home where a family who lived thousands of years ago left behind a legacy of love and conservation for a place that sustained them for countless generations. Stories of existence, celebration, survival, and reverence are etched into the sandstone canyon walls. Sacred sites are dotted across the desert mesas. Cultural heritage in the form of ancient pots, arrowheads, clothing, seeds, and evidence of lives well lived are as inseparable from bears' ears as the air we breathe at this moment. Today, children learn and sustain from their parents and elders the songs, traditions, and ceremonies that have been passed down from generation to generation at bears' ears. This is a place that must be protected in perpetuity for every American and every child of the world. Today's announcement, it's not just about national monuments. It's about this administration centering the voices of indigenous people and affirming the shared stewardship of this landscape with tribal nations. The president's actions today writes a new chapter 
that embraces indigenous knowledge, ensures tribal leadership has a seat at the table, and demonstrates that by working together, we can build a brighter future for all of us. We have much more good work ahead. Together, we will tell a more complete story of America. Together, we will conserve and protect our lands and ocean for people, for wildlife, for the climate. Together, we will strengthen our economy with healthy, resilient natural systems. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for strengthening the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Thank you on behalf of all Americans who love and value our cultural heritage. Thank you on behalf of the local communities whose economies are continually benefiting from healthy ecosystems on our public lands, national monuments, and parks. I am so grateful and very proud to serve on your team. And now, it's my distinct honor to introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Please, all we'll be seated, please. Madam Secretary, Deb, you've done an incredible job in a short amount of time. And uh, I told you when I asked you to be Secretary of Interior that I understood I was politically raised by Danny and Owe, Indian nations, Indian nations. And I want to thank all the leaders that are here today for, uh, for your support your help getting this done. And uh, it's really, really important. And I want to thank Brenda, the uh, Council of Economic Quality, Environmental Quality, and uh, Gina McCarthy. Uh, if you need any translation, talk to me. After. Gina, you're the best. You're the best. And I want you to know, although he, uh, he didn't speak today. I want to thank uh, my buddy Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture, for being here today because he's about preservation. And Maria, Senator Cantwell, thank you for your really hard, consistent, unrelenting work on these issues. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Michael Bennett the same way. He's been in this and never, from the moment he got elected, has been pushing, pushing hard. And uh, and Ruben, I want to thank you, Congressman Gallego, uh, for the work you've done and continue to do. I really mean it. This may be the easiest thing I've ever done so far as president. <laughs> I mean it. I mean it. I got to tell you a quick story. When I was running for office, and I'm, gonna, I'm embarrassed, I can't remember exactly which state I was in, but a gentleman, and uh, uh, I think it was his wife, and a little girl said, could I, the little girl said, could I talk to you? And she had this, I couldn't t understand what she had in her hand. It looked like a teddy bear or something. And she said, can I talk to you, uh, Mr. She wasn't sure what to call me. I wasn't elected yet. Mr. President or Mr. Vice President said, sure, what's the matter, honey? She said, I want to give you something. I want to give you some bear's ears. I looked at her, and she gave me this little set of bear's ears. She said, you got to promise me. You got to promise me. You'll protect the bear's ears. And I'm thinking, what the heck is we? I mean, at the time, I knew bear's ears, but I just didn't quite get it. She said, and her dad said, you know, a national park. I said, oh, yes. She said, and she went, look, she said, you promise. You promise. And I promised. And it's the easiest promise that I've made in a long time. I'm grateful to the tribal nation leaders and both those who are here with us today and those who are unable to join us. Today, I'm proud to announce the protection and expansion of three of the most treasured national monuments, our most treasured. Based on powers granted to the president under the Antiquities Act, first used more than a century ago by Teddy Roosevelt, first Bears Ears National Monument in Utah, this is the first national monument in the country to be established at the request of the federally recognized tribes and uh, a place of healing, as was spoken by the secretary, a place of reverence, 
a sacred homeland to hundreds of generations of Native peoples. The last administration reduced the size by 85 percent, leaving vulnerable more than one million acres of cherished landscape. Today, I'm we shall surely be signing a proclamation to fully restore the boundaries of Bears Ears. Second, I'm uh, restoring Utah's Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, a place of unique and extraordinary ge geology as well as biodiversity. Established as a national monument 25 years ago this month. <clears throat> Over the last quarter century, this land has produced a significant scientific discoveries per acre than more than any other national monument, everything from fossils to ancient indigenous artifacts. And once again, the last administration cut the size of the monument nearly in half, stripping away more than 800,000 protected acres. Today, I'm signing a proclamation to restore it to its full glory. Third, off the coast of New England, I'm restoring protection of the Northeast Canyons and, and Seamounts Marine National Monument. Waters teeming with life with underwater canyons as deep as parts of the Grand Canyon and underwater mountains as tall as the Appalachians. There's nothing like it in the world. Because its unique biodiversity, marine sciences, as scientists believe that this is a key to understanding life under the sea. President Obama established as, as a national monument five years ago, recognizing its irre irreplaceable value. Again, my predecessor chipped away at its protections. The proclamation I'll be signing today is going to restore protections established by President Obama when this monument was first created. <clears throat> Excuse me. The protection of public lands must become, must not become, I should say, a pendulum that swings back and forth depending on who's in public office. It's not a partisan issue. And I want to thank the members of Congress who have come together to support this important conservation work. And by the way, I might add, as a matter of courtesy, I spoke with <clears throat> both the senators from Utah. They were, they didn't agree with what I was doing, but they were gracious and polite about it, and I appreciate that as well. <clears throat> the truth is, <clears throat> national monuments and parks are part of the identity as our identity as a people. There are more than natural wonders. They're the birthright we pass from generation to generation, the birthright of every American. And preserving them is the fulfillment of a promise to our children and all those who will come to leave this world a little better than we found it. But today, <clears throat> our children are three times more likely to see climate disasters uproot and unsettle their lives than their grandparents' generation. We have to come together and understand why this work is so critical. When we protect and care for a forest, we're not just preserving the majesty of nature. We're safeguarding water sources and lessening the impact of fires, excuse me, <coughs> and the impact of fires. We're protecting wetlands. We're not only saving birds and fish and the livelihoods of people who depend on them, we're also shoring up the natural defenses to absorb the fury of hurricanes and superstorms. Nearly one in three Americans live in a community that has been struck by weather disasters just in the last few months. Hurricanes, wildfires, droughts, heat waves. Both the Build Back Better plan and my bipartisan infrastructure agreement are going to make critical investments, significantly increasing the resilience to these devastating effects on the climate, on the climate crisis. It includes creation of a civilian climate corps, similar to President Franklin Roosevelt's Civilian Con uh, Conservation Corps, which is going to put diverse groups of Americans to work doing everything from restoring wetlands to protecting clean water to making forests more resilient against wildfires. My plan also puts Americans on a course to achieve 50 to 52 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and to reach net zero emissions no later than 2050. You know, achieving these ambitious goals is going to require that nature itself play a role. Scientists estimate that the protection and restoration of natural lands and waters can provide nearly 40 percent of the solutions to climate change. That's why I'm signing these proclamations today as an additional reason. It's also why I'm restoring protections for the, Song, the Tongass National Forest in Alaska, which I've, <laughs> which I've had the great honor to visit. 
As a matter of fact, when I was meeting with, uh, back in the days when uh, the senator from Alaska, uh, I was with him after the oil spill on the North Slope, and we stopped in the Tongass Forest, and he sat me at a table in this magnificent restaurant in the middle of the Tongass Forest, which has tree trunks as big as those trees holding up the whole building. It's magnificent. And he sat me with what I kid and call Hoss Cartwright and his family. Four big guys, really big, big guys, and they were, they were, uh, they were, had a uh, lumber company that they were uh, foresting in the area, and they wanted me to support uh, paying for roads into the into the national forest so they could forest. <clears throat> and um, uh, and we started the conversation. And to make a long story short, when I made it clear I wasn't going to do that, the father turned to his son who. Uh, look like like that program at Hoskar Big Fella. And he said, I'll bet, I won't use the exact language. He turned to me, I'm across the table. And it's got he and three of his sons. And he said, I'll bet this so-and-so, referring to me in a expletive ex deleted, <laughs> doesn't realize he's closer to Lexington, Kentucky today than he was when he just flew off the North Slope. And it made the point to me. <laughs> Alaska is pretty big. There's an awful lot we need to protect. <laughs> but that's why I'm working to protect Bristol Bay from mining operations <clears throat> that would threaten one of the world's largest salmon runs. That's why I'm refusing to sell out the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve to oil and gas trade. These protections provide a bridge to our past, but they also build a bridge to a safer, more sustainable future, one where we strengthen our economy, and pass on a healthy planet to our children and our grandchildren. Let me close with this. Edward Abbey, a writer who once worked as a ranger at the Arches National Park in Utah wrote, and I quote, this is the most beautiful place on earth. There are many such places. Every man, every woman carries in, in heart and mind the image of the ideal place, the right place, the one true home, known or unknown, actual or visionary. End of quote. Folks, that's the United States of America. That's America. A country we all share together. A country that we must protect together. And this is just one more step in doing what other presidents have done, starting with Teddy Roosevelt. And I'm now going to sign these proclamations and thank you all. Thank you all for your support. Thank you. <clears throat> Come on, guys. signing this grand statues. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the second one I'm signing is the, uh, the uh, Bears Ears. Yes. I wish I could remember that little girl's name. I hope she's watching. <laughs> I hope she's watching. Thank you for signing this, President. Oh, it's important. Well, you guys know it better than anybody. All right, here we go. I'm going to get you all pinned. And the third one I'm signing is the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Mar uh, Marine National Monument. <laughs> Next one. I'm going to do the same back home, Mr. President. Thank you. Next one. I'm going to start adding middle names. <laughs>
going here. How many more can you get to rest you guys? <laughs> There. Yeah. <laughs> PS there. PS to come. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, two more. Barack used to be able to do this as a Barack Obama, and he didn't give away seven minutes. There you go. One more. And if I don't have enough pens. <laughs> Sign. <laughs> Everybody get one? Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. All right, President Biden uh, taking no more uh, uh, questions there from the media. Second event there in a row as uh, this time signing some bills to protect national monuments. Three in our country You're watching live now from Fox, everybody. We always cover uh, the breaking news events as they're happening in real time. And we got one right here for you monitoring uh, this breaking news of a plane crash in Georgia. Take a look at this. Looks really bad there. No word yet on injuries yet, but it looks very, very bad. This is at the DeKalb Peachtree Airport in DeKalb County, Georgia. There are officials on scene right now investigating this plane crash. No word yet on the type of plane that was involved. And uh, we will wait and see for more information, but uh, it does not look good right there with that crash. You're watching live now from Fox. We're going to step away for a quick two-minute break. Stay right here with us in the mix. More news and updates from across the country. Welcome back, everyone, here to Live Now from Fox. We appreciate you joining us here, always in the mix. I'm your host, Mike Page, as we bring you the top stories and headlines always from across the country. We're going to take it back out to California. We didn't get to hear the remarks from Governor Gavin Newsom uh, talking about uh, building back the economy after the pandemic, uh, especially for small businesses. We know that uh, for some, so many businesses across the country, and of course, including California, they were hit hard with the rolling lockdowns and so much more that had to be dealt with during this pandemic. Let's listen right now to Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, later tonight, and I know all the preparation, time, energy uh, that you've put into that, and I'm grateful, though, you took the time to be here in this important uh, bill signing. And also, I want to thank the Senator and New Assembly woman uh, that represents the most progressive, the finest, the best, the most diverse. Uh, 
<laughs> Battle District in the state of California. Uh, and Nigel, thank you for, for opening up your business, uh, particularly this, this time of the day. Um, normally, folks like you would be asleep. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm grateful you, you took the time to be here uh, and to express uh, not only your support and appreciation for what we're trying to do, uh, but to allow us to reciprocate and thank you for your support of all of us. Um, we're not, it's not lost on any of us, the power and potency of establishments like yours. It's the antidote to all of the stress that so many has felt over the last year and a half in particular. So many of us feeling isolated, feeling disconnected, so many friendships, relationships that have atrophied because of this pandemic. The opportunity to come here is not just about extraordinary food. It, in fact, if it's about food, you know, we can all order in, we can make food every single night. Um, it's about experiences. It's about magical moments. It's about the serendipity that is life. It's about meeting someone that may become your life partner. It's about finding um, your soulmate. It's about having an experience or hearing an expression uh, or a point of view that, you know, marks a moment in your life that changes the trajectory of your life. Uh, it is all of those intangibles that tangibly make life worth living. It's about experiences. Um, and we're so desperate for those right now. Uh, and we need to feel connected once again. We need to feel seen and heard. And, and so much of what we're struggling with societally here in Oakland, all across this country, in terms of some of the friction and frustration, the otherness, uh, honestly, is, uh, is represented in the lack of that kind of engagement. And so it's really important that businesses like this not just survive, but thrive. And we have their backs and we support efforts like we're supporting and advancing here today. And so I'm really proud of the legislature um, because almost universally, we've not only embraced this industry and the supports, but we've also stretched our mind because it wasn't that long ago, getting a table and chair permit could take a year or two. And you had local opposition, the city council wasn't necessarily enthusiastic, boards of supervisors weren't sure. And then even if you got through those local jurisdictional bodies, then you had the alcohol beverage control of Sacramento said, well, time out, no, no, no. And days become weeks, weeks, months, months, years. And then as a business person, you just give up. But now we've just broken past that mindset. And now, you know, Eat your heart out, Paris. Uh, you know, it's like you go all across the state and you're like, why haven't we done this 20, 40, 30 years ago? And the biggest fear and anxiety I think all of us have had as consumers, not just businessmen and women, but it's like, please don't take this away. Don't let them take this away after this pandemic. And so that's what these bills represent. Uh, not only we don't want to take this away, uh, this is a pathway for these businesses to frankly make up for a lot of the constraints that have been imposed upon them over the course of the last 18 months. The great thing about being able to do these parklets and these outdoor spaces is the costs associated with the uptop capital um, quickly is recouped because you're not necessarily going back to your landlord, not necessarily in most cases, and having to pay for that extra space. All of a sudden, you've expanded the number of seats. You've expanded uh, the number of SKUs and sort of the lex kind of retail. You've expanded the opportunity uh, to, to sell more and more of your product. And you've also expanded the opportunity to hire more and more people. So it's a virtuous cycle. It's, it's about activating streets. It's about making people feel safer, more energized, more engaged, more creative. Just look at the creative expression around here, not least of which I was just reading those remarkable words up on the wall. Talk about sort of the serendipity that is life, this notion that one day we can look beyond the color of our skin, look at it as nothing more interesting than the differences of our colors of our eyes. I mean, just things like that, that you don't experience unless you have an experience of coming into a business or establishment like this. Forgive me for the long windedness on this point, but some of you also know I come from this world before I got into politics, restaurants um, and bars. And so I'm very passionate uh, about the work Nigel and his team do. And it's work. This is not easy. Businesses like this in the best of times struggle. Um, and so we have to do more. $4 billion of grants we put out 
as a state. We've waived license fees for renewals for the next two years, ABC license fees and other fees. We did $147 million in a hiring tax credit up to $1,000 for everybody that's hired in new tax credits. Put more CalCompete's dollars out, more manufacturing tax credits, more sales tax credits. This is this year's business supports unprecedented in California's history. We stepped up with grants, not just loans, tax credits across the spectrum, focusing on micro businesses, businesses that fall through the cracks, and not just minority owned businesses, but many businesses uh, that are here, mixed status, uh, that were struggling with access or lack of access to credit and banks. Uh, we're making sure we get grants and loans to them as well, not just larger, well established businesses. We though do know, though, we have a lot of work to do, and I'll just close on that. Uh, today, the president highlighted uh, uh, the fact that our unemployment rate in this nation now has dropped below 5%, which is significant. It's an important and significant milestone in this country. Uh, and while the job numbers are about 194,000, those get adjusted up and down over the course of the next few weeks when the dust settles. Uh, and in any other economy, an economic cover, you'd say that's just extraordinary and great. Uh, but I know we have high expectations because we still have a lot of work to do to get ourselves fully back from this pandemic. I want to note, though, California, we're the tent pole of the American job recovery. Last month, 44% of America's jobs, 44% of America's jobs came out of the state of California, over 104,000 jobs. This state, since January, has had the privilege, because of Nigel's work and other business leaders all up and down the state and their entrepreneurial spirit and their resiliency, to have created just shy of three quarters of a million jobs. No other state comes close in terms of that job creation. It's led to unprecedented surplus, which allows us to unprecedented investment back in to the small business community, back into the pockets of hardworking men and women all up and down the state of California. I just need to make that point because I'm proud of California's resilience. We're proud of our recovery, though we are mindful of the work we have in front of us and the work that remains to have a fully equitable recovery, not just here in California, but all across our nation. And so with that, let's advance this cause that unites us and these efforts by signing three important pieces of legislation. And very briefly, the last 15 seconds, this, as the senator said, uh, codifies some of the work we did on a temporary basis last year to allow for uh, take out of mixed drinks and cocktails and booze broadly defined in a responsible way. Um, it also codifies our efforts to expand the footprint of these businesses and to remove the burdens that the state imposes in terms of the flexibility that local governments like Oakland provide in terms of making determinations for themselves, Madam Mayor, now imposing you. that determination, providing you flexibility in terms of your zoning uh, and your rules and regulations as it relates to these parklets and these outdoor areas. And as the Senator said as well, and I appreciate uh, the nuances in his legislation you two worked on, which was impressive around more catering permits, which allow more pop-ups and allow more um, creative use of existing space. And so much innovation comes out of that space that that legislation is more important than perhaps people may believe if you just read it. And so I'm really grateful to you, Senator, and you, Assemblymember Gabriel, for the wisdom and your leadership that you are providing us uh, with this opportunity to sign this bill with this pen, not the other. With that, let's sign these three pieces. Of very pro restaurant, pro small business legislation. Senator, Assembly Member. May, well, we got to do the mayor. Got to do mayor. Sorry, Cong wait, wait. Assemblywoman and mayor and Congresswoman. I got nothing to hold up except gratitude. That's all. Hold up gratitude. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. We are here to answer any questions, uh, though the mayor may have to take off. I don't know, but uh, 
I can't believe you are here on a stay. Yes, this, governor, this, this, that's very it, I kind did of a you. film, so it's all done. Oh, you do? Oh, no, what? No, no, why you're so relaxed. Yeah. All right. No, I, no, this did not make sense until that last moment. Forgive me. Okay. Uh, awesome. Governor Carlo Marinucci from Politico. Um, as you know, there's been some uh, good news on the COVID front as health officers in the Bay Area jurisdictions have issued conditions under which uh, mask wearing rules are going to be lifted. How do you feel about the counties pulling back on that? Do you think the state. Um, is going to uh, follow through, and I have another question too. But... No, I, I, I think the Bay Area, particularly San Francisco's uh, decision to begin to modify the mass wearing is is, an, is a positive sign. It's an encouraging sign. It's a sign of progress uh, in our nation-leading effort with the lowest COVID case rate in the country. But I am deeply mindful, and I want to make this point: uh, marking that optimism and marking with pride the fact that we have over the course of the last few months consistently had the lowest case rates in this country and among the lowest positivity rates, fifth lowest as I speak today, 2.5%. That this time last year, we were experiencing not dissimilar optimism, only to experiences, experience we're going to take a quick two-minute break right here on Live Now from Fox, everyone. Stay right here with us for more news and updates. Welcome back, everyone, here to Live Now from Fox. Host Mike Page as we continue to navigate the world of news together right here, bringing you the top stories and headlines from across the country. Here's what we have coming up next for everyone pretty soon. We are expecting a White House briefing. We'll bring that to you as soon as it gets going right here on Live Now from Fox. The next event is another live one that we have here for you. Like I said, if it's happening live, it's happening now. Good chance it's happening on Live Now from Fox. We're going to go out to Los Angeles here where uh, a victim of R. Kelly, who testified recently at his criminal trial in New York, resulting in R. Kelly being convicted of charges being brought against him for, for her, will speak out today for the first time since R. Kelly was convicted. This is Faith Rogers, a victim of R. Kelly is going to uh, attack the argument by Bill Cosby's spokesperson who, who said that R. Kelly was railroaded and did not receive a fair trial. Faith is with her attorney, Gloria Allred, and uh, we are listening right now on Live Now from Fox. And that is what she is here to do today. Now I present Faith Rogers. <laughs> Three 
years ago, as a 19-year-old young woman, I started this journey, the journey in telling my truth. There was no real preparation for the harassment, the loss of friends, the days of hating what I saw in the mirror because of online comments, the feeling of loneliness that slept with me every night through it all. But the people I've had physically around me in this journey that felt like a one-woman battle reminded me that the sacrifice I made was not in vain. I hope any young woman following my story was inspired, but especially my young black peers. To them I say, please do not be afraid to free yourself and speak your truth. In this journey while fighting for myself, I stood against many opinions and lies from those in my own community, but I kept going. Your inner strength will take you to your healing. It was disheartening to see even years and a second trial later that the abuser, my abuser, and the abuser of many women is being held up as a victim and even considered to be railroaded. The women who were victims of R. Kelly had many nights of being reminded of their own trauma, which resulted from being abused by him. I hope the conviction makes it a little easier to think about those times. And when you have those nights of anxiety, worry, or just feeling left out because you make the choice to stop your abuser, know that it was not in vain. I pray that instead of pointing the finger, we can learn to take care and truly protect our black women. I heard Andrew Wyatt, a spokesperson for Bill Cosby say, R. Kelly was railroaded. To me, that term is beyond insulting. After meeting R. Kelly at 19 years old, for that year and a half, he manipulated me for his own enjoyment and sexually abused me and tried to control me. When I made the choice to come forward with my story, he threatened me on multiple occasions that if I continued to go forward with the telling of my truth, he would publish many pictures and videos of me. Despite the threats, I continued to tell what happened to me, and as a result, R. Kelly retaliated against me and published those photos. Even though he did this, I refused to back down, and I still testify at trial. R. Kelly did receive a fair trial, and he was convicted based on the who was not railroaded. Thank you to my parents, thank you to Gloria Alred, thank you to Lee Merritt, and thank you to all survivors of abuse who have shared their stories with me, gave me support, and still to this day helped me. The greatest gift was not his conviction, but knowing I helped someone else in my shoes. Thank you. I also want to point out that Mr. Wyatt, I guess approximately a day after he made the statement, uh, which many people attributed to Bill Cosby, since Mr. Wyatt is generally only known as Mr. Uh, Cosby's spokesperson, uh, then said, well, that was his own opinion, to exercise his first amendment rights. I, I suppose that was after uh, Mr. Cosby received a great deal of backlash in reference to that statement. And so we'll be happy to take any questions, whether it's uh, by Zoom or anyone who is present. If it's by Zoom, uh, feel free to type in your question and it will be related. Uh, are there any questions? Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Dillard, Rolling Stone. You've spoken in the past about how when you were um, faced with this threatening letter, you can photos, how it caused you such great stress. Can you just talk about that? I think you, was a very physical. The question, well, I'll just read the question and then you answer it. Uh, that you had spoken in the past about when you received, and actually, I think it was your attorney representing you in a civil lawsuit. And transmitted to you a threatening letter, which appeared to be signed from by R. Kelly, uh, and threatening to release the naked photos of you. And so your question was, well, this was a big deal at the trial. With the, had a um, prosecutor saying that one of the reasons that this went on for so long, this conspiracy, was because there was a lot of intimidation at play. You experienced that, I believe, with that letter, and it caused you, you know. You, I think you're a good example of how that affected. Uh, how did you um, feel about it? Is that the question? I think you mentioned once and it caused you, you at the trial. Is that it? Um, I think you mentioned once it caused you seizures. Is that right? Um, so actually, okay, not here. 
So um, there was a lot of moments that helped him, but that moment of when my pictures got leaked on the internet, um, I actually was at home. So that moment for me, I don't think anybody, just any young woman, especially trying to just figure it out, wants their whole body part exposed. Like I woke up to text and friends from my family, like, you gotta see this. Like, so it was one of those moments. Um, it was hard and it's one of those things that when things are on the internet, you know, it's there for people to see. So that's something that will forever follow me. Um, a lot of people saw my body parts and they don't even know me. So that definitely wasn't a good feeling. Um, and it was one of those reminders that like, he really didn't want me to talk, but even through all that, like it just gave me more drive to keep going because once all my cards are on the table, there's nothing you can really do to me at that point. I've gone through all the embarrassment, everything that's been said about me. There's nothing more you can do to me at that point than what's already been done. Um, so the stress of it all, of course, it caused me anxiety, all types of medical problems. Um, I'm in a much better space now, but through it, in that moment, I didn't know if I was going to make it through or how I was going to redeem myself from all this. It's already hard going up against, you know, people's favorite. So um, it was a humbling experience. And yeah. Um, can you just um, describe your feeling when that verdict came in? Okay. The question is can she describe her feelings when the verdict came in of guilty? Guilty, 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 guilty. All right. Um, when I got the call from my mom, um, I was I woke up. It was a regular day for me, and I said to myself, "Oh, I forgot." I said, "Okay, I'm gonna just wait." Um, and it wasn't within like 30 minutes of me like reminding myself that something big was happening. Um, I got the call from my mom, and then after that, it was just a train of ah, congratulations. But deep on the inside, it didn't feel like congratulations. It was like a phone call, does that one call or that one text doesn't make everything you went through worth it. But I can definitely say like it kind of was it it felt good to to have the evidence stamp everything I've been saying and I no longer have to explain myself the facts are facts. So there's no black and white when it comes to that situation. So that definitely was a uh, weight off my chest. We have some questions from Zoom. Yes. First one is, can we confirm Faith's age, please? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Age. But the question is from Zoom. And yes. What? Can we confirm Faith's age, please? My age of now? I'm yeah. 24 years old. Second question. How did you deal with questions from defense attorneys on cross-examination cross about why you stayed with Kelly or continued to visit him despite your negative experiences? What do you think of the victim blaming from defense attorneys? So the question from Zoom is, uh, what did you think of uh, the defense's questioning about why you stayed with uh, Mr. Kelly and uh, how do you feel about the victim shape? Yes. Um, when they questioned me about that, it wasn't really anything that shook me up too bad because we do things when we're younger, we have experiences that they're, they're, that person that I was involved with at 19, now at 24, I wouldn't be involved with them. So it really didn't bother me when they were. We're going to step away and take a quick two minute break for some of you. Stay right here with us. More on Live Now from Fox. Um, and at that age, you're taking opinions from everybody around you. And there was nobody around me I really talked to to tell me no. Or so if I'm going based off what he thinks of me and what I think of myself. At that time, I wasn't the same for three years um, before surviving R. Kelly, before any of that. So I've had my time to deal with opinions and people questioning me. So the security I have on myself um, to know that I'm not the same person, and I was, I made a mistake, um, but I chose to stop. And I didn't choose to just, okay, he's gonna do me wrong, and I and and I just let it go. I pressed forward, so the next person that comes across could even just be aware. To me, there was no clear 
warning. Everything around him was kind of acceptable. So there comes a point when you have to hold yourself accountable and your leader. And I did that. Not only did I hold myself accountable, but uh, I would also add to that the question of why a victim stays is a frequent question and has been, has been testified to by experts in sexual assault and rape in numerous high profile trials, including this one, including uh, the one involving uh, Harvey Weinstein, uh, and including in the trial of Bill Cosby that it's a, it's a sexual assault rape myth that if someone stays in an abusive relationship that it must not have been abusive. And that's a myth, it's false, and it's false as to survivors of domestic violence as well, many of them stay. So uh, I just think that the real question is not why they stay, but why the creditors do what they do to abuse women. We'll be happy to take another question. Next question from Zoom. Next question is from Zoom. Faith, what does healing look like for you moving forward? Can you say the question again, please? Faith, what does healing look like for you moving forward? Faith, what does healing we were listening in to some of the coverage there from Los Angeles. Attorney Gloria Allred uh, with an R. Kelly victim speaking out for the first time after the conviction. R. Kelly still facing uh, trials in Minnesota and Illinois as his sex trafficking uh, allegations continue uh, in those states. He was convicted in New York. You're watching live now from Fox, everybody. We are going to continue on right here with more news here of the day. It's it's a really busy day like we were setting up when we were telling you that earlier today. Uh, we are going to now go out to the White House. The briefing is underway. We were rolling on it, so you're not going to miss anything. Let's play it back from the very beginning right here on Live Now from Fox. So one item for all of you at the top, uh, today OECD's agree o today's OECD agreement shows how American leadership and diplomacy can advance the economic interests of American working families. A global minimum tax of 15% up from 0% today will finally even the playing field for American workers and taxpayers. President Biden, Secretary Yellen, and the entire administration worked overtime to rally more than 130 countries representing more than 90% of the world's GDP to ensure that profitable corporations pay their fair share and provide governments with the resources to invest in their workers and economies. The President's Build Back Better agenda now being considered by Congress will build on this agreement. It will eliminate incentives to shift jobs and profits abroad and ensure that multinational corporations pay their fair share here at home. The international agreement is proof that the rest of the world agrees that corporations can and should do more uh, that we to help build back better. I understand you're all looking for a week ahead. We will have one, I promise, uh, in the later days of this weekend, and we'll provide that to all of you as soon as we have it. And last item, I know we talk about serious things in here, but we have one fun thing today. Chris is getting one. Chris is getting married in a week, so you won't so you won't see him for two weeks, and nobody can call him or bother him for two weeks. Bother me, Kareen, Chris, and just to embarrass him a little bit, I got him a little special uh, sash to wear just for the briefing, because everybody should know that Chris is marrying up, as many people do. You can put it on yourself, and also a pin. Um, also a pin. I'll let Andrew or someone else put on you. Uh, but really, we just wanted to congratulate Chris, celebrate him. Most important decision you make is the person you choose to be your partner. Glad you have your mask on. Exactly. Okay. With that. Um, um, Say hi, baby. With that, um, Amr. I, I, I don't know how I talk about it. <laughs> you, you can give him, give him uh, advice. I'll try to ask this question. Uh, can you confirm that the White House is authorizing the National Archives to turn over documents covering all communications related to Trump's activity on uh, January 6th? 
The administration takes the events of January 6th incredibly seriously, as the President said on its six-month anniversary. Uh, that day posed an existential crisis and a test of whether our democracy could survive. It was in many respects a unique attack on the foundations of our democracy. The President's dedicated to ensuring that something like that could never happen again, which is why the administration is cooperating with ongoing investigations, including the sixth select committee to bring to light what happened. As a part of this process, the President has determined that an assertion of executive privilege is not warranted for the first set of documents from the Trump White House that have been provided to us by the National Archives. As we've said previously, this will be an ongoing process, uh, and this is just the first set of documents. And we will evaluate questions of privilege on a case-by-case -case basis, but the President has also been clear that he believes it to be of the utmost importance for both Congress and the American people to have a complete understanding uh, of the events of that day to prevent them from happening again. The President uh, had previously said uh, that the American Rescue Plan would add 7 million jobs uh, to the economy. Uh, at this point, are you, is the White House still confident in that reaching that 7 million number? Well, that was, uh, of course, based on outside economists providing their analysis. Uh, and you're talking about the Build Back Better agenda, not the American Rescue Plan. I, mean, I believe it's the heart of the million. Oh, sorry. I didn't know if you were asking about the bill that's moving its way through or the bill that has been passed. The bill that has been. I thought seven million would end. I apologize. No, no, no. I was just trying to. I was just trying to understand which part of his agenda you were asking about. Uh, nothing has changed on, on the projections of economists in terms of the American Rescue Plan that we're currently implementing. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, then, and finally, uh, today the president became um, the first U.S. president to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, why should the U.S. Um, continue to celebrate Columbus Day? Um, and has there been any talk or discussion of as many cities and I think a few states have shifted from Columbus Day um, to an Indigenous Peoples Day? Well, today is both Columbus Day, as of now, and this is why you're asking the question, as well as Indigenous uh, Peoples Day. I'm not aware of any discussion of ending that uh, either of ending the, the prior federal holiday at this point, uh, but I know that uh, recognizing today as Indigenous Peoples Day is something that the President felt uh, strongly about personally. He's happy to be the first President to celebrate um, and to make it um, uh, the, 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 the history of moving forward. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. I want to ask you about the jobs numbers. One of the things that the jobs numbers showed is that there are more jobs available, a historic number of jobs available compared to how many people are actually seeking jobs. Yeah. Why do you think there are so many people who are still reluctant to re-enter the workforce? There's a range of factors um, in our assessment. Uh, one is uh, people are still fearful of COVID. Um, and what it will be like uh, in workplaces and ensuring their own safety. Uh, there are still uh, challenges as it relates to child care, elder care, uh, the costs of those uh, and, and being able to afford it and also the availability, which is something we've seen a shortage of in many uh, communities. Uh, and we'd also have seen that uh, the pandemic, while it's been incredibly challenging on many, many levels, it's also uh, prompted many people to rethink uh, what their careers might look like and what uh, careers they may may pursue. So you're right, there are an enormous number of jobs that are still available out there in the workforce, and we believe those are the range of factors that uh, are attributed to that. And then I was wondering if you could give us an update on the negotiations with Senators Manchin and Sinema. Democrats are expressing more and more public frustration with the two of them arguing that they're not moving off of their positions. Are the two of them providing more concessions in private than they appear to be in public? And is the president getting frustrated? Well, we don't have the luxury of being frustrated. This is a process. The president of all people recognizes that, that the process can take some time. There can be ups and downs in the process. And uh, he feels uh, that we're continuing to make progress, uh, that both Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema are uh, negotiating in good faith, that there is a recognition that not only uh, do some people have to come down from their expectations of what might be in a package, but some others uh, have to come up. That's what compromise is all about. So we're going to continue to pursue uh, these discussions and negotiations. Uh, the president is confident we're going to get this done. Go ahead. Thank you. First on the economy, there are a half a million containers floating off the California coast with nowhere to go. 
major issues in the global supply chain right now. The vice president warned that this could happen in August. So why wasn't more done to prepare? For the global supply chain issues? Yeah, she was talking in August about if you want to have your Christmas toys for your children, now might be the time to start buying them because the delays could be many, many months. I, I ask that because we've been talking about the issues in the global supply chain since January. And the president has not only put in place a task force, but we have taken a range of steps to work to address. Now, it's not just about uh, ensuring that uh, we are having uh, different companies speak to each other. We've certainly done that. We've been a forum for hosting. Uh, uh, different industry leaders to see what we can uh, what we can reduce in terms of red tape in the process. The one of the biggest issues in the global supply chain is also COVID and the fact that COVID uh, continues to be uh, a threat to uh, supply chains that are happening globally. So we've also worked to be the by far and away the largest provider of vaccines, know-how, manufacturing capacity to the world. So we've not only been talking about this since January. We've been working to put in place a range of steps to uh, help address the challenges in the supply chain. And as we understand it, it's not just COVID. There are also labor shortages and issues with uh, shipping lines here, uh, overground shipping lines in the U.S. Is the president satisfied that his task force is doing a good job? The, the president recognizes that there are several uh, several layers of the challenge here uh, that contribute to uh, the bottleneck. And on ports and transportation bottlenecks specifically, we appointed, the president appointed, a White House ports envoy this summer, John Bercari, to work with Secretary Buttigieg and bring stakeholders, labor, private industry together to help solve the global transportation supply problems. The fact that he designated and, uh, and uh, appointed someone at that level with a range of vast experience experience shows that this is a part of the issue we're absolutely focused on. We're also focused, as I noted, on uh, the work of the supply chain task force, also the semiconductor shortage, which has been an I issue that has impacted a range of industries. And we're working to attack the challenges in the global supply chain at every point they are in the bottleneck. Thank you. The Democratic candidate for governor in Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, who President Biden stumped for over the summer now says, the president is unpopular today, unfortunately, here in Virginia, so we've got to plow through. Why why do you think the president is unpopular in Virginia? Well, just if you look at facts and the polling, the president is the most popular figure in Virginia of anyone currently running for president or any former recent president. So I just note that in terms of the data. But I would say that the president's agenda is incredibly popular. That's probably the reason why former Governor uh, McAuliffe is also running on that agenda, uh, whether it is reducing costs for the American people on child care, on elder care, uh, making sure the tax system is more fair, rebuilding our roads, rails, and bridges. Uh, those are all components of the president's agenda that he has a, a, a huge agreement with uh, Governor McAuliffe, former Governor McAuliffe on. And then just one more topic following up on his remarks yesterday. President Biden claims that he cold called a Pennsylvania hospital to ask the desk receiving nurse why it was taking so long for a good friend's wife to be seen. What happened next? Well, the context of why the president told this story, which I think is important, and I promise I'll answer your question, is that he was expressing that hospitals, frontline workers, nurses, doctors in emergency rooms are still see seeing and feeling the impact of the number of people who are unvaccinated, who are filling beds uh, and in emergency rooms, ICUs, and it is preventing, in some cases, people who have other illnesses, uh, who may be seeking treatment, who may be ha uh, fearful of a heart attack, who other people who might be going to the emergency emergency room from getting the care that they need. Uh, I don't have any other update uh, for the privacy of, uh, of this individual. But setting aside the privacy of the individual, how often does President Biden call around trying to help his friends cut the line? That certainly was not his intention. He was not trying to do that. He was checking in on a friend. And do you know if this particular hospital might have been having staffing shortages because they have a vaccine mandate and maybe some folks have had to leave because they didn't want to get vaccinated? I would love for you to account for me uh, where that is the issue at over uh, more so than the number of unvaccinated who are filling uh, emergency rooms filling ICU beds. That is the problem in hospitals across the country. Go ahead. Jen, what does the president say to America? Inflation is a big issue right now for Americans from coast to coast as yeah. we head into the holidays. What does the president say to Americans right now who are worried about those rising costs? 
the president would say we take uh, the, uh, the the commitment. He takes the commitment of lowering costs for the American people uh, very seriously. Uh, we, of course, have seen and from outside experts, including the Federal Reserve, OECD, and others, that uh, the, their expectation is that these inflation uh, rises will be transitory, that they will come back down next year, and that one of the best things we can do is pass his agenda. That's what outside economists, 15, 17 Nobel laureates, uh, have conveyed in order to reduce the risk of inflation over the long term. But he's also attacking this from everywhere he can. Uh, if, I, if you take, for example, uh, the cost of meat in the grocery store, which we know is a concern to the American people. We believe that uh, the lack of competition is a huge issue here, uh, that con that the uh, con conglomeration of uh, big companies in some industries is a huge factor. So he's also taken that on. But we would say to the American people that what we're trying to do is lower your costs, whether it's child care, whether it's the cost of meat, uh, or whether it's ensuring this is not an issue in years to come. And for clarity, the time frame is still with the Fed set of next year. There isn't any better time frame the White House can give Americans about how long we kind of got to hunker down and get through this. Um, Americans should know that the Federal Reserve is in, makes independent assessments. That's an important thing for history, and that continues to be their assessment. Can I ask you then about the reporting earlier today as it relates to the president, former president's documents um, as they associate with the January 6th attack on the Capitol right now? Can you help detail for us or characterize what types of documents these are that would be provided? Well, the documents are Trump-era White House records responsive to the select committee's request to the archivist. Um, and so there is a process uh, where the former president would have a period of time to assert executive privilege, and then the current president uh, and team would have a, a period of time to review uh, that request. Uh, but in terms of the details of them, I point to the select committee for more, more specifics. specifically in terms of what the White House is saying you can't grant, you can't exert executive privilege over. Is it phone records, visitors? logs. Is there any way can you run us through that list? That is something I would point you to the committee on. Uh, go ahead. Jen, can you explain the standard of review then that the White House is undertaking? What would be something that this White House might consider privileged or should remain secret that a, this former president or any other former president should have the, the privilege that apply? To which the privilege should apply. Are you talking about as it relates to January 6th or just in general? Well, just, uh, well, specifically in this review, if there's any information you could share about the process that has been undertaken and more broadly. Well, the process that is is not is one that has been outlined through history and law is that the former president has the ability, not that there's a lot of past precedent here, I will acknowledge, um, has the opportunity to exert executive privilege uh, then, uh, to documents that uh, are in the National Archives. And then this president and this White House has the opportunity to review that. Now, I think it's important to note, and I know I said this, but I will just reiterate, this is, a, this is the first set of documents. So these will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, we will be responsive to the requests of the committee. I, I would like to know, just broadly speaking, that, um, you know, what this committee is investigating is not the normal course of government business, right? There is, a, as you know, and as all of you know, there are normal requests for documents, for information. Uh, there are uh, there are moments throughout history where presidents and White Houses have asserted executive privilege. We will continue to evaluate those on a case-by-case -case basis, but this committee is investigating a dark day in our democracy, an attempt to undermine our constitution and democratic processes by the former president. And that context, I think, is important here, too. I'd like to ask you to put a finer point on, on a question Amr asked you about sure. uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. The president today issued two proclamations, yes. one for Indigenous Peoples Day and yep. for Columbus Day. In the Indigenous Peoples Day proclamation, the president spoke of it as a day to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. And in the Columbus Day proclamation, the president spoke of the need for reflection on that day. And he also seemed to indicate that Congress has requested that the president proclaim Columbus Day. So my question is, is President Biden begrudgingly proclaiming Columbus Day this year? He's declaring both a holiday. Obviously, Indigenous Peoples Day is something that uh, he's honored to be the first president to be uh, issuing a proclamation on and celebrating. Is it his wish that the federal law be changed, that Columbus Day no longer be the, de the designation of the second Monday in October? I don't have any prediction of that at this point in time. Go ahead. Going back to the documents that the January 6th committee requested, can you clarify, we've heard, we've seen public statements from former President Trump and his lawyers about intention to invoke executive privilege, but did they specifically reach out and ask that certain documents not be shared? There's an entire process that transpires. I would point you to them and to the National Archives. 
Go ahead. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. So sorry, on the, on the economy really fast. You talked about labor shortages. You talked about supply chain issues. How long does the White House expect those issues to go on? Supply ch global supply chain issues? So what's your best guess for how long we'll have to be dealing with that? Well, look, I think, as I noted earlier in response to Peter's question, there are a couple of issues at play here. Um, I thought his question about the length of inflation. Or he, he also asked me about the global supply chain. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry, the, yes, yes. Also about the, the he, also, he asked me about the global supply chain issues. Um, I, okay, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, that is true, two Peters over here. Um, so one of the issues is, of course, how uh, how quickly we can work uh, as a global community to address COVID um, and get it under control around the world. The United States is far and away the largest provider of vaccines, donating uh, millions uh, to billions to uh, the global community to get the pandemic under control. We have also taken significant steps far and away, more than any other country, on manufacturing know-how, on ensuring that we are uh, providing uh, the supplies that are needed to countries. We continue to need other countries around the world to step up to help address because the global supply chain issues are in some part related to manufacturing in other countries. Uh, there are some issues we've seen um, you know, some progress on addressing, but we also need to get the CHIPS uh, uh, funding passed and through Congress. That's something the President strongly supports. A semiconductor chip shortage is a huge issue, as you all know, in the auto industry and manufacturing here uh, in the United States and around the world. So I would say there's not a, a one-sentence answer on this, because I know you weren't asking for one, but because there are a range of issues, we're working to, the point is, we're working to address them on several paths and on several fronts. Um, um, and I can't make a prediction of when it will be concluded. It is just a top priority of the president's. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jan. Just a quick follow-up on inflation. Um, so we're looking at Labor Department data. It shows that there is like a 0.9% uh, decline in how much Americans have earned per hour uh, on average this August versus last year. So year-over-year -year data when you adjust it for inflation. And so inflation is clearly eating into people's paychecks. And, you know, I understand that you're saying that, you know, in you have said this in the past that impact from inflation is transitory, that the president will, you know, when asked how he plans to address this, we'll talk about competition issues, we'll talk about meat prices. But are there any sort of near term steps that, you know, the White House is now thinking of taking as you look at this data that is starting to flow in? And is he starting to get, is the president starting to get increasingly concerned perhaps that this is now starting to actually eat into people's paychecks? Well, as you picked that wages piece of data, though, I think what's important to note is that uh, the progress that the president talked about this morning uh, is on a range of fronts, which is also important. Uh, we're at a faster projection of economic growth than we were at a year ago, far and away. Uh, the 4.8 percent unemployment rate is down from 6.3 percent in January. Unemployment claims are down 60 percent since the president took office. We have we have uh, seen close to 5 million jobs created since President Biden took office, and wages actually went up month to month from last month to the prior month. So that's all important data. I understand we can cherry pick different data pieces from a year ago or two years ago, but what we're seeing in the trend is encouraging and is progress being made. Uh, as you well know, um, inflation uh, is the purview of the Federal Reserve. They make projections. We rely on those projections. Those continue to say that it's transitory and will come down next year. It is also important that we address this over the long term and we address the costs. That is really what we're talking about in terms of the impact on the American people. People may not know, you hear inflation, it's like, what does that mean? That means rising costs, right? And how do you address those costs. And what the president's trying to do with his economic agenda is do exactly that. Cut the costs for the American people. Child care, elder care, uh, you know, cut in, in half the child poverty. Make sure that people have some breathing room. That's really what he's focused on doing in terms of how it's impacting uh, people who are sitting at home worried about their economic future. Now, are there specific, perhaps, commodities? You know, you spoke about chips. We've been talking about chips for a long time. Are there specific commodities or specific bottlenecks in uh, the global supply chain that are perhaps emerging more than ever now, uh, you know, in the run-up to the holidays that the White House is particularly focused on? 
Well, uh, I mean, I've, I've talked about a couple of the areas where we are quite focused on um, doing more and ensuring we're doing more, including uh, addressing ports and transportation bottlenecks, which, as we know, uh, can impact a lot of different areas uh, because it is how goods are moved and transported and ensuring there aren't the delays that I think you all have reported on in a range of ways. And John Percari is somebody who has a great deal of experience having worked for the Department of Transportation in the past and is working to address those global transportation issues. Uh, I noted, of course, the semiconductor uh, shortage, which, as you know, impacts a number of industries here. Um, and we have made some progress in our view, including improving communications and trust across the supply chain, improvements in the supply chain practices, which may seem overly simplistic or just cutting through bureaucratic uh, red tape, but it can help the process and move things forward. I also noted food processing. This is an area also where we have seen uh, impacts in communities is uh, from food pr processing and issues in the global supply chain. And so we and we know that the pandemic has revealed vulnerabilities in our food system. That's one of the reasons the Department of Agriculture announced the new food supply chain loan guarantee program. And we've also seen as it relates to lumber, which was an area that we talked about quite a bit several months ago and we saw the impact on how that impacted housing prices of new homes specifically since its peak the cost of lumber has decreased by 60% and as one example of the market leveling off so point is, there are different, as you know, there are different issues as it relates to the supply chain in different industries. We're working to address them uh, and uh, attack them all at the same time. We have seen some elements of progress, but we also continue to understand and know that as we're coming back from a global pandemic, a massive undertaking, and the economy's turning back on, uh, we're going to have to keep uh, pressing uh, to make sure we're addressing these issues, and we're doing that around the clock at agencies across the federal government. Uh, thank you. I mean, just uh, one quick question on, on gas prices. Um, Reuters has uh, some reporting that shows uh, a lot of American uh, consumers we're talking to have started to link the rise in gas prices to the administration's policies uh, that ban uh, fossil fuels. Uh, for example, a pause on federal leasing on land and water. Um, and so my question is, why keep a lid on production uh, at home uh, with American companies and instead ask open for more production where that production is perhaps not as environmentally regulated. Um, is there any consideration perhaps being given uh, to uh, to this, um, you know, keeping in mind uh, rising gas prices? Well, we are in touch. We are not a member of OPEC, as you all know. Uh, we are in regular touch with OPEC, and we have also raised um, issues of supply uh, in meetings that members of our national security team and others have had in recent weeks, as I have confirmed from here. Uh, we, of course, want to address uh, the short-term supply issues. One of those issues, as we know, uh, was uh, related to Hurricane Ida and the impacts in the region, which we took steps to address, certainly at the time. Uh, but our view, to, to go back to your original question, is also that, well, we need to take steps to address short-term supply issues. We need to also keep our eye on the long-term and the impact of the climate, uh, the crisis that is we are in the middle of, uh, and ensure that we are uh, continuing to encourage the production and rise of renewables and the clean energy industry, which is exactly what the President's uh, proposals would do. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, as the January 6th committee looks to enforce some of the subpoenas that it has been issuing for witnesses, will the President direct the Justice Department uh, to prosecute criminal referrals from the Select Committee? That would be up to the Department of Justice, and it would be their purview to determine they're an independent Has agency. Has the president discussed that at all with the attorney general? Or they're independent. The they, would, they would determine any uh, decision on criminal prosecutions. I'd point you to them and, of course, the committee. And then just going kind of big picture here, um, today we saw another jobs report that fell well below expectations, the smallest jobs gains in nearly a year. Gas prices are at a seven-year high. Inflation is up. Uh, the president is struggling to get the rest of his uh, Build Back Better agenda passed through Congress. How do you assess where things stand right now with regards to, uh, to his presidency? And, and do you see a need at this point to course correct, perhaps? We certainly don't see things as darkly as you do. Um, look, the president's focus is on on uh, leading through 
a challenging time. And that has been his focus from the first day he took office. Uh, if you look at the data month over month, as I noted a few minutes ago, we, he has also created 5 million jobs under his presidency. We've created an average of 500,000 jobs a month. We are at a faster rate of economic growth, a lower rate of unemployment than in quite some time. That's progress. That's moving exactly in the right direction. And as it, as it relates to the president's agenda, uh, we're continuing to press forward uh, with uh, members of Congress who have a broad range of views about the path forward. But we're making progress. The president remains confident. We're going to get it done. Uh, and this is what governing looks like. Do you not see today's jobs report as a warning sign in any way that perhaps the economy is not headed in the right direction, that perhaps the recovery is not going at the pace that it should be? I don't believe that's what economists are projecting at this point in time. And just a quick foreign policy question. It's been three weeks now since President Biden authorized the use of sanctions against uh, the Ethiopian government. Uh, we've seen credible allegations of human rights abuses, allegations of genocide. Uh, the Ethiopian government expelled seven senior UN officials last week. What is the president waiting for to actually implement those sanctions? Well, he signed the executive order in order to ensure we had the authority, should we determine, should we make the determination to put sanctions in place. That's, of course, an interagency process and a decision he would make the final sign off on, but I don't have any update on the status of that at this point in time. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, the president of Havana act into law today, but he did so out of public view. His statement today said that the United States government is offering resources to people who suffered from Havana syndrome incidents, but he stopped short of calling these incidents attacks. So at this point, what should the public know and what can the public know about what Havana syndrome actually is and how it is caused? I think the public should know that this president is the first president to acknowledge uh, the existence of a Havana syndrome or anonymous health incidents that across the government, across the national security team, they're taking this incredibly seriously. The National Security Council has worked closely with departments and agencies to take a number of significant steps, standardizing the reporting process so that all possible AHIs that are reported by U.S. personnel, regardless of department or agency affili affiliation, are uniformly documented and quickly shared, improve the quality and speed of medical care, which is part of what this bill would help do, ensure there is uh, financial support for that, ensure all relevant departments and agencies have messaged their workforce to provide guidance, increase intelligence collection and analytic focus on determining the cause of AHIs, and enlist U.S. government and outside experts to increase our understanding. What is important to also know and understand is that we, of course, are determined to get to the bottom as quickly as possible uh, of, the, of the attribution and cause of these incidents. The intelligence community is in the lead on that. They have launched a large-scale investigation into the potential causes. They're actively examining a range of hypotheses, but they have not made a determination about the cause of these incidents or who is responsible. So our focus is on uh, implementing, starting a process that uh, did not exist when the president took office. It's a huge priority for the government, the national security team, and the president was certainly pleased to sign the bill today. Is Havana syndrome a, th a threat to Americans, particularly those traveling abroad? I don't think you should make that assessment. We have not made an attribution. You should not, we have not made an attribution of the source, but we take every reported incident seriously. And what we want to do is ensure that our national security team is using every resource at our disposal, intelligence gathering, uh, assessing, treating every incident seriously, ensuring people receive medical care, uh, but without an attribution and without um, an assessment of the cause uh, or the origin. Uh, I just don't want to go further than that. Go ahead. Um, well, I'll come back to you, Patsy. So uh, the Congress has now solved the temporarily solved the debt ceiling and uh, funded the government. What is the president's expectation for a timeline of any sort to move forward on the infrastructure? bill um, and, and the Build Back Better agenda. You know, obviously, he's had a lot of conversations with members of Congress. But now that those two more immediate things are passed, is there an expectation that there's going to be a lot of progress next week? Is that something that he's conveyed to, to members of Congress? He wants to move forward on this, particularly before these issues come up again in December. The President wants to move forward as quickly as possible. Um, but I'm not going to set new deadlines. 
Uh, on, on the debt ceiling again, mm -hmm. is that something you know, it seems like he will be able to sign a, a short term suspension of that? Are yeah. there any uh, conversations about trying to avoid the situation that Congress faced this week so that it doesn't happen again in December? Or is the focus primarily on, on the two pieces of legislation? Well, I think there's no question our preference this week, last week, and in the future uh, would be to fully address the debt limit and not put the American people in a position where they are worrying about their retirement savings, their Social Security uh, payments to members of the military uh, moving forward. Uh, so we would like to have a longer term solution, there's no question. Uh, well, it took us some time to get there through a little blood, sweat, and tears. Um, well, not blood, but sweat and tears, perhaps. Um, you know, we are, what last night showed is that um, this can happen through regular order. And obviously, we, our preference would have been longer term, but there was a short term extension. It happened through regular order. We're going to continue to press uh, to uh, raise the debt limit and do it as, as it has been done in the past in a bipartisan fan, mash fashion. One, one last on that. Um, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer gave a speech after it passed um, Senator Manchin, um, and some Republicans criticized that speech. Does the White House have any uh, response to kind of the words that the, the leader used on the Senate floor? Well, we also issued our own statement, so I'd point you to the tone of that statement as to what our view is. But I would say that our con our view continues to be that Leader Schumer has shown uh, great skill in navigating this process uh, through a challenging process. We have confidence in his ability to do that uh, moving forward. And I think it's important to remember that the reason we were teetering on the edge of default in an economic calamity is because Republicans were refusing to join with Democrats or even to allow Democrats to be the adults in the room and raise the debt limit themselves. Go ahead, Tim. Thank you. Um, does the president support eliminating the debt limit entirely through uh, some sort of legislative process? There, there seems to be a growing chorus to just take away the cliffs. I've heard that, read that, seen that. Um, you know, I would say our focus right now is on uh, we're about six weeks away from another timeline and deadline. We want to uh, do what has been done in the past. 81, 80, almost 81 times in the past uh, in raising the debt limit, doing it in a bipartisan way through regular order. There's plenty of time for discussion after that. Is there any possibility of putting the debt limit into the reconciliation build back better Plan. We'll, we'll lead the, leave the legislative strategy and approach to Leader Schumer. Obviously, we just got agreement on the short-term extension last night, um, and we'll work closely with him and his team over the course of the period ahead. Yeah, and has the president spoken with Senator Sinema this week? Uh, and do you have a sense of what the areas of difference are? Well, we'll let her. I, I wouldn't say we see it as areas of different a difference with the president. The president's working to obviously he supports absolutely everything in his package. It was his package. He proposed it. He gave a big speech about it. He also understands and is known from the beginning that compromise was inevitable. People were going to have to give, including him. He's not going to get everything he wants out of a final package. So really, what the stage we're in now is is about determining what a smaller package looks like. We've been in that stage for a couple of days, as we expect it to be. And we will continue to be, I would expect. Our senior team has been uh, in touch with Senator Sinema. Uh, we believe she continues to uh, work with us, uh, communicate, negotiate, discuss uh, in good faith, and we'll work to continue to make progress. So maybe if I rephrase it as areas of requested compromise. Well, now, I'll let there, I'll let Senator compromise you could, could just I will let Senator Cinema speak for herself um, on that and what her points of view uh, are at this point in time. Go ahead. Yeah. Or go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, uh even as vaccination rates are going up and, as the president said, um, COVID cases are starting to come down, one of the main reasons why people are avoiding the workforce, workforce according to recent data, is fear of catching the coronavirus. So what more can the White House do here in order to fix the, the labor shortage? Because this seems to be the big issue. Is there more the White House can do? Well, one of the big steps we took is to announce a mandate for businesses with 100 or more employees, which obviously the next step would be OSHA regulations on how that would be implemented. A number of companies, as you know, have already put that, uh, have already put their own mandates or requirements in place. And we've seen a great deal of success across the board uh, on this front, um, where uh, companies
Companies have been able to, United Airlines for example, ensure there was greater certainty. Employees knew they were working with people who were vaccinated. There are fewer people who are, of course, out sick with COVID, fewer people who have even worse uh, impacts than that. Um, so one of the big steps we've taken and announced is to, uh, uh, is to put in place these requirements for businesses. Hopefully that will create more certainty. Uh, and we, there's no question, uh, to your point, that fear of COVID, uh, fear of work environments, that people are not sure if they're safe or not is a contributor as we look at uh, the number of open jobs out there. Oh, go ahead. One more on immigration. Um, the courts uh, said about two months ago that the administration would need to restart uh, the Migrant Protection Protocol program. Is there an update on that? Um, is the administration going to restart that soon? Uh, uh, we, we have been um, working in uh, to abide by what the requirements are uh, under the ruling, uh, while at the same time uh, the Department of Homeland Security, I believe, issued a new uh, memorandum just a few, a week or so ago. I'm happy to get you that after the briefing, too, on our path forward. Go ahead. Um, the, uh, the President's very tough approval ratings these days. I know you probably like to talk about polls and you might say that they don't mean anything, but um, it's also fair to say the White House, when there are good polls, you, you publicize them. So what do you make of these really terrible polls? Uh, are they that he's doing something wrong? Is it just the communication? Or is it he's doing the popular things that have to be done? Or something else? Sure. Well, look, I would say that this is a really tough time in our country. We're still battling COVID. Uh, and a lot of people thought we'd be through it, uh, including us. Uh, and we, because of the rise of the Delta variant, uh, because of the fact that uh, even though it was a vaccine that was approved under a Republican administration, uh, even though uh, we now have full FDA approval, and even though it's widely available across the country, we still have a quarter of the country who have, uh, less than that, 20% uh, of the country who've decided not to get vaccinated. No question that's having an impact. Uh, and of course, as the president has said, the buck stops with him. Uh, that's far and away the biggest issue in the minds of the American people. And it's impacting a lot of issues. We've talked a little bit about the supply chain. We've talked about, uh, you know, people's safety and feeling in the workforce. And so our focus is, uh, yes, not not exactly on, on the day-to-day -day up and downs of the polls. Our focus is on getting the pandemic under control, uh, returning to, uh, to uh, life, a version of normal, uh, so people can uh, have security and going into work and dropping their kids off and uh, knowing people will be safe. Um, and that's uh, where we think we should spend our time and energy. Go ahead, Kelly. On the executive privilege issue, mm -hmm. Donald Trump has certainly suggested he might again be a candidate for the nomination of his party and run for uh, the presidency again. President Biden has said he intends to run. So for people who are not familiar with the rules of executive privilege and might look at this as uh, through a political lens, what would your response to that be in terms of how the public should judge this action from this White House? Sure. There, there our view is that um, there's nothing uh, political about working to ensure that the events of January 6th never happen again. It shouldn't be a Democratic thing or a Republican thing, an independent thing, a political thing at all. Um, this should be a shared goal. And a key part of that, in our view, is ensuring that the select committee has the information it needs to ensure accountability for these events. Um, the Supreme Court has recognized that it is, quote, the current president who is vitally concerned with and in the best position to assess the present and future needs of the executive branch and to support invocation of the privilege accordingly. That's exactly what we're doing. And as I noted earlier, we're going to evaluate on a case by case. This is the first tranche of documents. Uh, and it is also important for people to understand that this is the use of executive privilege, which I think you're asking, because people don't entirely always know exactly what that is. Uh, we have been very cooperative with Congress. We will continue to be, as it relates to a range of issues related to our administration as well, and evaluate on a case by case basis. But this was a uniquely dark day in our democracy, uh, a day that we need to get to the bottom of. Um, and, uh, you know, that's important context here as well. Go ahead, Jen. Um, thanks. I just wanted to come back to um, the, the incident, the protest that happened with Senator Sinema over the weekend, um, and whether that's something that the White House or the President has been thinking more about since then. Sure. I mean, I, I would say I talked to the President about this maybe two days ago. It's all running together. In the last few days, I would say. And what he conveyed very clearly, just in case there's any confusion about where he stands, is that, well, of course, we all agree, uh, and as Senator Sinema said herself, the right to free speech and to protest uh, is sacred to our country. He believes that what happened to her uh, crossed the line and was absolutely 
acceptable and flat out wrong to violate someone's personal space in a bathroom. It doesn't need to happen in that way. We can peacefully protest uh, without it crossing that line. Uh, so that continues to be uh, his point of view. And has he had any conversation with her or other senators about it? Uh, he, we, he, our staff has been in close touch with her over the course of the last uh, several days, uh, working uh, in good faith uh, to move uh, to make progress and move forward. I'm not aware of other discussions he's had with other senators. On one other thing, on the, on the global minimum tax, um, Secretary Yellen said she wanted to see this happen through reconciliation. Would that be a part of the Build Back Better bill, or how are you thinking about the strategy on how to deliver on the U.S. commitment on that? Yeah, part of it is uh, certainly making the tax code more fair and discussing that as a part of the reconciliation package, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, on student loans, 15 House members sent a letter um, to the White House demanding the memo about the administration's authority on forgiving student loans by October 22nd. First, has the president um, seen the letter and made aware that the letter and that frustration is out there? And what's your reaction to the letter? I'm not aware of the letter. I haven't seen the letter. It, I'm sure someone in our legislative team, I'm happy to check if they have seen the letter. Um, I'm happy to check with them, but I'd have to take a closer look at it. I would say the president certainly believes we should lower the cost of college, uh, make it more affordable to people. Uh, he wants to ensure it's a, an option. That's why he proposed uh, an expansive plan on community college and making that accessible uh, to people across the country. And he also continues to, uh, would welcome a bill sent by Congress that would, um, uh, that would uh, eliminate uh, $10,000 in student debt. That hasn't passed. That's something everybody could certainly work toward passing. Go ahead, Patsy. I promise to get back to you. Yeah. But is the um, review that the Department of Education was said to be doing, are they still doing that? Have they started that? Is it over and you guys are just figuring out you know, typing it up, the, you know, print like, what, I, what is the, what <laughs> I don't have any, I don't have any update on it. I can, I can see if there's an update from the Department of Education. Go ahead, Patsy, and then come Thank back you to you. Jen. Uh, two questions to follow up on the Havana Act. One of the complaints that I hear a lot from both who believe that they were targeted by these attacks and also suffering from the so-called Havana Syndrome is the disparity in acknowledgement and also treatment depending on the country in which they were attacked. So they're saying if they were attacked in Cuba, the government would admit and acknowledge, uh, but if it happens in China, the government would not readily admit. So would you say this is a fair characterization? Is there a reason for this, diplomatic or not? And would you commit to treating all the victims and supporting them in the same way, no matter where they were attacked? It's hard to speak to anonymous sources here, Patsy. I would say that, as I noted earlier, our objective and the President's commitment is to standardizing the reporting process, is to ensuring we're improving the quality and speed of medical care, is of ensuring every case that comes forward uh, is taken seriously treated seriously. That has not always been the case, but that is our objective and the commitment of this administration. And just to follow up on that, I understand uh, you've explained how you want to standardize a process uh, of reporting, but will that include some sort of centralized support system, maybe a hotline or a task force where the victims can go and call? Because right now when I'm talking to, to the victims, they're saying they have to fight a skeptical bureaucracy. They don't know how to find care uh, from doctors who understand the syndrome, for example, and they just don't know how to take care of themselves and their families having to fight all of this bureaucracy. Well, I'm not sure that your characterization, I Look, this is a priority for every national security agency. It's something that many members of our national security team have spoken to personally, passionately, themselves, and their commitment to addressing this. We've also taken a number of very concrete steps. Each agency has their own process and system, but what we're working to do is coordinate it. So it's, it's, I, I think it's not really fair to speak to one or two anonymous cases uh, when this is a, an across the government effort, commitment, priority. The President signed a bill to law today. We've put a number of steps into, into place that are incredibly concrete. The President has acknowledged this is a problem. We're using every resource in the government to address it, and I think that really speaks to the President's commitment. Go ahead. Um, yesterday, I had like, hundreds of immigrants and activists protested outside the White House calling um, for Democrats to still include a pathway to citizenship in the reconciliation package. Um, there's been about 90 legal experts who've also submitted a letter saying that the presiding officer of the Senate can issue a ruling contra contrary to the Senate parliamentarian. Has the White House discussed any of these options with lawmakers on Capitol Hill? And would the president support, you know, kind of bypassing um, the 
Senate parliamentarians ruling on including a pathway to citizenship? Well, just so everybody understands the process, and, and they may or may, they very well may, but just to give the additional context here, um, we of course wanted Im uh, comp key components of immigration reform to be in the reconciliation package. The president supported that. He was vocal about that. The Senate Democrats went back twice and tried to get uh, components into a reconciliation pro uh, uh, package. And the parliamentarian, as you noted, but just so everybody understands the process, twice ruled that they could not be included in the package. In order to overrule a parliamentarian, it is not just waving a magic wand. Uh, it requires a majority of votes in the Senate, and it requires the vice president. Uh, so I would say that's a legislative process. I would point to Leader Schumer and others to ask the question of whether there is the opportunity or the appetite to do that. Many activists see this though, see reconciliation as one of the last opportunities to get immigration reform passed. Uh, President Biden said that that's you know one of the part of his agenda. I don't know, what are, are there any concerns that this isn't going to happen at all? The president is nine months into his first term in office. Uh, he introduced an immigration bill his first day in office. And his immigration bill not only included a pathway to citizenship, it included investment in smart border security, it, in, it included uh, re reforms to the asylum processing uh, system, uh, it included uh, in ensuring that dreamers no longer have to worry about their uh, safety and security in the United States, security primarily, being able to stay. Um, and that's something he's absolutely committed to. And uh, it, it, there are a lot of Democrats in Congress who feel as passionately uh, ab about it as he does. So we're going to have to press forward and work to find the vehicle. And what these activists are doing is great. They're out there advocating for uh, putting in place long overdue reforms. We agree they need to be put in place, and we need to keep pressing to get the job done. Go ahead. <laughs> Do you want to go on that all Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions. One on India. After last month's uh, meeting between President Biden and Prime Minister Modi, there have been a series of visits with the two countries ongoing and few are next, next several weeks. Where does the India US relations stand now of visit? Well, I would say clearly the quad meeting that happened just a week or two ago, it's all times running together for me at this point in time, but uh, was just uh, an opportunity uh, to discuss the importance of the par of the relationship and the partnership, the work that can be done moving forward, as well as, of course, the bilateral meeting. So those two meetings in, in one day. Uh, and now, at this point, uh, the focus is going to be on continuing to work through uh, high-level uh, interlocutors, whether it's the Secretary of State and, the, and leaders of the State Department or leaders from our national security team about how we can continue to move forward on a range of issues, whether it's economic security, uh, physical uh, national security, uh, addressing COVID and getting the pandemic under control. So that work will continue at lower uh, lower than the leader level, but still high levels in the weeks and months ahead. The immigration thing, uh, President has spoken about giving a uh, pathway to citizenship for illegal, both uh, documented dreamers as well, and the legal immigrants as well. Uh, this month, uh, 80,000 green cards uh, spots were lost uh, and they have millions waiting for green card. Does the president think that was a waste, could have been revived and given a faster pathway to citizenship to a lot of citizens? Uh, the president absolutely wants to address the delays um, in the green card processing system as well. On, uh, on the Afghanistan attack, 100 people died today. Do you have something on that? Uh, we uh, obviously any loss is a is a huge is an enormous tragedy and uh, our our heart goes out to the families who lost loved ones. Um, we of course will continue to um, uh, work in partnership with uh, leaders in the region to uh, work to get uh, partners who stood by our side uh, out of Afghanistan who want to depart. Um, that's something that there's ongoing work on as we speak. I guess I think it's going to be the last one. I wanted to ask about the COVID-19 vaccine rule that OSHA is working on. Sure. It's it's supposed to be an emergency temporary standard. What does that mean in this context in terms of time -off? Right, everybody, we are going to step away here. We want to update you on a breaking news story that we brought to you uh, the last hour. Unfortunate news here. You know, obviously it did not look good from the start here of this plane crash uh, that now we know has killed three people in this crash here. This was in DeKalb County, Georgia. So just to reiterate everybody, this was at the DeKalb Peachtree Airport and three people confirmed dead in this crash. You're watching live now from Fox. We are going to take a quick two minute break. Stay right here with us.
Welcome back everyone here to live now from Fox. Thank you out to Polk County, Florida here with the sheriff uh, is giving an update that happened earlier this morning in the overnight hours, a single motorcycle crash and a shooting that is believed to ha have occurred on Interstate 4 there in Polk County. Let's listen right here. Well, let's advance to 2021. The same thing happened last night, except the outlaws, instead of being on horses, we're on mo motorcycles. I guess you could call them iron horses. What I'm about to tell you is just a messed up situation by a bunch of messed up people. The information I give you is preliminary and the reason I give you this disclaimer is nobody's telling us the truth. I know that's a news flash, but it's not working in their best interest but we've cobbled together some information that I'm about to give to you. We apologize that we had to have the interstate shut down for a protracted period of time. However, we had bullet casings from three different firearms scattered over a half mile. And here's what occurred just after midnight. Ronald Donovan, who's 38 years of age and a black male, is a member of the Sin City Disciples motorcycle gang. He and at least two other motorcycles were eastbound through on Interstate 4 through the county, headed toward the Orlando area. When along came two thug riders, a different gang, on at least two motorcycles and passed them. Well, apparently that didn't work so well. And so then there was some skirmishing and some driving about 100 miles an hour. And during this event, Ronald shot from his motorcycle. He shot one of the thug riders, who is what we will call victim one who's 36 years of age and a Hispanic male. Victim one says, I felt the sharp pain in the back as I was shot, and I immediately returned fire toward Ronald Donovan, who had a white female as his partner on the back of his motorcycle. He struck the white female in the head and she's dead. I mean, I'm sorry, she's going to die. She is not dead yet, but she is mortally wounded according to the information that we received from the hospital. It is a through and through wound from just above the ear and comes out the other side. So now we have two victims that are shot. She falls off of the motorcycle and Ronald stops. Ronald and she have been friends, as we're told, for about eight or nine years. At this time, victim one drives to Champions Gate, which is the next large intersection past I-4 and 27, stops at a Papa John's, dials 911, and said, I got shot on the interstate. In the meantime, we're receiving other 911 calls that there's a shooting down on the interstate and obviously it's the same. We send deputies to both locations. The Florida Highway Patrol assist us and we determine immediately that this is not a crash that's caused this fatality or t soon to be fatality. I keep calling it a fatality because they tell us she is, she is in super, super critical condition at this moment. We start the investigation. We find out that there's a really a driving, riding gun battle down Interstate 4 just after midnight last night. We have witnesses that said they were wearing gang colors, but by the time we arrived, they were not only not wearing their gang colors, their gang colors weren't there. Ronald had two empty gun holsters when he was taken into custody, 
but there were no firearms around. Just as deputies were arriving, they saw a motorcycle leave the scene, and we suspect the person on that motorcycle may have the gang colors and are the firearms. So we had to search for evidence and firearms all up and down the interstate. There was a half mile trail of empty casings where this gunfight took place. At this moment in time, and I'm cautious at this moment in time, it appears to me that victim one who was shot in the back was acting in self-defense when he returned fire toward Ronald Donovan, striking victim two, who's a 33-year-old female. Ronald Donovan, now keep in mind, has his friend, his girlfriend, shot off the back of his motorcycle. When we are trying to determine what happened from him, he says, I know my rights. I don't have to talk to you. I take the fifth. Dude, your girlfriend is just shot off the back of your motorcycle, is an extremely critical condition, and you won't cooperate to tell us what happened? I know my rights. Well, he needs his rights because we ended up arresting him at the scene for battery on a law enforcement officer, resisting arrest. We're also going to charge him with attempted second degree felony murder on his girlfriend. If she dies, that will change to felony murder because all evidence all indication at this moment in the investigation indicates he started the shooting. He's also being charged with attempted first degree murder for shooting the other victim. The other victim had an independent witness, had an independent gang witness. We separated them immediately. They told us virtually the same exact story and we didn't give them the opportunity to collaborate on their stories once we arrived. This is a significant event. So now we can expect the Sin City Disciples, and it's spelled D-E-C-I-P-L-E-S, they spelled it wrong intentionally, and the Thug Riders to get all dusted up and be mean-mouthing each other on social media and let me warn you retaliation will get you all locked up in prison for a very long time and that's a guarantee in Polk County I don't recommend you do it in any county but stay out of Polk County your stupidness has already gotten a 33 year old beautiful young lady in a near-death situation and another man shot. And old Ronald, who started the shooting, locked up in prison or jail on his way to prison for what a man amounts to lifetime felonies. Now, I'll be glad to entertain questions because I do that sort of thing. However, I've literally told you everything that we're comfortable with at this point in time. We've had a lot of lying going on. We've had people that don't talk. We've had evidence hidden. We've had wit we've had at least witnesses and possible co-defendants that, that fled on us. And we'll find you too. Just give us the time. We got to get this sorted out. But we're coming to you to talk to you. So we are, as you know, very early into this investigation. Any questions? Was there a specific beef between these two guys, just the fact they're part of a rival gang? I hate you guts. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. The information we have at this time, they came, both came from Tampa. One came from a restaurant, and one came from a restaurant and apparently a gang house. They, they did not have a rivalry going on. They weren't at the same place earlier in the evening. So it just happened that 
the Thug Riders decided they would pass the Sin City Riders, and that didn't work so well. You had a rush of testosterone and a rush of idiocy, and it ended up with death, near death. I keep saying death. I shouldn't. She is not deceased yet, but she is in horribly bad condition. Okay? Anything else? Yes. Do you have any civilian witnesses? I mean, this is pretty scary that this was happening on the interstate. We do have some civilian witnesses that, that obviously we're not talking about right now that were behind the motorcycles when this event occurred. So there are some independent witnesses. Excuse me, sir? The, the, the fear that some folks might have is how even though these people are where they are now, but yeah. people on the highways. Sure. The good news is that there's no one at large. There's not a random shooter out here. We, we, we may not have all the shooters, but we're comf comfortable that we've got the groups together, and it's not like there's going to be someone out there tonight randomly shooting at cars. So it was great work by our deputies and detectives and highway patrol who assisted us. But understand, the one guy that was shot in the back, he raced to a phone to call us. And the other guy, who his girlfriend is near death, he knows his rights. And we're going, dude, we're just trying to find out what happened here. We're not accusing anybody. This was when we first got there. I know my rights. Okay. See how that works for you. Are you the groups local to here? Or they just have to be passing through Polk County? Passing through. The interstate four goes from coastline to coastline, so they, they were just passing through on their way back to the Orlando area. Sure. I mean, I know you've seen a lot, but hearing this, it's like I think most people don't realize that there's biker gangs out there that have so little regard for human life that they're just shooting at each other on the interstate. There's people behind them. I mean, how scary is this? For well, this is just one example. There, there's lots of little independent gangs, and and they this is a this is a motorcycle gang, and we have all kinds of, of gangs of criminals. Fortunately, you, you know, they behave most of the time, and it doesn't come to our attention. And these folks focused their their shooting toward each other, but. Unfortunately, why they're shooting at each other driving down the road on the eastbound lanes, there's people going the other way in the westbound lane. At this point in the investigation, it appears that none of them were hit. You know, who knows? After someone sees your television broadcast, they may say, well, I thought that was a rock that I heard hit, hitting my vehicle last night, and they go out and find a bullet hole later today. But the end result is... And we've discussed it. While the crime rate in Polk County is at a 49-year low, and it's historically low across this state, all of this talk about nationwide about bail reform and holding criminals in jail, it appears that it's, it has encouraged criminal conduct. Well, let me give all of you a newsflash that want to commit crime. That jail reform business that's letting thugs and criminals out all over the nation, it's not us. It's not us. Those criminals let out early for their criminal mischief, it's not us in Florida. So you're packing in the time being stupid out there. Behave. Behave. Or if you want to enjoy that low bail and don't go to jail, New York and California is wide open. And apparently they encourage that. So go there and have a big time. But if you come here and, and continue with your angst, it's going to be like the last three or four events where people were just off the rails. It doesn't work here. You're going to jail. You're going to get a no bond. We're going to try you. Our state attorney, Brian Haas, is simply the best, and then we're going to send you to prison for the rest of your life. Personal choice. You make a bad decision, we're going to make a good decision. 
guaranteed. Sheriff, how about priors for either the victim one or the I plan to do a wrap up next week. We we haven't got into their backgrounds and their priors and that sort of thing at this point because we're still working this initial event. I mean, believe it or not, we were hustling around to try to get that interstate open last night. So it took a even though if you happen to be the one stuck in traffic, it seemed like an eternity. We were doing our best to get that road open as quick as we could for obvious reasons, but. We, you know, they took an 1888 Old Western shootout and brought it to 2021 last night. Is this the first time you heard of something like that? That sounds like a scene from a Fast and Furious movie or something. Well, I think they watched the movie and they wanted to emulate it last night. But the unfortunate thing is we got we've got a a lady, a beautiful lady, if. You know, obviously we can't release her identity, but I've seen I've seen photographs of her. She's a beautiful young 33-year-old lady that's near death. And her boyfriend is locked up on, on many, many, many death case charges. We got another guy shot in the back. It, it, it's just craziness. Fortunately, because it was midnight and the interstate was not, packed thick bumper to bumper, there was room for bullets to move between cars. Had it been right now, it would have been a whole different story because it is bumper to bumper well in excess of the speed limit out there at this moment. And have you been talking to him? Has the investigators said or does he realize how he could have been hurt? Yes, sir, but see, it, it, it's, it's apparent to us after trying to talk to this man he was born smarter than the rest of the world and only got smarter as he aged. So he's he's someplace around uh, 842 points on the genius range right now in in his mind. And he didn't seem to care at all when he was talking to us. And this is initially, we weren't accusing him of anything, we just wanted to know what happened. But I suppose that when you're trying to talk to a guy and he's got two empty holsters there, he would need to have a lawyer because you got empty holsters, that guy's got a hole in him, your girlfriend got shot off the back of your motorcycle, that ain't a good night. Anything else? Going once, going twice, have a good weekend. We hope to give you a wrap up on this on Monday. And what are you doing out in Polk County? I thought you were behind the desk all the time. I'm glad to see you again. You do an awesome, awesome, awesome job, and we miss you out here. I walked in, I thought, my goodness, my buddy. How's it going? All right, so once again, that was uh, the latest with Sheriff Grady. So let's go ahead and uh, send some of our viewers off into a quick two-minute break. When we come back, going to be taking us out to some of that breaking news out of Prince George's County. Again, we do know at this time they do have that shooting suspect in custody. We'll be getting the latest with a reporter down there on the ground. More to come here in just two quick minutes.
And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. Christy Larson here at the desk with you as we continue to bring you some of these top news stories, breaking news events that have been taking place across the country. Do you want to turn our attention back out to Maryland where earlier this morning we did have a shooting at a senior facility take place. And now we're joined with Fox 5's uh, Stephanie Ramirez with more on this situation because, Stephanie, we are now uh, hearing that we do have that person in custody at this time. Correct. That person was in custody this morning, uh, but just shocking that these shootings are playing out more frequently, like we're seeing across the country, but also around the D.C. region, especially. And here in Prince George's County, the shooting also happened at a senior living facility. Some of those shots uh, were told the 911 calls, actually, some of them coming in at around 9, 10 this morning. So I'm just going to step out of your way here and show you that there's still a very active investigation here at the Gateway Village community. This is a senior uh, living facility in Capitol Heights, Maryland. And again, very active situation. A spokesperson confirmed that two people were killed and that those two people are employees of this facility. The shooter is believed to be a resident. We did talk with some of the residents and some of the people who knew the residents and had a hard time trying to get in contact earlier this morning as the scene was just unfolding. Let's play some of that sound for you. This is really, really horrible to, to be in the situation. You don't know what's going on. We saw about what happened because then he could have went another way. I saw him, the shooter, lying on the hallway with his arms stretched out and the weapon was like six feet in front of him. He told me to let the police know that he is no threat. He's ready. He's waiting for them. What he had done, he knew he was going away. Now, we can tell you that Capitol Heights Police, which is the police department for this local town here, they said that they started getting 911 calls, 911 calls at around 9:10 this morning. And this was for an active shooter at the senior living facility here. Now, they responded. They also called Prince George's County for police for backup and that there ended up being a barricade situation. Residents around the community were told to shelter in place. We're also told around 89 people live inside this facility. Some were, again, shelter sheltering in place in the building, but others did evacuate after a fire alarm rang out and some of those folks were taken to a nearby firehouse in the area so that they could reconnect uh, with their loved ones or try to get some assistance. I'm telling us they still hadn't taken their medication here. Again, this is a senior living facility uh, with some folks dealing with handicaps, including um, walking and, and where they need help there. Now, the two employees killed. A spokesperson with the facility confirmed that they are employees, in fact, with this facility, Prince George's County Police, with not confirm that right away, but when we asked more information about who these victims were, we were told that they were women and that one was found in a uh, corridor, the other one in an office. We're still waiting for more information, victim identification, and also information on this shooter. A lot of questions uh, still not answered yet, but we did hear from the county executive who voiced some frustration, really, quite frankly, saying that she can't understand why we keep seeing these scenes play out over and over again, especially when there are resources in Prince George's County. I mentioned, you know, right off the top there that this area is also seeing an increase in violent crimes as well as other areas in the nation, but especially outside of D.C. Here in Prince George's County, we learned that the homicide that took place here this morning marked around 102 homicides in the county so far this year, and that is compared to around 69 this same time last year. It's also back to you. Well, and Stephanie, I just wanted to touch on, you got to speak with some of those residents who were inside during this time. So did they know uh, this person, the suspect, very well? What did they have to say about that person? You know, there, there are what police, because we did ask police about this as well. And police told us, of course, there's going to be rumors. They're still trying to work out the motive and what was going on here. Several residents, I can tell you, did make allegations that there appeared to be some kind of frustration between the suspected shooter and the people involved, potentially the victims. But we're still trying to sort out what happened here. And one of the questions we were asking the county executive, as well as it was mental health, at play here, but a very unfortunate scene here in Prince George's County for sure. Right, especially with those lives that were lost this morning. So we do appreciate you helping uh, keep us up to date on the latest going on there down on the ground. Again, Fox 5's Stephanie Ramirez joining us here on Live Now from Fox. Thanks for being here and updating us all.
and we will continue to follow that developing story. As Stephanie said, obviously there's still a lot of questions that come from that area. We're going to step away for a quick two-minute commercial break when we come back, giving you even more stories, including a search that's going on down in Texas for a missing three-year-old. Plus, Biden's been talking about the job numbers as we've been seeing uh, them not show up as what the administration might want. So we'll have more to come here on Live Now from Fox after a quick two-minute break. Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. This is just a quick live look. Yes, the markets have closed not only here on this Friday, but also for the week. And I just wanted to pop this in because, as we all know, uh, we've been keeping a close eye on the stocks, especially if we've seen a few different numbers throughout the day. It did look like uh, we were going to end in the green, but just at the very tail end, right before that closing bell, uh, we did go down uh, not even to 10 points. So uh, it does look like uh, ending here in the red. This also could have some part of because of the Labor Department announcing employers hired 194,000 workers. President Biden discussing earlier here today the jobs report while speaking from the White House. We played those remarks out for you. We'll replay them a little later here on our Live Now from Fox stream. But um, again, it was uh, saying that uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the September unemployment rate fell to 4.8 percent, down from 5.2 percent in August. Uh, now, uh, President uh, Biden was uh, touting the country's fall in long-term unemployment, uh, going on to say the job creation made by his administration compared to the last one is much higher. But uh, again, uh, it did miss the mark for some of the goals that uh, people would like to see from this report. So we'll stay on top of that here for you on Live Now from Fox. But do want to jump out to more stories that, that have taken place across our country. Going to be uh, going out to a news conference that was uh, held by the sheriff's office. Um, they were uh, talking about a uh, suspect in the murder of a woman and her unborn child has been now arrested in North Carolina. Let's listen into this update right here on Live Now from Fox. Junior. And do you know if he is the father of her other children? No, he's not. Is he the father of this child? The unborn child, yes. 
And can you tell us his rank, please? I do not know that. Um, do you know how far along she was? She was 33 weeks. 33 weeks, you said? Yes. Huh? Had they gotten into, had they broken up or they were? I can't discuss that at this time. Can you say? Um, you know what type of evidence is that thing that breaks that? Uh, car parts. Car parts, tag, bag? No. Okay. Do you know how many shots were fired? Uh, I can't give that out. Do you know if this was premeditated? I can't give that out right now. What's his age? I want to say he's 35, around 35. Can you tell us where the incident happened specifically and kind of how far it um, do you know the area of Highway 18? Okay, um, we believe it, well, the, where Highway 219 and the Highway 18 meet, that area is called Jones Crossroad, and we believe it started in that area, and she ended up wrecking just south of where East Drummond Road comes into Highway 18. About, about three miles, one to three miles. Were any other cars involved in the situation? Just those two. So just to be clear, was she shot while she was driving or was her car and body dumped? Oh, no, it's not, no, she wrecked. Oh, okay. Yes, and she was shot while she was, the car was moving. Do you have any, do you have any phone records of contacting, texting or phone records? I can't discuss that right now. Do you believe that he shot from his vehicle, like he pulled up beside her and started shooting or was he? out of the car somewhere? Right no, there. they were they were both driving. Do you believe he followed her for some period of time? Can you elaborate on that at all? I could just say that they were together. He was following her from Jones Crossroads. We know that for a fact, and then where the incident ended. And was he stationed in North Carolina at Point Bragg? Yes, ma'am. So this was a long distance relationship? Yes. Okay, so she did live, live here, she lived around here? Yes. Okay. Is he married or unmarried? He's married. Children? I believe so. Do you know how many? I don't. But he is an active duty soldier with Fort Bragg. Yes. And that was where you guys arrested him. Yes. Has, has he had any criminal history or any, um, or has, has there been any domestic issues between him that you guys are aware of? Not that we're aware of. And will he be prosecuted here? Yes, sir. We have um, the extra, they will do the extradition process and then he will be brought back to Troop County. Is he currently in military custody? No, he, the military took him in custody for us and then turned him over to the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office. For He will be held there until um, extradition is, process is complete and can be transferred back down here. Can you please repeat the charges? Murder, feet aside, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime. Possession of? A firearm during the commission of a crime. Do you know what kind of weapon he used? A handgun. We're, we're not, not going to release the caliber. How, how, he's from there and she's from here. What was the name? He grew up in um, Troop County and they went to school together. Was his wife aware of this relationship? I can't release that at this time. Was it a military issued weapon? We don't know. You have the weapon? No. Are you guys looking at anybody else as um, potential suspects? No. Mr. Everybody watching, uh, I can't understand you, but. So the uh, record, Vita is uh, the definition of Vita It's the, the death of the unborn child. Mr. Everybody watching. Is either the unborn child was a boy or a girl? I believe it was a boy. And she has five other children, correct? Yes. Okay. So nothing that you can speak to as far as goes at this time? No. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, if you've got got any questions I heard some uh, related directly to his military status please refer those to the United States Army Public Affairs Office we don't have any information on that so just refer those to them can you spell his name one more time please yeah uh, one second one. Yeah. 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 
Alonzo. Oh, gotcha. Um, Alonzo, A L O N Z O. Dargan, D A R G A N Jr. Do you all have a mugshot or is that North Carolina? I do, right here. And this is um, available through the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office, North Carolina website. That was quick service. All right, are there any further questions? And when we're done here, I will send out what information we provided today through a printed press release. And you can follow with me if you've got any further questions. I did have one more question. All right. um, you said they were following each other while they were driving. Did he run her off the road? Yes. Okay. And then when was he taken into custody again? Uh, yesterday afternoon, 3.30ish. Yeah, around 3.30 in North Carolina. Wait, so he ran her off the road, then shot her? No. Mm -hmm. He shot her first. And then ran her off the road. And how many shots? How many times was she shot, or how many shots did he fire? We're still determining that, right? I mean, we don't know how many. I mean, we don't know. Multiple. Several. Yeah. Multiple gunshot wounds. And were any of those gunshot wounds in her uh, stomach area? I can't really say that. When authorities found him, was he cooperative? Uh, we didn't have any issues with him. Uh, Go ahead, we didn't have any issues of taking him into custody, um, but no statements were made in regards to the incident or his charges. And how did y'all find his whereabouts? Uh, with the help of uh, the CID division at Fort Bragg. Did he have any of their weapons at his house? Uh, no. No, he didn't. Was he living there on the post? No, he lived off post. Did you all take him into, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the county of North Carolina take him into custody or was this? No, the, the, the Fort Bragg has their own criminal investigation division. They actually took him into custody and then released him to the, the local county. Do you know the gunshot killer or the actor? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Do you know the gunshot killer or the actor? I, I can't. Yeah, we can't. Do you know his ring? I don't. Again, reach out to Public Affairs, U.S. Army. Is there any kind of timeline on the extradition process? Just, I mean, I don't really know what timeline. No, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Of course, if he agrees to be extradited back to Troop County, it'll be very fast. If he fights it, we would then have to get a governor's warrant, and we would have to bring him back against his will. But either way, he's coming back to Troop County to face these charges. Chair, could you just put into perspective the, just the horrific nature of this case? Sure. Absolutely. You know, I went to the scene and could not believe that somebody had shot and killed a young mother of five children, and on top of that, killed her, and she had a baby inside of her that resulted in the death of that baby. I personally, along with my chief deputy and one of my chaplains, went to the home of her father and had to deliver this news that your daughter is dead. That's very terrible news to have to hear from anybody, especially when it's one of your children and a grandchild, even if it's unborn. And then for my team to step up the way they did and work tirelessly to bring this man to justice speaks volumes for them. And I appreciate them and I know the family does as well. And thank you all for coming out to cover it this morning too. I appreciate that. Thank you. What school did they go to? You said they went to school. There are several children. There's five other children that went to two different schools. Some went. I meant the suspect and the victim, I'm sorry. Didn't they oh, I don't know what school they went know. to. That was years ago, okay, so I'm not they, sure. That's how they met. Supposedly. Troop County School System. Yeah. Troop County. Sorry, the what? Troop County? Troop, Troop County, County School System. System. They went to a public school here. <laughs> so once again, we've been listening in. This was an update that came in this morning after there was an arrest made, uh, after there was a unfortunate homicide of a pregnant woman. She was found dead in a car that was riddled with bullet holes. And again, they have uh, arrested the, what was the father of that unborn child, Alonzo Dargan Jr. Again, he was the father of this unborn baby. So uh, we do continue to give you some of these different news stories, as hard as it may be to hear, because 
course, we all like to keep you up to date on some of these news situations that are happening across the country. Do you want to say thanks again for being here with us on Live Now from Fox? We continue to follow a number of news stories here for you. We're going to be going out to a quick two-minute break when we come back, talking about COVID-19 mandates as well as a unique way to getting kids to school during a school bus shortage. More coming up here on Live Now from Fox when we all return. Welcome back here to live now from Fox and live look at the White House where we have had a couple different Biden events we've been bringing to here again. He was speaking earlier this morning on the jobs report also was uh, speaking about uh, preserving national monuments. We're going to replay some of those events a little bit later here today, but I want to continue to keep us all up to date on the coronavirus as more big companies are putting COVID vaccine mandates into place. Uh, the feds say it is working. Fox News correspondent Jonathan Siri has more from Atlanta. All right, it looks like we're having just a little bit of trouble getting the sound from this story. It will be something that I can always bring back here later as, again, there's many states that are mandating vaccines for healthcare workers uh, with no testing options. Out. And so there's uh, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, New York, uh, Maine, and Rhode Island. And again, uh, according to the feds, they are saying that these vaccine mandates in place seem to be helping as we continue to see uh, this pandemic continue on. So we'll stay on top of that story here for you on Live Now from Fox. But I do want to jump out to another event that we did have pop up here. Uh, we're going to be headed out to uh, the event where uh, in California, where we do have the George Floyd family members, attorneys, uh, they're all talking about uh, and also have some social uh, justice activists. They're in South Los Angeles. They're announcing a new nonprofit. It's called A Soulful Heart Memorializing George Floyd, Inc. Now, this is all going to be a nonprofit that is aimed at uh, focusing on uh, pushing to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. It's also going to be uh, aimed to raise awareness and reduce police killing killings hold law enforcement accountable for misconduct so let's go into that event here for you all as again we are uh, getting this coming to us from South Los Angeles okay. where's the family oh uh, let me, let me at, at least, at, at least the uh, 
Maybe the uh tap him. Maybe the patriarch and the matriarch. Maybe the patriarch and the matriarch. Oh, okay. Welcome. Where, where is Frank? He's coming. Come on in. <laughs> Give me one second here. Okay. Oh yeah, I need you to go to Facebook Live on the standby speaker. Hold on one second. Where is it? Okay. Oh, here it is. Just hit start live. So as we do have uh, everyone getting set up, you can see quite a few people stepping out here. This is taking place again in South Los Angeles. We do have out here George Floyd's uncle and also more relatives again there. Uh, also joined with social justice activists in South Los Angeles. They're announcing this creation of a new nonprofit. It's going to be called a Soulful Heart Memorializing George Floyd Inc. Now, um, they do say that this is a creation of a nonprofit to raise awareness, reduce police killings, and hold law enforcement accountable for misconduct. They also will be focusing on pushing to pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Uh, so we do have a few of the attorneys who also have been helping the Floyd family uh, during this time, also here speaking out as well. And uh, this is part of what we do here on Live Now from Fox is uh, when we bring you in these events, you can see it took some time for everyone to get gathered, get set up, uh, especially with uh, how many different people they have here, different speakers who are going to be wanting to make some comments about this new nonprofit getting started. And while this instance happened in Minneapolis, uh, we do know that it has been uh, a problem that we've seen across the country. So again, the uh, family of George Floyd has been very vocal about trying to reach out and help other families who may be uh, dealing with similar situations. And now also here, a new nonprofit being announced here today uh, to help with reducing that violence that they've seen in some cities across the United States. So it uh, looks like uh, things are finally getting set a little bit more ready? in place. And here we get started yeah. in South Los Angeles. <laughs> My name is Najee Ali, N-A-J-E-E, -E, Ali, A-L-I, community activist. Say his name. George Floyd. 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 Brothers and sisters, I'm grateful for each and every one of you for being here today. Today is a very special day. We have the family of George Floyd here in Los Angeles, and it's an honor to be with the members of George Flam family again. As many of the LA activists know, I went to Minnesota several times to support the family of George Floyd. What you may not know is Robert Sacedo, the CEO of Community Build, where we are today, who are hosting the Floyd family, came out of his own pocket each and every time to help sponsor my trip and my airfare and my food and my lodging. So I want to thank him. I want you to know what type of man he is. So uh, with that, and I'll talk later on, but we certainly were very touched and moved by the character that George Floyd's family displayed during the worst ordeal that they probably have experienced or any family can experience with the loss of a loved one who was essentially lynched in public. George Floyd was murdered in public and his murder shocked the nation. And as black people, the family and the community responded, but not only did we respond, for the first time in my 30 year history of activists, 
It seemed like the whole nation responded. We had a multiracial coalition of people in the streets fighting for the justice of George Floyd. So we want to thank everyone. So with that, I just want to introduce Robert Sacedo, the CEO of Community Build, who is our host today. Thank you, thank you, thank you Najee, thank you. Uh, let me first and foremost say uh, welcome to the Floyd family. This is an honor uh, to be here with the family and, to, so, and to, to just memorialize this moment. You know, I heard that George Floyd wanted to change the world. Well, he did. In 2020, Time Magazine named Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as Persons of the Year. It should have been George Floyd he un who unified people under a common cause unlike anyone since Gandhi or Martin Luther and Martin Luther King. The he was that civil rights leader of this time. As a matter of fact, I believe he really should have been on the cover of Time Magazine, and I hope that they put him on there as a person that held America and the world accountable for change. You know, the Bible says that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. George achieved God's purpose for his life, and the world is forever changed. I am forever changed. And I remember when I watched that, that dreadful murder, it reminded me of the time my own father was beat by the police. It reminded me of the pain of, of what we went through having seen the result of that. And so I thank you, Floyd family, for sharing George, his memory, and all that this has become for the world, not just the United States, but for the world, for those who got out and protested. At this time, I'd like to ask Pastor Anthony Williams, a senior pastor of the 88th Street Temple of Church of God in Christ, to say a few words. Pastor Williams. Thank you, Robert. God bless you all today. My name is Senior Pastor Anthony Williams, Senior Pastor of the 88th Street Temple Church of God in Christ here in South Central Los Angeles. And I serve on many hats, many boards, many auxiliaries, but none greater than working in the community here that we serve today. One of the roles that George Floyd's death sparked was our activism in the neighborhood I served, Athens Park. And because of that, I got very intricately, intricately involved in police matters and civic engagement. And one of the first things I did was join the Faith Advisory Council, helped found that council with Chief Michael Moore here in Los Angeles. And I'm pleased to say that because of this tragic event, that Earth's loss is definitely the nation's gain. George Floyd was a lightning rod for this nation, for this world. He caused us all to deal with some tough choices that maybe we haven't come as far as we think we have. And we should treat each other even a little better. So as I joined the council with Police Chief uh, Michael Moore, we added some changes and some, uh, some oversight committees from banning the chokehold from shooting at moving vehicles, the elimination of California gangs, and changing the tactics we use for nonviolent offenders. Now there are body cameras being worn on every police officer. Releasing those videos were critical in reducing officer-involved shootings and lowering the records. Uh, George Floyd's uh, death was a tragedy, but it sparked something in all of us that we need to just take a deeper look at each other and how we treat each other. Uh, we've all been in a pandemic, we've all been locked in together, we've all been isolated, and that causes us to just look into ourselves. But I think we're coming out a little bit, and this has definitely been an opportunity for us to all come back together. And so we need to continue to maintain the changes, continue oversight, and continue to just make sure that we're doing the things we need to do in the communities that we serve. And I hope that everyone today, and I want to thank the Floyd family for being here today, because they spark something in all of us that no matter how good things go or how bad things get, we can dig a little deeper and we can do a little better. And as we move forward, I want to thank Community Build, Najee Ali, and these men that have been on the front lines for so many years to keep us in our mind that what we do have to do and the work that we have to do moving forward. At this time, I'd like to introduce Stephen Davis uh, to speak a little further on these issues. Say his name. George Floyd. Say his name. George Floyd. Say his name. George Floyd. Today is a great turning point day. And the reason why it's a turning point day is we went through a whole year and a half of sorrow. And there's still sorrow going. Mm -hmm. But 
the Floyd family has turned the corner and they picked Los Angeles to start the thank you tour to say thank, thank you, you to all of you all who came out did did everything and my first act is to ask all of the Floyd family members to stand up and take a bow and say hello to your public stand up those that are the Floyd family they, they're standing. They're next oh. to you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, there, was, uh, there, there are others. There are okay. others out there. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, we chosen Los Angeles, and I'm always reminded. Somebody asked me, "Well, why did you choose Los Angeles?" And I said, like Frankie Beverly said in his uh, concert, "Why do a concert live in New Orleans?" And he said, "Why not?" You dig? <laughs> this is the place to be, right. to start off with. And we do thank you all so much. And I want to introduce some other folks that are that have joined us. Uh, one of the persons I want is to come up, come, uh, uh, Shelly White, come on up, come on up. Some of you all might not remember Shelly White, but she was one of the one of the honeycombs. She is one of the honeycombs. And her, her husband is Verdine White of Earth, Wind, and Fire. All right. All right. How are you? How are you doing? Okay. Um, there are a number of people that I want to introduce. And the first person I want to introduce is uh, Selwyn Jones, lawyer. I'm not getting to Selwyn Jones yet. <laughs> I want to introduce Selwyn Jones, lawyer, who's going to guide guide him to even greater heights and the Floyd family to greater heights. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. I'm Frank K. Wheaton, attorney. It is indeed my august pleasure to represent uh, the Jones family and certain members of the Floyd family. I've enjoyed the extraordinary privilege over the last 35 years of representing very important people and cer certainly some of those happen to be public figures. But I'm not certain that any have been able to make the kind of impact of a George Floyd. George Floyd is ubiquitous. He's global. He's spiritual. He touches every part of the earth. As in law, we say sui generis. He is one of a kind. And I am indeed extraordinarily privileged to be a part of this movement, of this family, and all that this entire group, and the group meaning all of the world, has joined in to really give an impetus and flow to George Floyd's meaning from this point forward. In legend all right, guys, do you want to say thanks again for being here with us? I'm live now from Fox. Christy Connor here with you. And what we're going to do is uh, show you just a quick shot. We do have our uh, storms uh, down in the south. You can see here our uh, vehicle giving us a look at these wet roadways that some of our people in Florida are having to deal with. Uh, we're going to come back here on live now from Fox in a double box, continuing to listen in to the uh, folks who are introducing that new nonprofit in the name of George Floyd but also uh, going to be taking a look at uh, this rain ban that's coming down in Florida. So more to come right here after some of you go off into a quick two-minute break. Memory and spirit will be pervasive where all of our souls are concerned and provide more meaning into everything that we do, more meaning in loving, eating and living. Subsequently, there'll be more meaning in you. I am privileged to be a part of the Selwyn Jones family. And of course, that means the George Floyd family. Right. Thank you very much. Good day. All right, good job. I also want to depart a little bit from what I was going to say to introduce someone that has helped the Floyd family uh, tremendously, and especially Selwyn, and that's his civil rights attorney, Mr. Greg Gates. As we move forward, there are a number of initiatives that are going to be started, 
and I'm not going to enumerate them because I'm going to let Selwyn Jones do that himself. All right. Okay. That's your own words. I'm not up here to pontificate in terms of taking time. I'm, I, you know, I'm here to introduce the persons that you all came to hear and see. The Floyd family, yes. led by their leader, Selwyn Jones. All right. Come on. Hello, young folks. How are we doing? Loving it. California, California. Loving it. You know, uh, I thank y'all all, each and every one of you, uh, for coming out, giving us the opportunity to spread our word and keep our movement going. Uh, good morning to all. My name is Selwyn Jones. I'm an American man. Raised in, I'm raised in North Carolina, currently residing in South Dakota. A successful businessman born in an economic impoverishment family. The uncle of George Floyd, who was tragically murdered in May 2020. There is much I could say about myself. Boy, I never stop talking about me, but you know, we'll try this one. Uh, but we're not here to talk about me. We are here to talk about the nation, the United States of America and to the answer the challenge posed by tragically, mur tragically murdered John F. Kennedy. Ask not what you could do for your country, ask what your country could do for you. My friends, and I are here today to acknowledge the man that George Ford wanted to be. We want to let the spirit of the man I knew as Perry know, as I knew as Perry, that his pain, our pain, shall not evaporate into nothingness, but shall continue to inspire, guide us to demand, not ask that our country, our government, our neighbors, our friends, our family, do the right thing and embrace the wave of change has swept across our land. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. answered, I mean, answered the question, how long? By saying, not long. We are here as a loving aimed that response and say how long, too long. As our people, we may have the fortitude of Nelson Mandela, but there has been enough pain, misery at this time for change is here. Everyone is somehow, is someone's son, daughter, sister, brother, or maybe a father or mother. Each and every one of us is a child of God, deserving of love. We have a problem, therefore, with insisting that love needs to rule, not ignorance and hate. America can and must do much more to, to ensure that no more black men, child, I mean, children, dies from police brutality and ignorance fueled racism and accompanies that brutality. How do we do that? How do we promote a great, a great love that is needed in this nation to align policy with sensibility and respect? Hundreds of thousands of individuals have posed in our have protested in our streets and in a corporate boardroom since the horrible day that my nephew died. Was it enough? Not yet. All we ask is the respect and dignity accord the parts of our population by according to us. My first action item is to announce I will personally engage in good trouble and push John R. Lewis's Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2021, also known as H.R. 4. Right. This is an act of love, a firm believer that in our country, most people want to do the right thing. They are just scared to do so. Most people understand that our system do not treat black people equally, but they are comfortable with how things are. They think it's too hard to make changes, but it's not guaranteed anyone the right to freedom to vote. It's simple expression of love, American style. I have, I have committed myself to personally speaking with those elected officials who are resistant who are resistant to love so our nation can move forward in a healthy and loving way in my life my heart has been my mother and my family my mother instilled love in our soul and the only things we are born with and will depart with when we transition is love god's favorite word 
I know that these things, because my family had nothing when we were growing up, and I will have nothing when I die. Yet, I know I love everyone. Most importantly, know that my nephew loved everyone. I think the late, great Maya Angelou, Angelo, Angelou, quoted my mother's, my mother, when she wrote, love recognizes no barrels, uh, barriers. It jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. And let, it, and let me also invoke the genius of Albert Einstein, who wrote the words to his daughter, if we want our species to survive, we want to save the world. Every sentiment being that inhibits it loves is the one and the only answer. This brings me to the second reason for asking I'm you here today. I'm honored to announce that I will be serving as the president of our new nonprofit organization. The official name is Soulful Heart, memorizing George Floyd, Inc. And the purpose is to rebuild relationships, promoting respect, trust, and love that in turn will empower individuals to make changes, positive decisions in their lives. We want a soulful heart to be a global connection, helping people. individuals to develop the skills, competence, and resources they need to handle future crises more effectively. One specific fo focus of Soulful Heart will be work with youth, will be working with youth. Positive messages promoted through the arts will help our young people take daily challenges while advocating for the social changes needed to protect the future. Today we'll start our fundraising efforts, and I am proud to be the first donor. <laughs> Man, do I really have to? <laughs> <laughs> For the important initiative. <laughs> uh, proud to serve as a, vol as a volunteer president. While we are starting the particular chapter of our Amer uh, of American Tale, we have been strugg struggling for a long time. How long? Way too long. My nephew murder was a sacrifice needed to wake up America. His loving soul has transformed my life and now intend to pass that on to transform other lives. George Floyd's soul will continue to infuse us with energy and determination. Right. We need to carry on. The end. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say his name! George Floyd! 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 Time for the mask to come back off. <clears throat> um, I, I do want to introduce two, uh, uh, two more people that really helped make this come together and has been working and, and their work has really just started. Um, the first person is uh, the chief of staff to Selwyn Jones and and her daughter, who is right there. <laughs> but uh, I want to introduce Love McCall. I want to introduce also, come Love, Margaret Bushware to come up. <clears throat> She's the one who helped put this all together and I want them to, them to acknowledge, be acknowledged. Um, I want to uh, also acknowledge uh, George Floyd's uncle from his other side, Ike. All right. Okay. Um, and with that, I probably have a lot of other people that I, I, I could introduce, but I don't want to keep you all here all day. Oh, what other person? I got one other person. Bindi, come on up. <clears throat> this is the great singer Bindi. <clears throat> Bindi Leibowitz. Le 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 <laughs> uh, and uh, so well, I want to close. I don't want. I want to close this section of the of it, and then add in the the part of you all asking us questions. So if you all have any questions, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and. Uh, if you don't have any questions, that's great. <clears throat> it means that we did our job. <clears throat> any questions? 
Okay, so remember, there are going to be some major initiatives announced in the coming weeks in terms of what? Question. Oh, excuse me, Stephen. Would you kindly repeat the name of the charity foundation again for purposes of the media, the correct spellings, and okay. of course the formation? It's called. I'm gonna let love. <laughs> I'm gonna let love do it because love because she it. came up with the name. That's why. Frank, <laughs> you thought I didn't I un time. remember it. I That's not. What is it? <laughs> it's a beautiful name. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the George Floyd family and management team, we would like to say thank you all for coming out for your support. The name of the nonprofit organization is entitled A Soulful Hard Memorializing George Floyd, Inc. And the reason for coming up with A Soulful Hard in the beginning of the title is because you have to know Selwyn Jones. I've grown to know Selwyn Jones for several months now. And one of the very first things Mr. Jones will always tell you is he loved his mother from the bottom of her soul and he loves his family. And before he get off the phone with you, he will always tell you I love you. I love everyone. So when I look at the life of George Floyd, he sacrificed his soul and his heart. And it took, it took his sacrifice to bring us together today to make an additional change, not just for my children, but for your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the future. When it comes to the soul, that's the only thing in this world that we're coming to this world with, is our soul. When we leave this world, that is the only thing that we're going to leave with, is our soul. And George Floyd had to be the sacrifice for us to be here today. Yes. So I ask you all to come together, support the George Floyd family, as well as our nonprofit organization, and let's show our youth that we do hear them, we do see the cry, and we will stick together in this fight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm gonna bring back Naji to be able to close it out. Oh, well. I want to once again thank the George Floyd family for coming to Los Angeles and thanking our activists and our community for supporting them from day one. As I said, I went to Minnesota several times. I have no regret because the family of George Floyd needed our support. In L.A., we showed up and showed out. That's what we do. So with that, uh, someone from the media asked me a question, and keep in mind, I'm glad Mr. Davis reminded me, as nonprofits, uh, you can't like endorse political candidates or, or campaign, but uh, I need to say this, our beloved Congresswoman Karen Bass is running for mayor, so the Floyd family all right, so we've been listening in again to this event that was taking place in Los Angeles as, again, uh, the name George Floyd not being forgotten about. But we do want to continue to give you more of these top stories that are coming in across the country. We just got in some uh, breaking news that I want to turn our attention to. You're taking a look at uh, some video from this incident, and now the Justice Department has said it will not pursue federal civil rights violation charges against the Wisconsin police officer who shot Jacob Blake last summer, which culminated in a uh, then it ended with days of violent protests where two people were killed. So Kenosha police officer Rusty uh, Rustin Shensky was shot had shot Blake on August 23rd, 2020, during a domestic response call. Now the shooting did leave Blake paralyzed amid a summer of massive demonstrations nationwide about police tactics and racial justice. So again, this was just some breaking news we wanted to bring to your attention as we just got word that the Justice Department will not be pursuing federal civil rights violations charges against the Wisconsin police officer who shot Jacob Blake last summer. Again, that shooting did leave Blake paralyzed. So we will, of course, always stay on top of breaking news, live stories that are happening across the country for you here on Live Now from Fox. Going to go ahead, step away for a quick two-minute commercial break. When we come back, and be taking you out uh, to more stories, including uh, some remarks from Secretary Blinken that happened uh, earlier here today. More to come here in just moments.
Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. Just want to give you this breaking news again here as federal prosecutors announced Friday they won't file charges against a white police officer who shot Jacob Blake in Wisconsin last year. Now, Officer Rustin Shisky shot Blake, who is black, during a domestic disturbance in Kenosha in August of 2020. Now, the shooting did leave Blake paralyzed from the waist down, and it did spark several nights of protests. Now, an Illinois man shot three people, killing two of them during one of those demonstrations. And state prosecutors have decided not to file these charges against the Wisconsin officer in January after the video showed that Blake had been armed with a knife. U.S. Department of Justice launched its own investigation days after the shooting. The agency announced Friday it won't pursue charges against uh, Shisky either saying there's not enough evidence to prove he used excessive force or violated Blake's federal rights. So again, just wanted to bring you this breaking news as we always follow the latest uh, developments across the country right here on Live Now from Fox. Taking us back out to the White House, let's go ahead and uh, check in with uh, the remarks that were made just earlier here today. We did get uh, Secretary Blinken, who is down in Mexico. Uh, he was uh, with the Mexican Foreign Secretary. Let's listen in to uh, this joint press conference that took place again just a little earlier here today. Hola, muy, muy buenas tardes. Agradecemos la presencia de los medios de comunicación. Good afternoon to everyone. Sin más, le damos la palabra al canciller Marcelo Ebrard. Okay. Is it working? Is the translation, is the interpretation working? Yes. Okay. okay. Gracias. Eh, muchas gracias. Thank you. We are here today um, wrapping up a process that has gone on for several months and that allows us to first affirm that we are leaving the Merida Initiative behind. We start with the Bicentennial Agreement. Why Bicentennial? Because we will be uh, celebrating 200 years of relations with, between Mexico and the United States. As you know, they were the first country that recognized us. So that is why we have given it this name. What is this agreement based on? You will have a declaration with the details. However, it is based on the incorporation of the visions of President Biden as well as President Lopez Obrador's of having a more comprehensive approach regarding security, health, and safe communities. This morning, the President Lopez Obrador was saying that we are inspired and that we coincide in terms of the concepts of freedoms and liberties of President Roosevelt. So there is an ideological and political affinity between both our presidents. What you will see in this document is the translation in terms of security, public health, and safe communities of those points that we agree on, which are crucial. The second thing I need to say is that we have found from the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, um, and from the Secretary of Home, all, and all representatives of the U.S. government, that we have a relation in which Mexico's priorities are the same, have the same level of priority as the ones from the United States. Today, is something. This is something that we can say, something that we did not have before. For Mexico, we must prioritize violence, homicides, providing opportunity for development uh, for young people. We are addressing the root causes of all of the issues that we are facing, and these priorities have been taken into account. In this document, we see a translation 
creation of a system, an institutional system to follow up on this agreement. This agreement is not a declaration, it's a path to be taken that is verifiable and that will provide results. We have to present on December 1st our yearly plan. What are we going to do from December 1st, 2021 to December 1st, 2022? At the end of January by next year, we have to lay down on paper, write down on paper what we're going to do in the next three years. So verifiable, transparent towards our citizens. To summarize, this is not a limited cooperation. This is a partnership that is superior qualitatively speaking. A partnership with people that you trust and respect. Partnerships cannot be done otherwise. So respect, co-responsibility, and reciprocity. Partnership between Mexico and the United States in matters of security, public health, and safe communities. You will see that there are three broad objectives to protect our people to prevent crime in the border region, to dismantle criminal organizations, to create immediate memorandums, MOUs, to reduce addiction to drugs and the harm related to them. This is the first time that we do something like this in our history. An MOU to launch the program for control of port containers, a binational working group on chemical precursors, joint work in terms of supporting what Mexico is doing in forensics to locate people who have disappeared. So this is an agreement that will be memorable due to its content and due to the fact that it translates for our peoples, for our societies, the coincidences that both administrations, both governments have. Thank you so much to the U.S. delegation and especially the Secretary of State, Mr. Antony Blinken, who will now have the floor. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, with you and with your entire uh, delegation uh, and ours. Uh, I think the spirit of, of collaboration, of, uh, of teamwork, of partnership was as strong as I've ever felt it uh, in working, uh, uh, working uh, with the United States and Mexico. And it's wonderful for me to be back in Mexico. My last visit was actually a virtual one, uh, one of the first visits I did uh, when we first uh, took office. But I think um, even a br brief time here is uh, a demonstration that there is no substitute uh, for being uh, together in person. Uh, our two countries, Mexico and the United States, share so much more uh, than a border. We share a history, parts of which I had uh, the opportunity to see this morning in the incredibly evocative murals of Diego Rivera at the Palazzo Nacional. Uh, and um, I. Uh, had something uh, I will never forget, which was um, a personal uh, commentary on the murals and on the history of Mexico by President Lopez Obrador. It was for me a, t a truly extraordinary moment. I'm so grateful to him uh, for taking the time and sharing so much uh, about his uh, knowledge of, uh, of Mexico's history and the, the history that unites our countries. Um, cultural, uh, economic ties, deep bonds, of course, between our communities and families. The relationship between our governments is wide-ranging uh, and complex. Every single day, we are working together on an incredibly broad range of issues, uh, from commerce to climate, from public health to public education, tourism to regional diplomacy. Uh, maintaining that relationship and strengthening it demands constant candid dialogue at every level. Uh, it requires seizing opportunities and adapting uh, to new challenges. And that's exactly what we did today with the high-level uh, dialogue. And I'm tempted to say I agree with everything Marcelo uh, said, because I do. Uh, it was a very um, accurate and uh, important description of, what we, of the work we did today. Um, and 
I have to say the, the relationship that we demonstrated today, the, um, the trust that is there uh, between us, uh, I'd like to say, if I can, Marcelo, I think that's the kind of relationship we've uh, been able to build uh, these past nine months and for which I'm really, really grateful. Um, so as you all know, this morning, together with uh, Attorney General uh, Garland, Secretary of Homeland Security Mayorkas, Deputy Treasury Secretary Adiamo, and other senior officials from our administration, um, we started the day with a chance to meet with President Lopez Obrador. We touched on, uh, again, the very broad range of issues that are so crucial to our relationship, including security, including migration, the economy, COVID-19, the climate uh, crisis. Um, and after that, with uh, Foreign Secretary Rivard and our colleagues, uh, we had a very productive first meeting of the high-level uh, security dialogue, where we launched the U.S.-Mexico Bicentennial Framework on Security, Public Health, and Communities. Now, that might sound like a mouthful, uh, and it is, but it is rooted in the idea that we have a shared responsibility as neighbors and as partners to improve security for the people of our, of our nations. That's what it boils down to. And it marks the beginning uh, of a new chapter in Mexico-U.S. security cooperation, one that will see us working as equal partners in defining and tackling shared priorities, one that seeks to address uh, the root causes of the security challenges that we face, including inequity, corruption, impunity, and one that does that not only by modernizing law enforcement, but also strengthening public health, the rule of law, and broader-based economic opportunity. Uh, there are three pillars to this framework, which I just want to very briefly uh, describe. Uh, the first is protecting the health and safety of the people of our nations. Um, often in the past, we tried to do this by relying too much on security forces and too little on other tools in our kit. Of course, law enforcement has a critical role to play in reducing homicides and other serious crimes. But its efforts have to be matched by investments in growing economic opportunity, particularly for underserved communities and regions. That happens to be a central focus of the high-level economic dialogue that we launched a few weeks ago uh, in Washington. And it is crucial to giving Mexican and American workers the tools they need to compete in the 21st century economy. Our efforts also have to include substance abuse prevention, treatment, recovery uh, support to help those struggling with addiction, to reduce the profound harm that illicit drugs inflict on our communities, and to reduce demand. Uh, and our governments agree that protecting our people means protecting human rights. And that means establishing effective mechanisms to assure that abusers are held accountable, which is critical to earning the trust of communities, shoring up again the rule of law, and giving victims the justice they deserve. Uh, as Marcelo noted, we're, we're expanding through our partnership uh, efforts for resolving tens of thousands of cases of disappearances and missing persons in Mexico. That is one example of how we can work toward this broader goal together. It could help bring closure to families as they search for their loved ones, and, and impunity for offenders. Uh, the second pillar uh, is on preventing trafficking across borders. Uh, we know that reducing arms trafficking is a priority for Mexico, as many of the illicit weapons in this country come from the United States. Uh, and we're committed to deepening our collaboration on arms tracing, on investigations, on prosecutions to disrupt this supply. We're also collaborating on fighting human smuggling and trafficking organizations, as well as drug trafficking organizations, which perpetuate cycles of violence and human suffering. Finally, the third pillar of the framework focuses on pursuing transnational criminal networks. Uh, we will deepen our collaboration to combat money laundering and other forms of corruption, particularly as these illicit organizations are growing more nimble in exploiting financial systems. Uh, we'll be making our justice systems more effective at investigating and prosecuting organized crime and increasing cooperation on extraditions. Uh, we agreed to build better metrics as well so that we can track all of these goals and hold ourselves accountable to them. Uh, the delegation that represented the United States government in today's high-level dialogue, including the Attorney General, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, in and of itself reflects how seriously we take our shared responsibility to deliver security for our people and the comprehensive tools that we are bringing to bear to do that. But crucial as this new framework is, we want the Mexico-U.S. relationship 
to be about more, much more than migration and security. Instead, it has to reflect the full range of issues where we share interests and we share values, including the environment, agriculture, technology, energy, trade, supply chains, and the innovative ideas that we came up with at the first high-level economic dialogue. All right, guys, we've been listening in to Secretary Blinken's remarks. Again, he was having a joint press conference with the Mexican Foreign Secretary, but I do want to step away from this uh, just for a moment because we do want to continue to give you some of these other stories that are happening all across our country. So thanks again for being here with us on Live Now from Fox. Christy Larson here at the desk with you. And um, it's a big push to bring better Internet access to uh, communities who may not have it. NASA scientists are now on a mission to help. So a new study explaining how they would establish Wi-Fi on the moon and now the same idea could work on Earth. We are joined with Fox's Stephen Gowen. And Stephen, this seems like a really interesting idea. You're in Cleveland. Let's hear a little bit more about this. Hi, Daytona. Yeah, it is really interesting, like you said. It's coming uh, from a group of scientists at a research center here. And this wouldn't be the first time an innovation that's been made for space has had a pretty big impact here on our lives on Earth, or at least the potential to. Take a look. Inside the Compass Lab, NASA's Glenn Research Center, Steve Olson and a team of engineers solve problems for the future of space travel. Come up with new ideas on how to land on different planets, to grab samples from them. But it was no coincidence when this team, tasked to find a way to bring internet to astronauts on the moon, found their answer in the digital divide of Northeast Ohio. So we were basically thinking, how would they do it on Earth and we can transport that in some ways, in some ways not, to the moon. The Compass Lab proposing the use of Wi-Fi routers mounted on street lamps instead of a single tower to create a mesh network in Cleveland. That same concept now proposed for use in a future lunar base. Though it has more practical applications today in the city that inspired it. We started a conversation with NASA Glenn and they were intrigued with the idea of examining this further, using their expertise to help solve this community problem. It's an option Cleveland leaders say could influence one of the many remedies needed in a city where nearly a third of homes have no broadband. The biggest issue we see is really around affordability. We know that solutions may need to be local. It's probably not going to be a one size fits all. Beyond Cleveland, millions across the country face a similar struggle, but with mesh networks already launched in places like New York, proving efficient and inexpensive alternatives to Wi-Fi towers and fiber. Really provides a real near-term solution. NASA's study supporting a similar fix could soon take off both here and beyond. have also pledged millions of dollars of federal COVID relief to broadband expansion. So it's interesting to think that if they use NASA's approach, you know, that space age fix could be a part of their plan, Daytona. Yeah, a lot of uh, big questions and uh, work that needs to be done for this to be uh, happening. So we do thank you again, Fox's Stephen Go and joining us here on Live Now from Fox. We appreciate you tuning in here. And what we'll do is uh, go ahead, take a quick look out in San Francisco, because I do want to show people we have been uh, giving you this look at uh, the fleet show that we have happening in San Francisco. So San Francisco is the only a city nationwide to host a fleet week. This year, you're taking a live look at just some of those amazing stunts that have been taking place up in the air. I know we had it kind of a, a visual for you a little bit earlier here. Wanted to bring that back here as, again, we do know uh, that there is uh, quite a few uh, plane fanatics who are hearing those rumbling noises across uh, the skies. And again, this is a live look out in San Francisco. So here is again uh, just a look at Fleet Week. It is officially underway. Navy ships have been arriving into the bay to get ready for all of the visitors and the guided missile destroyer. Uh, Shoop was the first to make it into the bay on Sunday. Fleet Week this year is going to be a big deal since it is the only Fleet Week 
nationwide of 2021. So it was the first of four Navy ships to make it on the shores of San Francisco. Right here, taking a look, though, at just some of the events taking place up in the sky. So uh, this year, the in-person tours are going to be resuming. Visitors, though, are going to be required to wear masks if they're going on board some of those ships. And uh, Fleet Week in San Francisco is the only in-person Fleet Week nationwide this year. And sailors and Marines say they're happy to be in the city by the bay. Going on to say, being the only Fleet Week for the last two years, a lot of excitement. We're happy to be out here again. Happy to bring our Navy to you. It's just going to make this Fleet Week in 2021 that much more special. So ships expected to be a major draw, but you can also see so are some of the aircrafts up in the sky as they zip past the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, we do have uh, what is said to be a lot of visitors who hopefully will be coming into the city for this as well. So uh, we did have um, the Aquarium of the Bay CEO George Jacobs say it's good news for other attractions as well. The regional tourism, regional traffic has actually shot up and our numbers are better than 2019 numbers from the same time, which is really surprising and encouraging. Events like Fleet Week definitely bring in more energy and we'd like to harness that energy and do it safely. So in fact, the aquarium already selling tickets for a fleet week watch party, including access to their balcony. And uh, they're hoping for some great weather over the weekend as well. And it, they said, uh, it's so fun to see uh, the blue angels shoot right by from what I understand, they're gonna fly upside down so you can actually see them in the cockpit. And here we're just getting a look at just some of these stunts being performed by some of the aircrafts up in the air. Uh, so visitors do say that they saw already um, some traffic with, uh, with uh, this being uh, taking place and ships tours began on Wednesday. Air show getting started uh, Friday here. You're seeing some of that through Sunday. So a lot of folks happy to be getting some of these big events back. As again, we do know that uh, they've been missed uh, when we've been looking for them here. Let's go ahead and take another live look at another event taking place. You can see we do have Secretary Blinken stepping out here. This is a meet and greet at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. Let's listen in live. Ron Unfiltered here on Live Now from Fox. Bienvenidos! Secretario Tony Blinken. So here at Mission Mexico today, we are profoundly honored, orgullosos del corazón to have somebody who I have known for a long time, but somebody who Joe Biden, the President of the United States, has known for a long time and who is leading the transformation of the relationship between the United States and Mexico, and that's the Secretary. Stephanie, I had understood Brian and Todd were here somewhere. And the Attorney General? They're, how about Brian and, are they around? Okay, well, here's what I'm gonna say, anyway. So today has been a very historic day for uh, us here in Mexico, but also for the U.S.-Mexico relationship. So the day's events, which Tony may recount to all of you in some way, have been very historic. Never before, in the recollection of many of you who I've talked to, have we ever had the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Attorney General of the United States, the Deputy Treasurer, Treasurer of the United States, and a whole host of other officials convening upon here in Mexico City to inaugurate this new chapter that we're on. And part of that representation that we have here are two people who are very close to us, Mr. Secretary. One of them is 
our Western Hemisphere Assistant Secretary, Brian Nichols. The other is INL Assistant Secretary, Todd Robinson. Is that Juan Gonzalez over there? Hey, Juan, come over here. Stephanie, come over here. Hang on, like You don't mind if I take some of your time. Now, we're, we're starting a journey that I am more excited about than anything I've ever done before, and you and I have talked about that. But some of the people who just make a lot of it happen, it's all of you here, first and foremost, because you have been on the ground. You're here with Stephanie when she had just arrived, and you hosted Jake Sullivan and Ali Mayorkas and Juan Gonzalez for really what was the opening of the door to the things we're doing now we'll do for the next four months. The person who made that happen was all of you and our DCM, Stephanie simpak Ramoth. Let's give her a round of applause. Now, this young man started working at the State Department not too long ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, being mentored by people like Jake Sullivan, Tony and others who really believed in the kind of work that you all do. So what we're trying to do now is, in many ways, transform a relationship. And it is transformative. But one of the engines, and there are many of them, but right in the middle of the White House, helping us drive this and coordinating all of our multi-agency programs at the NSC, Juan Gonzalez, Juan Sebastián Gonzalez. And now, to all of you who are here in Mexico City, and then throughout Mexico, from all of our consulates and around this country, we are so fortunate and delighted to have Secretary Blinken here. You know, I have known Joe Biden for a long time. He and I were senators together. He and I served on the cabinet together when I was Secretary of Interior and he was Vice President. But there were people who knew him long before I knew him and people who helped shape his foreign policy views of the world, recognizing really at the root that we are one humanity and we're trying to move together to create a more perfect place for the United States of America and for all of our citizens, but also for our neighbors around the world. As I joked around, introduced Tony at several events today, and Brian and, and Todd, I would say, uh, Brian has half of the world together in the Western Hemisphere, geographically. Uh, Todd has the whole world together because he's INL all over the world. But the person who has all of the world twice over, China, Middle East, Africa, you name it, is the leader of the United States Department, Secretary Tony Blinken. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, a few things right from the start. First rule of politics, never, never, never follow Ken Salazar to a podium. <laughs> Second, I've had the opportunity now in the nine or so months that uh, we've been in office to, uh, to visit some of our missions around the world, and of course we have challenges with with COVID, uh, but missions are stepping up, but I will admit it, and I'll admit it in public, Mission Mexico, unbelievable. We've not had a reception like this any place. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I have to start by saying as well that Ambassador Salazar is the best political ambassador we have. He's also the only political ambassador we have right now. But we're working on it. 
Um, and in all seriousness, in the short time that the ambassador's been here, that we've been working together, I, I have to tell you I've never seen anything like it. Uh, no one in my experience has ever hit the ground running uh, as fast and as hard as uh, the ambassador has. No one has accomplished more in such a sh short period of time. And it's a time that really has the potential to be transformational in the relationship between the United States and Mexico. And Ken, because of your extraordinary energy, um, the optimism that you bring to this mission's work, but also, and maybe most important, the vision that you're bringing, um, I think the chance to really uh, make that transformation real is greater than, it, uh, than it's ever been. So I'm so grateful that you're here leading uh, our, our way. Now, you've all, you've all discovered uh, the ambassador's sometimes distinct approach. Um, I understand there have been a few sing-alongs, including during the introductory town hall. I got some feeling for that uh, today. By the way, muchas gracias. Um, I wonder if, can you come home uh, with, uh, thank you. And, and Stephanie, it's wonderful uh, to, uh, to be with you again. We actually travel together to Japan and Korea during my very first trip uh, as secretary when Stephanie was the de deputy exec sec. Um, and I said I would come to Mexico City since you were heading here. Well, <laughs> promise delivered. Uh, and to my great friend and colleague Juan Gonzalez, uh, the ambassador is exactly right. With Juan, with Brian Nichols, we have the most amazing leadership team back in Washington uh, for this hemisphere and for this relationship. As the ambassador said, though, uh, more important than ever, there, and there, come on up, come on up, Ryan Nichols, all right, and, and Todd, all right. So as good as these, uh, these people are, something the ambassador said really uh, sums it up, and that is, uh, Whatever success we have is really because of each and every one of you. Um, whether you're here at the embassy, whether you're at one of our many consulates across the country, uh, what you're doing every single day, day in, day out, is what is building and transforming uh, this relationship. I know that trips like these, even relatively short ones, <laughs> involve an incredible amount of work, a tremendous amount of churn underwater. Everything is very smooth on the surface. Uh, I know it doesn't always um, uh, look that way when you're in the midst of it, but um, I really want to say to all of you who worked on this visit, have a great wheels up party. Uh, but as Ken said, we had a, I think, I don't want to be too presumptuous, but I, I think that we may have an opportunity to look back on this day as one of the pivotal days in the, in, in the relationship. There are going to be many more. but. We had uh, meetings this morning, as you know, with President López Obrador, with uh, Foreign Secretary Evard. We had the high-level security dialogue uh, with the Foreign Secretary and all of our, our, our cabinet colleagues, including the Attorney General, uh, including the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, including the Deputy Treasury Secretary, and all of uh, our, our senior team. And we managed uh, to fit in a tour of the incredible uh, Diego Rivera murals at the Palazzo Nacional. And I have to tell you that, for me, it was uh, something I'll never forget because uh, the tour guide was um, President López Obrador. And he recounted through the, the murals the extraordinary history of Mexico as well as the history of the relationship between our countries. And it was incredibly uh, powerful. Uh, incredibly evocative, and I think my hope for all of us with Ambassador Salazar in the lead is that we will, together with our partners, partners in Mexico, paint another panel for that mural that shows uh, a transformed relationship, one that is truly a partnership, one that is based on shared responsibility, 
uh, and really shared opportunity, and that captures the extraordinary breadth of the relationship between our countries that sometimes gets lost in the understandable day-in, day-out focus on some of the immediate challenges, whether it's migration uh, or security. Uh, so I think we have that opportunity, and this is really, uh, I believe, our, our mission um, going forward. But you all know this. It's trite to say it, but it is fundamentally true and so important to restate it. This relationship is, simply put, one of the handful of most important relationships the United States has with any country in the world. Our governments are working together. You're working together every single day on dozens of issues that actually affect the lives of our fellow citizens and affect the lives uh, of Mexicans, whether it's commerce, whether it's trade, whether it's climate, whether it's energy, whether it's justice, policing, border management, public health, education, cultural exchanges, tourism, the entire gamut. And that's what I hope we, um, we don't lose sight of as we're uh, focused sometimes on the, the day in, day out urgencies. We don't lose sight of the incredible breadth of this relationship. So I really wanted to just have an opportunity to, to come by. I gather this is a typical Friday afternoon gathering. And, uh, and just say thank you for the work that you're doing uh, to, uh, to make this real. Your work is actually having a direct impact of our people on the lives of Mexicans and actually on the lives of people uh, throughout the region and beyond. Let me just cite a few quick examples of some of the work that I know you've been doing. In addition to the high-level security dialogue, we launched the high-level economic dialogue just about a month ago. Mexico is our largest trading partner. Our economies are incredibly closely linked. We've worked together to, to strengthen trade, infrastructure, supply uh, chains to promote sustainable development in southern Mexico uh, and Central America. And that is the work of this mission. On security, INL is working closely with the government of Mexico on fighting drug trafficking, on making our border more secure, more efficient. USAID, where the rubber really meets the road at so many of our missions around the world, has had amazing success working with at-risk youth, kids who had previously committed crimes but go through our violence diversion program, as I understand it, have a 7 percent recidivism rate. That's compared to a national average of 60 percent. That's a remarkable success story. On migration and immigration, uh, we've made tremendous progress under the most difficult circumstances, reducing the immigrant visa backlog thanks to the work you're doing here. My understanding is that since May, uh, the consular team in Ciudad Juarez has decreased pending immigrant visa cases by nearly 40 percent. And I'm really grateful for everything you're doing uh, to make the immigration process more efficient, more humane, and making sure that the legal pathways to migration uh, are working is one of the critical factors in taking pressure off uh, irregular migration. So this is both very important and it's also a profound way that our countries are connected. I want to mention something that may not be expected, uh, and that is how this mission helped our evacuation efforts halfway around the world in Afghanistan. You here made more than 13,000 calls to U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents in Afghanistan to share vital evacuation information uh, and to help them know uh, what they needed to do uh, in order to leave if that's what they chose to do. This was literally the definition of an all-hands-on-deck uh, situation and the fact that so many of our people here in Mexico but also around the world stepped up made a huge difference. And of course, like missions around the world, you have been grappling with COVID-19. You provided emergency services to U.S. citizens in Mexico. Uh, in fact, last time I was here, uh, when I was Deputy Secretary, I spent uh, some time uh, visiting with U.S. citizen services, and it's a remarkable operation that I wish uh, more of our fellow Americans got a chance to see, because you do incredible work every day uh, helping our fellow citizens. You've facilitated the uninterrupted flow of temporary agricultural and other essential workers to the United States. You've helped with our donation of almost 8 million vaccines to Mexico. And you did that even while you were dealing with this terrible pandemic. And let me just say that I know it's been a hard time for, uh, for many of you. Uh, we've lost 21 Mission Mexico colleagues to COVID-19. And it's hard to put words to that, that loss. Um, each of them mattered a great deal to people in both our countries. Uh, and I know that uh, for, for many of you, 
this was deeply felt, personally felt, and a hard, hard thing to get through. Um, but throughout the difficulties of the last year and a half, two years, I just have to say I'm really humbled by your dedication to keep doing the job, to keep getting it done, to serve our country, to serve the relationship between Mexico and the United States. So whether you work for the State Department or one of the more than 30 agencies represented here, whether you're Foreign Service, whether you're Civil Service, locally employed staff, and locally employed staff, you are the lifeblood of this mission and every mission around the world. We're so grateful to you and for the partnership. Whether you are U.S. direct hire, a contractor, a family member, because we know your service too, very simply, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're here to support you. We want to give you everything you need to do your jobs well. Uh, as we say, I'm from the federal government. I'm here to help. Um, but uh, for today, it's just this. Thank you. Job very well done. Let's keep doing it. All right, Secretary Blinken uh, there in Mexico City, now back here in the U.S. They ended that very abruptly, camera turning off, so uh, that's why we saw that black for a quick second. But that's what happens here on Live Now from Fox. Sometimes when we're in these full press conferences, we bring the entire thing to you, uh, whether it's down in Mexico City, it's in New York City. We've shown you some press conferences out in Los Angeles and down in Florida. So no matter where it's happening, we're on top of it here for you on Live Now from Fox. Going to send our folks off into a quick two-minute break. When we come back, New Orleans police is saying they've had a deadly uh, overnight as well as a past week in their city. Let's go ahead and go into that break. We'll be hearing from New Orleans Police Department when we return. Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox, taking a live look here in our newsroom as we continue to bring you stories happening across the country. Going to take us out now to New Orleans, where uh, overnight they did have a violent night with two separate shootings that left two people dead, five others injured. Let's go ahead and give you that press conference that took place a little earlier here today with police. Cued up and all. Can you hear me? Just making sure. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, just want to uh, take this opportunity first to thank you all for helping us to message, uh, I think, what is an important message to our community. Uh, you know, this week has been a different week in which we've seen uh, a number of violent incidents, uh, as many as, I was prepared to say six homicides, but now there's seven one that we are currently working right now in the 1100 block of North Claiborne, uh, as well as six non-fatal shooting incidents reported. 
uh, this week with as many as 20 victims. So over the last 48 hours, we have noticed a, a little significant spike in violent crime, specifically to the 6th District. And when we're speaking about the incidents in the 6th District, we had as many as two homicide investigations as well as a non-fatal shooting investigation uh, in the 6th District over the last 48 hours. None of which I can specifically state that are related. But I think it was important that we, I, came, I come before our community on this Friday and say, hey, we are aware, we do see the spike, and we are invest investigating each and every one of these incidents appropriately. I have issued additional overtime hours to our homicide division, as well as our district patrols to further their investigations, but to also increase our visibility uh, throughout our city. I think what is the most alarming thing to me right now about these incidents this week is that they're occurring during broad daylight. And not just during broad daylight, to have an incident to occur, a homicide to occur at a church. Oh, if a church ground is not sacred, what is? So we really have to think about what the, the, the criminal element that we're dealing with today. Uh, this day and age, a bolder, as I've said before, more brazen criminal element that we're dealing with. So in, with that being said, I just wanted to reassure our citizens that we, the New Orleans Police Department, are continuing to be engaged. We will continue to be engaged, not through th just through thorough investigations, but also through our deployment and proactive investigations. Uh, I have an ask of our community as well. I've always said this, I will continue to say it. If you see something, please say something. But it goes a step further. If you have information that can help further our investigation, if you have evidence such as video footage, still prints or what have you, that can help further our investigation, please bring that to us so that we can do our due diligence and bring in peace to those victims and their loved ones. So I'm asking you, reach out to our district investigators at the various districts if you have information. Reach out to Homicide, 658-5300 is our Homicide Division. Or you can contact us anonymously through Crime Stoppers at 822-1111. But please bring that information to us as the investigating agency so that we can do our due diligence, due diligence and appropriately investigating these cases. Last but certainly not least, to those offenders, those individuals who have committed these crimes, we are coming for you. We have several cases that have been solved thus far. We have some persons of interest. We have a lot of things that are working in our favor to further these investigations. But to those criminals or to those offenders who feel as though they will continue to victimize our citizens and our city, just know for a fact that we are coming for you. With that being said, again, I thank you for coming here today and, and, and uh, allowing us to message this, what I feel is an important message to our citizens, and I'll, I'll answer any questions that we may have at this time. Can you, Chief, has the yeah. public been forthcoming in any of these shootings with information or anything that could help? You know, we, we, we always talk about the partnerships and, and how much of a partner, big partner, big parts that the community plays in this partnership. They have been, but we, we've seen some, in some cases where they've been a little bit reluctant. And I can understand that. And that is why you have that, that, that avenue to get us the information anonymously. And in some instances, some people just thought that the information wasn't worth giving to us. So no matter how minor you may think that information is, get it to us, and that would help us. It, that could be the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back with regards to our investigations. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Chief, this uh, homicide at the church, where, what location is that? 600 block of General Taylor. I do not know the name of that uh, church, but we had four victims in this shooting, two of which are deceased, and that is an ongoing investigation at this time. October 6th, Wednesday, this past Wednesday. Yes. Um, Chief, you didn't touch too much on juvenile, but I do know that it's in several of the incidents of shooting in juvenile. Yes. Is it your juveniles involved, young 15 years old? Can you talk about that a little bit and your concern? I mean, this is obviously, obviously it's a school day. 
Yes, yes. And that, and that, that is, you know, that is part of our concern. Again, as I mentioned before, it is alarming to have a violent incident to occur where any death, anyone, anytime anyone loses their life, anytime anyone is victimized of, in a violent crime, it is very concerning to us. But to have it to occur during broad daylight, uh, not under the cover of darkness, uh, that we are dealing with a different uh, criminal element at this point in time. I won't just put it on the juveniles because we have some adults that have been just as much responsible for that. But we have to continue to do our diligence, whether they are juveniles or adults, to ensure that we hold them accountable for their actions. Um, what is the tally again, the 48 hours we have how many I, I'll, get, I'll let PIO get that to you, have Gary get that to you, but I can't speak to the 6th District over the last 48 hours. They had three incidents in which they had two homicides as well as a non-fatal shooting. One homicide was last night, which we had four victims. One of the four is deceased, three are surviving victims. The one I mentioned to you on the 600, uh, 600 block of General Taylor, in which uh, we had four victims, two of which are deceased. And the other occurred in the 6th District on Richard Street, and I believe that may have been three victims as well. That, that was a homicide? That, that was a non-fatal shooting, the last one on Richard Street I just mentioned. What can you tell us about this one you're working currently? It just came out as I, as I walked out that door. Do you know how many people I have? I don't have any information on that at this time, unfortunately. I was prepared to speak to six homicides, not seven, unfortunately. Now we're dealing with seven. And let me see this. This week, I mean, we really had a, we were having a great week with regards to uh, crimes reported in the city of New Orleans. As of this morning, we had 40 violent crimes reported uh, to us thus far uh, as of uh, this morning. Um, no, this week, for the week. Uh, when we were averaging about 55, 56 uh, homicide, uh, no, I'm sorry, homicides, violent crimes per week. Uh, last year, we were averaging about 81, 82 violent crimes reported per week, same time last year. So we have seen this decline in violent crime, but we still have to do our due diligence in, in preventing others from occurring. You have operations in place to deal with these issues, so how are you guys going to change these things going forward to continue to combat crime? I'm sorry? Do you have operations in place mm -hmm. these issues, so how do you plan yeah. to change things going forward? So each district has their own deployment plan based on the needs of that community, based on the needs of that district. But we also have our violent crime abatement investigation team, which is composed or uh, comprised of our FBI partners, our partners at ATF, our partners at the Louisiana State Police, as well as our investigators that help enhance or further not just those district investigations, but also the homicide investigations. Again, giving additional overtime to homicide, giving additional overtime to the districts so that the investigators can further their investigations, but also create some visibility or uh, add additional visibility into our deployment plan throughout their patrol as well as a part of our overall package. But each district have their own specific deployment plan based on the needs of that district. Warm out here, so we're going to take two more.